Section 1 of The French Revolution, Volume 1, The Bastille. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The French Revolution by Thomas Carroll. Volume 1, Book 1, Chapter 1. Louis the Well-Beloved. President Hinault, remarking on royal surnames of honor, how difficult it is often to ascertain not only why, but even when they were conferred, takes occasion in a sleek official way to make a philosophical re reflection. The surname of Bienne, well beloved, says he, which Louis the Fifteenth bears, will not leave posterity in the same doubt. This prince, in the year 1744, while hastening from one end of his kingdom to the other, in suspending his conquests in Flanders, that he might fly to the assistance of Alsace, was arrested at Metz by a milady who threatened to cut short his days. At the news of this, Paris, all in terror, seemed a city taken by a storm. The churches resounded with supplications and groans. The prayers of priests and people were every moment interrupted by their sobs, and it was from an interest so dear and tender that the surname of Bienname fashioned itself. A title higher still than all the rest which this great prince has earned. Rich Chronology de l'Histoire de France, Paris, 1775, page 701. So stands it written in last memorial of that year, 1744. Thirty other years have come and gone, and this great prince again lies sick. But in how altered circumstances now? Churches resound not with excessive groanings. Paris is stoically calm. Sobs interrupt no prayers, for indeed none are offered, except priests' litanies, read or chanted at fixed money rate per hour, which are not liable to interruption. The shepherd of the people has been carried home from Little Trianon, heavy of heart, and has been put to bed in his own chateau of Versailles. The flock knows it and heeds it not. At most, in the immeasurable tide of French speech, which ceases not day after day, and only ebbs toward the short hours of night. May this of the royal sickness emerge from time to time is an article of news. Bets are doubtless depending, nay, some people express themselves loudly in the streets. Memoir de M. Le Baron, Bessonville, Paris, 1805, 59-90. But for the rest, on Greenfield and Steeple City, the May sun shines out, the May evening fades, and men ply their useful or useless business, as of no Lewis lay in danger. Dame Dubarry, indeed, might pray if she had talent for it. Duke Davy Lord, too. My Pio in the Parliament, but May Pio. These, as they sit in their high places, with France harness under their feet, know well on what places they continue there. Look to it, Davy Lord, sharply as thou didst, or in the mill of St. Cast on Quiberon and the invading English. Thou. Covered if not with glory, yet with meal. Fortune was ever accounted inconstant, and each dog has but his day. Forlorn in our language, Duc de Goulon. Some years ago, covered, as we said, with meal, nay, with worse. For Le Chalotes, the Breton parliamentier, accused him not only of poltroonie and tyranny, but even of concussion, official plunder of money which accusations it was easier to get quashed by backstairs influences than to get answered. Neither could th thoughts or even the tongues of men be tied. Thus, under disastrous eclipse, had this grand nephew of the great Richelieu to glide about, unworshipped by the world, resolute Toisio, the abrupt proud man, disdaining him, or even forgetting him. Little prospect but to glide into Gascony, to rebuild chateaus there. Arthur Young, Travels During the Year 1787 to 889. Paris St. Eminence, 1792, I 44. In dire and glorious killing game. However, in the year 1770, a certain young soldier, Dumouri is by name, returning from Corsica, could see with sorrow at Campagne, the old king of France, on foot, with doffed hat, inside of his army, at the side of a Magnificent fight on, doing homage, the Dewberry. La Vie et les Memoirs du General de Maurice, Paris, 1793-1794.
Paris, 1822. I, 141. Much lay therein. Thereby, for one thing, could de Goulon postpone the rebuilding of his chateau and build his fortunes first. For stout choice, would discern in the Dewberry nothing but a wonderfully dizzied scarlet woman, and go on his way as if she were not. Intolerable the source of sighs, tears, of pettings and pouting, which would not end till France, La France, as she named her royal valet, finally mustered heart to see Choiseul, and with that quivering a little, tremblement to mentor natural in such cases. Best involved memoirs, 21. Faltered out a dismissal, dismissal of those last substantial man, but pacification of the scarlet woman. Thus de Beulon rose again, and culminated, and with him there rose Maupeu, the banisher of Parliament, who pledged to a refractory president at Crawl in Combrails on the top of steep rocks, inaccessible except by litters, there to consider himself. Likewise there rose A. Tere, dissolute financier, paying eight pence in the shilling. So that went to claim in some press at the playhouse. Where is Ab Ture, that he might reduce us to two thirds? And so have these individuals built the Dom Daniel, or enchanted Dubery Dom, called in an Armida Palace, where they dwell pleasantly. Chancellor Malpio, playing blind man's buff with the scarlet enchantress, or gallantly presenting her with dwarf negroes, and the most Christian king has unspeakable peace within doors, whatever he may have without. My chancellor is a scoundrel, but I cannot do without him. Dulor, Histoire de Paris, Paris, 1824, 328. Beautiful Armida Palace, may the inmates live enchanted lives, wrapped in soft music of adoration, waited on by the splendors of the world, which nevertheless hangs wondrously as by a single hair. Should the most Christian king die, or even get seriously afraid of dying? For, alas, had not the fair haughty Chateau to fly, with wet cheeks and flaming heart, from that fever she not met, driven forth by sour shavelings? She hardly returned, when the fever and shavelings were both swept to the background. Pompadour, too, when Damien's wounded royalty slightly, under the fifth wig, and our drive to Trayadon was all futile, and shrieks and madly shaken torches, had to pack, and be in readiness, yet did not go, the wound not proving poisoned. For his majesty has religious faith, believes, at least the devil, and now a third peril, and who knows what may be in it, for the doctors look grave, asked privily. If his majesty had not the smallpox long ago, and doubt it may be a, been a false kind, Yes, my pill, pucker those sinister brows of thine, and peer out at it with thy malign rat eyes. It is a questionable case. Surely that man is mortal. That with the life of one mortal snaps irrevocably the wonderfulest talisman, and all Dewberry Dom rushes off with tumult into infinite space. And ye, as subterranean apparitions are wont, vanish utterly leaving only a spell of sulphur. These, and what holds of these may pray, to Beelzebub, or whoever will hear them. But from the rest of France, there comes, as was said, no prayer, or one of an opposite character, expressed openly in the streets. Chateau or hotel, where an enlightened philosophism scrutinizes many things, is not given to prayer. Neither are Rossbatch victories. Terry finances, nor, say, only 60,000 letres de cachet, which is Mopio's share, persuasives towards that, oh, head aunt, prayers, who were fret spitten by black art, with plague after plague, and lying now in shame and pain, with a harlot's foot on its leg, what prayer can come? Those lake scarecrows, that proud hunger stricken through all highways and byways of French existence. Will they pray? The dull millions that, in the workshop or furrow field, glide for that at the wheel of labor, like haltered gin horses, that blind so much the quarter, 
or are they that in the Bessetri hospital, in torment, lie waiting in the manumission? Dim are those heads of theirs, dull stagnant those hearts. To them the great sovereign is known, mainly as the great, the greater of bread. If they hear of a sickness, they will answer with a dull taunt, he poor Louis, or with the question, will he die? Yes, will he die? That is now, for all for it, the great question and hope, or by alone, the king's sickness has still some interest. End of section one. Section 2 of The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 1, Chapter 2. Realized Ideals. Such a changed France have we, and a changed Louis, changed truly, and further than thou yet seest. To the eye of history many things, in that sick room of Louis, are now visible, which to the courtiers there present were invisible. For indeed it is well said, in every object there is inexhaustible meaning, the eye sees in it what the eye brings means of seeing. To Newton, and to Newton's dog diamond, what a different pair of universes, while the painting on the optical retina of both was, most likely, the same. Let the reader here, in this sick room of Louis, endeavor to look with the mind, too. Time was when men could, so to speak, of a given man, by nourishing and decorating him with fit appliances, to the due pitch, make themselves a king, almost as the bees do, and what was still more to the purpose, loyally obey him when made. The man so nourished and decorated, thenceforth named royal, does verily bear rule, and is said and even thought to be, for example, prosecuting conquests in Flanders, when he lets himself like luggage be carried thither, and no light luggage, covering miles of road. For he has his unblushing Chateau Roux, with her bandboxes and rouge pots, at his side, so that at every new station a wooden gallery must be run up between their lodgings. He has not only his maison bouche and valetaille without end, but his very troop of players with their pasteboard coulisses, thunder barrels, their kettles, fiddles, stage wardrobes, portable larders, and chaffering and quarrelling enough, all mounted in wagons, tumbrils, second-hand chaises, sufficient not to conquer Flanders but the patience of the world. With such a flood of loud jingling appurtenances does he lumber along, prosecuting his conquests in Flanders, wonderful to behold. So nevertheless it was and had been. To some solitary thinker it might seem strange, but even to him inevitable, not unnatural. For ours is a most fictile world, and man is the most fingent plastic of creatures, a world not fixable, not fathomable, an unfathomable somewhat, which is not we which we can work with, and live amidst, and model, miraculously in our miraculous being, and name world. But if the very rocks and rivers, as metaphysic teaches, are in strict language, made by those outward senses of ours, how much more, by the inward sense, are all phenomena of the spiritual kind, dignities, authorities, holies, unholies, which inward sense, moreover, is not permanent like the outward ones, but forever growing and changing. Does not the black African take of sticks and old clothes, say exported Monmouth Street cast clothes, what will suffice, and of these, cunningly combining them, fabricate for himself an eidolon, idol or thing seen, and name it mumbo-jumbo, which he can thenceforth pray to, with upturned awestruck eye, not without hope, the white European mocks, but ought rather to consider, and see whether he at home could not do the like a little more wisely. So it was, we say, in those conquests of Flanders thirty years ago, but so it no longer is, Alas, much more lies sick than poor Louis, not the French king only, but the French kingship. This, too, after long rough tear and wear, is breaking down. The world is all so changed. So much that seemed vigorous has sunk decrepit. So much that was not is beginning to be. Born over the Atlantic, to the closing ear of Louis, king by the grace of God, what sounds are these? Muffled ominous, new in our centuries. Boston Harbor is black with unexpected tea. Behold the Pennsylvanian Congress gather. And ere long, on Bunker Hill, democracy announcing, in rifle volleys, death-winged, under her star banner, to the tune of Yankee Doodle Doo, that she is born, and, whirlwind-like, will envelop the whole world. Sovereigns die in sovereignties. How all dies, and is for a time only, is a time phantasm, yet reckons itself real. The Merovingian kings, slowly wending on their bullock carts through the streets of Paris, with their long hair flowing, have all wended slowly on, 
into eternity. Charlemagne sleeps at Salzburg, with truncheon grounded, only fable expecting that he will awaken. Charles the Hammer, Pepin bow-legged, where now is their eye of menace, their voice of command? Rollo and his shaggy northmen cover not the Seine with ships, but have sailed off on a longer voyage. The hair of Towhead, tete de dupe, now needs no combing. Iron cutter, tie affair, cannot cut a cobweb. Shrill Fredegonda, shrill Brunhilde have had out their hot life scold, and lie silent, their hot life frenzy cooled. Neither from that black tower de Nell descends now darkling the doomed gallant in his sack to the Seine waters, plunging into night. For Dame de Nell, how cares not for this world's gallantry, heeds not this world's scandal. Dame de Nell is herself gone into night, they're all gone, sunk, down, down, with the tumult they made. And the rolling and the trampling of ever new generations passes over them, and they hear it not any more forever. And yet withal has there not been realized somewhat? Consider, to go no further, these strong stone edifices, and what they hold, mud-town of the borderers, Lutetia Perisiorum, or Berisiorum, has paved itself, has spread over all the St. Islands, and far and wide on each bank, and become city of Paris, sometimes boasting to be Athens of Europe, and even capital of the universe. Stone towers frown aloft, long-lasting, grim with a thousand years. Cathedrals are there, and a creed, or memory of a creed, in them, palaces and a state and law. Thou seest the smoke vapor, unextinguished breath as of a thing living, labor's thousand hammers ring on her anvils. Also a more miraculous labor works noiselessly, not with the hand, but with the thought. How have cunning workmen in all crafts, with their cunning head and right hand, tamed the four elements to be their ministers, yoking the winds to their sea chariot, making the very stars their nautical timepiece, and written and collected a bibliothèque du roi, among whose books is the Hebrew book, a wondrous race of creatures. These have been realized, and what of skill is in these? Call not the past time, with all its confused wretchedness, a lost one. Observe, however, that of man's whole terrestrial possessions and attainments, unspeakably the noblest are his symbols, divine or divine seeming, under which he marches and fights, with victorious assurance in this life battle, what we can call his realized ideals, of which realized ideals, omitting the rest, consider only these two, his church or spiritual guidance, his kingship or temporal one. The church, what a word was there, richer than Golconda and the treasures of the world. In the heart of the remotest mountains rises the little kirk, the dead all slumbering round it, under their white memorial stones, in hope of a happy resurrection. Dull wert thou, O reader, if never in any hour, say of moaning midnight, when such kirk hung spectral in the sky, and being was as if swallowed up of darkness, it spoke to thee, things unspeakable, that went into thy soul's soul. Strong was he that had a church, what we can call a church, he stood thereby, though, in the center of immensities, in the conflux of eternities, yet manlike towards God and man. The vague shoreless universe had become for him a firm city, and dwelling which he knew. Such virtue was in belief, in these words well spoken, I believe. Well might men prize their credo, and raise stateliest temples for it, and reverend hierarchies, and give it the tithe of their substance. It was worth living for and dying for. Neither was that an inconsiderable moment when wild-armed men first raised their strongest aloft on the buckler throne, and with clanging armor and hearts said solemnly, Be thou our acknowledged strongest. In such acknowledged strongest, well-named king, conning, canning, or man that was able, what a symbol shone now for them, significant with the destinies of the world, a symbol of true guidance in return for loving obedience. Properly, if he knew it, the prime want of man, a symbol which might be called sacred, for is there not, in reverence for what is better than we, an indestructible sacredness? On which ground, too, it was well said, there lay in the acknowledged strongest a divine right, as surely there might in the strongest, whether acknowledged or not, considering who made him strong. And so, in the midst of confusions and unutterable incongruities, as all growth is confused, did this of royalty, with loyalty environing it, spring up, and grow mysteriously, subduing and assimilating, for a principle of life was in it, till it also had grown world great, and was among the main facts of our modern existence, such a fact that Louis the Fourteenth, for example, could answer the expostulatory magistrate with his l'état c'est moi, the state, I am the state, and be replied to by silence and abashed looks. So far had accident and forethought, had your Louis Eleventh, with the leaden virgin in their hat-band, and torture-wheels and conical oubliettes, man-eating, under their feet, your Henri Fourths, 
with their prophesied social millennium, when every peasant should have his fowl in the pot, and on the whole, the fertility of this most fertile existence, named of good and evil, brought it, in the matter of the kingship. Wondrous! Concerning which may we not again say, that in the huge mass of evil, as it rolls and swells, there is ever some good working imprisoned, working towards deliverance and triumph? How such ideals do realize themselves, and grow wondrously from amid the incongruous ever-fluctuating chaos of the actual. This is what world history, if it teach anything, has to teach us, how they grow, and after long stormy growth, bloom out mature, supreme, then quickly, for the blossom is brief, fall into decay, sorrowfully dwindle, and crumble down, or rush down, noisily or noiselessly disappearing. The blossom is so brief, as of some centennial cactus flower, which after a century of waiting shines out for hours. Thus from the day when rough Clovis, in the Champ de Mars, in sight of his whole army, had to cleave retributively the head of that rough Frank, with sudden battle-axe, and the fierce words, It was thus thou clavest the vase, son remise in mine, at Soissons. Forward to Louis the Grand and his Letas et moi, we count some twelve hundred years, and now this the very next Louis is dying, and so much dying with him. Nay, thus too, if Catholicism, with and against feudalism, but not against nature and her bounty, gave us English a Shakespeare and era of Shakespeare, and so produced a blossom of Catholicism, it was not till Catholicism itself, so far as law could abolish it, had been abolished here. But of those decadent ages in which no ideal either grows or blossoms, when belief and loyalty have passed away, and only the cant and false echo of them remains, and all solemnity has become pageantry, and the creed of persons in authority has become one of two things, an imbecility or a Machiavellianism. Alas, of these ages world history can take no notice. They have to become compressed more and more, and finally suppressed in the annals of mankind, blotted out as spurious, which indeed they are. Hapless ages, wherein, if ever in any, it is an unhappiness to be born. To be born, and to learn only, by every tradition and example, that God's universe is Belial's, and a lie, and the supreme quack, the hierarch of men, in which mournfulest faith, nevertheless, do we not see whole generations, two and sometimes even three successively, live, what they call living, and vanish without chance of reappearance? In such a decadent age, or one fast verging that way, had our poor Louis been born, grant also that if the French kingship had not, by course of nature, longed to live, he of all men was the man to accelerate nature. The blossom of French royalty, cactus-like, has accordingly made an astonishing progress. In those Metz days, it was still standing with all its petals, though bedimmed by Orléans regents and Rouet ministers and cardinals. But now, in 1774, we behold it bald, and the virtue nigh gone out of it. Disastrous indeed does it look with those same realized ideals, one and all. The church, which in its palmy season, 700 years ago, could make an emperor wait barefoot in penance shift, three days, in the snow, has for centuries seen itself decaying, reduced even to forget old purposes and enmities, in joint interest with the kingship. On this younger strength it would fain stay its decrepitude, and these two will henceforth stand and fall together. Alas, the Sorbonne still sits there, in its old mansion, but mumbles only jargon of dotage, and no longer leads the consciences of men. Not the Sorbonne. It is Encyclopédie, Philosophie, and who knows what nameless innumerable multitude of ready writers, profane singers, romancers, players, disputators, and pamphleteers that now form the spiritual guidance of the world. The world's practical guidance too is lost, or has glided into the same miscellaneous hands. Who is it that the king, able man named also Roi, Rex or director, now guides? His own huntsmen and prickers. When there is to be no hunt, it is well said, Le roi ne fera rien. Today his majesty will do nothing. He lives and lingers there, because he is living there, and none has yet laid hands on him. The nobles, in like manner, have nearly ceased either to guide or misguide, and are now, as their master is, little more than ornamental figures. It is long since they have done with butchering one another or their king. The workers, protected, encouraged by majesty, have ages ago built walled towns, and there ply their crafts. Will permit no robber baron to live by the saddle, but maintain a gallows to prevent it. Ever since that period of the fronde, the noble has changed his fighting sword into a court rapier, and now loyally attends his king as ministering satellite, divides the spoil, not now by violence and murder, but by soliciting and finesse, 
These men call themselves supports of the throne, singular gilt pasteboard caryatides in that singular edifice. For the rest, their privileges everywhere are now much curtailed. That law authorizing a seigneur, as he returned from hunting, to kill not more than two serfs, and refresh his feet in their warm blood and bowels, has fallen into perfect desuetude, and even into incredibility. For if Deputy Lapoule can believe in it, and call for the abrogation of it, so cannot we. No Charleroi for these last fifty years, though never so fond of shooting, has been in use to bring down slaters and plumbers, and see them roll from their roofs, but contents himself with partridges and grouse. Close viewed, their industry and function is that of dressing gracefully and eating sumptuously. As for their debauchery and depravity, it is perhaps unexampled since the era of Tiberius and Commodus. Nevertheless, one has still partly a feeling with the Lady Marichelle. Depend on it, sir. God thinks twice before damning a man of that quality. These people of old surely had virtues, uses, or they could not have been there. Nay, one virtue they are still required to have, for mortal man cannot live without a conscience, the virtue of perfect readiness to fight duels. Such are the shepherds of the people. And now how fares it with the flock? With the flock, as is inevitable, it fares ill, and ever worse. They are not tended, they are only regularly shorn. They are sent for, to do statute labor, to pay statute taxes, to fatten battlefields, named a bed of honor, with their bodies, in quarrels which are not theirs. Their hand and toil is in every possession of man, but for themselves they have little or no possession, untaught, uncomforted, unfed, to pine dully in thick obscuration, in squalid destitution and obstruction. This is the lot of the millions, peuple taillable et corvéable, à merci et miséricorde. In Brittany they once rose in revolt at the first introduction of pendulum clocks, thinking it had something to do with the gabelle. Paris requires to be cleared out periodically by the police, and the horde of hunger-stricken vagabonds to be sent wandering again over space for a time. During one such periodical clearance, says Lacretel, in May 1750, the police had presumed withal to carry off some reputable people's children in the hope of extorting ransoms for them. The mothers fill the public places with cries of despair. Crowds gather, get excited. So many women in distraction run about exaggerating the alarm. An absurd and horrible fable arises among the people. It is said that the doctors have ordered a great person to take baths of young human blood for the restoration of his own, all spoiled by debaucheries. Some of the writers, adds Lacretel, quite coolly, were hanged on the following days. The police went on. O oh, ye poor naked wretches! And this, then, is your inarticulate cry to heaven, as of a dumb tortured animal, crying from uttermost depths of pain and debasement? Do these azure skies, like a dead crystalline vault, only reverberate the echo of it on you? Respond to it only by hanging on the following days? Not so, not forever. Ye are heard in heaven. And the answer, too, will come, in a horror of great darkness and shakings of the world, and a cup of trembling which all the nations shall drink. Remark, meanwhile, how from amid the wrecks and dust of this universal decay new powers are fashioning themselves, adapted to the new time and its destinies. Besides the old noblesse, originally of fighters, there is a new recognized noblesse of lawyers, whose gala day and proud battle day even now is, an unrecognized noblesse of commerce, powerful enough with money in its pocket. Lastly, powerfulest of all, least recognized of all, a noblesse of literature, without steel on their thigh, without gold in their purse, but with the grand thaumaturgic faculty of thought in their head. French philosophism has arisen, in which little word how much do we include? Here indeed lies properly the cardinal symptom of the whole widespread melody. Faith is gone out, skepticism is come in, evil abounds and accumulates, no man has faith to withstand it, to amend it, to begin by amending himself. It must even go on accumulating, while hollow languor and vacuity is the lot of the upper, and want and stagnation of the lower, and universal misery is very certain, what other thing is certain? That a lie cannot be believed. Philosophism knows only this. Her other belief is mainly that, in spiritual, supersensual matters, no belief is possible. Unhappy. Nay, as yet the contradiction of a lie is some kind of belief. But the lie with its contradiction once swept away, what will remain? The five unsatiated senses will remain the sixth insatiable sense of vanity, the whole demonic nature of man will remain, hurled forth to rage blindly without rule or reign, savage itself, 
yet with all the tools and weapons of civilization, a spectacle new in history. In such a France, as in a powder tower, where fire unquenched and now unquenchable is smoking and smoldering all around, has Louis the Fifteenth lain down to die. With pompadourism and duberiasm, his fleur-de-lis has been shamefully struck down in all lands and on all seas. Poverty invades even the royal exchequer, and tax farming can squeeze out no more. There is a quarrel of twenty-five years standing with the Parliament. Everywhere want, dishonesty, unbelief, and hot-brained sciolists for state physicians. It is a portentous hour. Such things can the eye of history see in this sick room of King Louis, which were invisible to the courtiers there. It is twenty years, gone Christmas Day, since Lord Chesterfield, summing up what he had noted of this same France, wrote and sent off by post the following words that have become memorable. In short, all the symptoms which I have ever met with in history, previous to great changes and revolutions in government, now exist and daily increase in France. End of section 2「The French Revolution, Volume 1, by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Wayman. The French Revolution, by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 1, Chapter 3. Viaticum. For the present, however, the grand question with the governors of France is, shall extreme unction or other ghostly viaticum, to Louis, not to France, be administered? It is a deep question. For, if administered, if so much is spoken of, must not, on the very threshold of the business, which du Barry vanish, hardly to return should Louis even recover? With her vanishes Duke d'Aiguillon and company, and all their Armida palace, as was said. Chaos swallows the whole again, and there is left nothing but a smell of brimstone. But then, on the other hand, what will the Dauphinists and Choiseulists say? Nay, what may the royal martyr himself say, should he happen to get deadly worse, without getting delirious? For the present he still kisses the Dubarry hand, so we, from the ante-room, can note. But afterwards? Doctors' bulletins may run as they are ordered, but it is confluent smallpox, of which, as is whispered too, the gatekeeper's once so buxom daughter lies ill. And Louis the Fifteenth is not a man to be trifled with in his viaticum. Was he not wont to catechise his very girls in the Parc aux Cerfs? and pray with and for them that they might preserve their orthodoxy. A strange fact, not an unexampled one, for there is no animal so strange as man. For the moment, indeed, it were all well, could Archbishop Beaumont but be prevailed upon uh, to wink with one eye. Alas, Beaumont would himself so fain do it, for, singular to tell, the church too, and whole posthumous hope of Jesuitism, now hangs by the apron of this same unmentionable woman. But then, the force of public opinion? Rigorous Christophe de Beaumont, who has spent his life in persecuting hysterical Jansenists and incredulous non-confessors, or even their dead bodies, if no better might be, how shall he now open heaven's gate, and give absolution with the corpus delicti still under his nose? Our grand almoner roche for his part, will not higgle with a royal sinner about turning of the key. But there are other churchmen. There is a king's confessor, foolish Abbe Moudon, and fanaticism and decency are not yet extinct. On the whole, what is to be done? The doors can be well watched, the medical bulletin adjusted, and much, as usual, to be hoped for from time and chance. The doors are well watched, no improper figure can enter. Indeed, few wish to enter, for the putrid infection reaches even to the Œil de Boeuf, so that more than fifty fall sick and ten die. Madame the princesses alone wait at the loathsome sick-bed, impelled by filial piety. The three princesses, Grey, Chief, Coche, 
rag, snip, pig, as he was wont to name them, are assiduous there, when all have fled. The fourth princess, Luke, dud, as we guess, is already in the nunnery, and can only give her orisons. Poor Grey and sisterhood, they have never known a father. Such is the hard bargain grandeur must make. Scarcely at the debotte, when royalty took off its boots, could they snatch up their enormous hoops, gird the long train round their waists, huddle on their black cloaks of taffeta up to the very chin. And so, in fit appearance of full dress, every evening at six, walk majestically in, receive their royal kiss on the brow, and then walk majestically out again, to embroidery, small scandal, prayers, and vacancy. If Majesty came some morning with coffee of its own making, and swallowed it with them hastily while the dogs were uncoupling for the hunt, it was received as a grace of heaven. Poor withered ancient women, in the wild tossings that yet await your fragile existence before it be crushed and broken, as ye fly through hostile countries over tempestuous seas, are almost taken by the Turks, and wholly in the sansculotic earthquake, know not your right hand from your left, be this always an assured place in your remembrance, for the act was good and loving. To us also it is a little sunny spot in that dismal howling waste where we hardly find another. Meanwhile, what shall an impartial prudent courtier do, in these delicate circumstances, while not only death or life, but even sacrament or no sacrament, is a question, the skilfulest may falter. Few are so happy as the Duke d'Orléans and the Prince de Condé, who can themselves with volatile salts attend the King's antechamber, and at the same time send their brave sons, Duke de Chartres, Egalité that is to be, Duke de Bourbon, one day Condé too, and famous among dotards, to wait upon the Dauphin. With another few it is a resolution taken, Jacta est alia. Old Richelieu, when Beaumont, driven by public opinion, is at last for entering the sick-room, will twitch him by the rocher into a recess, and there, with his old dissipated mastiff face and the oiliest vehemence, be seen pleading, and even, as we judge by Beaumont's change of colour, prevailing, that the king be not killed by a proposition in divinity. Duke de Fronsac, son of Richelieu, can follow his father, when the curé of Versailles whimpers something about sacraments, he will threaten to throw him out of the window if he mentions such a thing. Happy these, we may say. But to the rest that hover between two opinions, is it not trying? He who would understand to what a pass Catholicism and much else had now got, and how the symbols of the holiest have become gambling dice of the basest, must read the narrative of those things by Besanfal and Soulavi and the other court newsmen of the time. He will see the Versailles galaxy, all scattered asunder, grouped into new ever-shifting constellations. There are nods and sagacious glances, go-betweens, silk dowagers mysteriously gliding, with smiles for this constellation, sighs for that. There is tremor of hope or desperation in several hearts. There is the pale grinning shadow of death, ceremoniously ushered along by another grinning shadow of etiquette. At intervals the growl of chapel organs, like prayer by machinery, proclaiming, as in a kind of horrid diabolic horse-laughter, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. End of section 3 Section 4 of The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elliot Gage. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 1, Chapter 4. Louis the Unforgotten. Or, Louis, with these it is a hollow phantasmagory, where, like mimes, they mope and maul and utter false sounds for hire. 
but with thee it is frightful earnest. Frightful to all men is death, from of old named King of Terrors, our little compact home of an existence where we dwelt complaining, yet as in a home is passing, in dark agonies, into an unknown of separation, foreignness, unconditioned possibility. The heathen emperor asks of his soul, Into what places art thou departing? The Catholic king must answer, To the judgment bar of the Most High God. Yes, it is a summing up of life, a final settling, and giving in the accounts of the deeds done in the body. They are done now, and lie there unalterable, and do bear their fruits, long as eternity shall last. Louis XV had always the kingliest abhorrence of death. Unlike that praying Duke of Orleans, Egalite's grandfather, for indeed several of them had a touch of madness, who honestly believed that there was no death. He, if the court newsman can be believed, started up once on a time, glowing with sulfurous contempt and indignation on his poor secretary, who had stumbled on the words, Fouwa de Spania, the late king of Spain. Fouwa, monsieur? Monseigneur, hastily answered the trembling but adroit man of business. C'est ton tetra qu'il prenons. Tis a title they take. Louis, we say, was not so happy, but he did what he could. He would not suffer death to be spoken of, avoided the sight of churchyards, funereal monuments, and whatsoever could bring it to mind. It is the resource of the ostrich, who, hard-hunted, sticks his foolish head in the ground, and would fain forget that his foolish unseeing body is not unseen too, or sometimes with a spasmodic antagonism significant of the same thing, and of more, he would go, or stopping his court carriages, would send into churchyards and ask how many new graves there were today, though it gave his poor pompadour the disagreeablest qualms. We can figure the thought of Louis that day when, all royally comparisoned for hunting, he met at some sudden turning in the wood of Sennar a ragged peasant with a coffin, for whom it was a poor brother's slave, whom Majesty had sometimes noticed slaving in those quarters. What did he die of? Of hunger. The king gave his steed the spur. But figure his thought when death is now clutching at his own heartstrings, unlooked for, inexorable. Yes, poor Louis, death has found thee. No palace walls or lifeguards, gorgeous tapestries of gilt buckram of stiffest ceremonial, could keep him out. But here he is, here at thy very life breath, and will extinguish it. Thou, whose whole existence hitherto was a chimera and scenic show, at length becomest a reality. Sumptuous Versailles bursts asunder, like a dream, into a void immensity. Time is done, and all the scaffolding of time falls wrecked with hideous clangor round thy soul. The pale kingdoms yawn open. There must thou enter, naked and unkinged, and await what is appointed thee. Unhappy man! There, as thou turnest in dull agony on thy bed of weariness, what a thought is thine! Purgatory and hellfire now all too possible in the prospect. In the retrospect, alas, what things didst thou do that were not better undone? What mortal didst thou generously help? What sorrow hadst thou mercy on? Do the five hundred thousand ghosts, who sank shamefully on so many battlefields, from Rossbach to Quebec, that thy harlot might take revenge on an epigram, crowd around thee in this hour? Thy foul harem, the curses of mothers, the tears and infamy of daughters. Miserable man, thou hast done evil as thou couldst. Thy whole existence seems one hideous abortion and mistake of nature, the use and meaning of thee not yet known. Wert thou a fabulous griffin, devouring the works of men, daily dragging virgins to thy cave, clad also in scales that no spear could pierce, no spear but death? A griffin not fabulous, but real. Frightful, O Lewis, seem these moments for thee. We will pry no further into the horrors of a sinner's deathbed. 
and yet let no meanest man lay flattering unction to his soul. Lewis was a ruler, but art thou not also one? His wide France, look at it from the fixed stars, themselves not yet infinitude, is no wider than thy narrow brickfield, where thou too didst faithfully or didst unfaithfully. Man, symbol of eternity, imprisoned into time, it is not thy works which are all mortal, infinitely little, and the greatest no greater than the least, but only the spirit thou workest in that can have worth or continuance. But reflect in any case what a life problem this of poor Louis, when he rose as bien ami from that met sickbed, really was. What son of Adam could have swayed such incoherences into coherence? Could he? Blindest fortune alone has cast him on top of it. He swims there, can as little sway it as the drift log sways the wind-tossed, moon-stirred Atlantic. What have I done to be so loved, he said then. He may say now, what have I done to be so hated? Thou hast done nothing, poor Louis. Thy fault is properly even this, that thou didst nothing. What could poor Louis do? Abdicate and wash his hands of it? in favor of the first that would accept. Other clear wisdom there was none for him. As it was, he stood gazing dubiously, the absurdest mortal extant, a very solecism incarnate, into the absurdest confused world, wherein at last nothing seemed so certain as that he, the incarnate solecism, had five senses that were flying tables, tables volantes, which vanished through the floor to come back, reloaded, and a parc au serre, whereby at least we have again this historical curiosity, a human being in an original position, swimming passively, as on some boundless mother of dead dogs, towards issues which he partly saw. For Lewis had withal a kind of insight in him, so, uh, when a new minister of marine, or what else it might be, came announcing his new era, the scarlet woman would hear from the lips of majesty at supper. He laid out his ware like another, promised the beautifulest things in the world, not a thing of which will come. He does not know this region. He will see. Or again, tis the twentieth time I hear all that. France will never get a navy, I believe. How touching also was this. If I were lieutenant of police, I would prohibit those Paris cabriolets. Doomed mortal, for is it not a doom to be a solecism incarnate? A new wa fuen wa. King do nothing. But with the strangest new mayor of the palace, no bow-legged pippin now, but that same cloud-capped fire-breathing specter of democracy incalculable which is enveloping the world. Was Louis no wickeder than this, or the other private do-nothing and eat all, such as we often enough see, under the name of man, and even man of pleasure, cumbering God's diligent creation for a time? Say wretcheder. His life solecism was seen and felt of a whole scandalized world. Him endless oblivion cannot engulf and swallow to endless depths, not yet for a generation or two. However, be this as it will, we remark, not without interest, that on the evening of the fourth, Dame du Barry issues from the sick room with perceptible trouble in her visage. It is the fourth evening of May, year of grace, 1774. Such a whispering in the Oya de Bouf. He's dying then? What can be said is that du Barry seems making up her packages. She sails weeping through her gilt boudoirs, as if leave-taking. D'Aiguillon and company are now near their last card, and nevertheless they will not yet throw up the game. But as for the sacramental controversy, it is as good as settled without being mentioned. Louis can send for his Abbe Moudon in the course of the next night, be confessed by him, some say for the space of seventeen minutes, and demand the sacraments of his own accord. 
Nay, already in the afternoon, behold, is not this your sorceress Dubarry with her handkerchief at her eyes, mounting d'Aiguillon's chariot, rolling off in his duchess's consolatory arms? She is gone, and her place knows her no more. Vanish, false sorceress, into space. Needless to hover at neighboring Ruel, for thy day is done. Shut are the royal palace gates for evermore. Hardly in coming years shalt thou, under cloud of night, descend once in black domino, like a black night-bird, and disturb the fair Antoinette's music party in the park, all birds of paradise flying from thee, and musical windpipes growing mute, thou unclean, yet unmalignant, not unpitiable thing. What a course was thine, from that first truckle-bed in Joan of Arc's country, where thy mother bore thee, with tears to an unnamed father, forward through the lowest subterranean depths and over the highest sunlit heights of harlotdom and rascaldom to the guillotine axe which shears away thy vainly whimpering head rest there uncursed only buried and abolished what else befitted thee louis meanwhile is in considerable impatience for his sacraments sends more than once to the window to see whether they are not coming be of comfort louis what comfort thou canst they are under way, those sacraments. Towards six in the morning they arrive. Cardinal Ron Almana Rochemont is here, in pontificals, with his pyxes and his tools. He approaches the royal pillow, elevates his wafer, mutters, or seems to mutter somewhat, and so, as the Abbe Georgel, in words that stick to one, expresses it, has Louis made the amende honorable to God? So does your Jesuit construe it. Wah, wah as the wild Clotaire groaned out when life was departing. What great god is this that pulls down the strength of the strongest kings? The Amman nor Abel, what legal apology you will, to God, but not if d'Aiguillon can help it to man. Du Barry still hovers in his mansion at Ruel, and while there is life there is hope. Ron Almana Rochemont, accordingly, for he seems to be in the secret, has no sooner seen his pyxes and gear repacked than he is stepping majestically forth again as if the work were done. But King's confessor, Abbe Modoan, starts forward with anxious, acidulent face, twitches him by the sleeve, whispers in his ear, whereupon the poor cardinal must turn round and declare audibly that his majesty repents of any subjects of scandal he may have given au pu donné, and purposes by the strength of heaven assisting him to avoid the like for the future. Words listened to by Richelieu with mastiff face growing blacker, answered to aloud with an epithet which Bazon Val will not repeat. Old Richelieu, conqueror of Menorca, companion of flying table orgies, perforator of bedroom walls. Is thy day also done? Alas, the chapel organs may keep going. The shrine of Saint Genevieve be let down and pulled up again, without effect. In the evening the whole court, with Dauphin and Dauphiné, assist at the chapel. Priests are hoarse with chanting their prayers of forty hours, and the heaving bellows blow, almost frightful for the very heaven blackens, battering rain torrents dash with thunder, almost drowning the organ's voice, and electric fire flashes make the very flambeau on the altar pale, so that the most, as we are told, retired when it was over, with hurried steps, in a state of meditation, a roquemont, and said little or nothing. So it has lasted for the better half of a fortnight, the Dubarry gone almost a week. Besenval says all the world was getting impatient. Que cela fini, that poor Louis would have done with it. It is now the 10th of May, 1774. He will soon have done now. This 10th May day falls into the loathsome sickbed, but dull unnoticed there, for they that look out of the windows are quite darkened. The cistern wheel moves discordant on its axis. Life, like a spent steed, is panting towards the goal. In their remote apartments, Dauphine and Dauphine stand road ready, all grooms and equiaries booted and spurred, waiting for some signal to escape the house of pestilence. 
one grudges to interfere with the beautiful theatrical candle which madame campon has lit on this occasion and blown out at the moment of death what candles might be lit or blown out in so large an establishment as that of versailles no man at such distance would like to affirm at the same time it was two o'clock in a may afternoon and these royal stables must have been some five or six hundred yards from the royal sick-room the candle does threaten to go out in spite of us it remains burning indeed in her fantasy throwing light on much in those memoirs of hers and hark across the oya de Bouf. what sound is that sound terrible and absolutely like thunder it is the rush of the whole court rushing as in wager to salute the new sovereigns hail to your majesties the dauphin and dauphine are king and queen overpowered with many emotions they fall on their knees together and with streaming tears exclaim o oh god guide us protect us we are too young to reign too young indeed thus in any case with a sound absolutely like thunder has the horologue of time struck and an old era passed away the louis that was lies forsaken a mass of abhorred clay abandoned to some poor persons and priests of the chapelle ardinon who make haste to put him in two lead coffins pouring in abundant spirits of wine the new louis with his court is rolling towards choisy through the summer afternoon the royal tears still flow but a word mispronounced by monsignor de artois sets them all laughing and they weep no more light mortals how he walk through your light life minuet over bottomless abysses divided from you by a film for the rest the proper authorities felt that no funeral could be too unceremonious Besenval himself thinks it was unceremonious enough. Two carriages containing two noblemen of usher species, and a Versailles clerical person, some score of mounted pages, some fifty palfreniers, these with torches, but not so much as in black, start from Versailles on the second evening with their leaden buyer. At a high trot they start, and keep up that pace. For the jibes, brocards of those parisians who stand planted in two rows all the way to st denis and give vent to their pleasantry the characteristic of the nation do not tempt one to slacken towards midnight the vaults of st denis receive their own unwept by any eye of all these if not by poor Locke, his neglected daughters whose nunnery is hard by him they crush down and huddle underground in this impatient way him and his era of sin and tyranny and shame for behold a new era is come the future all the brighter that the past was base end of section four recording by elliot gage section five of the french revolution by thomas carlyle this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Golding. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 1, Astrea Redux. A paradoxical philosopher, carrying to the uttermost length that aphorism of Montesquieu's, Happy the people whose annals are tiresome, has said, happy the people whose annals are vacant, in which saying, mad as it looks, may there not still be found some grain of reason. For truly, as it has been written, silence is divine, and of heaven, so in all earthly things too there is a silence which is better than any speech. Consider it well, the event, the thing which can be spoken of and recorded. Is it not, in all cases, some disruption, some solution of continuity? Were it even a glad event, it involves change, involves loss of active force, and so far, either in the past or in the present, is an irregularity, a disease. Stillest perseverance were our blessedness, not dislocation and alteration. Could they be avoided? The oak grows silently in the forest a thousand years. Only in the thousandth year, when the woodsman arrives with his axe, is there heard an echoing through the solitudes and the oak announces itself when, with a far-sounding crash, it falls. How silent, too, was the planting of the acorn, scattered from the lap of some wandering wind. 
Nay, when our oak flowered, or put on its leaves, its glad events, what shout of proclamation could there be? Hardly from the most observant a word of recognition. These things befell not, they were slowly done, not in an hour, but through the flight of days. What was to be said of it? This hour seemed altogether as the last was, as the next would be. It is thus everywhere that foolish rumour babbles not of what was done, but of what was misdone or undone, and foolish history, ever more or less the written epitomised synopsis of rumour, know so little that were not as well unknown. Attila invasions, Walter the penniless crusades, Sicilian vespers, thirty years' wars, mere sin and misery, not work, but hindrance of work. For the earth, all this while, was yearly green and yellow with her kind harvests. The hand of the craftsman, the mind of the thinker, rested not. And so, after all, and in spite of all, we have this so glorious high-domed blossoming world, concerning which poor history may well ask, with wonder, whence it came. She knows so little of it, knows so much of what obstructed it, what would have rendered it impossible. Such, nevertheless, by necessity or foolish choice, is her rule and practice, whereby that paradox, happy the people whose annals are vacant, is not without its true side. And yet, what seems more pertinent to note here, there is a stillness, not of unobstructed growth, but of passive inertness, and symptom of imminent downfall. As victory is silent, so is defeat. Of the opposing forces, the weaker has resigned itself. The stronger marches on, noiseless now, but rapid, inevitable. The fall and overturn will not be noiseless. How all grows, and has its period, even as the herbs of the fields, be it annual, centennial, millennial. All grows and dies, each by its own wondrous laws, in wondrous fashion of its own. Spiritual things most wondrously of all. Inscrutable to the wisest are these latter, not to be prophesied of or understood. If, when the oak stands proudliest flourishing to the eye, you know that its heart is sound, it is not so within the man, how much less with the society, with the nation of men. Of such it may be affirmed, even at the superficial aspect, that the inward feeling of full health is generally ominous, for indeed it is of apoplexy, so to speak, and a plethoric lazy habit of body, that churches, kingships, social institutions oftenest die. Sad, when such institution plethorically says to itself, Take thy ease, thou hast goods laid up, like the fool of the gospel, to whom it was answered, Fool, this night thy life shall be required of thee. Is it the healthy peace, or the ominous unhealthy, that rests on France for these next ten years? over which the historian can pass lightly, without call to linger, for as yet events are not, much less performances. Time of sunniest stillness. Shall we call it, what all men thought it, the new age of God? Call it at least of paper, which in many ways is the succedaneum of gold. Bank paper, wherewith you can still buy when there is no gold left. Book paper, splendent with theories, philosophies, sensibilities, beautiful art, not only of revealing thought, but also of so beautifully hiding from us the want of thought. Paper is made from the rags of things that did once exist. There are endless excellences in paper. What wisest philosoph in this halcyon uneventful period could prophesy that there was approaching, big with darkness and confusion, the event of events? Hope ushers in a revolution, as earthquakes are preceded by bright weather. On the 5th of May, fifteen years hence, old Louis will not be sending for the sacraments, but a new Louis, his grandson, with the whole pomp of astonished, intoxicated France, will be opening the States General. Dubaridum and its d'Aguillon are gone forever. There is a young, still docile, well-intentioned king, a young, beautiful, and bountiful, well-intentioned queen, and with them all France, as it were, become young. Maupieu and his Parlement have to vanish into thick night. Respectable magistrates, not indifferent to the nation, were it only for having been opponents of the court, can descend unchained from their steep rocks at Croy in Cambrai and elsewhere, and return singing praises. The old Parlement of Paris resumes its functions. Instead of a profligate bankrupt Abbe Terray, we have now, for Controller General, a virtuous philosophic Turgot, with a whole reformed France in his head. 
by whom whatsoever is wrong, in finance or otherwise, will be righted, as far as possible. Is it not as if wisdom herself were henceforth to have seat and voice in the council of kings? Turgot has taken office with the noblest plainness of speech to that effect, being listened to with the noblest royal trustfulness. Turgot's letter, Condorcet, Vie de Turgot, Oeuvre de Condorcet, page 67. The date is 24th August, 1774. It is true, as King Louis objects, they say he never goes to Mass, but liberal France likes him little worse for that. Liberal France answers, the Abbe Terre always went. Philosophism sees, for the first time, a philosoph, or even a philosopher, in office. She in all things will applausively second him. Neither will light old Maurepas obstruct, if he can easily help it. Then how sweet are the manners, vice losing all its deformity, becoming decent, as established things, making regulations for themselves, do, becoming almost a kind of sweet virtue. Intelligence so abounds, irradiated by wit and the art of conversation. Philosophism sits joyful in her glittering saloons, the dinner guest of opulence grown ingenuous, the very nobles proud to sit by her, and preaches, lifted up over all Bastille, a coming millennium. From far Fernie, Patriarch Voltaire gives sign. Veterans Diderot, d'Alembert, have lived to see this day. These with their younger Marmontels, Morellet, Chamfort, Renel, make glad the spicy board of rich ministering dowager, of philosophic farmer-general. O knights and suppers of the gods! Of a truth, the long demonstrated will now be done. The age of revolutions approaches, as Jean Jacques wrote. But then of happy blessed ones. Man awakens from his long somnambulism, chases the phantasms that beleaguered and bewitched him. Behold the new morning glittering down the eastern steeps. Fly, false phantasms, from its shafts of light. Let the absurd fly utterly forsaking this lower earth for ever. It is truth and astria redux that, in the shape of philosophism, henceforth reign. For what imaginable purpose was man made, if not to be happy? By victorious analysis and progress of the species, happiness enough now awaits him. Kings can become philosophers, or else philosophers kings. Let but society be once rightly constituted, by victorious analysis. The stomach that is empty shall be filled, the throat that is dry shall be wetted with wine. Labor itself shall be all one as rest, not grievous, but joyous. Wheat fields, one would think, cannot come to grow untilled, no man made clayey or made weary thereby, unless, indeed, machinery will do it. Gratuitous tailors and restaurateurs may start up, at fit intervals, one as yet sees not how. But, if each will, according to rule of benevolence, have a care for all, then surely no one will be uncared for. Nay, who knows but, by sufficiently victorious analysis, human life may be indefinitely lengthened, and men get rid of death, as they have already done of the devil. We shall then be happy in spite of death and the devil. So preaches magniloquent philosophum, her redunt Saturnia Regna. The prophetic song of Paris and its philosophes is audible enough in the Versailles Eau de Boeuf, and the Eau de Boeuf, intent chiefly on nearer blessedness, can answer at worst with a polite, why not? Good old cheery Maurepas is too joyful a prime minister to dash the world's joy. Sufficient for the day to be its own evil. Cheery old man, he cuts his jokes, and hovers careless along, his cloak well adjusted to the wind, if so be he may please all persons. The simple young king, whom a Maurepas cannot think of troubling with business, has retired into the interior apartments, taciturn, irresolute, though with a sharpness of temper at times. He at length determines on a little smith work, and so, in apprenticeship with a Sir Germain, whom one day he shall have little cause to bless, is learning to make locks. Campan, 1, 125. It appears further he understood geography, and could read English. Unhappy young king, his childlike trust in that foolish old Maurepas deserved another return, but friend and foe, destiny and himself, have combined to do him hurt. Meanwhile the fair young queen, in her halls of state, walks like a goddess of beauty, the cynosure of all eyes, as yet mingles not with affairs, heeds not the future, least of all dreads it. Weber and Campin, L.B., I., 100 to 151, Weber, I., 11 to 50, have pictured her, 
there within the royal tapestries in bright boudoirs baths peignoirs and the grand and little toilette with a whole brilliant world waiting obsequious on her glance fair young daughter of time what things has time in store for thee like earth's brightest appearance she moves gracefully environed with the grandeur of earth a reality and yet a magic vision for behold shall not utter darkness swallow it the soft young heart adopts orphans portions meritorious maids delights to succour the poor such poor as come picturesquely in her way and sets the fashion of doing it for as was said benevolence has now begun reigning in her duchess de polignac in princess de lamballe she enjoys something almost like friendship now, too, after seven long years, she has a child, and soon even a dauphin of her own, can reckon herself, as queens go, happy in a husband. Events? The grand events are but charitable feasts of morals, fête de meur, with their prizes and speeches. Poissard processions to the dauphin's cradle, above all flirtations, their rise, progress, decline, and fall. There are snow statues raised by the poor in hard winter to a queen who has given them fuel. There are masquerades, theatricals, beautifyings of little Trianon, purchase and repair of St. Cloud, journeyings from the summer court Elysium to the winter one. There are poutings and grudgings from the Sardinian sisters-in-law, for the princes too are wedded, little jealousies, which court etiquette can moderate. Holy, the lightest-hearted, frivolous foam of existence, yet an artfully refined foam, pleasant were it not so costly, like that which mantles on the wine of champagne. Monsieur, the king's elder brother, has set up for a kind of wit, and leans towards the philosophe's side. Monseigneur d'Artois pulls the mask from a fair impertinent, fights a duel in consequence, almost drawing blood. Ben Senval, 2.282-330. He has breaches of a kind new in this world, a fabulous kind, four tall lackeys, says Mercier, as if he had seen it, hold him up in the air, that he may fall into the garment without vestige of wrinkle from which rigorous encasement the same four, in the same way, and with more effort, must deliver him at night. Mercier, Nouveau Paris, 3, 147. This last is he who now, as a grey time-worn man, sits desolate at Gratz, A.D. 1834, having winded up his destiny with the three days. In such sort are poor mortals swept and shoveled to and fro. End of Section 5 Recording by Greg Golding, Georgetown, Ontario, Canada Section 6 of The French Revolution, Volume 1, by Thomas Carlyle This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Alan Wayman Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 2 Petition in Hieroglyphs With the working people, again, it is not so well. Unlucky, for there are twenty to twenty-five millions of them, whom, however, we lump together into a kind of dim compendious unity, monstrous but dim far off as the canai or, more humanely, as the masses. Masses, indeed, and yet, singular to say, if, with an effort of imagination, thou follow them over broad France, into their clay hovels, into their garrets and hutches, the masses consist all of units, every unit of whom has his own heart and sorrows, stands covered there with his own skin, and if you prick him, he will bleed. O oh, purple sovereignty, holiness, reverence, thou, for example, cardinal grand almoner, with thy plush covering of honour, who hast thy hands strengthened with dignities and monies, and art set on thy world watch tower solemnly in sight of God for such ends, what a thought, that every unit of these masses is a miraculous man, even as thyself art, struggling with vision or with blindness for his infinite kingdom, this life which he has got once only in the middle of eternities, with a spark of the divinity, what thou callest an immortal soul in him. Dreary, languid do these struggle in their obscure remoteness, 
their hearth cheerless, their diet thin. For them in this world rises no era of hope, hardly now in the other, if it be not hope in the gloomy rest of death, for their faith too is failing. Untaught, uncomforted, unfed, a dumb generation, their voice only an inarticulate cry, spokesman in the king's council in the world's forum they have none that finds credence at rare intervals as now in seventeen seventy five they will fling down their hoes and hammers and to the astonishment of thinking mankind flock hither and thither dangerous aimless get the length even of versailles Turco is altering the corn trade, abrogating the absurdest corn laws. There is dearth, real, or were it even factitious, an indubitable scarcity of bread. And so, on the second day of May, 1775, these waste multitudes do hear, at Versailles Chateau, in widespread wretchedness, in sallow faces, squalor, winged raggedness, present as in legible hieroglyphic writing their petition of grievances the chateau gates have to be shut but the king will appear on the balcony and speak to them they have seen the king's face their petition of grievances has been if not read looked at for answer two of them are hanged on a new gallows forty feet high and the rest driven back to their dens, for a time. Clearly a difficult point for government, that of dealing with these masses, if indeed it be not rather the sole point and problem of government, and all other points mere accidental crotchets, superficialities, and beatings of the wind. For let charter chests, use and wont, law common and special say what they will the masses count to so many millions of units made to all appearance by god whose earth this is declared to be besides the people are not without ferocity they have sinews and indignation do but look what holiday old marquis mirabeau the crabbed old friend of men looked on in these same years from his lodging at the baths of montor the savages descending in torrents from the mountains our people ordered not to go out the curate in surplice and stole justice in its peruke marechaussee sabre in hand guarding the place till the bagpipes can begin the dance interrupted in a quarter of an hour by battle, the cries, the squealings of children, of infirm persons, and other assistants tarring them on, as the rabble does when dogs fight. Frightful men, or rather frightful wild animals, clad in jupes of coarse woollen, with large girdles of leather studded with copper nails, of gigantic stature, heightened by high wooden clogs, sabots rising on tiptoe to see the fight tramping time to it rubbing their sides with their elbows their faces haggard figure ave and covered with their long greasy hair the upper part of the visage waxing pale the lower distorting itself into the attempt at a cruel laugh and a sort of ferocious impatience and these people pay the tie and you want further to take their salt from them, and you know not what it is you are stripping bearer, or, as you call it, governing, what, by the spurt of your pen, in its cold dust and indifference, you will fancy you can starve always with impunity, always till the catastrophe come. Ah, madame, such government by blind man's buff, stumbling along too far, will end in the general overturn. Quel but général. Undoubtedly a dark feature this in an age of gold, age at least of paper and hope. Meanwhile, trouble us not with thy prophecies, O croaking friend of men. 
"'Tis long that we have heard such, and still the old world keeps wagging in its old way." End of section six. Section seven of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Golding. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume one, book two, chapter three. Questionable. Or is this same age of hope itself but a simulacrum, as hope too often is? Cloud vapor with rainbows painted on it, beautiful to see, to sail towards, which hovers over Niagara Falls? In that case, victorious analysis will have enough to do. Alas, yes, a whole world to remake, if she could see it. Work for another than she, for all is wrong, and gone out of the joint, the inward spiritual and the outward economical. Head or heart, there is no soundness in it. As indeed evils of all sorts are more or less of kin, and do usually go together, especially it is an old truth, that wherever huge physical evil is, there, as the parent and origin of it, has moral evil to a proportionate extent been. Before those five-and-twenty laboring millions, for instance, could get that haggardness of face which old Mirabeau now looks on, in a nation calling itself Christian, and calling man the brother of man, what unspeakable, nigh infinite dishonesty of seeming and not being, in all manner of rulers, and appointed watchers, spiritual and temporal, must there not, through long ages, have gone on accumulating? It will accumulate. Moreover, it will reach ahead. For the first of all Gospels is this, that a lie cannot endure for ever. In fact, if we pierce through that rose-pink vapor of sentimentalism, philanthropy, and feasts of morals, there lies behind it one of the sorriest spectacles. You might ask, what bonds that ever held a human society happily together, or held it together at all, are in force here? It is an unbelieving people, which has suppositions, hypotheses, and froth systems of victorious analysis, and for belief this mainly, that pleasure is pleasant. Hunger they have for all sweet things, and the law of hunger. But what other law? Within them or over them? properly none. Their king has become a King Popinjay, with his Moropa government, gyrating as the weathercock does, blown about by every wind. Above them they see no god, or they even do not look above, except with astronomical glasses. The church indeed still is, but in the most submissive state, quite tamed by philosophism, in a singularly short time, for the hour was come. Some twenty years ago, your Archbishop Beaumont would not even let the poor Jansenists get buried. Your Lomini Brienne, a rising man, whom we shall meet with yet, could, in the name of the clergy, insist on having the anti-Protestant laws, which condemn to death for preaching, put in execution. And alas, now not so much as Baron Holbach's atheism can be burnt, except as pipe matches, by the private speculative individual. Our church stands haltered, dumb like a dumb ox, lowing only for provender of tithes, content if it can have that, or dumbly, dully expecting its further doom. And the twenty millions of haggard faces, and as finger-post and guidance to them in their dark struggle, a gallows forty feet high. Certainly a singular golden age, with its feasts of morals, its sweet manners, its sweet institutions, institutions douce, betokening nothing but peace among men. Peace? O oh, philosoph sentimentalism, what hast thou to do with peace when thy mother's name is Jezebel, foul product of still fouler corruption, thou with the corruption art doomed. Meanwhile it is singular how long the rotten will hold together, provided you do not handle it roughly. For whole generations it continues standing, with a ghastly affectation of life, after all life and truth has fled out of it, so loath are men to quit their old ways, and conquering indolence and inertia venture on new. Great truly is the actual, is the thing that has rescued itself from bottomless deeps of theory and possibility, and stands there as a definite indisputable fact, whereby men do work and live, or once did so. Widely shall men cleave to that, while it will endure, and quit it with regret, when it gives way under them. 
rash enthusiast of change, beware. Hast thou well considered all that habit does in this life of ours, how all knowledge and all practice hang wondrous over infinite abysses of the laboriously built together? But if every man, as it has been written, holds confined within him a madman, what must every society do? Society, which in its commonest state is called the standing miracle of this world. Without such earth-rind of habit, continues our author, call it system of habits. In a word, fixed ways of acting and of believing, society would not exist at all. With such it exists, better or worse. Herein, too, in this its system of habits, acquired, retained how you will, lies the true law code and constitution of a society, the only code, though an unwritten one, which it can in no wise disobey. The thing we call written code, constitution, form of government, and the like, what is it but some miniature image and solemnly expressed summary of this unwritten code? Is, or rather, alas, is not, but only should be, and always tends to be in which latter discrepancy lies struggle without end. And now, we add in the same dialect, let but by ill chance in such ever-enduring struggle your thin earth rind be once broken. The fountains of the great deep boil forth, fire fountains enveloping, engulfing. Your earth rind is shattered, swallowed up. Instead of a green flowery world, there is a waste wild weltering chaos, which has again, with tumult and struggle, to make itself into a world. On the other hand, be this conceited. Where thou findest a lie that is oppressing thee, extinguish it. Lies exist there only to be extinguished. They wait and cry earnestly for extinction. Think well, meanwhile, in what spirit thou wilt do it, not with hatred, with headlong selfish violence, but in clearness of heart, with holy zeal, gently, almost with pity. Thou wouldst not have replaced such extinct lie by a new lie, which a new injustice of thine own were, the parent of still other lies, whereby the latter end of that business were worse than the beginning. So, however, in this world of ours, which has both an indestructible hope in the future and an indestructible tendency to preserve as in the past, must innovation and conservation wage their perpetual conflict, as they may and can. Wherein the demonic element that lurks in all human things may doubtless some once in the thousand years get vent. But indeed may we not regret that such conflict, which, after all, is but like that classical one of hate-filled Amazons with heroic youths, and will end in embraces, should usually be so spasmodic? For conservation, strengthened by that mightiest quality in us, our indolence, sits for long ages, not victorious only, which she should be, but tyrannical, incommunicative. She holds her adversary as if annihilated, such adversary lying all the while, like some buried Enceladus, who, to gain the smallest freedom, must stir a whole Trinacria with it Etnas. Wherefore, on the whole, we will honor a paper age too, an era of hope. For in this same frightful process of Enceladus' revolt, when the task, on which no mortal would willingly enter, has become imperative, inevitable, is it not even a kindness of nature that she lures us forward by cheerful promises, fallacious or not, and a whole generation plunges into the Erebus blackness, lighted on by an era of hope? It has been well said, man is based on hope. He has properly no other possession but hope. This habitation of his is named the place of hope. End of section 7 Recording by Greg Golding, Georgetown, Ontario, Canada Section 8 of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Golding. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 4. Morapa. But now, amongst French hopes, is not that of old Monsieur de Morapa one of the best grounded? who hopes that he, by dexterity, shall contrive to continue minister. Nimble old man, who for all emergencies has his light jest, and ever in the worst confusion will emerge, cork-like, unsunk. Small care to him is perfectibility, progress of the species, and astria redux, 
Good only that a man of light wit, verging towards fourscore, can in the seat of authority feel himself important among men. Shall we call him, as haughty Chateaurieu was of want of old, Monsieur Faquinet, diminutive of scoundrel? In courtier dialect, he is now named the Nestor of France, such governing Nestor as France has. At bottom, nevertheless, it might puzzle one to say where the government of France, in these days, specially is. In that chateau of Versailles we have Nestor, king, queen, ministers and clerks, with paper bundles tied in tape. But the government? For government is a thing that governs, that guides, and if need be compels. Visible in France there is not such a thing. Invisible, inorganic, on the other hand, there is. In philosophes saloons, in eau de boeuf, galleries, in the tongue of the babbler, in the pen of the pamphleteer. Her Majesty, appearing at the opera, is applauded. She returns all radiant with joy. Anon the applauses wax fainter, or threaten to cease. She is heavy of heart. The light of her face has fled. Is sovereignty some poor Montgolfier, which, blown into by the popular wind, grows great and mounts, or sinks flaccid if the wind be withdrawn? France was long a despotism tempered by epigrams, and now, it would seem, the epigrams have got the upper hand. Happy were a young Louis the desired to make France happy, if it did not prove too troublesome, and he only knew the way. But there is endless discrepancy round him, so many claims and clamours, a mere confusion of tongues. Not reconcilable by man, not manageable, suppressible, saved by some strongest and wisest men, which only a light jesting, lightly gyrating Monsieur de Maurepas can so much as subsist amidst. Philosophism claims her new era, meaning thereby innumerable things, and claims it in no faint voice, for France at large, hitherto mute, is now beginning to speak also, and speaks in that same sense. A huge, many-toned sound, distant, yet not unimpressive. On the other hand, the Oeil de Boeuf, which as nearest one can hear best, claims with shrill vehemence that the monarchy be as heretofore a horn of plenty, wherefrom loyal courtiers may draw to the just support of the throne. Let liberalism and a new era, if such is the wish, be introduced, only no curtailment of the royal monies, which latter condition, alas, is precisely the impossible one. Philosophism, as we saw, has got her turgot made controller general, and there shall be endless reformation. Unhappily, this turgot could continue only twenty months. With the miraculous Fornatus's purse in his treasury, it might have lasted longer. With such purse, indeed, every French controller general that would prosper in these days ought first to provide himself. But here again may we not remark the bounty of nature in regard to hope. Man after man advances confident to the Augean stable, as if he could clean it, expends his little fraction of an ability on it with such cheerfulness, does, in so far as he was honest, accomplish something. Turgot has faculties, honesty, insight, heroic volition, but the Frenaticist's purse he has not. Sanguine controller general, a whole Pacific French revolution may stand schemed in the head of the thinker, but who shall pity the unspeakable indemnities that will be needed? Alas, far from that, on the very threshold of the business, he proposes that the clergy, the noblesse, the very parlement be subjected to taxes. One shriek of indignation and astonishment reverberates through all the chateau galleries. Monsieur de Maurepas has to gyrate. The poor king, who had written a few weeks ago, Il n'y a que vous et moi qui aimions le peuple, there is none but you and I that has the people's interest at heart, must write now a dismissal and let the French Revolution accomplish itself, pacifically or not, as it can. Hope, then, is deferred? Deferred, not destroyed, or abated. Is not this, for example, our patriarch Voltaire, after long years of absence, revisiting Paris, with face shriveled to nothing, with huge peruque à la Louis XIV, which leaves only two eyes visible, glittering like carbuncles? The old man is here. What an outburst! Sneering Paris has suddenly grown reverent, devotional with hero-worship. Nobles have disguised themselves as tavern-waiters to obtain sight of him. The loveliest of France would lay their hair beneath his feet. His chariot is the nucleus of a comet, whose train fills the whole streets. They crown him in the theatre with immortal viva. Finally stifle him under roses, for old Richelieu recommended opium in such state of the nerves, and the excessive patriarch took too much. 
Her Majesty herself had some thought of sending for him, but was dissuaded. Let Majesty consider it, nevertheless. The purport of this man's existence has been to wither up and annihilate all whereon Majesty and worship for the present rests. And is it so that the world recognizes him? With apotheosis as its prophet and speaker, who has spoken wisely the thing it longed to say? Add only that the body of this same rose-stifled, beatified patriarch cannot get buried except by stealth. It is wholly a notable business, and France without doubt is big, what the Germans call of good hope. We shall wish her a happy birth-hour and blessed fruit. Beaumarchais, too, now has winded up his law-pleadings, not without result, to himself and to the world. Caron Beaumarchais, or de Beaumarchais, for he got ennobled, had been born poor, but aspiring, assyriant, with talents, audacity, adroitness, above all, with the talent for intrigue, a lean, but also a tough, indomitable man. Fortune and dexterity brought him to the harpsichord of Madame, our good princesses Logue, Grey, and Sisterhood. Still better, Paris du Vernier, the court banker, honoured him with some confidence, to the length even of transactions in cash, which confidence, however, du Vernier's heir, a person of quality, would not continue. Quite otherwise, there springs a lawsuit from it, wherein tough Beaumarchais, losing both money and repute, is, in the opinion of Judge Reporter Guzman, of the Parlement Montpieu, of a whole indifferent acquiescing world, miserably beaten, in all men's opinions, only not in his own. Inspired by the indignation, which makes, if not verses, satirical law-papers, the withered music-master, with a desperate heroism, takes up his lost cause in spite of the world, fights for it against reporters, parlement, and principalities, with light banter, with clear logic, adroitly, with an inexhaustibly toughness and resource, like the skilfulest fencer, on whom, so skilful is he, the whole world now looks. Three long years it lasts, with wavering fortune. In fine, after labours comparable to the twelve of Hercules, our unconquerable Caron triumphs, regains his lawsuit and lawsuits, strips reporter Guzman of the judicial ermine, covering him with a perpetual garment of obloquy instead. And in regard to the Parlement Maupieu, which he has helped to extinguish, to parliaments of all kinds, and to French justice generally, gives rise to endless reflections in the minds of men. Thus has Beaumarchais, like a lean French Hercules, ventured down, driven by destiny, into the nether kingdoms, and victoriously tamed hell-dogs there. He also is henceforth among the notabilities of his generation. End of section 8. Recording by Greg Golding, Georgetown, Ontario, Canada. Section 9 of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Golding. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 5. Astria Redux Without Cash. Observe, however, beyond the Atlantic. Has not the new day verily dawned? Democracy, as we said, is born. Stormgirt is struggling for life and victory. A sympathetic France rejoices over the rights of man. In all saloons, it is said, what a spectacle. Now to behold our Dean, our Franklin, American plenipotentiaries, here in position, soliciting. The sons of the Saxon Puritans, with their old Saxon temper, old Hebrew culture. Sleek Silas, sleek Benjamin. Here on such errand, among the light children of heathenism, monarchy, sentimentalism, and the scarlet woman. A spectacle indeed, over which saloons may cackle joyous, though Kaiser Joseph, questioned on it, gave this answer, most unexpected from a philosophe. Madame, the trade I live by is that of royalist. Mon métier et moi, c'est d'être royaliste. So thinks light Morapa too, but the wind of philosophism and the force of public opinion will blow him round. Best wishes, meanwhile, are sent. Clandestine privateers armed. Paul Jones shall equip his bonhomme Richard. Weapons, military stores can be smuggled over, if the English do not seize them. Wherein, once more Beaumarchais, dimly as the giant smuggler becomes visible, filling his own lank pocket with all. But surely, in any case, France should have a navy. 
For which great object were not now the time, now when that proud termagant of the seas has her hands full? It is true, an impoverished treasury cannot build ships, but the hint once given, which Beaumarchais says he gave, this and the other loyal seaport, Chamber of Commerce, will build and offer them, goodly vessels bound into the waters, a ville de Paris, leviathan of ships. And now when gratuitous three-deckers dance there at our anchor, with streamers flying, and a Lutheromaniac philosophidum grows ever more clamorous, what can a Morapa do but gyrate? Squadrons cross the ocean, gauges, lees, rough Yankee generals, with woolen nightcaps under their hats, present arms to the far-glancing chivalry of France, and new-born democracy sees, not without amazement, despotism tempered by epigrams, fight at her side. So, however, it is. King's forces and heroic volunteers, Rochambeau's, Bouy, Lameth's, Lafayette, have drawn their swords in this sacred quarrel of mankind, shall draw them again elsewhere in the strangest way. Off you shan't some naval thunder is heard, in the course of which did our young prince, Duke de Chartres, hide in the hold, or did he materially, by active heroism, contribute to the victory? Alas, by a second edition we learn that there was no victory, or that English Keppel had it. Our poor young prince gets his opera plaudits changed into mocking tee-hees, and cannot become Grand Admiral, the source to him of woes which one may call endless. Woe also for Ville de Paris, the leviathan of ships. English Rodney has clutched it, and led it home with the rest. So successful was his new manoeuvre of breaking the enemy's line. It seems as if, according to Louis the Fifteenth, France were never to have a navy. Brave Suffren must return from Hyder Ali and the Indian waters, with small result, yet with great glory, for six non-defeats, which indeed, with such seconding as he had, one may reckon heroic. Let the old sea-hero rest now, honoured of France, in his native Cévennes mountain, send smoke, not of gunpowder, but mere culinary smoke, through the old chimneys of the castle of jails, which one day, in other hands, shall have other fame. Brave La Perouse shall by and by lift anchor on philanthropic voyage of discovery, for the king knows geography. But alas, this also will not prosper. The brave navigator goes and returns not. The seekers search far seas for him in vain. He has vanished trackless into blue immensity, and only some mournful, mysterious shadow of him hovers long in all heads and hearts. Neither, while the war yet lasts, will Gibraltar surrender. Not though Creon, Nassau Segan, with the ablest projectors extant, are there, and Prince Condé and Prince d'Artois have hastened to help. Wondrous leather-roofed floating batteries, set afloat by French-Spanish Pacte de Famille, give gallant summons to which, nevertheless, Gibraltar answers plutonically, with mere torrents of red-hot iron, as if stone calp had become a throat of the pit, and utters such a doom's blast of a no as all men must credit. And so, with this loud explosion, the noise of war has ceased. An age of benevolence may hope for ever. Our noble volunteers of freedom have returned to be her missionaries. Lafayette, as the matchless of his time, glitters in the Versailles Oeil de Boeuf, has his bust set up in the Paris Hotel de Ville. Democracy stands inexpungable, immeasurable, in her new world, has even a foot lifted towards the old, and our French finances, little strengthened by any such work, are in no healthy way. What to do with the finance? This, indeed, is the great question. A small but most black weather symptom, which no radiance of universal hope can cover. We saw Turgot cast forth from a controller ship, with shrieks, for want of a fortunatus's purse. As little could Monsieur de Cluny manage the duty, or indeed do anything, but consume his wages. Attain a place in history, where, as an ineffectual shadow, thou beholdest him still lingering, and let the duty manage itself. Did Genevese Necker possess such a purse, then? He possessed banker's skill, banker's honesty, credit of all kinds, for he had written academic prize essays, struggled for India companies, given dinners to philosophes, and realized a fortune in twenty years. He possessed, further, a taciturnity and solemnity of depth, or else of dullness, how singular for Celadon Gibbon, false swain as he had proved, whose father, keeping most notably his own gig, would not hear of such a union, to find now his forsaken Demoiselle Courchot sitting in the high places of the world, as minister's madame, and Necker not jealous. 
A new young demoiselle, one day to be famed as a madame in Distail, was romping about the knees of the decline and fall. The Lady Necker founds hospitals, gives solemn philosoph dinner parties, to cheer her exhausted controller general. Strange things have happened. By clamor of philosophism, management of Marquis de Pézé, and poverty constraining even kings. And so Necker, Atlas-like, sustains the burden of the finances for five years long? Without wages, for he refused such, cheered only by public opinion, and the ministering of his noble wife. With many thoughts in him, it is hoped, which, however, he is shy of uttering. His Comte Rendu, published by the royal permission, fresh sign of a new era, shows wonders, which what but the genius of some Atlas Necker can prevent from becoming portents. In Necker's head, too, there is a whole Pacific French Revolution of its kind, and in that taciturn dull depth, or deep dullness, ambition enough. Meanwhile, alas, his fortune at his purse turns out to be little other than the old vectigil of parsimony. Nay, he too has to produce his scheme of taxing. Clergy, noblesse to be taxed, provincial assemblies, and the rest, like a mere Turgot. The expiring Marquis de Maurepas must gyrate one other time. Let Necker also depart, not unlamented. Great in a private station, Necker looks on from the distance, abiding his time. Eighty thousand copies of his new book, which he calls Administration des Finances, will be sold in a few days. He is gone, but shall return, and that more than once, borne by a whole shouting nation. Singular Controller General of the Finances, once clerk in Thelusson's Bank. End of Section 9 Recording by Greg Golding, Georgetown, Ontario, Canada. Section 10 of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Golding. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 6. Windbags. So marches the world in this its paper age, or era of hope, not without obstructions or explosions, which, however, heard from such distance, are little other than a cheerful marching music. If indeed that living chaos of ignorance and hunger, five and twenty million strong, under your feet, were to begin playing. For the present, however, consider Longchamp, now when Lent is ending, and the glory of Paris and France has gone forth as an annual want not to assist a tenebri mass, but to sun itself and show itself and salute the young spring. Manifold, bright-tinted, glittering with gold, all through the Bois de Boulogne, in long-drawn, variegated rows, like long-drawn living flower-borders, tulips, dahlias, lilies of the valley, all in their moving flower-pots of new gilt carriages, pleasure of the eye and pride of life. So rolls and dances the procession, steady, of firm assurance, as if it rolled on adamant and the foundations of the world, not on mere heraldic parchment, under which smoulders a lake of fire. Dance on, ye foolish ones, ye sought not wisdom, neither have ye found it. Ye and your fathers have sown the wind, ye shall reap the whirlwind. Was it not, from of old written, the wages of sin is death? But at Longchamp, as elsewhere, we remark for one thing, that dame and cavalier are waited on each by a kind of human familiar, named jockey. Little elf or imp, though young, already withered, with its withered air of premature vice, of knowingness, of completed elfhood, useful in various emergencies. The name jockey comes from the English, as the thing also fancies that it does. Our Anglomania, in fact, is grown considerable, prophetic of much. If France is to be free, why shall she not, now when mad war is hushed, love neighboring freedom? Cultivated men, your Dukes de Léoncourt, de la Rochefoucauld, admire the English constitution, the English national character, would import what of it they can. Of what is lighter, especially if it be light as wind, how much easier the freightage. Non-admiral Duc de Chartres, not yet d'Orléans, or Egalité, flies to and fro across the strait, importing English fashions. This he, as hand and glove with an English Prince of Wales, is surely qualified to do. Carriages and saddles, top-boots and redingotes, as we call riding-coats, nay, the very mode of riding, for now no man on a level with this age but will trot à l'anglaise, rising in the stirrups, scornful of the old sit-fast method, in which, according to Shakespeare, butter and eggs go to market. 
Also he can urge the fervid wheels, this brave Chartres of ours. No whip in Paris is rasher and surer than the unprofessional one of Monseigneur. Elf jockeys we have seen, but see now real Yorkshire jockeys and what they ride on and train. English racers for French races. These likewise we owe first, under the providence of the devil, to Monseigneur. Prince d'Artois also has his stud of racers. Prince d'Artois has with all the strangest horse-leech, a moon-struck, much-enduring individual, of Neuchâtel in Switzerland, named Jean-Paul Marat, a problematic Chevalier Dion, now in petticoats, now in breeches, is no less problematic in London than in Paris, and causes bets and lawsuits. Beautiful days of international communion. Swindlery and blackguardism have stretched hands across the channel, and saluted mutually. On the race-course of Vincennes or Sablon, behold an English curricle and four, wafted glorious among the principalities and rascalities, an English Dr. Dodd, for whom also the two early gallows gapes. Duke de Chartres was a young prince of great promise, as young princes often are, which promise unfortunately has belied itself. With the huge Orléans property, with Duke de Pontrièvre for father-in-law, and now the young brother-in-law Lamballe killed by excesses, he will one day be the richest man in France. Meanwhile, his hair is all falling out, his blood is quite spoiled, by early transcendentalism of debauchery. Carbuncle stud his face, dark studs on a ground of burnished copper. A most signal failure, this young prince. The stuff prematurely burnt out of him, little left but foul smoke and ashes of expiring sensualities. What might have been thought, insight, and even conduct, gone now, or fast going, to confused darkness, broken by bewildering dazzlements, to obstreperous crochet, to activities which you may call semi-delirious, or even semi-galvanic. Perry affects to laugh at his charioteering, but he heeds not such laughter. On the other hand, what a day, not of laughter, was that when he threatened, for lucre's sake, to lay sacrilegious hand on the Palais Royal Garden. The flower parterres shall be riven up, the chestnut avenues shall fall, time-honoured bocage, under which the opera hamadryads were wont to wander, not inexecrable to men. Perry moans aloud, Philidor from his Café de la Régence shall no longer look on greenness. The loungers and losers of the world, where now shall they haunt? In vain is moaning, the axe glitters, the sacred groves fall crashing, for indeed Monseigneur was short of money. The opera hamadryads fly with shrieks, Shriek not, ye opera hamadryads, or not as those that have no comfort. He will surround your garden with new edifices and piazzas. Though narrowed, it shall be replanted, dizened with hydraulic jets, cannon which the sun fires at noon, things bodily, things spiritual, such as man has not imagined. And in the Palais Royal shall again, and more than ever, be the sorcerer's Sabbath and Satan at home of our planet. What will not mortals attempt? From remote Enronne in the Viverin, the brothers Montgolfier send up their paper dome, filled with the smoke of burnt wool. The Viverin Provincial Assembly is to be prorogued this same day. Viverin Assembly members applaud, and the shouts of congregated men. Will victorious analysis scale the very heavens, then? Paris hears with eager wonder. Paris shall ere long see. From Réveillon's paper warehouse there in the Rue Saint-Antoine, a noted warehouse, the new Montgolfier airship launches itself. Ducks and poultry are born skyward. But now shall men be born. Nay, chemist Charles thinks of hydrogen and glazed silk. Chemist Charles will himself ascend from the Tuileries garden, Montgolfier solemnly cutting the cord. By heaven he also mounts, he and another. Ten times ten thousand hearts go palpitating. All tongues are mute with wonder and fear, till a shout, like the voice of seas, rolls after him on his wild way. He soars, he dwindles upwards, has become a mere gleaming circlet, like some turgotine snuff-box, what we call turgotine platitude, like some new daylight moon. Finally he descends, welcomed by the universe. Duchess Polignac, with a party, is in the Bois de Boulogne, waiting, though it is drizzly winter, the 1st of December, 1783. The whole chivalry of France, Duc de Chartres foremost, gallops to receive him. Beautiful invention, mounting heavenward so beautifully, so unguidably, emblem of much, and of our age of hope itself, which shall mount, specifically light, majestically in this same manner, and hover, tumbling whither fate will. Well, if it do not, pilatra-like, explode, and demount all the more tragically. 
So, riding on windbags, will men scale the Imperium. Or observe Herr Dr. Mesmer in his spacious magnetic halls. Long stoled he walks, reverend, glancing upwards, as in rapt commerce, an antique Egyptian hierophant in this new age. Soft music flits, breaking fitfully the sacred stillness. Round their magnetic mystery, which to the eye is mere tubs with water, sit breathless, rod in hand, the circles of beauty and fashion, each circle a living circular passion flower, expecting the magnetic afflatus and new manufactured heaven on earth. O women, O men, great is your infidel faith. A parlementary du port, a bergasse, d'Espremenil, we notice there. Chemist Berthollet, too, on the part of Monseigneur de Chartres. Had not the Academy of Sciences, with its Baileys, Franklins, Lavoisier, interfered? But it did interfere. Mesmer may pocket his hard money and withdraw. Let him walk silent by the shore of the Bodensee, by the ancient town of Constance, meditating on much. For so, under the strangest new vesture, the old great truth, since no vesture can hide it, begins again to be revealed. That man is what we call a miraculous creature, with miraculous power over men, and on the whole with such a life in him, and such a world round him, as victorious analysis, with her physiologies, nervous systems, physic and metaphysic, will never completely name, to say nothing of explaining, wherein also the quack shall, in all ages, come in for his share. End of section 10. Recording by Greg Golding, Georgetown, Ontario, Canada. Section 11 of the French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeremiah Sutherland, Victoria, British Columbia. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1. Book 2. Chapter 7. Contrat Social. In such succession of singular prismatic tints, flush after flush suffusing our horizon, does the era of hope dawn on towards fulfillment? Questionable. As indeed with an era of hope that rests on mere universal benevolence, victorious analysis, vice cured of its deformity, and in the long run on twenty-five dark savage millions looking up in hunger and weariness to that ecce signum of theirs forty feet high, how could it but be questionable? Through all time, if we read aright, sin was, is, will be the parent of misery. This land calls itself most Christian, and has crosses and cathedrals, but its high priest is some Roche Aymon, some necklace cardinal Louis de Rohan. The voice of the poor through long years ascends inarticulate in jacquerie meal mobs, low whimpering of infinite moan, unheeded of the earth, not unheeded of heaven. Always moreover where the millions are wretched, there are the thousands straitened, unhappy. Only the units can flourish, or say rather be ruined the last. Industry all noosed and haltered, as if it too were some beast of chase for the mighty hunters of this world to bait and cut slices from, cries passionately to these its well-paid guides and watchers, not guide me, but laissez faire, leave me alone of your guidance. What market has industry in this France? For two things there may be market and demand, for the coarser kind of field fruits since the millions will live, for the fine kinds of luxury and spicery, of multiform taste, from opera melodies down to racers and courtesans, since the units will be amused. It is at bottom but a mad state of things. To mend and remake all which we have, indeed, victorious analysis. Honor to victorious analysis, nevertheless, out of the workshop and laboratory, what thing was victorious analysis yet known to make? Detection of incoherences, mainly. Destruction of the incoherent. From of old, doubt was but half a magician. She evokes the spectres which we cannot quell. We shall have endless vortices of froth logic, whereon first words and then things are whirled and swallowed. Remark, accordingly, as acknowledged grounds of hope, at bottom mere precursors of despair, this perpetual theorizing about man, the mind of man, philosophy of government, progress of the species and such like, the main thinking furniture of every head, Time, and so many Montesquieu's, Mabley's, spokesmen of time, have discovered innumerable things, and now has not Jean-Jacques promulgated his new Evangel of a Contrat Social, explaining the whole mystery of government, and how it is contracted and bargained for, to universal satisfaction? Theories of government. 
such have been and will be in ages of decadence. Acknowledge them in their degree, as processes of nature, who does nothing in vain, as steps in her great process. Meanwhile, what theory is so certain as this, that all theories, were they never so earnest, painfully elaborated, are, and, by the very conditions of them, must be incomplete, questionable, and even false? Thou shalt know that this universe is, what it professes to be, an infinite one. Attempt not to swallow it, for thy logical digestion. Be thankful if skillfully planting down this and the other fixed pillar in the chaos, thou prevent its swallowing thee. That a new young generation has exchanged the skeptic creed, what shall I believe, for passionate faith in this gospel, according to Jean-Jacques, is a further step in the business, and betokens much. Blessed also is hope, and always from the beginning there was some millennium prophesied, millennium of holiness, but, what is notable, never till this new era any millennium of mere ease and plentiful supply. In such prophesied lubberland of happiness, benevolence, and vice cured of its deformity, trust not, my friends. Man is not what one calls a happy animal. His appetite for sweet victual is so enormous. How, in this wild universe, which storms in on him, infinite, vague menacing, shall poorer man find, say not happiness, but existence and footing to stand on, if it be not by girding himself together for continual endeavor and endurance? Woe, if in his heart there dwelt no devout faith, if the word duty had lost its meaning for him, or as to this of sentimentalism so useful for weeping with over-romances and on pathetic occasions, it otherwise verily will avail nothing, nay less. The healthy heart that said to itself, How healthy am I, was already fallen into the fatalist sort of disease. Is not sentimentalism twin sister to Kant, if not one and the same with it? Is not Kant the materia prima of the devil, from which all falsehoods, imbecilities, abominations body themselves, from which no true thing can come? For Kant is itself properly a double distilled lie, the second power of a lie. And now, if a whole nation fall into that? In such case, I answer, infallibly, they will return out of it. For life is no cunningly devised deception or self-deception. It is a great truth that thou art alive, that thou hast desires, necessities. Neither can these subsist and satisfy themselves on delusions, but on fact. To fact, depend on it, we shall come back. To such fact, blessed or cursed, as we have wisdom for. The lowest, least blessed fact one knows of, on which necessitous mortals have ever based themselves, seems to be the primitive one of cannibalism, that I can devour thee. What if such primitive fact were precisely the one we had, with our improved methods, to revert to, and begin anew from? End of section 11 Section 12 of The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Golding the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 8, Printed Paper In such a practical France, let the theory of perfectibility say what it will. Discontents cannot be wanting. Your promised reformation is so indispensable, yet it comes not. Who will begin it? With himself? Discontent with what is around us, still more with what is above us, goes on increasing, seeking ever new vents of street ballads, of epigrams, that from of old-tempered despotism we need speak not, nor of manuscript newspapers, nouvelles à la main, do we speak. Bacomont and his journeymen and followers may close those thirty volumes of scurrilous eavesdropping, and quit that trade, for at length, if not liberty of the press, there is license. Pamphlets can be surreptitiously vended and read in Paris. Did they even bear to be printed at Pekin? We have a courier de l'Europe in those years, regularly published at London, by a de Morand, whom the guillotine has not yet devoured. There, too, an unruly Languet, still unguillotined, when his own country has become too hot for him, and his brother advocates have cast him out, can emit his hoarse wailings, and Bastille de Boyer, Bastille unveiled. Loquacious Abbe Renault, at length, has his wish, sees the histoire philosophique with its lubricity, unveracity, loose, loud, eleutheromaniac rant, contributed, they say, by philosophedom at large, though in the Abbe's name, and to his glory. 
burnt by the common hangman, and sets out on his travels as a martyr. It was the edition of 1781, perhaps the last notable book that had such fire beatitude, the hangman discovering now that it did not serve. Again, in courts of law, with their money quarrels, divorce cases, wheresoever a glimpse into the household existence can be had, what indications! The Parlement of Besançon and O Ring, audible to all France, with the amour and destinies of young Mirabeau. He, under the nurture of a friend of men, has, in state prisons, in marching regiments, Dutch authors' garrets, and quite other scenes, been for twenty years learning to resist despotism despotism of men, and, alas, also of gods. How, beneath this rose-coloured veil of universal benevolence and astria redux, is this sanctuary of home so often a dreary void, or a dark contentious hell on earth? The old friend of men has his own divorce case too, and at times his whole family but one under lock and key. He writes much about reforming and enfranchising the world, and for his own private behoof he has needed sixty lettres de cachet, a man of insight, too, with resolution, even with manful principle, but in such an element, inward and outward, which he could not rule, but only madden. Edacity, rapacity, quite contrary to the finer sensibilities of the heart. Fools that expect your verdant millennium, and nothing but love and abundance. Brooks running wine, winds whispering music, with the whole ground and basis of your existence champed into a mud of sensuality which daily growing deeper will soon have no bottom but the abyss. Or consider that unutterable business of the diamond necklace, red-hatted Cardinal Louis de Rohan, Sicilian jailbird Belsamo Cagliostro, milliner Dame de Lamotte, with a face of some piquancy, the highest church dignitaries waltzing in Walpurgis dance, with quack prophets, pick purses, and public women, a whole Satan's invisible world displayed, working there continually under the daylight visible one, the smoke of its torment going up for ever. The throne has been brought into scandalous collision with the treadmill. Astonished Europe rings with the mystery for ten months, sees only lie unfold itself from lie, corruption among the lofty and the low, gulosity, credulity, imbecility, strength nowhere but in the hunger. Weep, fair queen, thy first tears of unmixed wretchedness. Thy fair name has been tarnished by foul breath, irremediably while life lasts. No more shalt thou be loved and pitied by living hearts, till a new generation has been born, and thy own heart lies cold, cured of all its sorrows. The epigrams henceforth become not sharp and bitter, but cruel, atrocious, unmentionable. On that 31st of May, 1786, a miserable Cardinal Grand Almoner Rohan, on issuing from his Bastille, is escorted by hurrahing crowds, unloved he, and worthy of no love, but important since the court and queen are his enemies. How is our bright era of hope dimmed, and the whole sky growing bleak with signs of hurricane and earthquake? It is a doomed world, gone all obedience that made men free, fast going the obedience that made men slaves, at least to one another. Slaves only of their own lust they now are, and will be. Slaves of sin, inevitably also of sorrow. Behold the mouldering mass of sensuality and falsehood, round which plays foolishly itself a corrupt phosphorescence, some glimmer of sentimentalism, and over all rising, as ark of their covenant, the grim patibulary fork, forty feet high, which also is now nigh rotted. Add only that the French nation distinguishes itself among nations by the characteristic of excitability, with the good, but also with the perilous evil which belongs to that. Rebellion, explosion, of unknown extent is to be calculated on. There are, as Chesterfield wrote, all the symptoms I have ever met with in history. Shall we say, then, woe to philosophism, that it destroyed religion, what it called extinguishing the abomination, écraser la femme? Woe, rather, to those that made the holy an abomination, and extinguishable. Woe at all men that live in such a time of world abomination and world destruction. Nay, answer the courtiers, it was Turgot, it was Necker, with their mad innovating, it was the Queen's want of etiquette, it was he, it was she, it was that. Friends, it was every scoundrel that had lived, and quack-like pretended to be doing, and been only eating and misdoing, in all provinces of life, as shoe-black or as sovereign lord, each in his degree, 
from the time of Charlemagne and earlier. All this, for be sure no falsehood perishes, but is as seed sown out to grow, has been storing itself for thousands of years, and now the account day has come, and rude will the settlement be, of wrath laid up against the day of wrath. O my brother, be not thou a quack, die rather, if thou wilt take counsel. Tis but dying once, and thou art quit of it for ever. Cursed is that trade, and bears curses, thou knowest not how long ages after thou art departed, and the wages thou hadst are all consumed. Nay, as the ancient wise have written, through eternity itself, and is verily marked in the doom-book of a god. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, and yet, as we said, hope is but deferred, not abolished, not abolishable. It is very notable and touching how this same hope does still light onwards the French nation through all its wild destinies. For we shall still find hope shining, be it for fond invitation, be it for anger and menace, as a mild heavenly light it shone, as a red conflagration it shines, burning sulphurous blue, through darkest regions of terror. It still shines, and goes sent out at all, since desperation itself is a kind of hope. Thus is our era still to be named of hope, though in the saddest sense, when there is nothing left but hope. But if any one would know summarily what a Pandora's box lies there for the opening, he may see it in what by its nature is the symptom of all symptoms, the surviving literature of the period. Abbé Reynaud, with his lubricity and loud loose rant, has spoken his word, and already the fast-hastening generation responds to another. Glance at Beaumarchais's Mariage de Figaro, which now, after difficulty enough, has issued on the stage, and runs its hundred nights to the admiration of all men. By what virtue or internal vigor it so ran, the reader of our day will rather wonder. And indeed will know so much the better that it flattered some pruriency of the time, that it spoke what all were feeling and longing to speak. Small substance in that Figaro, thin wire-drawn intrigues, thin wire-drawn sentiments and sarcasms, a thing lean, barren, yet which winds and whisks itself, as through a wholly mad universe, adroitly, with a high-sniffing air, wherein each, as was hinted, which is the grand secret, may see some image of himself, and of his own state and ways. So it runs its hundred nights, and all France runs with it, laughing applause. If the soliloquizing barber ask, What has your lordship done to earn all this? And can only answer, You took the trouble to be born. Vous vous êtes donne la peine de naître? All men must laugh, and a gay horse-racing Anglomaniac noblesse loudest of all. For how can small books have a great danger in them? asked the Sir Caron, and fancies his thin epigram may be a kind of reason. Conqueror of a golden fleece, by giant smuggling, tamer of hell-dogs in the Parlement Maupieux, and finally crowned Orpheus in the Théâtre Français. Beaumarchais has now culminated, and unites the attributes of several demigods. We shall meet him once again in the course of his decline. Still more significant are two books produced on the eve of the ever-memorable explosion itself, and read eagerly by all the world. Saint-Pierre's Paul et Virginie, and Louvet's Chevalier de Faublas, noteworthy books, which may be considered as the last speech of old feudal France. In the first there rises, melodiously, as it were, the wail of a moribund world, Everywhere wholesome nature in unequal conflict with diseased perfidious art cannot escape from it in the lowest hut, in the remotest island of the sea. Ruin and death must strike down the loved one, and what is most significant of all, death even here not by necessity, but by etiquette. What a world of prurient corruption lies visible in that super-sublime of modesty! Yet on the whole our good Saint-Pierre is musical, poetical, though most morbid we will call his book the swan song of old dying france louvet's again let no man account musical truly if this wretched faublas is a death speech it is one under the gallows and by a felon that does not repent wretched cloaca of a book without depth even as a cloaca what picture of french society is here picture properly of nothing if not of the mind that gave it out as some sort of picture yet symptom of much above all of the world that could nourish itself thereon. End of section 12. Recording by Greg Golding, Georgetown, Ontario.
Section 13 of The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dustin Tuttle. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 3, Chapter 1 Dishonored Bills. While the unspeakable confusion is everywhere weltering within, and through so many cracks in the surface, sulfur smoke is issuing, the question arises, through what crevice will the main explosion carry itself? Through which of the old craters or chimneys, or must it at once form a new crater for itself? In every society are such chimneys, or institutions serving as such. Even Constantinople is not without its safety valves. There, too, discontent can vent itself, in material fire, by the number of nocturnal conflagrations, or of hanged bakers, the reigning power can read the signs of the times, and change course according to these. We may say that this French explosion will doubtless first try all the old institutions of escape, for by each of these there is, or at least there used to be, some communication with the interior deep. They are national institutions in virtue of that. Had they even become personal institutions, and what we can call choked up from their original uses, there nevertheless must the impediment be weaker than elsewhere. Through which of them, then, an observer might have guessed, through the law parliaments, above all through the Parliament of Paris. Men, never so thickly clad in dignities, sit not inaccessible to the influences of their time, especially men whose life is business who at all turns, were it even from behind judgment seats, have come in contact with the actual workings of the world. The Councillor of Parliament, the President himself, who has bought his place with hard money that he might be looked up to by his fellow creatures, how shall he, in all philosophy soirees and saloons of elegant culture, become notable as a friend of darkness? Among the Paris long robes there may be more than one patriotic Mazerba whose rule is conscience and the public good. There are clearly more than one hot-headed d'Espremil, to whose confused thought any loud reputation of the brutus sort may seem glorious. The Le Peltier, La Mignons, have titles and wealth, yet at court are only styled nobles of the robe. There are duports of deep scheme, fratus, saboteurs, of incontinent tongue, all nursed more or less on the milk of the contract social. Nay, for the whole body, is not this patriotic opposition also a fighting for oneself? Awake, Parliament of Paris, renew thy long warfare. Was not the Parliament Mapu abolished with ignominy? Not now hast thou to dread a Louis the Fourteenth with a crack of his whip and his Olympian looks. Not now a Richelieu and Bastille. No, the whole nation is behind thee. Thou too, O oh heavens, mayest become a political power and with the shakings of thy horsehair wig shake principalities and dynasties, like a very Jove with his ambrosial curls. Light old Monsieur de Maupas, since the end of 1781, has been fixed in the frost of death. Nevermore, said the good Louis, shall I hear his step overhead. His light jestings and gyratings are at an end. No more can the importunate reality be hidden by pleasant wit, and today's evil be deftly rolled over upon tomorrow. The morrow itself has arrived, and now nothing but a solid phlegmatic Monsieur de Vergen sits there, in dull matter of fact, like some dull punctual clerk, which he originally was, admits what cannot be denied, let the remedy come whence it will. In him is no remedy, only clerk-like dispatch of business according to routine. The poor king, grown older yet hardly more experienced, must himself, with such no faculty as he has, begin governing, wherein also his queen will give help, bright queen with her quick clear glances and impulses, clear and even noble, but all too superficial, vehement shallow, for that work. To govern France were such a problem, and now it has grown well nigh too hard to govern even the Oya de Buck. For if a distressed people has its cry, so likewise, and more audibly, has a bereaved court. 
To the Oya de Buff it remains inconceivable how, in a France of such resources, the Horn of Pliny should run dry. Did it not used to flow? Nevertheless, Necker, with his revenue of parsimony, has suppressed above six hundred places before the courtiers could oust him, parsimonious finance pedant as he was. Again, a military pedant, Saint-Germain, with his Prussian maneuvers, with his Prussian notions, as if merit and not coat of arms should be the rule of promotion, has disaffected military men. The Mosqueter, with much else, are suppressed. For he, too, was one of your suppressors, and unsettling and oversetting did mere mischief to the Ouya de Buff. Complaints abound, scarcity, anxiety. It is a changed Ouya de Buff. Bezonval says, already in these years, 1781, there was such a melancholy, such a tristesse, about court, compared with former days, as made it quite dispiriting to look upon. No wonder that the Ouya de Buff feels melancholy, when you are suppressing its places. Not a place can be suppressed, but some purse is the lighter for it, and more than one heart the heavier. For did it not employ the working classes too, manufacturers, male and female, of laces, essences, of pleasure generally, whosoever could manufacture pleasure? Miserable economies, never felt over twenty-five millions. So however it goes on, and it is not yet ended. Few years more, and the wolfhounds shall fall suppressed the bear-hounds, the falconry. Places shall fall, thick as autumnal leaves. Duc de Polignac demonstrates to the complete silencing of ministerial logic that his place cannot be abolished, then gallantly turning to the queen surrenders it, since her majesty so wishes. Less chivalrous was Duc de Cogne, and yet not luckier. We got into a real quarrel, Cogne and I, said King Louis, but if he had even struck me, I could not have blamed him. In regard to such matters there can be but one opinion. Baron Bessonval, with that frankness of speech which stamps the independent man, plainly assures Her Majesty that it is frightful, affreux. You go to bed, and are not sure but you shall rise impoverished on the morrow. One might as well be in Turkey. It is indeed a dog's life. How singular this perpetual distress of the royal treasury! And yet it is a thing not more incredible than undeniable a thing mournfully true, the stumbling block on which all ministers successively stumble and fall. Be it want of fiscal genius or some far other want, there is the palpless discrepancy between revenue and expenditure, a deficit of the revenue. You must choke, combler the deficit, or else it will swallow you. This is the stern problem, hopeless seemingly as squaring of the circle. Controller Jolet de Flore, who succeeded Necker, could do nothing with it, nothing but propose loans, which were tardily filled up, impose new taxes, unproductive of money, productive of clamor and discontent. As little could Controller Dormerson do, or even less, for if Jolet maintained himself beyond year and day, Dormerson reckons only by months, till the king purchased Rambouillet without consulting him, which he took as a hint to withdraw. And so, towards the end of 1783, Matters threaten to come to still stand. Vain seems human ingenuity. In vain has our newly devised Council of Finances struggled. Our intendants of finance, controller general of finances, there are unhappily no finances to control. Fatal paralysis invades the social movement. Clouds, of blindness or of blackness, envelop us. Are we breaking down, then, into the black horrors of national bankruptcy? Great is bankruptcy. The great bottomless gulf into which all falsehoods, public and private, do sink, disappearing. Whither, from the first origin of them, they are all doomed. For nature is true and not a lie. No lie you can speak or act, but it will come, after longer or shorter circulation, like a bill drawn on nature's reality, and be presented there for payment, with the answer, no effects. Pity only that it often had so long a circulation that the original forger were so seldom he who bore the final smart of it. Lies and the burden of evil they bring are passed on, shifted from back to back and from rank to rank, and so land ultimately on the dumb lowest rank, who with spade and mattock, with sore heart and empty wallet, daily come in contact with reality, and can pass the cheat no further. Observe nevertheless how, by a just compensating law, 
if the lie with its burden, in this confused whirlpool of society, sinks and is shifted ever downwards, then in return the distress of it rises ever upwards and upwards, whereby, after the long pining and demi-starvation of those twenty millions, a Duke de Cogne and his majesty come also to have their real quarrel. Such is the law of just nature, bringing, though at long intervals, and were it only by bankruptcy, matters round again to the mark. But with a fortunatus purse in his pocket, through what length of time might not almost any falsehood last? Your society, your household, practical or spiritual arrangement, is untrue, unjust, offensive to the eye of God and man. Nevertheless, its hearth is warm, its larder well replenished, the innumerable Swiss of heaven, with a kind of natural loyalty, gather round it, or prove, by pamphleteering, musketeering, that it is a truth, or, if not an unmixed, unearthly, impossible truth, then better, a wholesomely attempered one, as wind is to the shorn lamb, and works well. Changed outlook, however, when purse and larder grow empty. Was your arrangement so true, so accordant to nature's ways, then how, in the name of wonder, has nature, with her infinite bounty, come to leave it famishing there? To all men, to all women and all children, it is now indutiable that your arrangement was false. Honor to bankruptcy, ever righteous on the great scale, though in detail it is so cruel. Under all falsehoods it works, unweariedly mining, no falsehood, did it rise heaven high and cover the world, but bankruptcy one day will sweep it down and make us free of it. End of section 13 Recording by Dustin Tuttle Section 14 of The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Golding. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 3, Chapter 2. Controller Cologne. Under such circumstances of tristesse, obstruction, and sick langueur, when to an exasperated court it seems as if fiscal genius had departed from among men, what apparition could be welcomer than that of Monsieur de Cologne? Cologne, a man of indisputable genius, even fiscal genius, more or less, of experience, both in managing finance and parlement, for he has been intendant at Metz, at Lille, king's procurer at Douai, a man of weight, connected with the moneyed classes, of unstained name, if it were not some peccadillo, of showing a client's letter, in that old Deguillon la Chalotte business, as good as forgotten now. He has kinsmen of heavy purse, felt on the stock exchange. Our Foulon, Berthier, intrigue for him, old Foulon, who has now nothing to do but intrigue, who is known and even seen to be what they call a scoundrel, but of unmeasured wealth, who from commissariat clerk, which he once was, may hope, some think, if the game go right, to be minister himself one day. Such propping and backing has M. de Calonne, and then intrinsically such qualities. Hope radiates from his face. Persuasion hangs on his tongue. For all straits he has present remedy, and will make the world roll on wheels before him. On the 3rd of November, 1783, the Oeil de Boeuf rejoices in its new controller. General Calonne also shall have trial. Calonne, also in his way, as Turgot and Necker had done in theirs, shall forward the consummation, suffuse, with one other flush of brilliancy, our now too leaden colored era of hope, and wind it up into fulfillment. Great, in any case, is the felicity of the Oeil de Boeuf. Stinginess has fled from these royal abodes. Suppression ceases. Your Besenval may go peaceably to sleep, sure that he shall awake unplundered. Smiling plenty, as if conjured by some enchanter, has returned, scatters contentment from her new flowing horn, and mark what suavity of manners. A bland smile distinguishes our controller. To all men he listens with an air of interest, nay, of anticipation, makes their own wish clear to themselves, and grants it, or at least grants conditional promise of it. I fear this is a matter of difficulty, said Her Majesty. Madame, answered the controller, if it is but difficult, it is done. If it is impossible, it shall be done, Sifar. A man of such facility withal. 
to observe him in the pleasure vortex of society, which none partakes of with more gusto. You might ask, when does he work? And yet his work, as we see, is never behindhand. Above all, the fruit of his work, ready money. Truly a man of incredible facility, facile action, facile elocution, facile thought. How, in mild suasion, philosophic depth sparkles up from him, as mere wit and lambent sprightliness, and in Her Majesty's soirees, with the weight of a world lying on him, he is the delight of men and women. By what magic does he accomplish miracles? By the only true magic, that of genius. Men name him the minister, as indeed, when was there another such? Crooked things are become straight by him, rough places plain, and over the oeil de boeuf there rests an unspeakable sunshine. Nay, in seriousness, let no man say that Cologne had not genius, genius for persuading, before all things for borrowing. With the skilfulest judicious appliances of underhand money, he keeps the stock exchanges flourishing, so that loan after loan is filled up as soon as opened. Calculators likely to know have calculated that he spent, in extraordinaries, at the rate of one million daily, which indeed is some fifty thousand pounds sterling. But did he not procure something with it, namely peace and prosperity, for the time being? Philosophidum grumbles and croaks, buys, as we said, eighty thousand copies of Necker's new book. But non parai calon, in Her Majesty's apartment, with the glittering retinue of dukes, duchesses, and mere happy admiring faces, can let Necker and philosopher dumb croak. The misery is, such a time cannot last. Squandering, and payment by loan, is no way to choke a deficit. Neither is oil the substance for quenching conflagrations, but only for assuaging them, not permanently. To the non pareil himself, who wanted not insight, it is clear at intervals, and dimly certain at all times, that his trade is by nature temporary, growing daily more difficult, that changes incalculable lie at no great distance. Apart from financial deficit, the world is wholly in such a new-fangled humor, all things working loose from their old fastenings, towards new issues and combinations. There is not a dwarf jockey, a cropped Brutus's head, or anglomaniac horseman rising on his stirrups that does not betoken change. But what then? The day, in any case, passes pleasantly, for the morrow, if the morrow come, there shall be counsel too. Once mounted, by munificence, suasion, magic of genius, high enough in favor with the oeil de boeuf, with the king, queen, stock exchange, and so far as possible with all men, an empereur controller may hope to go careering through the inevitable, in some unimagined way, as handsomely as another. At all events, for these three miraculous years, it has been expedient heaped on expedient, till now, with such cumulation and height, the pile topples perilous. And here has this world's wonder of a diamond necklace brought it at last to the clear verge of tumbling. Genius in that direction can no more. Mounted high enough, or not mounted, we must fare forth. Hardly is poor Rohan, the necklace cardinal, safely bestowed in the Auvergne mountains, Dame de la Motte unsafely in the Salpetriere, and that mournful business hushed up, when our sanguine controller once more astonishes the world. An expedient, unheard of for these hundred and sixty years, has been propounded, and by dint of suasion, for his light audacity, his hope and eloquence are matchless, has been got adopted. Convocation of the Notables Let notable persons, the actual or virtual rulers of their districts, be summoned from all sides of France. Let a true tale of His Majesty's patriotic purposes and wretched pecuniary impossibilities be suasively told them, and then the question put, What are we to do? Surely to adopt healing measures, such as the magic of genius will unfold, such as, once sanctioned by notables, all Parlement and all men must, with more or less reluctance, submit to. End of section 14. Recording by Greg Golding, Georgetown, Ontario, Canada. Section 15 of The French Revolution, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 3, Chapter 3. The Notables. Here, then, is verily a sign and wonder, visible to the whole world, bodeful of much. The old de Boeuf dolorously grumbles, Were we not well as we stood? 
quenching conflagrations by oil? Constitutional philosophdom starts with joyful surprise, stares eagerly what the result will be. The public creditor, the public debtor, the whole thinking and thoughtless public have their several surprises, joyful and sorrowful. Count Mirabeau, who has got his matrimonial and other lawsuits huddled up, better or worse, and works now in the dimmest element at Berlin, compiling Prussian monarchies, pamphlets on Cagliostro, writing with pay but not with honorable recognition, innumerable despatches for his government, scents or descries richer quarry from afar. He, like an eagle or vulture, or a mixture of both, preens his wings for flight homewards. Monsieur de Calon has stretched out an errand's rod over France, miraculous, and is summoning quite unexpected things. Audacity and hope alternate in him with misgivings, though the sanguine valiant side carries it. Anon he writes to an intimate friend, Je me fais pitié à moi-même. I am an object of pity to myself. Anon invites some dedicating poet or poetaster to sing, This assembly of the notables and the revolution that is preparing. Preparing indeed, and a matter to be sung, only not till we have seen it, and what the issue of it is. In deep obscure unrest, all things have so long gone rocking and swaying, will Monsieur de Calonne, with this his alchemy of the notables, fasten all together again, and get new revenues, or wrench all asunder, so that it go no longer rocking and swaying, but clashing and colliding? Be this as it may, in the bleak short days we behold men of weight and influence threading the great vortex of French locomotion, each on his several line, from all sides of France towards the Chateau of Versailles, summoned thither de par le roi. There on the twenty-second day of February, 1787, they have met, and got installed. Notables to the number of a hundred and thirty-seven, as we count them name by name. Add seven princes of the blood, it makes the round gross of notables, men of the sword, men of the robe, peers, dignified clergy, parliamentary presidents, divided into seven boards, bureaux, under our seven princes of the blood, Monsieur d'Artois, Pontiever, and the rest, among whom let not our new Duc d'Orléans, for since 1785 he is Chartres no longer, be forgotten, never yet made admiral, and now turning the corner of his fortieth year, with spoiled blood and prospects, half weary of a world which is more than half weary of him, Monsignor's future is most questionable. Not in illumination and insight, not even in conflagration, but as was said, in dull smoke and ashes of outburnt sensualities, does he live and digest. Sumptuosity and sordidness, revenge, life-weariness, ambition, darkness, putrescence, and, say, in sterling money, three hundred thousand a year. Were this poor prince once to burst loose from his court moorings, to what regions, with what phenomena, might he not sail and drift? Happily as yet he affects to hunt daily, sits there, since he must sit, presiding that bureau of his, with dull moon visage, dull glassy eyes, as if it were a mere tedium to him. We observe, finally, that Count Mirabeau has actually arrived. He descends from Berlin, on the scene of action, glares into it with flashing sun-glance, discerns that it will do nothing for him. He had hoped that these notables might need a secretary. They do need one, but have fixed on Dupont de Nemours, a man of smaller fame, but then of better, who indeed, as his friends often hear, labors under this complaint, surely not a universal one, of having five kings to correspond with. The pen of a Mirabeau cannot become an official one. Nevertheless, it remains a pen. In defect of secretaryship, he sets to denouncing stock brokerage, denunciation de l'ajotage, testifying as his wont is, by loud brute, that he is present and busy, till, warned by friend Talleyrand, and even by Callon himself underhand, that a seventeenth lettre de cachet may be launched against him, he timefully flits over the marches. And now in stately royal apartments, as pictures of that time still represent them, our hundred and forty-four notables sit organized, ready to hear and consider. Controller Callon is dreadfully behindhand with his speeches, his preparatives, however the men's facility of work is known to us. For freshness of style, lucidity, ingenuity, largeness of view, that opening harangue of his was unsurpassable, had not the subject matter been so appalling. A deficit, concerning which accounts vary, and the controller's own account is not unquestioned, but which all accounts agree in representing as enormous. This is the epitome of our controller's difficulties. And then his means? Mere turgoism. For thither, it seems, we must come at last. Provincial assemblies. New taxation. Nay, strangest of all, new land tax. What he calls subvention territoriale, from which neither privileged nor unprivileged, noblemen, clergy, nor parliamenteers shall be exempt. Foolish enough, 
These privileged classes have been used to tax, levying toll, tribute, and custom, at all hands, while a penny was left, but to be themselves taxed. Of such privileged persons, meanwhile, do these notables all but the merest fraction consist. Headlong Calone had given no heed to the composition or judicious packing of them, but chosen such notables as were really notable, trusting for the issue to offhand ingenuity, good fortune and eloquence that never yet failed. Headlong Controller General, eloquence can do much, but not all. Orpheus, with eloquence grown rhythmic, musical, what we call poetry, drew iron tears from the cheek of Pluto, but by what witchery of rhyme or prose wilt thou from the pocket of Plutus draw gold? Accordingly, the storm that now rose and began to whistle around Kelon, first in these seven bureaus, and then on the outside of them, awakened by them, spreading wider and wider over all France, threatens to become unappeasable, a deficit so enormous. Mismanagement, profusion is too clear. Peculation itself is hinted at. Nay, Lafayette and others go so far as to speak it out, with attempts at proof. The blame of his deficit, our brave Calonne, as was natural, had endeavored to shift from himself on his predecessors, not accepting even Necker. But now Necker vehemently denies, whereupon an angry correspondence, which also finds its way into print. In the Eure de Boeuf, and Her Majesty's private apartments, an eloquent controller, with his madam if it is but difficult, had been persuasive. But, alas, the cause is now carried elsewhither. Behold him, one of these sad days in Monsieur's bureau, to which all the other bureaus have sent deputies. He is standing at bay, alone, exposed to an incessant fire of questions, interpolations, objurgations, from those hundred and thirty-seven pieces of logic ordnance, what we may well call bouche à feu, fire mouths, literally, never, according to Bazanvel, or hardly ever, had such display of intellect, dexterity, coolness, suasive eloquence, been made by man. To the raging play of so many fire mouths, he opposes nothing angrier than light beams, self-possession, and fatherly smiles. With the imperturbablest bland clearness, he, for five hours long, keeps answering the incessant volley of fiery captious questions, reproachful interpellations, in words prompt as lightning, quiet as light. Nay, the crossfire, too, such side questions and incidental interpolations as in the heat of the main battle, he, having only one tongue, could not get answered. These also he takes up at the first slake, answers even these. Could blandest suasive eloquence have saved France, she were saved. Heavy-laden controller. In the seven bureaus seems nothing but hindrance. In Monsieur's bureau, a Lomini de Brienne, Archbishop of Toulouse, with an eye himself to the controllership, stirs up the clergy. There are meetings, underground intrigues. Neither from without anywhere comes sign of help or hope. For the nation, where Mirabeau is now with stentor lungs, denouncing Agio, the controller has hitherto done nothing, or less. For Philosophdom he has done as good as nothing, sent out some scientific La Perouse, or the like. And is he not in angry correspondence with its necker? The very Eul de Boeuf looks questionable. A falling controller has no friends. Solid Monsieur de Vergin, who with his phlegmatic judicious punctuality might have kept down many things, died the very week before these sorrowful notables met, and now a seal-keeper, Garde des Sceaux Miraminil, is thought to be playing the traitor, spinning plots for Lomini Brienne. Queen's reader, Abbé de Vermont, unloved individual, was Brienne's creature, the work of his hands from the first. It may be feared the backstairs passage is open, ground getting mined under our feet. Treacherous garde des Sceaux Miraminil, at least, should be dismissed. Lamagnon, the eloquent notable, a stanch man with connections and even ideas, Parlement president yet intent on reforming Parlement, were not he the right keeper? So, for one, thinks busy Bosonval, and at dinner table, rounds the same into the controller's ear, who always, in the intervals of landlord duties, listens to him as with charmed look, but answers nothing positive. Alas, what to answer? The force of private intrigue, and then also the force of public opinion, grows so dangerous, confused. Philosophdom sneers aloud, as if its necker already triumphed. The gaping populace gapes over woodcuts or copper cuts, where, for example, a rustic is represented convoking the poultry of his barnyard, with this opening address. Dear animals, I have assembled you to advise me what sauce I should dress you with. To which a cock responding, We don't want to be eaten, is checked by, You wander from the point. Vous vous écartez de la question. Laughter and logic, ballad singer, pamphleteer, epigram, and caricature. What wind of public opinion is this? As if the cave of the winds were bursting loose. At nightfall, 
President Lamoignon steals over to the controllers, finds him walking with large strides in his chamber like one out of himself. With rapid confused speech the controller begs Monsieur de Lamoignon to give him an advice. Lamoignon candidly answers that, except in regard to his own anticipated keepership, unless that would prove remedial, he really cannot take upon him to advise. On the Monday after Easter, the ninth of April, 1787, a date one rejoices to verify, for nothing can excel the indolent falsehood of these histoires and memoirs, on the Monday after Easter, as I, Bosanfal, was riding towards Romainville to the Marshal de Segur's, I met a friend on the boulevards, who told me that Monsieur de Calon was out. A little further on came Monsieur the Duc d'Orléans, dashing towards me, head to the wind, trotting à l'anglaise, and confirmed the news. It is true news. Treacherous garde des Sceaux Mirovenil is gone, and Lamoignon is appointed in his room, but appointed for his own profit only, not for the controllers. Next day... The controller also has had to move. A little longer he may linger near, be seen among the money-changers, and even working in the controller's office, where much lies unfinished, but neither will that hold. Too strong blows and beats this tempest of public opinion, of private intrigue, as from the cave of all the winds, and blows him, higher authority giving sign, out of Paris and France, over the horizon, into invisibility, or utter darkness. Such destiny the magic of genius could not forever avert. Ungrateful Oil de Boeuf, did he not miraculously rain gold manna on you? So that, as a courtier said, all the world held out its hand, and I held out my hat, for a time. Himself is poor, penniless, had not a financier's widow in Lorraine offered him, though he was turned of fifty, her hand and the rich purse it held. Dim henceforth shall be his activity, though unwearied. Letters to the king, appeals, prognostications, pamphlets, from London, written with the old suasive facility, which, however, do not persuade. Luckily his widow's purse fails not. Once in a year or two, some shadow of him shall be seen hovering on the northern border, seeking election as national deputy, but be sternly beckoned away. Dimmer, then, far-born over utmost European lands, in uncertain twilight of diplomacy, he shall hover, intriguing for exiled princes, and have adventures, be overset into the Rhine stream and half drowned, nevertheless save his papers dry, unwearied, but in vain. In France he works miracles no more, shall hardly return thither to find a grave. Farewell, thou facile sanguine controller general, with thy light rash hand, thy suasive mouth of gold. Worse men there have been, and better, but to thee also was allotted a task of raising the wind, and the winds, and thou hast done it. But now, while ex-controller Calone flies storm-driven over the horizon, in this singular way, what has become of the controllership? It hangs vacant, one may say, extinct like the moon in her vacant interlunar cave. Two preliminary shadows, poor Monsieur Foucault, poor Monsieur Vildoil, do hold in quick succession some simulacrum of it, as the new moon will sometimes shine out with a dim preliminary old one in her arms. Be patient, ye notables, an actual new controller is certain, and even ready were the indispensable maneuvers but gone through. Long-headed Lamoignon, with Home Secretary Bretoil and Foreign Secretary Montmorin, have exchanged looks. Let these three once meet and speak. Who is it that is strong in the Queen's favor, and the Abbé de Ramon's, that is a man of great capacity, or at least that has struggled these fifty years to have it thought great, now in the clergy's name demanding to have Protestant death penalties put in execution, no flaunting it in the Earl de Boeuf, as the gayest man-pleaser and woman-pleaser, gleaning even a good word from Philosophdom and your Voltaires and D'Alemberts, with a party ready-made for him in the notables, Lomini de Brienne, Archbishop of Toulouse, answer all the three, with the clearest instantaneous concord, and rush off to propose him to the king, in such haste, says Bosonval, that Monsieur de Lamoignon had to borrow a simar, seemingly some kind of cloth apparatus necessary for that. Lomini Brienne, who had all his life felt a kind of predestination for the highest offices, has now therefore obtained them. He presides over the finances. He shall have the title of Prime Minister itself, and the effort of his long life be realized, unhappy only that it took such talent and industry to gain the place, that to qualify for it hardly any talent or industry was left disposable. Looking now into his inner man, what qualification he may have, Lomini beholds, not without astonishment, next to nothing but vacuity and possibility. Principles or methods, acquirement outward or inward, for his very body is wasted by hard tear and wear, he finds none, not so much as a plan. 
even an unwise one. Lucky in these circumstances that Calon has had a plan. Calon's plan was gathered from Turgos and Neckers by compilation, shall become Lomenese by adoption. Not in vain has Lomenese studied the working of the British Constitution, for he professes to have some Anglomania of a sort. Why, in that free country, does one minister, driven out by Parliament, vanish from his king's presence, and another enter, born in by Parliament? Surely not for mere change, which is ever wasteful, but that all men may have share of what is going, and so the strife of freedom indefinitely prolong itself, and no harm be done. The notables, mollified by Easter festivities, by the sacrifice of Calon, are not in the worst humor. Already his majesty, while the interlunar shadows were in office, had held session of notables, and from his throne delivered promissory conciliatory eloquence. The queen stood waiting at a window, till his carriage came back, and monsieur from afar clapped hands to her, in sign that all was well. It has had the best effect, if such do but last. Leading notables, meanwhile, can be caressed. Brienne's new gloss, Lamagnon's long head, will profit somewhat. Conciliatory eloquence shall not be wanting. On the whole, however, is it not undeniable that this of ousting Calonde and adopting the plans of Calonde is a measure which, to produce its best effect, should be looked at from a certain distance, cursorily, not dwelt on with minute near scrutiny. In a word, that no service the notables could now do were so obliging as, in some handsome manner, to take themselves away. Their six propositions, about provisional assemblies, suppression of corvées and such like, can be accepted without criticism. The subvention on land tax, and much else, one must glide hastily over, safe nowhere but in flourishes of conciliatory eloquence, till at length, on this 25th of May, year 1787, in solemn final session, there bursts forth what we can call an explosion of eloquence. King, Lomini, Lamagnon, and Retinue, taking up the successive strain, in harangues to the number of ten, besides his majesties, which last the livelong day, whereby, as in a kind of choral anthem, or bravura appeal, of thanks, praises, promises, the notables are, so to speak, organed out, and dismissed to their respective places of abode. They had sat and talked some nine weeks. They were the first notable since Richelieu's, in the year 1626. By some historians, sitting much at their ease, in the safe distance, Lomini has been blamed for this dismissal of his notables. Nevertheless, it was clearly time. There are things, as we said, which should not be dwelt on with minute close scrutiny. Over hot coals you cannot glide too fast. In these seven bureaus, where no work could be done, unless talk were work, the questionablest matters were coming up. Lafayette, for example, in Monsignor d'Artois' bureau, took upon him to set forth more than one deprecatory oration about lettres de cachet, liberty of the subject, agio, and such like, which Monsignor endeavoring to repress was answered that a notable being summoned to speak his opinion must speak it. Thus, too, his grace, the Archbishop of Aix, perorating once with a plaintive pulpit tone in these words, Tithe, that free will offering of the piety of Christians. Tithe, interrupted Duke La Rochefoucauld, with the cold business manner he has learned from the English, that free will offering of the piety of Christians on which there are now forty thousand lawsuits in this realm. Nay, Lafayette, bound to speak his opinion, went the length one day of proposing to convoke a national assembly. You demand states general? asked Monsignor, with an air of minatory surprise. Yes, Monsignor, and even better than that. Write it, said Monsignor to the clerks. Written accordingly it is, and what is more, will be acted by and by. End of section 15「Section 16 of The French Revolution, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 3, Chapter 4. Lomini's Edicts. Thus, then, have the notables returned home, carrying to all quarters of France such notions of deficit, decrepitude, distraction, and that states general will cure it, or will not cure it, but kill it. Each notable, we may fancy, is as a funeral torch, 
disclosing hideous abysses better left hid the unquietest humor possesses all men ferments seeks issue in pamphleteering caricaturing projecting declaiming vain jangling of thought word and deed it is spiritual bankruptcy long tolerated verging now towards economical bankruptcy and becoming intolerable for from the lowest dumb rank the inevitable misery as was predicted has spread upwards in every man is some obscure feeling that his position oppressive or else oppressed is a false one all men in one or the other acrid dialect as assaulters or as defenders must give vent to the unrest that is in them of such stuff national well-being and the glory of rulers is not made o lomeni what a wild heaving waste looking hungry and angry world hast thou after lifelong effort got promoted to take charge of lomeni's first edicts are mere soothing ones creation of provincial assemblies for apportioning the imposts when we get any suppression of corvée or statute labor alleviation of gabelle soothing measures recommended by the notables long clamored for by all liberal men oil cast on the waters has been known to produce a good effect before venturing with great essential measures lomeni will see this singular swell of the public mind abate somewhat most proper surely but what if it were not a swell of the abating kind there are swells that come of the upper tempest and wind gust but again there are swells that come of subterranean pent wind some say and even of inward decomposition of decay that has become self-combustion as when according to neptuno plutonic geology the world is all decayed down into due atritis of this sort and shall now be exploded and new made these latter abate not by oil the fool says in his heart how shall not to-morrow be as yesterday as all days which were once to-morrows the wise man looking on this france moral intellectual economical sees in short all the symptoms he has ever met with in history unabatable by soothing edicts meanwhile abate or not cash must be had and for that quite another sort of edicts namely bursal or fiscal ones how easy were fiscal edicts did you know for certain that the parlement of paris would what they call register them such right of registering properly of mere writing down the parlement has got by old want and though but a law court can remonstrate and higgle considerably about the same hence many quarrels desperate mopu devices and victory and defeat a quarrel now near forty years long hence fiscal edicts which otherwise were easy enough become such problems for example is there not calon's subvention territoriale universal unexempting land tax the sheet anchor of finance or to show so far as possible that one is not without original finance talent lomeni himself can devise an edit du tambre or stamp tax 
borrowed also it is true but then from america may it prove luckier in france than there france has her resources nevertheless it cannot be denied the aspect of that parlement is questionable already among the notables in that final symphony of dismissal the paris president had an ominous tone adrien dupour quitting magnetic sleep in this agitation of the world threatens to rouse himself into preternatural wakefulness shallower but also louder there is magnetic despremenil with his tropical heat he was born at madras with his dusky confused violence holding of illumination animal magnetism public opinion adam weishaupt harmodius and aristogiton and all manner of confused and violent things of whom can come no good the very peerage is infected with the leaven our peers have in too many cases laid aside their frogs laces bagwigs and go about in english costume or ride rising in their stirrups in the most headlong manner nothing but insubordination eleutheromania confused unlimited opposition in their heads questionable not to be ventured upon if we had a fortunatus purse but lomeni has waited all june casting on the waters what oil he had and now be tied as it may the two finance edicts must out on the sixth of july he forwards his proposed stamp tax and land tax to the parlement of paris and as if putting his own leg foremost not his borrowed calon's leg places the stamp tax first in order alas the parlement will not register the parlement demands instead a state of the expenditure a state of the contemplated reductions states enough which his majesty must decline to furnish discussions arise patriotic eloquence the peers are summoned does the nemean lion begin to bristle here surely is a duel which france and the universe may look upon with prayers at lowest with curiosity and bets paris stirs with new animation the outer courts of the palais de justice roll with unusual crowds coming and going their huge outer hum mingles with the clang of patriotic eloquence within and gives vigor to it poor lomeni gazes from the distance little comforted has his invisible emissaries flying to and fro assiduous without result so pass the sultry dog days in the most electric manner and the whole month of july and still in the sanctuary of justice sounds nothing but harmodious aristogiton eloquence environed with the hum of crowding paris and no registering accomplished and no states furnished states said a lively parlementeer monsieur the states that should be furnished us in my opinion are the states general on which timely joke there followed cachinatory buzzes of approval what a word to be spoken in the palais de justice old dormison the ex-controller's uncle shakes his judicious head far enough from laughing but the outer courts and paris and france catch the glad sound 
and repeat it, shall repeat it, and re-echo and reverberate it till it grow a deafening peal. Clearly enough, here is no registering to be thought of. The pious proverb says, There are remedies for all things but death. When a parlement refuses registering, the remedy, by long practice, has become familiar to the simplest. A bed of justice. One complete month this parlement has spent in mere idle jargoning, and sound and fury. The tumbra edict, not registered, or like to be. The subvention, not yet so much as spoken of. On the 6th of August, let the whole refractory body roll out, in wheeled vehicles, as far as the king's chateau of Versailles. There shall the king, holding his bed of justice, order them, by his own royal lips, to register. They may remonstrate in an undertone, but they must obey, lest a worse unknown thing befall them. It is done. The Parlement has rolled out on royal summons, has heard the express royal order to register, whereupon it has rolled back again amid the hushed expectancy of men. And now, behold, on the morrow, this Parlement, seated once more in its own palais, with crowds inundating the outer courts, not only does not register, but, O oh, portent, declares all that was done on the prior day to be null, and the bed of justice as good as a futility. In the history of France, here verily is a new feature. Nay, better still, our heroic Parlement, getting suddenly enlightened on several things, declares that, for its part, it is incompetent to register tax edicts at all, having done it by mistake during these late centuries, that for such act one authority only is competent, the assembled three estates of the realm. To such length can the universal spirit of a nation penetrate the most isolated body corporate. Say, rather, with such weapons, homicidal and suicidal, in exasperated political duel, will bodies corporate fight. But, in any case, is not this the real death grapple of war and internecine duel, Greek meeting Greek, whereon men had they even no interest in it, might look with interest unspeakable. Crowds, as was said, inundate the outer courts. Inundation of young, eleutheromaniac noblemen in English costume, uttering audacious speeches. Of procurers, bazosh clerks, who are idle in these days of loungers, newsmongers, and other nondescript classes, rolls tumultuous there. From three to four thousand persons, waiting eagerly to hear the arete, resolutions, you arrive at within, applauding with bravos, with the clapping of from six to eight thousand hands. Sweet also is the mead of patriotic eloquence. When your despremenil, your froteau, or sabatier, issuing from his Demosthenic Olympus, the thunder being hushed for the day, is welcomed in the outer courts with a shout from four thousand throats, is borne home shoulder high with benedictions, and strikes the stars with his sublime head. End of section 16
Section seventeen of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume one, book three, chapter five. Lomini's Thunderbolts. Arise, Lomini Brienne. Here is no case for letters of gestion, for faltering or compromise. Thou seest the whole loose, fluent population of Paris, whatsoever is not solid and fixed to work, inundating these outer courts like a loud, destructive deluge. The very basoche of lawyers' clerks talks sedition. The lower classes, in this duel of authority with authority, Greek throttling Greek, have ceased to respect the city watch. Police satellites are marked on the back with chalk. The M signifies Musha, or spy. They are hustled, hunted like ferae naturae. Subordinate rural tribunals send messengers of congratulation, of adherence. Their fountain of justice is becoming a fountain of revolt. The provincial parliaments look on with intent eye, with breathless wishes, while their elder sister of Paris does battle. The whole twelve are of one blood and temper. The victory of one is that of all. Ever worse it grows. On the 10th of August there is a plant omitted touching the prodigalities of Calonne, and permission to proceed against him. No registering, but instead of it denouncing. Of dilapidation, peculation, and even the burden of the song, states general, have the royal armories no thunderbolt that thou couldst, O Lomini, with red right hand, launch it among these demosthenic theatrical thunder-barrels, mere resin and noise, for the most part, and shatter and smite them silent. On the night of the 14th of August, Lomini launches his thunderbolt, or handful of them. Letters named of the seal, de cachet, as many as needful, some six score and odd, are delivered overnight. And so, next day betimes, the whole Parliament, once more set on wheels, is rolling incessantly towards Troy in Champagne, escorted, says history, with the blessings of all people the very innkeepers and postilions looking gratuitously reverent. This is the 15th of August, 1787. What will not people bless in their extreme need? Seldom had the Parliament of Paris deserved much blessing, or received much. An isolated body corporate, which, out of old confusions, while the sceptre of the sword was confusedly struggling to become a sceptre of the pen, had got itself together better and worse, as bodies corporate do, to satisfy some dim desire of the world, and many clear desires of individuals, and so had grown, in the course of centuries, on concession, on acquirement and usurpation, to be what we see it, a prosperous social anomaly, deciding lawsuits, sanctioning or rejecting laws, and withal disposing of its places and offices by sale for ready money which method sleek President Henon, after meditation, will demonstrate to be the indifferent best. In such a body, existing by purchase for ready money, there could not be excess of public spirit. There might well be excess of eagerness to divide the public spoil. Men in helmets have divided that with swords, men in wigs with quill and inkhorn to divide it, and even more hatefully these latter, if more peaceably, for the Whig method is at once irresistibler and baser. By long experience, says Bessonval, it had been found useless to sue a parliamentaire at law. No officer of justice will serve a writ on one. His wig and gown are his Vulcan's panoply, his enchanted cloak of darkness. The Parliament of Paris may count itself an unloved body, mean, not magnanimous, on the political side. Were the king weak, always, as now, has his parliament barked, cur-like, at his heels, and what popular cry there might be. 
Were he strong, it barked before his face, hunting for him as his alert beagle. An unjust body, where foul influences have more than once worked shameful perversion of judgment. Does not, in these very days, the blood of murdered Lally cry aloud for vengeance? Baited, circumvented, driven mad like the snared lion, Valor had to sink extinguished under vindictive chicane. Behold him, that hapless Lally, his wild, dark soul looking through his wild, dark face, trailed on the ignominious death-hurdle, the voice of his despair choked by a wooden gag. The wild fire soul that has known only peril and toil, and for three score years has buffeted against fate's obstruction and men's perfidy, like genius and courage amid poltroonery, dishonesty and commonplace. Faithfully enduring and endeavouring, O Parliament of Paris, dost thou reward it with a gibbet and a gag? The dying Lally bequeathed his memory to his boy. A young Lally has arisen demanding redress in the name of god and man the parliament of paris does its utmost to defend the indefensible abominable nay what is singular dusky glowing aristogiton d'espremenil is the man chosen its spokesman in that such social anomaly is it that france now blesses an unclean social anomaly but in duel against another worse. The exiled Parliament is felt to have covered itself with glory. There are quarrels in which even Satan, bringing help, were not unwelcome. Even Satan, fighting stiffly, might cover himself with glory of a temporary sort. But what a stir in the outer courts of the Palais, where Paris finds its Parliament trumbled off to Troyes and Champagne, and nothing left but a few mute keepers of records. A demosthenic thunder become extinct, the martyrs of liberty clean gone. Confused wail and menace rises from the four thousand throats of procurers, bassoche clerks, nondescripts, and anglomaniac noblesse. Ever new idlers crowd to see and hear. Rascality, with increasing numbers and vigour, hunts mouchard. Loud whirlpool rolls through these spaces. The rest of the city, fixed to its work, cannot yet go rolling. Audacious placards are legible in and about the palais. The speeches are as good as seditious. Surely the temper of Paris is much changed. On the third day of this business, 18th of August, Monsieur and Monseigneur d'Artois coming in stage carriages according to use and want to have these late obnoxious arrêtes and protests expunged from the records are received in the most marked manner monsieur who is thought to be in opposition is met with vivats and strewed flowers monseigneur on the other hand with silence with murmurs which rise to hisses and groans Nay, an irreverent rascality presses towards him in floods with such hissing vehemence that the captain of the guards has to give order. All lays arms, handle arms, at which thunder word indeed and the flash of the clear iron, the rascal flood recoils through all avenues fast enough. New features these, indeed, as good as Monsieur de Malazerbes pertinently remarks. It is a quite new kind of contest, this, with the Parliament. No transitory sputter, as from collision of hard bodies, but more like the first sparks of what, if not quenched, may become a great conflagration. This good Malazerbes sees himself now again in the King's Council after an absence of ten years. Lomini would profit if not by the faculties of the man, yet by the name he has as for the man's opinion it is not listened to wherefore he will soon withdraw a second time back to his books and his trees in such king's council what can a good man profit turgo tries it not a second time turgo has quitted france and this earth some years ago and now cares for none of these things singular enough Togo, this same Lomini, 
and the Abbe Morellet were once a trio of young friends, fellow scholars in the Sorbonne. Forty new years have carried them severally thus far. Meanwhile, the Parliament sits daily at Troy, calling cases, and daily adjourns, no procurer making his appearance to plead. Troy's is as hospitable as could be looked for. Nevertheless, one has comparatively a dull life. No crowds now to carry you, shoulder high to the immortal gods. Scarcely a patriot or two will drive out so far and bid you be of firm courage. You are in furnished lodgings, far from home and domestic comfort, little to do but wander over the unlovely champagne fields, seeing the grapes ripen, taking counsel about the thousand times consulted, a prey to tedium, in danger even that Paris may forget you. Messengers come and go. Pacific Lomini is not slack in negotiating, promising. Dormesson and the prudent elder members see no good in strife. After a dull month, the Parliament, yielding and retaining, makes truce, as all Parliaments must. The stamp tax is withdrawn. The subvention land tax is also withdrawn. But, in its stead, there is granted what they call a prorogation of the second twentieth, itself a kind of land tax, but not so oppressive to the influential classes, which lies mainly on the dumb class. Moreover, secret promises exist on the part of the elders that finances may be raised by loan. Of the ugly word states general, there shall be no mention. And so, on the 20th of September, our exiled Parliament returns. De Spremenil said, It went out covered with glory, but had come back covered with mud. Not so, Aristogiton, or, if so, thou surely art the man to clean it. End of section 17section eighteen of the french revolution this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lynn thompson the french revolution by thomas carlyle volume one book three chapter six lomenie's plots was ever unfortunate chief minister so bested as Lomini Brienne? The reins of the state fairly in his hand these six months, and not the smallest motive power of finance to stir from the spot with, this way or that. He flourishes his whip, but advances not. Instead of ready money, there is nothing but rebellious debating in recalcitrating. Far is the public mind from having calmed, it goes chafing and fuming even worse, and in the royal coffers, and such yearly deficit running on, there is hardly the colour of coin. Ominous prognostics. Mal Serbs, seeing an exhausted, exasperated France grow hotter and hotter, talks of conflagration. Mirabeau, without talk, has, as we perceive, descended on Paris again, close to the rear of Parlement, not to quit his native soil any more. Over the frontiers, behold, Holland invaded by Prussia, October 1787. The French party oppressed, England and the Stadtholder triumphing. To the sorrow of War Secretary Montmorin, and all men, but without money, sinews of war, as of work, and of existence itself, what can a chief minister do? Taxes profit little. This of the second twentieth falls not due till next year and will then, with its strict valuation, produce more controversy than cash. Taxes on the privileged classes cannot be registered, are intolerable to our supporters themselves. Taxes on the unprivileged yield nothing. As from a thing drained dry, more cannot be drawn. Hope is nowhere, if not in the old refuge of loans. To Lomini, aided by the long head of La Moignon, deeply pondering this sea of troubles the thought suggested itself why not have a successive loan en prince successive or loan that went on lending year after year 
as much as needful say till seventeen ninety two the trouble of registering such loan were the same we had then breathing time money to work with at least to subsist on edict of a successive loan must be proposed to conciliate the philosophes let a liberal edict walk in front of it for emancipation of protestants let a liberal promise guard the rear of it and when our loan ends in that final seventeen ninety two the states general shall be convoked such liberal edict of protestant emancipation the time having come for it shall cost a lomini as little as the death penalties to be put in execution did as for the liberal promise of states general it can be fulfilled or not the fulfilment is five good years off in five years much intervenes but the registering ah truly there is a difficulty however we have that promise of the elders given secretly at trois judicious gratuities cajoleries underground intrigues with old foulon named arme damne familiar demon of the parlement may perhaps do the rest at worst and lowest the royal authority has resources which ought it not to put forth if it cannot realize money the royal authority is as good as dead dead of that surest and miserablest death inanition risk and win without risk all is already lost for the rest as in enterprises of pith a touch of stratagem often proves furthersome his majesty announces a royal hunt for the nineteenth of november next and all whom it concerns are joyfully getting their gear ready royal hunt indeed but of two-legged unfeathered game at eleven in the morning of that royal hunt day nineteenth of november seventeen eighty seven unexpected blare of trumpeting tumult of charioteering and cavalcading disturbs the seat of justice his majesty is come with garde des sceaux lamoignon and peers and retinue to hold royal session and have edicts registered what a change since louis the fourteenth entered here in boots and whip in hand ordered his registering to be done with an olympian look which none durst gainsay and did without stratagem in such unceremonious fashion hunt as well as register for louis the sixteenth on this day the registering will be enough if indeed he and the day suffice for it meanwhile with fit ceremonial words the purpose of the royal breast is signified two edicts for protestant emancipation for successive loan of both which edicts our trusty garde des sceaux lamoignon will explain the purport on both which a trusty parlement is requested to deliver its opinion each member having free privilege of speech and so la moignon too having perorated not amiss and wound up with that promise of states-general the sphere music of parliamentary eloquence begins explosive responsive sphere answering sphere it waxes louder and louder the peers sit attentive of diverse sentiment unfriendly to states-general unfriendly to despotism which cannot reward merit and is suppressing places but what agitates his highness d'orleans the rubicund moonhead goes wagging darker beams the copper visage like unscoured copper in the glazed eye is disquietude he rolls uneasy in his seat as if he meant something amid unutterable satiety has sudden new appetite for new forbidden fruit been vouchsafed him disgust and audacity laziness that cannot rest futile ambition revenge non-admiralship oh within that carbuncled skin what a confusion of confusion sits bottled eight couriers in course of the day gallop from versailles where lomini waits palpitating and gallop back again not with the best news in the outer courts of the palais huge buzz of expectation reigns it is whispered the chief minister has lost six votes overnight and from within resounds nothing but forensic eloquence pathetic and ever indignant heart-rending appeals to the royal clemency that the majesty would please to summon states-general forthwith and be the saviour of france wherein dusky glowing death Bremenil, but still more sabatier de cabre and fretto since named comer fretto goody fretto are among the loudest 
for six mortal hours it lasts in this manner the infinite hubbub unslackened and so now when brown dusk is falling through the windows and no end visible his majesty on hint of garde des sceaux lamoignon opens his royal lips once more to say in brief that he must have his loan edict registered momentary deep pause see monseigneur d'orleans rises the moon visage turned towards the royal platform he asks with a delicate graciosity of manner covering unutterable things whether it is a bed of justice then or a royal session fire flashes on him from the throne and neighbourhood surly answers that it is in session in that case monseigneur will crave leave to remark that edicts cannot be registered by order of a session and indeed to enter against such registry his individual humble protest vous êtes bien le maître you will do your pleasure answers the king and thereupon in high state marches out escorted by his court retinue d'orleans himself as in duty bound escorting him but only to the gate which duty done d'orleans returns in from the gate redacts his protest in the face of an applauding parlement and applauding france and so has cut his court moorings shall we say and will now sail and drift fast enough towards chaos thou foolish d'orleans equality that art to be is royalty grown a mere wooden scarecrow whereon thou pert scold-headed crow mayst alight at pleasure and peck not yet wholly next day a lettre de cachet sends d'orleans to bethink himself in his chateau of vie cotteret where alas is no paris with its joyous necessaries of life no fascinating indispensable madame de buffon light wife of a great naturalist much too old for her monseigneur it is said does nothing but walk distractedly at vie cotteret cursing his stars versailles itself shall hear penitent wail from him so hard is his doom by a second simultaneous lettre de cachet goody fretto is hurled into the stronghold of ham amid the norman marshes by a third sabatier de cabre into mont saint michel amid the norman quicksands as for the parlement it must on summons travel out to versailles with its register book under its arm to have the protest beef expunged not without admonition and even rebuke a stroke of authority which one might have hoped would quiet matters unhappily no it is a mere taste of the whip to rearing courses which make them rear worse when a team of twenty-five millions begins rearing what is lomini's whip the parlement will nowise acquiesce meekly and set to register the protestant edict and do its other work in salutary fear of these three lettres de cachet far from that it begins questioning lettres de cachet generally their legality endurability emits dolorous objurgation petition on petition to have its three martyrs delivered cannot till that be complied with so much as think of examining the protestant edict but puts it off always till this day week in which objugatory strain paris and france joins it or rather has preceded it making fearful chorus and now also the other parlement at length opening their mouths begin to join some of them as at grenoble and rennes with portentous emphasis threatening by way of reprisal to interdict the very tax-gatherer in all former contests as malsherbes remarks it was the parlement that excited the public but here it is the public that excites the parlement end of section 18section 19 of the french revolution this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Lynn Thompson The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle Volume 1, Book 3, Chapter 7 Internecine 
What a France through these winter months of the year 1787! The very Eau de Boeuf is doleful, uncertain, with a general feeling among the suppressed that it were better to be in Turkey. The wolfhounds are suppressed, the bear hounds, Duc de Coigny, Duc de Polignac, in the Triana Little Heaven, Her Majesty one evening takes Bensonval's arm, asks his candid opinion. The intrepid Bessonval, having, as he hopes, nothing of the sycophant in him, plainly signifies that, with a Parlement in rebellion and an eau de boeuf in suppression, the King's crown is in danger, whereupon, singular to say, Her Majesty, as if hurt, changed the subject, et ne me parle plus de rien. To whom, indeed, can this poor Queen speak? In need of wise counsel, if ever mortal was, yet beset here only by the hubbub of chaos. Her dwelling-place is so bright to the eye, and confusion and black care darkens it all. Sorrows of the sovereign, sorrows of the woman, think coming sorrows environ her more and more. La Motte, the necklace countess, has in these late months escaped, perhaps been suffered to escape, from the Salpetriere. Vain was the hope that Paris might thereby forget her, and this ever-widening lie and heap of lies subside. The Lamotte, with a V for voleur's thief, branded on both shoulders, has got to England, and will therefrom emit lie on lie, defiling the highest queenly name, mere distracted lies, which, in its present humour, France will greedily believe. For the rest, it is too clear our successive loan is not filling, as indeed, in such circumstances, a loan registered by expunging of protests was not the likeliest to fill. Denunciation of lettres de cachet, of despotism generally, abates not. The twelve parlements are busy, the twelve hundred placarders, ballad singers, pamphleteers. Paris is what in figurative speech they call flooded with pamphlets, regorge de brochures, flooded and eddying again, hot deluge from so many patriot ready writers, all at the fervid or boiling point, each ready writer now in the hour of eruption going like an Iceland geyser, against which what can a judicious friend Morier do? A riverol, an unruly langue, well paid for it, spouting cold. Now also, at length, does come discussion for the Protestant edict, but only for new embroilment, in pamphlet and counter-pamphlet, increasing the madness of men. Not even orthodoxy, bedrid as she seemed, but will have a hand in this confusion. She, once again in the shape of Abbe L'Enfant, whom prelates strive to visit and congratulate, raises audible sound from her pulpit drum. Or mark how Despreminil, who has his own confused way in all things, produces at the right moment in parliamentary harangue a pocket crucifix with the apostrophe. Will you crucify him afresh, him, O Despreminil, without scruple, considering what poor stuff of ivory and filigree he is made of? To all which add only that poor Brienne has fallen sick, so hard was the tear and wear of his sinful youth, so violent incessant is his agitation of his foolish old age. Baited, bayed at through so many throats, his grace growing consumptive, inflammatory, with humeur de dart, lies reduced to milk diet, in exasperation, almost in desperation, with repose precisely the impossible recipe, prescribed as the indispensable. On the whole, what can a poor government do, but once more recoil ineffectual? The king's treasury is running towards the less, the Paris eddies with a flood of pamphlets. At all rates, let the latter subside a little. D'Orléans gets back to Rancy, which is nearer Paris, and the fair frail Buffon, finally to Paris itself. Neither are Fréteau and Sabatier banished for ever. The Protestant edict is registered. To the joy of Boissy d'Anglas and good Malzerbe. Successive loan, all protests expunged or else withdrawn, remains open, the rather as few or none come to fill it. States-general, for which the Parlement has clamoured, 
and now the whole nation clamours will follow in five years if indeed not sooner oh parlement of paris what a clamour was that messieurs said old domesson you will get states general and you will repent it like the horse in the fable who to be avenged of his enemy applied to the man the man mounted did swift execution of the enemy but unhappily would not dismount instead of five years let three years pass and this clamorous parlement will have both seen its enemy hurled prostrate and itself ridden to foundering say rather jugulated for hide and shoes and lie dead in the ditch under such omens however we have reached the spring of seventeen eighty eight by no path can the king's government find passage for itself but is everywhere shamefully flung back beleaguered by twelve rebellious parliaments which are grown to be the organs of an angry nation it can advance no whither can accomplish nothing obtain nothing not so much as money to subsist on but must sit there seemingly to be eaten up of deficit the measure of the iniquity then of the falsehood which had been gathering through long centuries is nearly full at least that of the misery is for the hovels of the twenty-five millions the misery permeating upwards and forwards as its law is has gone so far to the very eau de boeuf of versailles man's hand in this blind pain is set against man not only the low against the higher but the higher against each other provincial noblesse is bitter against court noblesse robe against sword rocher against pen but against the king's government who is not bitter not even besenval in these days to all men and bodies of men are become as enemies it is the centre whereon infinite contentions unite and clash what new universal vertiginous movement is this of institution social arrangements individual minds which once worked cooperative now rolling and grinding in distracted collision inevitable it is the breaking up of a world solecism worn out at last down even to bankruptcy of money and so this poor versailles court as the chief or central solecism finds all the other solecisms arrayed against it most natural for your human solecism be it person or combination of persons is ever by law of nature uneasy if verging towards bankruptcy it is even miserable and when would the meanest solecism consent to blame or amend itself while there remained another to amend these threatening signs do not terrify lomini much less teach him lomini though of light nature is not without courage of a sort nay we have not read of lightest creatures trained canary birds that could fly cheerfully with lighted matches and fire cannon fire whole powder magazines to sit and die of deficit is no part of lomini's plan the evil is considerable but can he not remove it can he not attack it at lowest he can attack the symptom of it these rebellious parlements he can attack and perhaps remove much is dim to lomini but two things are clear that such parliamentary duel with royalty is growing perilous nay internecine above all that money must be had take thought brave lomini thou garde so lamoignon who hast ideas so often defeated bolt cruelly when the golden fruit seemed within clutch rally for one other struggle to tame the parlement to fill the king's coffers these are now life and death questions parlements have been tamed more than once set to perch on the peaks of rocks inaccessible except by litters a parlement grows reasonable oh mopo thou bold man had we left thy work where it was but apart from exile or other violent methods is there not one method whereby all things are tamed even lions the method of hunger what if the parlement's supplies were cut off namely its lawsuits minor courts for the trying of innumerable minor causes might be instituted these we could call grand bailliage whereupon the parlement shortened of its prey would look with yellow despair 
but the public fond of cheap justice would favor and hope then for finance for registering of edicts why not from our own oeil de boeuf dignitaries our princes dukes marshals make a thing we could call plenary court and there so to speak do our registering ourselves st louis had his plenary court of great barons most useful to him our great barons are still here at least the name of them is still here our necessity is greater than his such is the lomini lamoignon device welcome to the king's council as a light beam in great darkness the device seems feasible it is eminently needful be it once well executed great deliverance is wrought silence then and steady now or never the world shall see one other historical scene and no singular a man as lomini de brienne still the sage manager there Behold, accordingly, a Home Secretary Britoy, beautifying Paris, in the peaceablest manner, in this hopeful spring weather of 1788, the old hovels and hutches disappearing from our bridges, as if for the state too there were halcyon weather, and nothing to do but beautify. Parlement seems to sit acknowledged victor. Brienne says nothing of finance, or even says and prints that it is all well. How is this such halcyon quiet, though the successive loan did not fill? In a victorious Parlement, Councillor Goslard de Montsabert even denounces that levying of the second twentieth on strict valuation, and gets decree that the valuation shall not be strict, not on the privileged classes. Nevertheless, Brienne endures it, launches no lettre de cachet against it. How is this? smiling is such vernal weather but treacherous sudden for one thing we hear it whispered the intendants of provinces have all got order to be at their posts on a certain day still more singular what incessant printing is this that goes on in the king's chateau under lock and key sentries occupy all gates and windows the printers come not out they sleep in their workrooms their very food is handed into them a victorious parliament smells new danger despremenil has ordered horses to versailles prowls round that guarded printing office prying snuffing if so be the sagacity and ingenuity of man may penetrate it to a shower of gold most things are penetrable despremenil descends on the lap of a printer's dane in the shape of five hundred louis d'or the Danae's husband smuggles a ball of clay to her, which she delivers to the golden councillor of Parlement. Kneaded within it, there stick printed proof sheets. By heaven, the royal edict of that same self registering plenary court, and those grand bayages that shall cut short our lawsuits. It is to be promulgated over all France on one and the same day. This, then, is what the intendants were bid wait for at their posts this is what the court sat hatching as its accursed cockatrice egg and would not stir though provoked till the brood were out high with it despremenil home to paris convoke instantaneous sessions let the parlement and the earth and the heavens know it end of section nineteen Section 20 of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 3, Chapter 8. Lomini's Death Throes. On the morrow, which is the 3rd of May, 1788, an astonished Parliament sits convoked, listens speechless to the speech of Despremenil, unfolding the infinite misdeed deed of treachery of unhallowed darkness such as despotism loves denounce it o parliament of paris awaken france and the universe roll what thunder barrels of forensic eloquence thou hast with thee too it is verily now or never the parliament is not wanting at such juncture in the hour of his extreme jeopardy the lion first incites himself by roaring by lashing his sides so here the parliament of paris on the motion of despremenil 
a most patriotic oath of the one and all sort is sworn with united throat an excellent new idea which in these coming years shall not remain unimitated next comes indomitable declaration almost of the rights of man at least of the rights of parliament invocation to the friends of french freedom in this and in subsequent time all which or the essence of all which is brought to paper in a tone wherein something of plaintiveness blends with and tempers heroic valor and thus having sounded the storm-bell which paris hears which all france will hear and hurled such defiance in the teeth of lomanian despotism the parliament retires as from a tolerable first day's work but how lomany felt to see his cockatrice egg so essential to the salvation of france broken in this premature manner let readers fancy indignant he clutches at his thunderbolts de cachet of the seal and launches two of them a bolt for Desprimenil, a bolt for that busy goeslard whose service in the second twentieth and strict valuation is not forgotten such bolts clutched promptly overnight and launched with the early new morning shall strike agitated paris if not into requiescence yet into wholesome astonishment ministerial thunderbolts may be launched but if they do not hit Desprimenil and goeslard warned both of them as is thought by the singing of some friendly bird elude the lomini tipstaves escape disguised through sky windows over roofs to their own palais de justice the thunderbolts have missed paris for the buzz flies abroad is struck into astonishment not wholesome the two martyrs of liberty doff their disguises don their long gowns behold in the space of an hour by aid of ushers and swift runners the parliament with its councillors presidents even peers sits anew assembled the assembled parliament declares that these its two martyrs cannot be given up to any sublunary authority moreover that the session is permanent admitting of no adjournment till pursuit of them has been relinquished and so with forensic eloquence denunciation and protest with couriers going and returning the parliament in the state of continual explosion that shall cease neither night nor day waits the issue awakened paris once more inundates those outer courts boils in floods wilder than ever through all avenues dissonant hubbub there is jargon as of babel in the hour when they were first smitten as here with mutual unintelligibility and the people had not yet dispersed paris city goes through its diurnal epochs of working and slumbering and now for the second time most european and african mortals are asleep but here in this whirlpool of words sleep falls not the night spreads her coverlet of darkness over it in vain within is the sound of mere martyr invincibility tempered with the due tone of plaintiveness without is the infinite expectant hum growing drowsier a little so has it lasted for six and thirty hours but hark through the dead of midnight what tramp is this tramp as of armed men foot and horse gare de francaise gare de suisse marching hither in silent regularity in the flare of torchlight there are sappers too with axes and crowbars apparently if the doors open not they will be forced it is captain d'auguste missioned from versailles d'auguste a man of known firmness who once forced prince conde himself by mere incessant looking at him to give satisfaction in fight he now with axes and torches is advancing on the very sanctuary of justice sacrilegious yet what help the man is a soldier looks merely at his orders impassive moves forward like an inanimate engine the doors open on summons there need no axes door after door and now the innermost door opens discloses the long-gowned senators of france a hundred and sixty-seven by tail seventeen of them peers sitting there majestic in permanent session were not the men military and of cast iron this sight this silence re-echoing the clank of his own boots might stagger him for the hundred and sixty-seven receive him in perfect silence which some liken to that of the roman senate overfallen by brennus some to that of a nest of coiners surprised by officers of the police monsieur said d'auguste de par le roi express order has charged d'auguste with the sad duty of arresting two individuals m duval de spriminil and m goslard de montsabert which respectable individuals as he has not the honour of knowing them are hereby invited in the king's name to surrender themselves profound silence buzz which grows a murmur we are all de spriminis ventures a voice which other voices repeat the president inquires whether he will employ violence captain d'auguste honoured with his majesty's commission has to execute his majesty's order would so gladly do it without violence will in any case do it grants an august senate space to deliberate which method they prefer and thereupon d'auguste with grave military courtesy 
has withdrawn for the moment. What boots it, august senators? All avenues are closed with fixed bayonets. Your courier gallops to Versailles, through the dewy night, but also gallops back again, with tidings that the order is authentic, that it is irrevocable. The outer courts simmer with idle population, but d'Auguste's grenadier ranks stand there as immovable floodgates. There will be no revolting to deliver you. Monsieur, thus spoke de Spriminil, when the victorious Gauls entered Rome, which they had carried by assault, the Roman senators, clothed in their purple, sat there in their curial chairs, with a proud and tranquil countenance, awaiting slavery or death. Such, too, is the lofty spectacle which you, in this hour, offer to the universe, after having generously, with much more of the like as can still be read. In vain, Otis Brimenil, here is this cast-iron Captain d'Auguste, with his cast-iron military air, come back. Despotism, constraint, destruction sit waving in his plumes. Disprimenil must fall silent, heroically give himself up, lest worse to befall. Him Goslard heroically imitates. With spoken and speechless emotion, they fling themselves into the arms of their parliamentary brethren for a last embrace. And so amid plaudits and plaints from a hundred and sixty-five throats, amid wavings, sobbings, a whole forest sigh of parliamentary pathos, they are led through winding passages to the rear gate, where, in the grey of the morning, two coaches with exempts stand waiting. There must the victims mount, bayonets menacing behind. Disprimenil's stern question to the populace, whether they have courage, is answered by silence. They mount and roll, and neither the rising of the May sun, it is the sixth morning, nor its setting shall lighten their heart. But they fare forward continually, Desprimenil towards the utmost isles of Sainte Marguerite, or Yeres, supposed by some, if that is any comfort, to be Calypso's island, Goslard towards the land fortress of Pierre on Seas, extant then near the city of Lyon. Captain d'Auguste may now therefore look forward to majorship, to commandantship of the Tuileries, and withal vanish from history, where nevertheless he has been fated to do a notable thing, for not only are Desprimenil and Goslard safe whirling southward, but the Parliament itself has straightway to march out. To that also his inexorable order reaches. Gathering up their long skirts, they file out, the whole hundred and sixty-five of them, through two rows of unsympathetic grenadiers, a spectacle to gods and men. The people revolt not. They only wonder and grumble. Also, we remark, these unsympathetic grenadiers are gare de Francaise, who one day will sympathize. In a word, the palais de justice is swept clear. The doors of it are locked and d'Auguste returns to Versailles with the key in his pocket, having, as was said, merited preferment. As for this Parliament of Paris, now turned out to the street, we will without reluctance leave it there. The beds of justice it had to undergo, in the coming fortnight, at Versailles, in registering, or rather refusing to register, those new hatched edicts, and how it assembled in taverns and taprooms there, for the purpose of protesting, or hovered disconsolate, without spread skirts, not knowing where to assemble and was reduced to lodge protest with a notary, and in the end to sit still in a state of forced vacation, and do nothing. All this, natural now as the burying of the dead after battle, shall not concern us. The Parliament of Paris has as good as performed its part, doing and misdoing, so far, but hardly further could it stir the world. Lomini has removed the evil then? Not at all. Not so much as the symptom of the evil, scarcely the twelfth part of the symptom, and exasperated the other eleven. The intendant of provinces, the military commandants, are at their posts, on the appointed 8th of May. But in no parliament, if not in the single one of Douai, can these new edicts get registered. Not peaceable signing with ink, but browbeating, bloodshedding, appeal to primary club law. Against these bayages, against this plenary court, exasperated Themis everywhere shows face of battle. The provincial noblesse are of her party, and whoever hates Lomini in the evil time, with her attorneys and tipstaves, she enlists and operates down even to the populace, at Rennes in Brittany, where the historical Bertrand de Molville is intendant, it has passed from fatal continual dueling between the military and gentry, to street fighting, to stone volleys and musket shot, and still the edicts remain unregistered. The afflicted Bretons send remonstrance to Lomini, by a deputation of twelve, whom, however, Lomini, having heard them, shuts up in the Bastille. A second larger deputation he meets, by his scouts, on the road, and persuades or frightens back. But now a third largest deputation is indignantly sent by many roads. Refused audience on arriving, it meets to take counsel, invites Lafayette and all patriot Bretons in Paris to assist, 
agitates itself, becomes the Breton Club, first germ of the Jacobin Society. So many as eight parliaments get exiled. Others might need that remedy, but it is not always easy of appliance. At Grenoble, for instance, where a Mounier, a Barnav, have not been idle, the parliament had due order, by lettre de cachet, to depart and exile itself. But on the morrow, instead of coaches getting yoked, the alarm bell bursts forth ominous and peals and booms all day. Crowds of mountaineers rush down, with axes, even with firelocks, whom, most ominous of all, the soldiery shows no eagerness to deal with. Axe overhead, the poor general has to sign capitulation, to engage that the lettre de cachet shall remain unexecuted, and a beloved parliament stay where it is. Besançon, Dijon, Rouen, Bordeaux, are not what they should be. At Pau and Bayarn, where the old commandant had failed, the new one, a Gremon, native to them, is met by a procession of townsmen with the cradle of Henri IV, the palladium of their town, is conjured as he venerates this old tortoise shell, in which the great Henri was rocked, not to trample on Bayarnese liberty, is informed withal that his majesty's cannon are all safe, in the keeping of his majesty's faithful burghers of Pau, and do now lie pointed on the walls there, ready for action. At this rate, your grand voyages are like to have a stormy infancy. As for the plenary court, it has literally expired in the birth. The very courtiers looked shy at it. Old Marshal Broye declined the honor of sitting therein. Assaulted by a universal storm of mingled ridicule and execration, this poor plenary court met once, and never any second time. Distracted country, contention hisses up with forked hydrotongues, wheresoever poor Lomeny sets his foot, let a commandant, a commissioner of the king, says Weber, enter one of these parliaments to have an edict registered, the whole tribunal will disappear, and leave the commandant alone with the clerk and first president, the edict registered and the commandant gone, the whole tribunal hastens back to declare such registration null, the highways are covered with grand deputations of parliaments, proceeding to Versailles, to have their registers expunged by the king's hand, or returning home, to cover a new page with a new resolution still more audacious. Such is the France of this year, 1788, not now a golden or paper age of hope, with its horse racings, balloon flyings, and finer sensibilities of the heart. Ah, gone is that, its golden effulgence paled, be darkened in this singular manner, brewing towards preternatural weather, for, as in that wreck-storm of Paul et Virginie and Saint-Pierre, one huge motionless cloud, say of sorrow and indignation, girdles our whole horizon, streams up, hairy, copper-edged, over a sky of the color of lead, motionless itself, but small clouds, as exiled parliaments and such like, parting from it, fly over the zenith, with the velocity of birds, till at last, with one loud howl, the whole four winds be dashed together, and all the world exclaim, there is the tornado, tout le monde s'écrie, voilà l'ouragan. For the rest, in such circumstances, the successive loan very naturally remains unfilled. Neither indeed can that impost of the second twentieth, at least not on strict valuation, be levied to good purpose. Lenders, says Weber, in his hysterical vehement manner, are afraid of ruin, tax-gatherers of hanging. The very clergy turn away their face. Convoked in extraordinary assembly, they afford no gratuitous gift, if it be not that of advice. Here too, instead of cash, is clamor for states-general. O oh, Lomini Brienne, with thy poor flimsy mind all bewildered, and now three actual cauteries on thy worn-out body, who art like to die of inflammation, provocation, milk diet, d'autre vive, and maladie, best untranslated, and presidest over a France with innumerable actual cauteries, which also is dying of inflammation in the rest. Was it wise to quit the bosky verdures of Brienne, and thy new Ashlar chateau there, and what it held, for this? Soft were those shades and lawns, sweet the hymns of poetasters, the blandishments of high-rouged graces, and always this and the other philosophe Morellet, nothing deeming himself or thee a questionable sham priest, could be so happy in making happy, and also, hadst thou known it, in the military school hard by there sat, studying mathematics, a dusky-complexioned, taciturn boy, under the name of Napoleon Bonaparte, with fifty years of effort, and one final dead-lift struggle, thou hast made an exchange, thou hast got thy robe of office, as Hercules had his Nessus shirt. On the 13th of July of this 1788, there fell, on the very edge of harvest, the most frightful hailstorm, scattering into wild waste the fruits of the year, which had otherwise suffered grievously by drought. For sixty leagues round Paris especially, the ruin was almost total. 
To so many other evils, then, there is to be added that of dearth, perhaps of famine. Some days before this hailstorm, on the 5th of July, and still more decisively some days after it, on the 8th of August, Lomini announces that the States General are actually to meet in the following month of May, till after which period this of the plenary court and the rest shall remain postponed. Further, as in Lomini there is no plan of forming or holding these most desirable States General, thinkers are invited to furnish him with one, through the medium of discussion by the public press. What could a poor minister do? There are still ten months of respite reserved. A sinking pilot will fling out all things, his very biscuit bags, lead, log, compass and quadrant, before flinging out himself. It is on this principle of sinking, and the incipient delirium of despair, that we explain likewise the almost miraculous invitation to thinkers, invitation to chaos to be so kind as build, out of its tumultuous driftwood, an arc of escape for him. In these cases not invitation but command has usually proved serviceable. The queen stood that evening, pensive, in a window, with her face turned towards the garden. The chef de Goblet had followed her with an obsequious cup of coffee, and then retired till it were sipped. Her majesty beckoned Dame Campon to approach. Grand Dieu, murmured she with the cup in her hand, what a piece of news will be made public today. The king grants states general. Then raising her eyes to heaven, if Campon were not mistaken, she added, tis a first beat of the drum, a ill omen for France. This noblesse will ruin us. During all that hatching of the plenary court, while Lamagnon looked so mysterious, Bazonval had kept asking him one question, whether they had cash, to which, as Lamagnon always answered on the faith of Lomini, that the cash was safe, judicious Bazonval rejoined that then all was safe. Nevertheless, the melancholy fact is that the royal coffers are almost getting literally void of coin. Indeed, apart from all other things, this invitation to thinkers and the great change now at hand are enough to arrest the circulation of capital and forward only that of pamphlets a few thousand gold louis are now all of money or money's worth that remains in the king's treasury with another movement as of desperation lomini invites necker to come and be controller of finances necker has other work in view than controlling finances for lomini with a dry refusal he stands taciturn awaiting his time what shall a desperate prime minister do he has grasped at the strong box of the king's theatre some lottery had been set on foot for those sufferers by the hailstorm. In his extreme necessity, Lomini lays hands even on this. To make provision for the passing day, on any terms, will soon be impossible. On the 16th of August, poor Weber heard, at Paris and Versailles, hawkers, with a hoarse stifled tone of voice, drawling and snuffling, through the streets, an edict concerning payments, such was the soft title Riverol had contrived for it. All payments at the royal treasury shall be made henceforth, three-fifths in cash, and the remaining two-fifths in paper bearing interest. Poor Weber almost swooned at the sound of these cracked voices, with their bodeful raven note, and will never forget the effect it had on him. But the effect on Paris, on the world generally, from the dens of stock brokerage, from the heights of political economy, of necrism and philosophism, from all articulate and inarticulate throats, rise hootings and howlings, such as ear had not yet heard. Sedition itself may be imminent. Monsignor d'Artois, moved by Duchesse Polignac, feels called to wait upon Her Majesty, and explain frankly what crisis matters stand in. The Queen wept. Brienne himself wept, for it is now visible and palpable that he must go. Remains only that the court, to whom his manners and garrulities were always agreeable, shall make his fall soft. The grasping old man has already got his archbishopship of Toulouse exchanged for the richer one of Sens and now, in this hour of pity, he shall have the coadjutorship for his nephew, hardly yet of due age, a dameship of the palace for his niece, a regiment for her husband, for himself a red cardinal's hat, a coupe de bois, cutting from the royal forests, and on the whole from five to six hundred thousand livres of revenue. Finally, his brother, the Comte de Brienne, shall still continue war minister. Buckled round with such bolsters and huge feather-beds of promotion, let him now fall as soft as he can." And so Lomini departs, rich if court titles and money bonds can enrich him, but if these cannot, perhaps the poorest of all extant men. Hissed at by the people of Versailles, he drives forth to Jardy, to Brienne, for recovery of health, then to Nice, to Italy, but shall return, shall glide to and fro, tremulous, faint twinkling, fallen on awful times, till the guillotine snuff out his weak existence? Alas, worse, for it is blown out, or choked out, foully, pitiably, on the way to the guillotine. In his palace of Sons, rude Jacobin bailiffs made him drink with them, 
from his own wine cellars, feast with them from his own larder, and on the morrow morning the miserable old man lies dead. This is the end of Prime Minister, Cardinal Archbishop, Lomini de Brienne. Flimsier mortal was seldom fated to do as weighty a mischief, to have a life as despicable envied, an exit as frightful, fired as the phrase is, with ambition, blown like a kindled rag, the sport of winds, not this way, not that way, but of always, straight towards such a powder mine, which he kindled. Let us pity the hapless Lomini, and forgive him, and as soon as possible forget him. End of section 20《セクション twenty one of the French Revolution, Volume one。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa.《The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume one, Book three, Chapter nine, Burial with Bonfire. Besenval. During these extraordinary operations of payment two fifths in paper and change of prime minister, had been out on a tour through his district of command, and indeed for the last months peacefully drinking the waters of Contrexeville. Returning now in the end of August towards Moulins and knowing nothing, he arrives one evening at Langres, finds the whole town in a state of uproar, grande rumeur, doubtless some sedition, a thing too common in these days. He alights, nevertheless, inquires of a man tolerably dressed what the matter is. How, answers the man, you have not heard the news? The archbishop is thrown out, and Monsieur Necker is recalled, and all is going to go well. Such rumeur and vociferous acclaim has risen round Monsieur Necker, even from that day when he issued from the Queen's apartments a nominated minister. It was on the twenty fourth of August. The galleries of the chateau, the courts, the streets of Versailles, in a few hours the capital, and as the news flew, all France resounded with the cry of Vive le roi, vive Monsieur Necker. In Paris, indeed, it unfortunately got the length of turbulence. Petards, rockets go off in the Place Dauphine, more than enough. A wicker figure, mannequin d'osier, in archbishop's stole, made emblematically three-fifths of it satin, two-fifths of it paper, is promenaded, not in silence, to the popular judgment bar, is doomed, shriven by a mock abbé de Vermonde, then solemnly consumed by fire at the foot of Henri's statue on the Pont Neuf, with such petarding and huzzaing that Chevalier du Bois and his city watch see good finally to make a charge, more or less ineffectual, and there wanted not burning of sentry-boxes, forcing of guard-houses, and also dead bodies thrown into the Seine overnight, to avoid new effervescence. Parlement, therefore, shall return from exile. Plenary court, payment two-fifths in paper, have vanished, gone off in smoke at the foot of Henri's statue. States-general, with a political millennium, are now certain, nay, it shall be announced in our fond haste for January next, and all, as the long man said, is going to go. To the prophetic glance of Bessonval, one other thing is too apparent, that friend Lamoignon cannot keep his keepership. Neither he nor war minister Comte de Brienne Already old Foulon, with an eye to be war minister himself, is making underground movements. This is that same Foulon, named Arme Damne du Parlement, a man grown grey in treachery, in griping, projecting, intriguing, and iniquity, who once, when it was objected to some finance scheme of his, what will the people do? Made answer in the fire of discussion, the people may eat grass. Hasty words which fly abroad irrevocable, and will send back tidings. Foulon, to the relief of the world, fails on this occasion, and will always fail. Nevertheless, it steads not Monsieur de Lamoignon. It steads not the doomed man that he have interviews with the king, and be seen to return radieux, emitting rays. Lamoignon is the hated of Parlement. Comte de Brienne is brother to the Cardinal Archbishop. The 24th of August has been, and the 14th of September is not yet, when they too, as their great principal had done, 
descend, made to fall soft like him. And now, as if the last burden had been rolled from its heart, and assurance were at length perfect, Paris bursts forth anew into extreme jubilee. The Bazoche rejoices aloud that the foe of Parlement is fallen. Nobility, gentry, commonalty have rejoiced and rejoice. Nay, now, with new emphasis, rascality itself, starting suddenly from its dim depths, will arise and do it. For down even thither, the new political evangel, in some rude version or other, has penetrated. It is Monday, the 14th of September, 1788. Rascality assembles anew, in great force, in the Place Dauphine, lets off petards, fires, blunderbusses, to an incredible extent, without interval, for eighteen hours. There is again a wicker figure, mannequin of osier, the centre of endless howlings. Also Neckow's portrait, snatched or purchased from some print-shop, is borne processionally aloft on a perch with hussars, an example to be remembered. But chiefly on the Pont Neuf, where the great Henri in bronze rides sublime, there do the crowds gather. All passengers must stop till they have bowed to the people's king, and said audibly, Vive Henri IV! Au diable la moignon! No carriage but must stop, not even that of His Highness d'Orléans. Your coach doors are opened. Monsieur will please to put forth his head and bow, or even, if refractory, to alight altogether and kneel. From Madame, a wave of her plumes, a smile of her fair face, there where she sits, shall suffice. And surely a coin or two, to buy fusée, were not unreasonable from the upper classes, friends of liberty. In this manner it proceeds for days, in such rude horseplay, not without kicks. The city watch can do nothing, hardly save its own skin. For the last twelve months, as we have sometimes seen, it has been a kind of pastime to hunt the watch. Bessonval, indeed, is at hand, with soldiers, but they have orders to avoid firing, and are not prompt to stir. On Monday morning the explosion of petards began, and now it is near midnight of Wednesday, and the wicker mannequin is to be buried, apparently in the antique fashion. Long rows of torches following it move towards the Hôtel La Moignon, but a servant of mine's, Bessonval's, has run to give warning, and there are soldiers come. Gloomy La Moignon is not to die by conflagration, or this night, not yet for a year, and then by gunshot. Suicidal or accidental is unknown. Foiled rascality burns its mannequin of osier under his windows, tears up the sentry-box, and rolls off, to try Brienne, to try Dubois, captain of the watch. Now, however, all is bestirring itself. Gardes Françaises, Invalides, Horse Patrol. The torch procession is met with sharp shot, with the thrusting of bayonets, the slashing of sabres. Even Dubois makes a charge, with that cavalry of his, and the cruelest charge of all. There are a great many killed and wounded. Not without clangour, complaint, subsequent criminal trials, and official persons dying of heartbreak. So, however, with steel besom, rascality is brushed back into its dim depths, and the streets are swept clear. Not for a century and a half had rascality ventured to step forth in this fashion. Not for so long showed its huge rude lineaments in the light of day. A wonder and a new thing, as yet gambling merely, in awkward brobdingnag sport, not without quaintness, hardly in anger, yet in its huge half-vacant laugh lurks a shade of grimness, which could unfold itself. However, the thinkers invited by Lomini are now far on with their pamphlets. States-general on one plan or another will infallibly meet, if not in January, as was once hoped, yet at latest in May. Old Duc de Richelieu, moribund in these autumn days, opens his eyes once more, murmuring, What would Louis Fourteenth, whom he remembers, have said? Then closes them again, forever, before the evil time. End of section 21
Section 22 of The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 4, Chapter 1. States General. The Notables again. The universal prayer, therefore, is to be fulfilled. Always in days of national perplexity, when wrong abounded and help was not. This remedy of states-general was called for by a malzerbe, nay, by a fenelon. Even parliaments calling for it were escorted with blessings. And now, behold, it is vouchsafed us. States-general shall verily be. To say, let states-general be, was easy. To say in what manner they shall be, is not so easy. Since the year of 1614, there have no states-general met in France. All trace of them has vanished from the living habits of men. Their structure, powers, methods of procedure, which were never in any measure fixed, have now become wholly a vague possibility. Clay which the potter may shape, this way or that, say, rather, the twenty-five millions of potters, for so many have now, more or less, a vote in it. How to shape the states general? There is a problem. Each body corporate, each privileged, each organized class has secret hopes of its own in that matter, and also secret misgivings of its own. For, behold, this monstrous twenty-million class hitherto the dumb sheep which these others had to agree about the manner of shearing, is now also arising with hopes. It has ceased, or is ceasing to be dumb. It speaks through pamphlets, or at least brays and growls behind them, in unison, increasing wonderfully their volume of sound. As for the Parliament of Paris, it has at once declared for the old form of 1614, which form had this advantage, that the tiers-etat, third estate or commons, figured there as a show mainly, whereby the noblesse and clergy had but to avoid quarrel between themselves, and decide unobstructed what they thought best. Such was the clearly declared opinion of the Paris Parliament. But, being met by a storm of mere hooting and howling from all men, such opinion was blown straight away to the winds, and the popularity of the Parliament along with it, never to return. The Parliament's part, we said above, was as good as played, concerning which, however, there is this further to be noted, the proximity of dates. It was on the 22nd of September that the Parliament returned from vacation, or exile in its estates, to be reinstalled amid boundless jubilee from all Paris. Precisely next day it was that the same Parliament came to its clearly declared opinion, and then on the morrow after that, you behold it covered with outrages, its outer court, one vast sibilation, and the glory departed from it forevermore. A popularity of twenty-four hours was, in those times, no uncommon allowance. On the other hand, how superfluous was that invitation of Lomenies, the invitation to thinkers, thinkers and unthinkers, by the million, are spontaneously at their post, doing what is in them. Clubs labor, Société Publicole, Breton Club, Enraged Club, Club des Enrages, likewise dinner parties in the Palais Royal. Your Mirabeaus, Talleyrands, dining there, in company with Chamfort, Morellet, with Duponts and hot parliamentiers, not without object for a certain Nekirian lions provider, whom one could name, assembles them there, or even their own private determination to have dinner does it. And then, as to pamphlets, in figurative language, it is a sheer snowing of pamphlets, like to snow up the government thoroughfares. Now is the time for friends of freedom, sane and even insane. Count, or self-styled Count, d'Entrigue, the young Languedocian gentleman, with perhaps Chamfort the cynic to help him, rises into furor almost pithic, highest, where many are high, foolish young Languedocian gentleman, who himself so soon, emigrating among the foremost, must fly indignant over the marches, with the contrat social in his pocket, towards outer darkness, thankless intriguings, ignis fatuous hoverings, and death by the stiletto. Abbe C.A.S. has left Chartres Cathedral, and canonry and bookshelves there, has let his tonsure grow, and come to Paris with a secular head, of the most irrefragable sort, to ask three questions and answer them. What is the third estate? All. What has it hitherto been in our form of government? Nothing. What does it want? To become something. D'Orléans, for be sure he on his way to chaos, is in the thick of this, promulgates his deliberations, Deliberations à prendre pour les assemblées des béages, fathered by him, written by Laclos of the Liaison d'Angelouz, the result of which comes out simply, the third estate is the nation. On the other hand, Monsignor d'Artois, with other princes of the blood, publishes in solemn memorial to the king that if such things be listened to, 
privilege, nobility, monarchy, church, state, and strongbox are in danger. In danger, truly. And yet, if you do not listen, are they out of danger? It is the voice of all France, this sound that rises, immeasurable, manifold, as the sound of outbreaking waters. Wise were he who knew what to do in it, if not to fly to the mountains, and hide himself? How an ideal, all-seeing Versailles government, sitting there on such principles, in such an environment, would have determined to demean itself at this new juncture, may even yet be a question. Such a government would have felt too well that its long task was now drawing to a close, that, under the guise of these states-general, at length inevitable, a new omnipotent unknown of democracy was coming into being, in presence of which no Versailles government either could or should, except in a provisory character, continue extant, to enact which provisory character, so unspeakably important, might its whole faculties but have sufficed, and so a peaceable, gradual, well-conducted abdication and domine dimitas have been the issue. This for our ideal, all-seeing Versailles government, but for the actual, irrational Versailles government, alas, that is a government existing there only for its own behoof, without right except possession, and now also without might. It foresees nothing, sees nothing, has not so much as a purpose, but has only purposes, and the instinct whereby all that exists will struggle to keep existing. Wholly a vortex, in which vain counsels, hallucinations, falsehoods, intrigues, and imbecilities whirl, like withered rubbish in the meeting of winds. The Eau de Boeuf has its irrational hopes, if also its fears, since hitherto all states-general have done as good as nothing. Why should these do more? The commons, indeed, look dangerous, but on the whole is not revolt, unknown now for five generations, an impossibility? The three estates can, by management, be set against each other. The third will, as heretofore, join with the king, will, out of mere spite and self-interest, be eager to tax and vex the other two. The other two are thus delivered bound into our hands, that we may fleece them likewise. Whereupon, money being got, and the three estates all in quarrel, dismiss them, and let the future go as it can. As good Archbishop Lomini was wont to say, there are so many accidents, and it needs but one to save us. How many to destroy us? Poor Necker, in the midst of such an anarchy, does what is possible for him. He looks into it with obstinately hopeful face, lauds the known rectitude of the kingly mind, listens indulgent-like to the unknown perverseness of the queenly and courtly, emits if any proclamation or regulation, one favoring the tiers etat, but settling nothing, hovering afar off, rather, and advising all things to settle themselves. The grand questions, for the present, have got reduced to two. The double representation, and the vote by head. Shall the commons have a double representation? That is to say, have as many members as the noblesse and clergy united? Shall the states-general, when once assembled, vote and deliberate in one body, or in three separate bodies? Vote by head, or vote by class? Ordre, as they call it? These are the moot points now filling all France with jargon, logic, and eleutheromania, to terminate which, Necker bethinks him, might not a second convocation of the notables be fittest? Such second convocation is resolved on. On the 6th of November of this year, 1788, these notables accordingly have reassembled. After an interval of some eighteen months, they are Calon's old notables, the same hundred and forty-four, to show one's impartiality, likewise to save time. They sit there once again, in their seven bureaus, in the hard winter weather. It is the hardest winter seen since 1709. Thermometer below zero of Fahrenheit. Seine River frozen over. Cold, scarcity, and eleutheromania clamor. A changed world since these notables were organed out, in May gone a year. They shall see now whether, under their seven princes of the blood, in their seven bureaus, they can settle the moot points. To the surprise of patriotism, these notables, once so patriotic, seem to incline the wrong way, towards the anti-patriotic side. They stagger at the double representation, at the vote by head. There is not affirmative decision, there is mere debating, and that not with the best aspects. For indeed, were not these notables themselves mostly of the privileged classes? They clamored once, now they have their misgivings, make their dolorous representations. Let them vanish, ineffectual, and return no more. They vanish after a month's session, on this 12th of December, year 1788, the last terrestrial notables, not to reappear any other time, in the history of the world. And so the clamor still continuing, and the pamphlets, and nothing but patriotic addresses, louder and louder, pouting in on us from all corners of France, Necker himself some fortnight after, before the year is yet done, has to present his report, Rapport fait au roi dans son conseil, 
le 27 décembre 1788, recommending at his own risk that same double representation, nay almost enjoining it, so loud is the jargon and eleutheromania. What dubitating, what circumambulating, these whole six noisy months, for it began with Brienne in July, has not report followed report, and one proclamation flown in the teeth of the other? However, that first moot point, as we see, is now settled. As for the second, that of voting by head or by order, it unfortunately is still left hanging. It hangs there, we may say, between the privileged orders and the unprivileged, as a ready-made battle prize, and necessity of war, from the very first, which battle prize whosoever seizes it may thenceforth bear as battle flag, with the best omens. But so, at least, by royal edict of the 24th of January, Règlement du roi pour la convocation des états généraux à Versailles, reprinted, wrong dated, in Histoire parlementaire, I 262, does it finally, to impatient expectant France, become not only indubitable that national deputies are to meet, but possible, so far and hardly farther has the royal regulation gone, to begin electing them. End of section 22. The French Revolution, Volume 1, The Bastille, by Thomas Carlyle, Chapter 1.4.2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Thornton, Miranda, New Zealand. The Election Up then, and be doing! The royal signal word flies through France, as through vast forests the rushing of a mighty wind, at parish churches, town halls, and every house of convocation, by bailliages, by essential seas, in whatsoever form men convene, there, with confusion enough, are primary assemblies forming, to elect your electors, such is the form prescribed, then to draw up your writ of plaints and grievances, cahier de point et d'oléance, of which latter there is no lack. With such virtue works this royal January edict, as it rolls rapidly in its leathern mails along these frost-bound highways towards all the four winds, like some fiat or magic spell-word, which such things do resemble, for always, as it sounds out at the market cross, accompanied with trumpet-blast, presided by bailey, seneschal, or other minor functionary, with beef-eaters, or, in country churches, is droned forth after sermon, au prône de messe parosal, and is registered, posted, and let fly all over the world. You behold how this multitudinous French people, so long simmering and buzzing in eager expectancy, begins heaping and shaping itself into organic groups. Which organic groups, again, hold smaller organic grouplets, the inarticulate buzzing becomes articulate speaking and acting. By primary assembly, and then by secondary, by successive elections, and infinite elaboration and scrutiny, according to prescribed process, shall the genuine plaints and grievances be at length got to paper. Shall the fit national representative be at length lay hold of. How the whole people shakes itself as if it had one life, and, in thousand-voice rumour, announces that it is awake, suddenly out of long death sleep, and will thenceforth sleep no more. The long-looked-for has come at last, wondrous news of victory, deliverance, and franchisement, sounds magical through every heart. To the proud strong man it has come, whose strong hands shall no more be jived, to whom boundless, unconquered continents lie disclosed. The weary day-drudge has heard of it, the beggar with his crusts moistened in tears. What? To us also has hope reached, down even to us? Hunger and hardship are not to be eternal? The bread we extorted from the rugged glebe, and, with the toil of our sinews, reaped and ground, and kneaded into loaves, was not wholly for another then, but we also shall eat of it, and be filled. Glorious news, answer the prudent elders, but all too unlikely. Thus, at any rate, may the lower people, who pay no money taxes and have no right to vote, 
assiduously crowd round those that do. The most halls of assembly, within doors and without, seem animated enough. Paris, alone of towns, is to have representatives, the number of them twenty. Paris is divided into sixty districts, each of which, assembled in some church or the like, is choosing two electors. Official deputations pass from district to district, for all is inexperience as yet, and there is endless consulting. The streets swarm strangely with busy crowds, pacific yet restless and loquacious. At intervals is seen the gleam of military muskets, especially about the palais, where Parlement, once more on duty, sits querulous, almost tremulous. Busy is the French world. In those great days, what poorest speculative craftsman but will leave his workshop, if not to vote, yet to assist in voting? On all highways is a rustling and bustling. Over the wide surface of France, ever and anon, through the spring months, as the sower casts his corn abroad upon the furrows, sounds of congregating and dispersing, of crowds in deliberation, acclamation, voting by ballot and by voice, rise discrepant towards the ear of heaven, to which political phenomenon add this economical one, that trade is stagnant, and also bread getting dear, for before the rigorous winter there was, as we said, a rigorous summer with drought, and on the 13th of July with destructive hail. What a fearful day! All cried when that tempest fell. Alas! the next anniversary of it will be worse. Under such aspects is France electing national representatives. The incidents and specialities of these elections belong not to universal but to local or parish history, for which reason let not the new troubles of Grenoble or Bressancon, the bloodshed on the streets of Rouen, and consequent march thither of the Breton young men with manifesto by their mothers, sisters and sweethearts, nor such like detain us here. It is the same sad history everywhere, with superficial variations. A reinstated Parlement, as at Bressancon, which stands astonished at this behemoth of states-general, it is itself evoked, starts forward with more or less audacity to fix a thorn in its nose, and, alas, is instantaneously struck down and hurled quite out, for the new popular force can use not only arguments but brickbats, or else, and perhaps combined with this, it is an order of noblesse, as in Brittany, which will beforehand tie up the third estate, that it harm not the old privileges, in which act of tying them up, never so skilfully set about, there is likewise no possibility of prospering. But the behemoth, Briarius, snaps your cords like green rushes. Tie up? Alas, monsieur! And then, as for your chivalry, rapiers, valour, and wager of battle, think one moment, how can that answer? The plebeian heart, too, has read life in it, which changes not to paleness at a glance even of you, and the six hundred Breton gentlemen assembled in arms, seventy-two hours in the Cordelier's cloister at Rouen, have to come out again, wiser than they entered. For the Nantes youth, the Anjou youth, all Brittany was astir, mothers, sisters, and sweethearts, shrieking after them, March! The Breton noblesse must even let the mad world have its way, de Amis de Liberté, 1, 105 to 128. In other provinces, the noblesse, with equal goodwill, finds it better stick to the protests, to well-redacted cahiers of grievances and satirical writings and speeches, such as partially their course in Provence, whither indeed Gabriel Honoré Riquetti, Comte de Mirabeau, has rushed down from Paris to speak a word in season. In Provence, the privilege, backed by their A. Parmont, discover that such novelties, enjoined though they may be by royal edict, tend to national detriment, and what is still more indisputable, to impair the dignity of the noblesse. Whereupon Mirabeau, protesting aloud, this same noblesse, amid huge tumult within doors and without, flatly determines to expel him from their assembly. No other method, not even that of successive duels, would answer with him, the obstreperous, fierce, glaring man expelled he accordingly is in all countries in all times exclaims he departing the aristocrats have implacably pursued every friend of the people and with tenfold implacability if such a one were himself born of the aristocracy 
It was thus that the last of the Gracchi perished, by the hands of the patricians, but he, being struck with mortal stab, flung dusk towards heaven, and called on the avenging deities, and from this dust there was born Marius, Marius not so illustrious for exterminating the Cimbri, as for overturning in Rome the tyranny of the nobles, casting up which new curious handful of dust through the printing press to breed what it can and may. Mirabeau stalks forth into the third estate. That he now, to ingratiate himself with this third estate, opened a cloth shop in Marseilles, and for moments became a furnishing tailor, or even the fable that he did so, is to us always among the pleasant memorabilities of this era. Stranger, Clothier never wielded the L-wand, and rent webs for men, or fractional parts of men. The fee adoptif is indignant at such disparaging fable, which nevertheless was widely believed in those days. Marat, ami du peuple, nous papa, in histoire parlementaire, two, one hundred and three, etc. But indeed, if Achilles, in the heroic ages, killed mutton, why should not Mirabeau, in the unheroic ones, measure broadcloth? More authentic are his triumph progresses through that disturbed district, with mob jubilee, flaming torches, windows hired for two louis, and voluntary guard of a hundred men. He is deputy-elect, both of I and of Marseilles, and will prefer I. He has opened his far-sounding voice, the depths of his far-sounding soul. He can quell, such virtue is in a spoken word, the pride tumults of the rich, the hunger tumults of the poor, and wild multitudes move under him, as under the moon do billows of the sea. He has become a world compeller and ruler over men. One other incident and speciality we note, with how different an interest. It is the Parlement of Paris, which starts forward like the others, only with less audacity, seeing better how it lay, to nose-ring that behemoth of a states-general. Worthy Dr. Guillotine, respectable practitioner in Paris, has drawn up his little plan of a cahier of doléances, as he had not, having the wish and gift, the clearest liberty to do, he is getting the people to sign it, whereupon the surly Parlement summons him to give an account of himself. He goes, but with all Paris at his heels, which floods the outer courts, and copiously signs the cahier, even there, while the doctor is giving account of himself within. The Parlement cannot too soon demiss Guillotin with compliments, to be borne home high on a shoulder. This respectable Guillotin we hope to behold once more, and perhaps only once, the Parlement not even once, but let it be engulfed unseen by us. Meanwhile such things, cheering as they are, tend little to cheer the national creditor, or indeed the creditor of any kind. In the midst of universal portentous doubt, what certainty can seem so certain as money in the purse, and the wisdom of keeping it there? Trading speculation, commerce of all kinds, has as far as possible come to a dead pause. A hand of the industrious lies idle in his bosom. Frightfully enough, when now the rigour of seasons has also done its part, and to scarcity of work is added scarcity of food. In the opening spring, there come rumours of forestalment, there come king's edicts, petitions of bakers against millers, and at length, in the months of April, troops of ragged lackals, and fierce cries of starvation. These are the thrice-famed brigands, and actual existing, quantity, persons, who long reflected and reverberated through so many millions of heads, as in concave multiplying mirrors, become a whole brigand world, and, like a kind of supernatural machinery, wondrously move the epos of the revolution. The brigands are here, the brigands are there, the brigands are coming. Not otherwise sounded the clang of Phoebus Apollo's silver bow, scattering pestilence and pale terror, for this clang too was of the imagination, preternatural, and it too walked in formless immeasurability, having made itself light to the night, Greek. But remark at least, for the first time, the singular empire of suspicion, in those lands, in those days, if poor famishing men shall prior to death gather in groups and crowds, as the poor field fares and plovers do in bitter weather, were it but that they may chirp mournfully together, and misery look in the eyes of misery, if famishing men, what famishing field fares cannot do, should discover, once congregated, that they need not die while food is in the land, 
since they are many, and with empty wallets have right hands. In all this, what need were there of preternatural machinery? To most people none, but not to French people in a time of revolution. These brigands, as Turgos also were fourteen years ago, have all been set on, enlisted though without tuck of drum, by aristocrats, by democrats, by d'Orléans, d'Artois, and enemies of the public wheel. Nay, historians, to this day will prove it by one argument. These brigands, pretending to have no victual, nevertheless contrived to drink, nay, have been seen drunk, an unexampled fact. But on the whole, may we not predict that a people with such a width of credulity and of incredulity, the proper union of which makes suspicion, and indeed unreason generally, will see shapes enough of immortals fighting in its battle ranks, and never want for epical machinery. Be this as it may, the brigands have clearly got to Paris, in considerable multitudes, with sallow faces, lank hair, the true enthusiast complexion, with sooty rags, and also with large clubs, which they smite angrily against the pavement. These mingle in the election tumult, would fain sign Guillotin's cahier, or any cahier or petition whatsoever, could they but write. Their enthusiast complexion, the smiting of their sticks, bodes little good to any one, least of all to rich master manufacturers of the suburb Saint Antoine, with whose workmen they consort. End of chapter 1.4.2 The Election Section 24 of The French Revolution, Volume 1, by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Wayman. The French Revolution, by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 4, Chapter 3 grown electric. But now also national deputies from all ends of France are in Paris, with their commissions, what they call pouvoirs or powers, in their pockets, inquiring, consulting, looking out for lodgings at Versailles. The States-General shall open there, if not on the first, then surely on the fourth of May, in grand procession and gala. The salle des menus is all new carpentered, bedizened for them. Their very costume has been fixed, a grand controversy which there was as to slouch hats or slouched hats, for the Commons deputies, has got as good as adjusted. Ever new strangers arrive, loungers, miscellaneous persons, officers on furlough, as the worthy Captain Dom Martin, whom we hope to be acquainted with. These also from all regions have repaired hither to see what is toward. Our Paris committees of the sixty districts are busier than ever. It is now too clear the Paris elections will be late. On Monday, the 27th of April, astronomer Bailly notices that the Sieur Réveillon is not at his post. The Sieur Réveillon, extensive paper manufacturer of the Rue Saint-Antoine, he, commonly so punctual, is absent from the electoral committee, and even will never reappear there. In those immense magazines of velvet paper has aught befallen? Alas, yes. Alas, it is no Montgolfier rising there to-day, but drudgery, rascality, and the suburb that is rising. Was the Sieur Réveillon, himself once a journeyman, heard to say that a journeyman might live handsomely on fifteen sous a day? Some sevenpence halfpenny, tis a slender sum. Or was he only thought and believed to be heard saying it? By this long chafing and friction it would appear the national temper has got electric. Down in those dark dens, in those dark heads and hungry hearts, who knows in what strange figure the new political evangel may have shaped itself, what miraculous communion of drudges may be getting formed. Enough, 
Grim individuals, soon waxing to grim multitudes, and other multitudes crowding to see, beset that paper warehouse, demonstrate in loud ungrammatical language, addressed to the passions too, the insufficiency of sevenpence halfpenny a day. The city watch cannot dissipate them. Broils arise and bellowings. Réveillon at his wit's end entreats the populace, entreats the authorities. Bézenval, now in active command, commandant of Paris, does towards evening, to Réveillon's earnest prayer, send some thirty guard Françaises. These clear the street, happily without firing, and take post there for the night, in hope that it may be all over. Not so. On the morrow it is far worse. Saint Antoine has arisen anew, grimmer than ever, reinforced by the unknown tatterdemalion figures with their enthusiast complexion and large sticks. The city through all streets is floating thitherward to sea. Two cartloads of paving stones that happened to pass that way have been seized as a visible godsend. Another detachment of Garde Francaise must be sent, Bazanval and the Colonel taking earnest counsel. Then still another. They hardly, with bayonets and menace of bullets, penetrate to the spot. What a sight! A street choked up with lumber, tumult, and the endless press of men. A paper warehouse eviscerated by axe and fire, mad din of revolt, Musket volleys responded to by yells, by miscellaneous missiles, by tiles raining from roof and window, tiles, execrations, and slain men. The guard Francais like it not, but have to persevere. All day it continues, slackening and rallying. The sun is sinking, and Saint Antoine has not yielded. The city flies hither and thither. Alas, the sound of that musket volleying booms into the far dining rooms of the Chaussée d'Antin, alters the tone of the dinner gossip there. Captain Dammartin leaves his wine, goes out with a friend or two to see the fighting. Unwashed men growl on him with murmurs of A bas les aristocrates, down with the aristocrats, and insult the cross of Saint Louis. They elbow him and hustle him but do not pick his pocket, as indeed at Réveillon's too there was not the slightest stealing. At fall of night, as the thing will not end, Bézenval takes his resolution, orders out the guard Suisse with two pieces of artillery. The Swiss guards shall proceed thither, summon that rabble to depart in the king's name. If disobeyed, they shall load their artillery with grape-shot visibly to the general eye, shall again summon, if again disobeyed, fire, and keep firing till the last man be in this manner blasted off and the street clear. With which spirited resolution, as might have been hoped, the business is got ended. At sight of the lit matches of the foreign red-coated Switzers, Saint Antoine dissipates, hastily in the shades of dusk. There is an encumbered street, there are from four to five hundred dead men. Unfortunate Réveillon has found shelter in the Bastille, does there form safe behind stone bulwarks, issue, plaint, protestation, explanation for the next month. Bold Bézenval has thanks from all the respectable Parisian classes, but finds no special notice taken of him at Versailles. A thing the man of true worth is used to. But how it originated, this fierce electric sputter and explosion? From Doléon, cries the court party, he with his gold enlisted these brigands, surely in some surprising manner without sound of drum, he raked them in hither from all corners to ferment and take fire, evil is his good. From the court, cries enlightened patriotism, it is the cursed gold and wiles of aristocrats that enlisted them, set them upon ruining an innocent Sieur Réveillon, to frighten the faint and disgust men with the career of freedom. Bézenval, with reluctance, concludes that it came from 
the English, our natural enemies. Or, alas, might not one rather attribute it to Diana in the shape of hunger, to some twin Dioscuri, oppression and revenge, so often seen in the battles of men? Poor lack alls, all betoiled, besoiled, encrusted into dim defacement, into whom nevertheless the breath of the Almighty has breathed a living soul? To them it is clear only that Eleutheromaniac philosophism has yet baked no bread, that patriotic committee men will level down to their own level and no lower. Brigands, or whatever they might be, it was bitter earnest with them. They bury their dead with the title of Défenseur de la Patrie, Martyrs of the Good Cause. Or shall we say... Insurrection has now served its apprenticeship, and this was its proof-stroke and no inconclusive one. Its next will be a master-stroke, announcing indisputable mastership to a whole astonished world. Let that rock-fortress, tyranny's stronghold, which they name Bastille, or building, as if there were no other building, look to its guns. But in such wise, with primary and secondary assemblies and cahiers of grievances, with motions, congregations of all kinds, with much thunder of froth eloquence, and at last with thunder of platoon musketry, does agitated France accomplish its elections. With confused winnowing and sifting in this rather tumultuous manner, it has now, all except some remnants of Paris, sifted out the true wheat grains of national deputies, twelve hundred and fourteen in number, and will forthwith open its states general. End of section twenty four. The French Revolution, Volume One, by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Thornton, Miranda, New Zealand. Chapter 1.44 The Procession, Part 1 On the first Saturday of May, it is gala at Versailles, and Monday, fourth of the month, is to be a still greater day. The deputies have mostly got thither and sought out lodgings, and are now successively, in long, well-ushered files, kissing the hand of Majesty in the chateau. Supreme Usher de Bray's does not give the highest satisfaction. We cannot but observe that in ushering noblesse or clergy into the anointed presence, he liberally opens both his folding doors, and, on the other hand, for members of the third estate, opens only one. However, there is room to enter. Majesty has smiles for all. The good Louis welcomes his honourable members with smiles of hope. He has prepared for them the Hall of Menus, the largest near him, and often surveyed the workmen as they went on. A spacious hall, with raised platform for throne, court, and blood royal, space for six hundred common deputies in front, for half as many clergy on this hand, and half as many noblesse on that. It has lofty galleries, wherefrom dames of honour, splendent in gaze, door, foreign diplomacies, and other gilt-edged, white-frilled individuals, to the number of two thousand, may sit and look on. Broad passages flow through it, and outside the inner wall, all round it. There are committee rooms, guard rooms, robing rooms, really a noble hall, where upholstery, aided by the subject fine arts, has done its best, and crimson tasseled cloths and emblematic fleur-de-lis are not wanting. The hall is ready. The very costume, as we said, has been settled, and the commons are not to wear the hated slouch hat, chapeau clabeau, but one not quite so slouch, chapeau rabatu. As for their manner of working, when all dressed, for their voting by head or by order, and the rest, this, which it were perhaps still time to settle, and in a few hours will be no longer time, remains unsettled, hangs dubious in the breast of twelve hundred men. But now, finally, the sun, on Monday the 4th of May, has risen, unconcerned as if it were no special day. And yet, 
as his first rays could strike music from the Memnon statue on the Nile. What tones were these, so thrilling, tremulous of preparation and foreboding, which he awoke in every bosom at Versailles? Huge Paris, in all conceivable and inconceivable vehicles, is pouring itself forth. From each town and village come subsidiary rills. Versailles is a very sea of men. But above all, from the church of St. Louis to the church of Notre Dame, one vast suspended billow of life, with spray scattered even to the chimney pots. On chimney tops, too, as over the roofs, and up to the woods on every lamp iron signpost, break ned coin of vantage, sits patriotic courage, and every window bursts with patriotic beauty, for the deputies are gathering at St. Louis Church to march in procession to Notre Dame and hear sermon. Yes, friends, you may sit and look, boldly or in thought, all France and all Europe may sit and look, for it is a day like few others. Oh, one might weep like Xerxes. So many serried rows sit perched there, like winged creatures alighted out of heaven. All these, and so many more that follow them, shall have wholly fled aloft again, vanishing into the blue deep, and the memory of this day still be fresh. It is the baptism day of democracy. Sick time has given it birth, the numbered months being run. The extreme unction day of feudalism, a superannuated system of society, decrepit with toils, but has it not done much, produced you, and what ye have, and know? And with thefts and brawls, named glorious victories, with profligacies, sensualities, and on the whole with dotage and senility, is now to die, and so, with death throes and birth throes, a new one is to be born. What a work, O oh, earth and heavens, what a work! Battles and bloodshed, September massacres, bridges of Lodi, retreats of Moscow, Waterloo's, Peterloo's, ten-pound franchises, tar-barrels and guillotines, and from this present date, if one might prophesy, some two centuries of it still to fight. Two centuries, hardly less, before democracy go through its due, most baleful, stages of quackocracy and a pestilential world be burnt up, and have begun to grow green and young again. Rejoice nevertheless, ye versile multitudes, to you, from whom all this is hid, and glorious end of it is visible. This day sentence of death is pronounced on shams. Judgment of resuscitation, were it but far off, is pronounced on realities. This day it is declared aloud, as with a doom trumpet, that a lie is unbelievable. Believe that, Stand by that, if more there be not, and let what thing or thing soever will follow, follow it. Ye can no other, God be your help, so spake a greater than any of you, opening his chapter of world history. Behold, however, the doors of St. Louis Church flung wide, and the procession of processions advancing towards Notre Dame. Shouts rend the air, one shout at which Grecian birds might drop dead. It is indeed a stately solemn sight. The elected of France, and then the court of France, they are marshalled and marched there, all in prescribed place and costume. Our commons in plain black mantle and white cravat, noblesse in gold work, bright dyed cloaks of velvet, resplendent, rustling with laces, waving with plumes. The clergy in rocher, alb, or other best pontificabilius. Lastly comes the king himself, and king's household, also in their brightest blaze of pomp, their brightest and final one, some fourteen hundred men blown together from all winds on the deepest errand. Yes, in that silent marching mass there lies futurity enough. No symbolic ark, like the old Hebrews, do these men bear, yet with them too is a covenant. They too preside at a new era in the history of men. The whole future is there, and destiny dim brooding over it. In the hearts and unshaped thoughts of these men it lies illegible, inevitable. Singular to think. They have it in them. Yet not they, not mortal, only the eye above can read it. As it shall unfold itself in fire and thunder, of siege and field artillery, in the rustling of battle banners, the tramp of hosts, and in the glow of burning cities, the shriek of strangled nations. 
such things lie hidden, safe wrapped in this fourth day of May. Say rather, had lain in some other unknown day, of which this latter is the public fruit and outcome. As indeed what wonders lie in every day, had we the sight, as happily we have not, to decipher it. For it is not every meanest day the conflux of two eternities. Meanwhile, suppose we too, good reader, should, as now without miracle Muse Cleo enables us, take our station also on some coin of vantage, and glance momentarily over this procession, this lifelong sea, with far other eyes than the rest do, namely with prophetic. We can mount and stand there without fear of falling. As for the life sea, or onlooking unnumbered multitude, it is unfortunately all too dim. Yet, as we gaze fixedly, do not nameless figures, not a few, which shall not always be nameless, disclose themselves, visible or presumably there? Young Baroness de Stael, she evidently looks from a window, among older honourable women. Her father is minister, and one of the gala personages, to his own eyes the chief one. Young spiritual Amazon, thy rest is not there, nor thy loved father's, as Malebranche saw all things in God, so Monsieur Necker sees all things in Necker, a theorem that will not hold. But where is the brown-locked, light-behaved, fire-hearted Demoiselle Theron, brown eloquent beauty, who, with thy winged words and glances, shall thrill rough bosoms, whole steel battalions, and persuade an Austrian Kaiser, if I can help lie provided for thee in due season, and, alas, also straight waistcoat, a long lodging in the Salpetriere. Better hadst thou stayed in native Luxembourg, and been the mother of some man's brave children. But it was not thy task, it was not thy lot. Of the rougher sex, how, without tongue or hundred tongues of iron, enumerate the notabilities? Has not Marquis Valardi hastily quitted his Quaker broad brim, his Pythagorean Greek in Wapping, and the city of Glasgow? De Moran from his career de l'Europe, Lingue from his Annal, they looked eager through the London fog, and became ex-editors, that they might feed the guillotine and have their due. Does Louvet stand a tiptoe, and Brissot, Height de Warville, friend of the blacks, he with Marquis Concorce and Clavier de Genovese, have created the Moniteur newspaper, or about creating it? Able editors must give an account of such a day. Or seest thou with any distinctness, low down probably, not in places of honour, a Stanislas Maillard, riding tipstaff of the Châtelet, one of the shiftiest of men, a Captain Ulau of Geneva, Captain Ellie of the Queen's Regiment, both with an air of half-pay, sure down with tile-coloured whiskers, not yet with tile-beard, an unjust dealer in mules? He shall be, in a few months, draw down the headsman, and have other work. Surely also, in some place not of honour, stands or sprawls up querulous, that he too, though short, may see one squalidest, bleared mortal, redolent of suit and horse drugs, Jean-Paul Marat of Neustadt. O oh, Marat, renovator of human science, lecturer on optics, O oh, thou remarkable horse-leech, once in Dartois' stables, as thy bleared soul looks forth, through thy bleared, dull, acrid, woe-stricken face, what sees it in all this? Any faintest light of hope, like day spring after Nova's ember night? Or is it but blue sulphur light, and spectres? Woe, suspicion, revenge without end? Of Draper Le Quintre, how he shut his cloth shop hard by, and stepped forth, one hard needly speak, nor of Santerre, the sonorous brewer from the Faubourg Saint Antoine, Two other figures, and only two, we signalise there, a huge brawny figure, through whose black brows and rude flattened face there looks a waste energy, as of Hercules, not yet furibund. He is an Assyrian, unprovided advocate. Danton by name, him Mark. Then that other, his slight-billed comrade and crafter brother, he with the long curling locks, with the face of the dingy blackguardism, wondrously irradiated with genius, as if a naphtha lamp burned within it. That figure is Camille de Moulin, a fellow of infinite shrewdness, wit, nay humour, one of the sprightliest, clearest souls in all these millions. 
thou poor Camille, say of thee what they may. It were but falsehood to pretend one did not almost love thee, thou headlong, lightly sparkling man. But the brawny, not yet furibund figure, we say, is Jacques Danton, a name that shall be tolerably known in the Revolution. He is president of the electoral Cordelier district at Paris, or about to be it, and shall open his lungs of brass. We dwell no longer on the mixed shouting multitude, for now, behold, the Commons deputies are at hand. Which of these six hundred individuals in plain white cravat that have come up to regenerate France might one guess would become their king? For a king or leader they, as all bodies of men, must have. Be their work what it may, there is one man there who, by character, faculty, position, is fittest of all to do it. That man, as future not yet elected king, walks there among the rest. He with thick black locks, will it be? With the hewer, as himself calls it, or black boar's head, fit to be shaken as a senatorial portent, through whose shaggy beetle brows and rough hewn, seamed carbuncled face, there look natural ugliness, small tox, incontinence, bankruptcy, and burning fire of genius, like comet fire, glaring, fuliginous, through murkiest confusions. It is Gabriel Honore Riquette de Mirabeau, the world compeller, man-ruling deputy of I. According to the Baroness de Stael, he steps proudly along, though looked at askance here, and shakes his black chevalier or lion's mane, as if prophetic of great deeds. Yes, reader, that is the type Frenchman of this epoch, as Voltaire was at the last. He is French in his aspirations, acquisitions, in his virtues, in his vices, perhaps more French than any other man, and intrinsically such a mass of manhood too. Mark him well. The National Assembly were all different without that one. Nay, he might say with the old despot, the National Assembly, I am that. Of a southern climate, of wild southern blood, for the Riquettis, or Arigettis, had to fly from Florence and the Guelphs long centuries ago, and settled in Provence, where from generation to generation they have ever approved themselves a peculiar kindred, irascible, indomitable, sharp-cutting, true, like the steel they wore, of an intensity and activity that sometimes verged towards madness, yet did not reach it. One ancient Riquetti, in mad fulfilment of a mad vow, chains two mountains together, and the chain, with its iron star of five rays, is still to be seen. May not a modern Riquetti unchain so much and set it drifting, which also shall be seen? Destiny has worked for that swart burly-headed Mirabeau. Destiny has watched over him, prepared him from afar. Did not his grandfather, stout Colonel D'Argent, silver stock, so they named him, shattered and slashed by seven-and-twenty wounds in one fell day, lie sunk together on the bridge at Cassano, while Prince Eugene's cavalry galloped and regalloped over him, only the flying sergeant had thrown a camp-kettle over that loved head, and Vendôme, dropping his spyglass, moaned out, Mirabeau is dead, then! Nevertheless he was not dead. He awoke to breathe a miraculous surgery, for Gabriel was yet to be. With his silver stock, he kept his scarred head erect, through long years, and wedded, and produced tough Marquis Victor, the friend of men, whereby at last, in the appointed year, 1749, this long-expected rough-hewn Gabriel Honore did likewise see the light, roughest lion's whelp ever littered on that rough breed. How the old lion! For our old Marquis, too, was lion-like, most unconquerable, kingly genial, most perverse, gazed wonderingly on his offspring, and determined to train him as no lion had yet been. It is in vain, O Marquis, this cub, though thou slay him and flay him, will not learn to draw in dog-cart of political economy, and be a friend of men. He will not be thou, must and will be himself, another than thou. Divorce lawsuits, whole families save one in prison, and threescore lettres de cachet for thy own sole use, do but astonish the world. Our luckless Gabriel, sinned against and sinning, has been in the Isle of Ray, and heard the Atlantic from his tower in the castle of Eve and heard the Mediterranean at Marseilles. He has been in the fortress of Joux, and forty-two months, with hardly clothing to his back, 
in the dungeon at Vincennes, all by lettre de cachet from his lion father. He has been in Pontarlier jails, self-constituted prisoner, was noticed fording estuaries of the sea at low water in flight from the face of men. He has pleaded before I Parlement to get back his wife. The public gathering on roofs to see since they could not hear, the clatter teeth, snarl singular old Mirabeau, discerning in such admired forensic eloquence nothing but two clattering jawbones and a head vacant, sonorous, of the drum species. But as for Gabriel Honore, in these strange wayfarings, what has he not seen and tried, from drill sergeants to prime ministers, to foreign and domestic booksellers, all manner of men he has seen, all manner of men he has gained, for at bottom it is a social loving heart, that wild unconquerable one, more especially all manner of women, from the archer's daughter at Saint, to that fair young Sophie Madame Monnier, whom he could not but steal, and be beheaded for, in effigy, for indeed hardly since the Arabian prophet lay dead to Ali's admiration was there seen such a love hero with the strength of thirty men. In war again he has helped to conquer Corsica, fought duels, irregular brawls, horse-whipped calumnious barons. In literature he has written on despotism, on lettre de cachet, erotic sapphic verterian, obscenities, profanities, books on the Prussian monarchy, on Cagliostro, on Calon, on the water companies of Paris, each book comparable, we will say, to a bituminous alarum fire, huge, smoky, sudden. The firepan, the kindling, the bitumen were his own, but the lumber of rags, old wood, and nameless combustible rubbish, for all is fuel to him, was gathered from Huxter, an ass pannier, of every description under heaven, whereby, indeed, Huxter's enough have been heard to exclaim, out upon it, the fire is mine. Nay, consider it more generally. Seldom had man such a talent for borrowing. The idea, the faculty of another man he can make his, the man himself he can make his. All reflex and echo, snarls old Mirabeau, who can see but will not. Crabbed old friend of men, it is his sociality, his aggregative nature, and will now be the quality of all for him. In that forty years' struggle against despotism, he has gained the glorious faculty of self-help, and yet not lost the glorious natural gift of fellowship, of being helped. Rare union! This man can live self-sufficing, yet lives also in the life of other men, can make men love him, work with him, a born king of men. But consider further how, as the old Marquis still snarls, he has made away with all formulas, a fact which, if we meditate it, will in these days mean much. This is no man of system, then. He is only a man of instincts and insights, a man, nevertheless, who will glare fiercely on any object and see through it and conquer it, for he has intellect, he has will, force beyond other men. A man not with logic spectacles, but with an eye, unhappily without decalogue, moral code or theorem of any fixed sort, yet not without a strong living soul in him, and sincerity there, a reality, not an artificiality, not a sham, and so he, having struggled forty years against despotism, and made away with all formulas, shall now become the spokesman of a nation bent to do the same. For is it not precisely the struggle of France, also to cast off despotism, to make away with her old formulas, having found them naught, worn out, far from the reality? She will make away with such formulas, and even go bare, if need be, till she have found new ones. End of the section The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Thornton, Miranda, New Zealand. The French Revolution, Chapter 1.44, The Procession, Part 2. Towards such work, in such manner, marches he, this singular Riquetti Mirabeau, in fiery rough figure, with black Samson locks under the slouch hat, he steps along there, a fiery, fuliginous mass, which could not be choked and smothered, but would fill all France with smoke. And now it has got air, it will burn its whole substance, its whole smoke atmosphere too, and fill all France with flame. Strange lot! Forty years of that smouldering, 
with foul fire damp and vapour enough, then victory over that, and like a burning mountain he blazes heaven high, and, for twenty-three resplendent months, pours out, in flame and molten fire torrents, all that is in him, the pharos and wonder sign of an amazed Europe, and then lies hollow, cold for ever. Pass on, thou questionable Gabriel Anare, the greatest of them all, in the whole national deputies, in the whole nation, there is none like and none second to thee. But now, if Mirabeau is the greatest, who of these six hundred may be the meanest? Shall we say that anxious, slight, ineffectual-looking man under thirty in spectacles there? His eyes, with the glasses off, troubled, careful, with upturned face, snuffling dimly the uncertain future time, complexion of a multiplex atrabilier colour, the final shade of which may be the pale sea-green. That greenish-coloured individual is an advocate of Arras. His name is Maximilien Robespierre, the son of an advocate. His father founded Mason Lodges under Charles Edward, the English prince or pretender. Maximilien, the first-born, was thriftily educated. He had brisk Camille de Moulin for schoolmate in the college of Louis le Grand at Paris, but he begged our famed necklace cardinal, Rohan, the patron, to let him depart thence and resign in favour of a younger brother. The strict-minded Max departed, home to paternal Arras, and even had a law-case there, and pleaded not unsuccessfully in favour of the first Franklin thunder-rod. With a strict painful mind, and understanding small but clear and ready, he grew in favour with official persons, who could foresee in him an excellent man of business, happily quite free from genius. The bishop, therefore, taking counsel, appoints him judge of his diocese, and he faithfully does justice to the people. Till, behold, one day a culprit comes whose crime merits hanging, and the strict-minded Max must abdicate, for his conscience will not permit the dooming of any son of Adam to die. A strict-minded, straight-laced man, a man unfit for revolutions, whose small soul, transparent, wholesome-looking as the small ale, could by no chance ferment into virulent Allegar, the mother of ever-new Allegar, till all France had grown acetous virulent. We shall see. Between which two extremes of grandest and meanest, so many grand and mean roll on, towards their several destinies in that procession. There is Casal, the learned young soldier, who shall become the eloquent orator of royalism, and earn the shadow of a name. Experience Molnier, experience Malloway, whose presidential parliamentary experience the stream of things shall soon leave stranded. A petition has left his gown and briefs at Chartres for a stormier sort of pleading. Has not forgotten his violin, being fond of music. His hair is grizzled, though he is still young. Convictions, beliefs, placid, unalterable are in that man, not hindmost of them. Belief in himself. A Protestant clerical, Rabo saint Etienne, a slender young, eloquent and vehement Barnave, will help to regenerate France. There are so many of them young. Till thirty the Spartans did not suffer a man to marry, but how many men here under thirty, coming to produce not one sufficient citizen, but a nation and a world of such. The old to heal up rents, the young to remove rubbish. Which latter, is it not, indeed, the task here? Dim formless from this distance, yet authentically there, thou notice the deputies from Nantes? To us mere clothes-screens, with slouch hat and cloak, but bearing in their pocket a cahier of dolences with this singular clause, and much such in it that the master wig makers of Nantes be not troubled with new guild brethren, the actually existing number of ninety-two being more than sufficient. The round people have elected Farmer Gerard, a man of natural sense and rectitude, without any learning. He walks there, with solid step, unique, in his rustic farmer clothes, which he will wear always, careless of short cloaks and costumes. The name Gerard, or Père Gerard, Father Gerard, as they please to call him, will fly far, borne about in endless banter, in royalist satires, in republican didactic almanacs. As for the man Gerard, being asked once what he did, after trial of it, candidly think of this parliamentary work, I think, answered he, that there are a good many scoundrels among us. So walks Father Gerard, solid in his thick shoes, whithersoever bound. And worthy Dr. Guillotin, who we hope to behold one other time, if not here, the doctor should be here, 
and we see him with the eye of prophecy, for indeed the Parisian deputies are all a little late. Singular Guillotin, respectable practitioner, doomed by a satiric destiny to the strangest immortal glory that ever kept obscure mortal from his resting place, the bosom of oblivion. Guillotin can improve the ventilation of the hall. In all cases of medical police and hygiene be a present aid, but, greater far, he can reproduce his report on the penal code, and reveal therein a cunningly devised beheading machine, which shall become famous and world-famous. This is the product of Guillotin's endeavours, gained not without meditation and reading, which product popular gratitude or levity Christians by a feminine derivative name, as if it were his daughter, La Guillotine. With my machine, messieurs, I whisk off your head, in a twinkling, and you have no pain, whereat they all laugh. Unfortunate doctor! For two and twenty years he, unguillotined, shall near nothing but guillotine, see nothing but guillotine, then dying, shall through long centuries wander, as it were, a disconsolate ghost, on the wrong side of Styx and Lethe, his name likely to outlive Caesar's. See Bailey, like Coyotes of Paris, time-honoured historian of astronomy, ancient and modern. Poor Bailey, how thy serenely beautiful philosophing, with its soft, moonshiny clearances and thinness, ends in foul, thick confusion, of presidency, mayorship, diplomatic officiality, rabid triviality, and the throat of everlasting darkness. Far was it to descend from the heavenly galaxy to the drapeau rouge, beside that fatal dung-heap, on that last hell-day, thou must tremble, though only with cold, de froid. Speculation is not practice, to be weak is not so miserable, but to be weaker than our task. Woe the day when they mounted thee, a peaceable pedestrian, on that wild hippogriff of a democracy, which, spurning the firm earth, nay, lashing at the very stars, no yet known Astolfo could have written. In the Commons, deputies, there are merchants, artists, men of letters, three hundred and seventy-four lawyers, and at least one clergyman, the Abbe Sier. Him also Paris sends, among its twenty, behold him, the light-thin man, cold but elastic, wiry, instinct with the pride of logic, passionless, or with but one passion, that of self-conceit. If indeed that can be called a passion, which, in its independent concentrated greatness, seems to have soared into transcendentalism, and to sit there with a kind of godlike indifference, and look down on passion. He is the man, and wisdom shall die with him. This is the C.A., who shall be system-builder, constitution-builder-general, and build constitutions as many as wanted, sky-high, which shall all unfortunately fall before he get the scaffolding away. La politique, said he to Dumont, polity is a science. I think I have completed. What things, O C.A., with thy clear assiduous eyes art thou to see. But were it not curious to know how C.A., now in these days, for he is said to be still alive, looks out on all that constitution masonry through the roomy soberness of extreme age? Might we hope, still with the irrefragable transcendentalism, the victorious cause pleased the gods, the vanquished one pleased T.A., Thus, however, amid sky-rending vivats and blessings from every heart, has the procession of the commons' deputies rolled by. Next follow the noblesse, and next the clergy, concerning both of whom it might be asked what they specially have come for. Specially, little as they dream of it, to answer this question, put in a voice of thunder, What are you doing in God's fair earth and task garden, where whatsoever is not working is begging or stealing? Woe! Woe to themselves, and to all, if they can only answer, collecting tithes, preserving game. Remark, meanwhile, how Dorlian affects to stop before his own order, and mingle with the commons. For him are vivats, few for the rest, though all wave in plumed hats of a feudal cut, have sword on thigh, though among them is Don Fregru, the young Languedocian gentleman. Indeed, many appear more or less noteworthy. There are Liancourt and La Rochefoucauld, the liberal Anglomaniac dukes. There is a filially pious Lally, a couple of liberal Lameths. Above all, there is a Lafayette, whose name shall be Cromwell Grandison, and fill the world. Many a formula has this Lafayette too made away with, yet not all formulas. 
he sticks by the Washington formula, and by that he will stick, and hang by it, as by sure bower anchor hangs, and swings the tight warship, which, after all changes of wildest weather and water, is still found hanging. Happy for him, be it glorious or not. Alone of all Frenchmen he has a theory of the world, and right mind to conform thereto. He can become a hero and perfect character, were it but the hero of one idea. Note further our old parliamentary friend, Crispin Catalan d'Espremenil. He has returned from the Mediterranean islands, a red-hot royalist, repentant to the finger-ends, unsettled-looking, whose light, dusky glowing at best, now flickers foul in the socket, whom the National Assembly will by and by, to save time, regard as in a state of distraction. Note lastly that the globular younger Mirabeau, indignant that his elder brother is among the commons, it is Viscomte Mirabeau, named Ofna Mirabeau Tonneau, on account of his rotundity, and the quantities of strong liquor he contains. There then walks our French noblesse, all in the old pomp of chivalry, and yet, alas, how changed from the old position, drifted far down from their native latitude, like arctic icebergs, got into the equatorial sea, and fast thawing there. Once these chivalry deuces did actually lead the world, were it only towards battle spoil, where lay the world's best wages then. Moreover, being the ablest leaders going, they had their lion's shares, those juices, which none could grudge them. But now, when so many looms, improved ploughshares, steam engines, and bills of exchange have been invented, and for battle ruling itself, men hire drill sergeants at eighteen pence a day. What mean these gold-mantled chivalry figures, walking there in black velvet cloaks, in high-plumed hats of a feudal cut, reeds shaken in the wind? The clergy have got up, with Cahia for abolishing pluralities, enforcing residence of bishops, better payment of tithes. The dignitaries, we can observe, walk stately, apart from the numerous undignified, who indeed are properly little other than commons disguised in curate frocks. Here, however, though by strange ways, shall the precept be fulfilled, and they are greatest, much to their astonishment, become least. For one example, out of many, mark the plausible Gregoire. One day, Cure Gregoire shall be a bishop, when the now stately are wandering, distracted, as bishops in partibus. With other thought, mark also the Ab Maori, his broad, bold face, mouth accurately primmed, full eyes that ray out intelligence, falsehood, the sort of sophistry which is astonished you should find it sophistical. Skilfulest vamper up of old rotten leather to make it look like new. Always a rising man, he used to tell Mercier, You will see, I shall be in the academy before you. Likely indeed, thou skilfulest Maori. Nay, thou shalt have a cardinal's hat, and plush and glory, but alas also in the long run, mere oblivion, like the rest of us, and six feet of earth. What boots it, vamping rotten leather on these terms? Glorious in comparison is the livelihood thy good old father earns, by making shoes, one may hope in a sufficient manner. Maori does not want for audacity, he shall wear pistols by and by, and at death cries of the lamp iron answer coolly, Friends, you will see better there. But yonder, halting lamely along, thou notice next Bishop Talleyrand Perigore, his reverence of Altun. A sardonic grimness lies in that irreverent reverence of Altun. He will do and suffer strange things, and will become surely one of the strangest things ever seen, or like to be seen, a man living in falsehood and on falsehood, yet not what you can call a false man. There is the speciality. It will be an enigma for future ages, one may hope. Hitherto such a product of nature and art was possible only for this age of ours. Age of paper, and of the burning of paper. Consider Bishop Talleyrand and Marquis Lafayette as the topmost of their two kinds, and say once more, looking at what they did, and what they were, O Tempus Ferax Rerum! On the whole, however, has not this unfortunate clergy also drifted in the time-stream, far from its native latitude? An anomalous mass of men, of whom the whole world has already a dim understanding that it can understand nothing. They were once a priesthood. 
interpreters of wisdom, revealers of the holy that is in man, a true clerus, or inheritance of God on earth. But now they pass silently with such kahie as they have been able to redact, and none cries, God bless them. King Louis, with his court, brings up the rear. He, cheerful, in this day of hope, is saluted with plaudits. Still more necker his minister. Nor so the queen, on whom hope shines not steadily any more. Ill-fated queen! Her hair is already grey with many cares and crosses. Her first-born son is dying in these weeks. Black falsehood has ineffectably soiled her name. Ineffectably, while this generation lasts. Instead of Vive Lorrain, voices insult her with Vive d'Orléans. Of her queenly beauty little remains except its stateliness, not now gracious, but haughty, rigid, silently enduring. With a most mixed feeling, wherein joy has no part, she resigns herself to a day she hoped never to have seen. Poor Marie Antoinette! With thy quick, noble instincts, vehement glancings, Vision all too fitful, narrow for the work thou hast to do? Oh, there are tears in store for thee, bitterest wailings, soft womanly meltings, though thou hast the heart of an imperial Teresa's daughter. Thou doomed one, shut thy eyes on the future. And so in stately procession have passed the elected of France, some towards honour and quick fire consummation, most towards dishonour. Not a few towards massacre, confusion, emigration, desperation, all towards eternity. So many heterogeneities cast together into the fermenting vat, there with incalculable action, counteraction, elective affinities, explosive developments, to work out healing for a sick, moribund system of society. Probably the strangest body of men, if we consider well, that ever met together on our planet on such an errand. So thousandfold complex a society, ready to burst from its infinite depths, and these men, its rulers and healers, without life rule for themselves, other life rule than a gospel according to Jean-Jacques. To the wisest of them, what we must call the wisest, man is properly an accident under the sky. Man is without duty round him, except it be to make the constitution. He is without heaven above him, or hell beneath him. He has no God in the world. What further or better belief can be said to exist in these twelve hundred? Belief in high-plumed hats of a feudal cut, in heraldic scutcheons, and the divine right of kings, in the divine right of game-destroyers? Belief, or what is still worse, canting half-belief, or worst of all, mere Machiavellic pretense of belief, in consecrated dough-wafers and the godhood of a poor old Italian man. Nevertheless, in that immeasurable confusion and corruption, which struggles there so blindly to become less confused and corrupt, there is, as we said, this one salient point of a new life discernible, the deep, fixed determination to have done with shams, a determination which, consciously or unconsciously, is fixed, which waxes ever more fixed, into very madness and fixed idea, which in such embodiment as lies provided there shall now unfold itself rapidly, monstrous, stupendous, unspeakable, new for long thousands of years. How has the heaven's light, oft times in this earth, to clothe itself in thunder and electric murkiness, and descend as molten lightning, blasting, if purifying? Nay, is it not rather the very murkiness and atmospheric suffocation that brings the lighting and the light? The new evangel, as the old had been, was it to be born in the destruction of a world? But how the deputies assisted at high mass and heard sermon and applauded the preacher, church as it was, when he preached politics, how next day with sustained pomp they are for the first time installed in their salle de menus, hall no longer of amusements, and becomes a state's general. Readers can fancy for themselves. The king from his estrade, gorgeous as Solomon in all his glory, runs his eye over that majestic hall. Many plumed, many glancing, bright tinted as a rainbow, in the galleries and near side spaces, 
where beauty sits, reigning bright influence, satisfaction, as of one that after long voyaging had got to port, plays over his broad simple face, the innocent king. He rises and speaks with sonorous tone, a conceivable speech, with which, still more with the succeeding one hour and two hour speeches of Garde de Scot and Monsieur Necker, full of nothing but patriotism, hope, faith, and deficiency of the revenue, no reader of these pages shall be tried. We remark only that, as His Majesty, on finishing the speech, put on his plumed hat, and the noblesse, according to a custom, imitated him, our tiers attack deputies did mostly, not without a shade of fierceness, in like manner clap on, and even crush on their slouched hats, and stand there awaiting the issue. Thick buzz among them, between the majority and minority of Corevous, Decorevous, Hats off, hats on, to which His Majesty puts end by taking off his own royal hat again. The session terminates without further accident or omen than this, with which, significantly enough, France has opened her States General. Here ends the chapter. Section 27. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olga Bulova. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 5, Chapter 1, Inertia. That exasperated France in the same National Assembly of hers has got something, nay, something great, momentous, indispensable, cannot be doubted. Yet still the question were especially what, a question hard to solve even for calm onlookers at this distance, wholly insoluble to actors in the middle of it. The States General, created and conflated by the passionate effort of the whole nation, is there as a thing high and lifted up. Hope, jubilating, cries aloud that it will prove a miraculous brazen serpent in the wilderness, whereon whosoever looks, with faith and obedience, shall be healed of all woes and serpent bites. We may answer, it will at least prove a symbolic banner, round which the exasperating complaining twenty-five millions, otherwise isolated and without power, may rally and work, what it is in them to work. If battle must be the work, as one could not help expecting, then shall it be a battle banner, say an Italian gonfalon and its old Republican Carroccio, and shall tower up, carborne, shining in the wind, and with iron tongue peel forth many a signal a thing of prime necessity, which, whether in the van or in the center, whether lead nor led and driven, must do the fighting multitude incalculable services. For a season, while it floats in the very front, nay, as it were, stands solitary there, waiting where the force will get around it, this same national carroccio and the signal peals its reins are a main object with us. Force will get around it, this same national carroccio and the signal peals its reins are a main object with us. The omen of the slouch hats clapped on shows the common deputies to have made up their minds on one thing, that neither noblesse nor clergy shall have precedence of them, hardly even majesty itself. To such length has the contrat social and force of public opinion carried us. For what is majesty but the delegate of the nation, delegated and bargained, with even rather tightly, in some very singular posture of affairs, which Jean-Jacques has not fixed the date of? Coming, therefore, into their hall, on the morrow, an inorganic mass of six hundred individuals, these commons deputies perceive, without terror, that they have it all to themselves. Their hall is also the grand, or general hall, for all the three orders. But the noblesse and clergy, it would seem, have retired to their two separate apartments, or halls, and are there verifying their powers, not a conjoint, but in a separate capacity. They are to constitute two separate, perhaps separately voting orders, then? It is as if both noblesse and clergy had silently taken for granted that they already were such, two orders against one, and so the third order to be left in a perpetual minority? Much may remain unfixed, but the negative of that is a thing fixed, and the slouch-hatted heads in the French nation's head. 
double representation, and all else hitherto gained were otherwise futile. No, doubtless the powers must be verified. Doubtless the commission, the electoral documents of your deputy, must be inspected by his brother deputies and found valid. It is the preliminary of all. Neither in this question and of doing it separately or doing it conjointly a vital one, but if it lead to such, it must be resisted. Wise was that maxim: resist the beginnings. Nay, where resistance is inadvisable, even dangerous, yet surely pause is very natural. Pause with twenty-five millions behind you may become resistance enough. The inorganic mass of common deputies will restrict itself to a system of inertia, and for the present remain inorganic. Such method, recommendable alike for sagacity and to timidity, do the common deputies adopt, and not without adroitness and with ever more tenacity they persist in it, day after day, week after week. For six weeks, there are histories of the kind named barren, which indeed, as philosophy knows, is often the fruitfulest of all. These were their still creation days, wherein they sat incubating. In fact, what they did was to do nothing in a judicious manner. Daily, the inorganic body reassembles, regrets that they cannot get organization, verification of powers in common, and begin regenerating France. Headlong motions may be made, but let such be repressed. Inertia alone is at once unpunishable and unconquerable. Cunning must be met by cunning. Proud pretension by inertia, by a low tone of patriotic sorrow, low but incurable, unalterable, wise as serpents, harmless as doves. What a spectacle for France! Six hundred inorganic individuals, essential for its regeneration and salvation, sit there, on their elliptic benches, longing passionately towards life, in painful durance, like souls waiting to be born. Speeches are spoken. Eloquent, audible within doors and without, mind agitates itself against mind. The nation looks on with ever deeper interest. Thus do the Commons deputies sit incubating. There are private conclaves, supper parties, consultations, Breton club, club of Viaufle, germs of many clubs, wholly an element of confused noise, dimness, angry heat, wherein, however, the heiress egg, kept at the fit temperature, may hover safe. Unbroken till it be hatched. In your Mounier, Malouet, Le Chapelier, in science sufficient for that, fervor in your Barnave, Rabot, at times shall come an inspiration from Royal Mirabeau. He is no wise yet recognized as royal. Nay, he was grand at when his name was first mentioned, but he is struggling toward recognition. In the course of the week, the Commons having called their eldest to the chair and furnished him with yon strongly lined assistance, can speak articulately, and in audible, lamentable words declare, as we said, that they are an inorganic body longing to become organic. Letters arrive, but an inorganic body cannot open letters; they lie on the table unopened. The eldest may at most procure for himself some kind of list or muster roll to take the votes by, and wait what will betide. Noblesse and clergy are all elsewhere. However, an eager public crowds all galleries and vacancies, which in some comfort, with effort, it is determined now that a deputation shall be sent. For how can an inorganic body send deputations? But that certain individual Commons members shall, in an accidental way, stroll into the clergy chamber and then into the noblest one, and mention there, as a thing they have happened to observe, that the Commons seem to be sitting waiting for them in order to verify their powers. That is the wiser method. The clergy, among whom are such a multitude of undignified, of mere Commons and curates, frocks. Depute instant respectful answer that they are and will now more than ever be in deepest studies to that very matter. Contrariwise, the noblesse, in a cavalier attitude, reply after four days that they, for their part, are all verified and constituted, which they had trusted the Commons also were. Such separate verification being clearly the proper constitutional wisdom of ancestors' method. As they, the noblesse, will have much pleasure in demonstrating by a commission of their number, if the commons will meet them, commission against commission. Directly in the rear of which comes a deputation of clergy reiterating, in their insidious conciliatory way, the same proposal. Here then is a complexity. What will wise commons say to this? 
Warily, inertly, the wise commons, considering that they are, if not a French third estate, at least an aggregate of individuals pretending to some title of that kind, determine, after talking on its five days, to name such a commission, though, as it were, with proviso not to be convinced. A sixth day is taken up and name in it, a seventh and an eighth day in getting the forms of meeting, place, hour, and the like settled so that it is not till the evening of the 23rd of May that the Noblesse Commission first meets Commons Commission. Clergy act as conciliators, and begins the impossible task of convincing it. One other meeting on the 25th will suffice. The Commons are inconvincible. The Noblesse and clergy are fragilely convincing. The Commissions retire, each order persisting in its first pretensions. Thus have three weeks passed. For three weeks the third estate Carocio with far-seen Gonfalon has stood stock still, flout in the wind, waiting what force would gather round it. Fancy can conceive the feeling of the court, and how council met council, the loud-sounding inanity whirled in the distracted vortex where wisdom could not dwell. Your cunningly devised taxing machine has been got together, set up with incredible labor, and stands there, its three pieces in contact, its two flywheels of noblesse and clergy, its huge working wheel of tiers etat. The two flywheels whirl in the softest manner, but prodigious to look upon, the huge working wheel hangs motionless, refuses to stir. The cunningness engineers are at fault. How will it work when it does begin? Fearfully, my friends, and to many purposes, but to gather taxes or green court meal, one day apprehend never. Could we but have continued gathering taxes by hand? Messieurs d'Artois, Conti, Condé, named Corpium Virat, they of the anti-democratic Memoir au Roi, has not their foreboding proved true. They may wave reproachfully their high heads, they may beat their poor brains, but the cunningest engineers can do nothing. Necker himself, where he even listened to, begins to look blue. The only thing one sees advisable is to bring up soldiers. New regiments, two and a battalion of a third, have already reached Paris. Others shall get in march. Good were it in all circumstances to have troops within rich. Good that the command were in sure hands. Let Pogli be appointed. Old Marshal Duke de Dubrogli, veteran disciplinarian of a firm drill surgeon morality, such as may be depended on. For alas, neither are the clergy or the very noblesse what they should be, and might be, when so menaced from within, entire, undivided within. The noblesse, indeed, have their Catalin or Crispin d'Espermenil, dusky glowing, all in renegade heat, their boisterous barrel mirabeau, but also they have their Lafayettes, lion cords, slamas, above all their Dorleans, now cut forever from his court moorings, and musing drowsily of high and highest sea prices, for is not he too a son of Henri IV and partial potential Ier apparent, on his voyage towards chaos? From the clergy again, so numerous are the curers, actual deserters have run over. Two small parties, and the second party, cure, cure Gringoire. Now there is talk of a whole hundred and forty-nine of them about to desert in mass, and only restrained by an archbishop of Paris. It seems a losing game. But judge of France, if Paris sat idle all this while, addresses from far and near flow in, for our commons have now grown organic enough to be open letters, or indeed to cavil at them. Thus poor Marquise de Brez, supreme usher, master of ceremonies, or whatever his title was, writing about this time on some ceremonial matter, sees no harm in winding up with a Monsieur yours with sincere attachment. To whom does it address itself, this sincere attachment, inquires Mirabeau, to the dean of the tiers etat? There is no man in France entitled to write that, rejoins he, where read the galleries and the world will not be kept from applauding. Poor de Brez, these commons have a still older grudge on him, nor has he yet done with them. In another way, Mirabeau has had a protest against the quick suppression of his newspaper, Journal of the States General, and to continue it's under a new name in which act of valor the Paris electors, still busy redacting their cahier, could not but support him, by address to his majesty. They claim utmost provisory freedom of the press. They have spoken even about demolishing the Bastille and erecting a bronze patriot cane on it this side. These are the rich burghers. 
But now consider how it went, for example, with such loose miscellany, now roll grown yellow theromanic, of loungers, prowlers, social nondescripts, and the distilled rascality of our planet, as wheels forever in the Palais Royal, or what love infinite groan, first changing into a growl, comes from Saint Antoine and the twenty five millions in danger of starvation. In the Palais Royal there has been erected, apparently by subscription, a kind of wooden tent en planche de bois, most convenient, where select patriotism can now redact resolutions, deliver harangues with comfort, let the weather but, but as it will. Lovely is that satin at home. On his table, on his chair, in every cafe, stands a patriotic orator. A crowd round him within, a crowd listening from without, open-mouthed through open door and window, with thunders of applause for every sentiment of more than common hardness. In Monsieur de Saint's pamphlet shop, close by, you cannot without strong elbowing get to the counter. Every hour produces its pamphlet, or litter of pamphlets. There were thirteen today, sixteen yesterday, ninety-two last week. Think of tyranny and scarcity, fervid eloquence, rumor, pamphleteering. Société Publicale, Breton Club, Enraged Club, and whether every tap room, coffee room, social reunion, accidental street group over white France was not an enraged club. To all which the Commons deputies can only listen with a sublime inertia of sorrow, reduced to busy themselves with their internal police. Sure a position no deputies ever occupied, if they keep it with skill. Let not the temperature rise too high. Break not the arrow's egg till it be hatched, till it break itself. An eager public crowds all galleries and vacancies, cannot be restrained from applauding. The two privileged daughters, the noblesse all verified and constituted, may look on with what face they will, not without a secret tremor of heart. The clergy, always acting the part of conciliators, make a clutch at the galleries and the popularity there, and miss it. Deputation of them arrives with dolorous message about the dearth of grains and the necessity there is of casting aside vain formalities and deliberating on this. An insidious proposal, which, however, the commons, moved thereto by C. Green Robespierre, dexterously accept as a sort of hint, or even pledge, that the clergy will forthwith come over to them, constitute the States General, and so cheapen grains. Finally, on the 26th, 7th, sorry, day the May, Mirabeau, judging the time now nearly come, proposes that the inertia cease, that leaving the noblesse to their own stuff ways, the clergy be summoned, in the name of the God of Peace, to join the commons and begin. To which summons, if they turn a deaf ear, we shall see, are not 149 of them ready to desert? O triumvirate of princes, new garde du Sobarantin, Thou home secretary, Breteuil, Duchess Polignac, and Queen, eager to listen. What is now to be done? This third estate will get in motion, with the force of all France in it. Clergy machinery and noblesse machinery, which were to serve as beautiful counterbalances and drags, will be shamefully dragged after it, and take fire along with it. What is to be done? The eau de boeuf waxes more confused than ever. Whisper and counter-whisper, a very tempest of whispers. Leading men from all the three orders are nightly spirited thither. Conjure as many of them. But can they conjure this? Necker himself were now welcome, could he interfere to purpose. Let Necker interfere, then, and in the king's name. Happily that incendiary God of Peace message is not yet answered. The three orders shall again have conferences. Under this patriot minister of theirs, somewhat may be hailed, clued up, we, meanwhile, get in forward Swiss regiments and a hundred pieces of field artillery. This is what the Eau de Beau for its part resolves on. But as for Necker, alas, poor Necker, thy obstinate third estate, has one first last word, verification in common, as the pledge of voting and deliberating in common. Halfway proposals from such a tried friend, they answer with a stare. The tardy conferences speedily break up. The third estate, now ready and resolute, the whole world back in it, returns to his hall of the three orders, and Necker to the Eau de Boeuf, with the character of a discundred conjurer there, fit only for dismissal. And so the Commons deputies are at last, on their own strength, getting under way. Instead of chairman or dean, 
they have now got a president, astronomer Bai Yi, underway with a vengeance, with endless vociferous and temperate eloquence, borne in newspaper winds to all lands. They have now, on the seventeenth day of June, determined that their name is not Third Estate but National Assembly. They then are the nation, triumvirate of princes, queen, refractory noblesse, and clergy. What then are you? A most deep question, scarcely answerable in living political dialects. All, regardless of which, our new National Assembly proceeds to appoint a committee of subsistences. Dear to France, though we can find little or no grain. Next, as if our National Assembly stood quite firm on its legs, to appoint four other standing committees, then to settle the security of the national debt, then that of the annual taxation, all within eight and forty hours. At such rate of velocity it is going, the conjurers of the old buff may well ask themselves whither. End of section twenty seven. Section twenty eight of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Five, Chapter Two, Mercury Debris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Now surely were the time for a god from the machine, there is an artist worthy of one. The only question is, which god? Shall it be Mars de Broglie, with his hundred pieces of cannon? Not yet, answers Prudence. So soft, irresolute, is King Louis. Let it be messenger Mercury, our supreme usher de Brise. On the morrow, which is the 20th of June, these hundred and forty-nine false curates, no longer restrainable by his grace of Paris, will desert in a body. Let debris intervene and produce closed doors. Not only shall there be royal session in that salle de menu, but not meeting nor working except by carpenters till then. Your third estate, self-styled National Assembly, shall suddenly see itself extruded from its hall by carpenters in this dexterous way, and reduced to do nothing not even to meet or articulately lament, till Majesty, with séance royale, and new miracles be ready. In this manner shall de Brise, as Mercury ex machine, intervene, and, if the oil de Bouffe mistake not, work deliverance from the notice. Of poor de Brie we can remark that he has yet proposed in none of his dealings with these commons. Five weeks ago, when they kissed the hand of, of Majesty, the mode he took got nothing but censure. And then his sincere attachment, how was it scornfully whiffed aside? Before supper this night, he writes to President Bailey a new letter to be delivered shortly after dawn tomorrow in the king's name. Which letter, however, Bailey, in the pride of office, will merely crush together into his pocket like a bill he does not mean to pay. Accordingly, on Saturday morning of the 20th of June, shrill-sounding heralds proclaim through the streets of Versailles that there is to be a séance royale next Monday and no meeting of the States General till then. And yet we observe President Bailey, in sound of this, and with Debris' letter in his pocket, is proceeding with National Assembly at his heels to the accustomed salle de menu, as if Breeze and heralds were mere wind. It is shut, this salle, occupied by a guard francais. Where is your captain? The captain shows his royal order. Workmen, he is grieved to say, are all busy setting up the platform for His Majesty's seance. Most unfortunately, no admission. Admission at furthest for President and Secretaries to bring away papers, which the joiners might destroy. President Bailey enters with Secretaries and returns bearing papers. Alas, within doors, instead of patriotic eloquence, there is now no noise but hammering, sawing, and operative screeching and rumbling, a profanation without parallel. The deputies stand grouped on the Paris Road on his umbrageous Avenue de Versailles, complaining about the aloud uh, of the indignity done them. Courtier, it is supposed, look from their windows and giggle. The morning is none of the most comfortable. Raw, it is even drizzling a little. But all travelers pause. Patriot, gallerymen, miscellaneous spectators increase the groups. Wild councils alternate. Some desperate deputies propose to go and hold sessions on the great outer staircase at Marley. Under the king's windows, for his majesty, it seems, has driven over thither. Others talk of making the Chateau for court, what they call place d'armes, a runny mead, a new champ de maille of free Frenchmen, 
nay of awakening to sounds of indignant patriotism. The echoes of the oil de boeuf itself. Notice is given that President Bailey, aided the judicious guillotine, and others, has found place in the tennis court of the Rue Saint-Francois. Thither in long-drawn files, horse jingling, like cranes on wing, the commons deputies angrily went. Strange sight was this in the Rue Saint-Francois, view Versailles. A naked tennis court, as the pictures of that time still give it, four walls, naked, except aloft some poor wooden penthouse or roof spectator's gallery hanging round them. On the floor not now an idle teeing of snapping of balls and rackets, but the bellowing din of an indignant national representation scandally exiled hither. However, a cloud of witnesses looks down on them from wooden penthouse, from wall top, from adjoining roof and chimney, rolls towards them from all the quarters with passionate spoken blessings. Some tables can be procured to write on, some chair, if not to sit on, then to stand on. The secretaries undo their tapes. Bailey has constituted the assembly. Experience, Mounier, not wholly new to such things in parliamentary revolts, which has seen or heard of, thinks that it were well in these lamentable threatening circumstances to unite themselves by an oath. Universal acclamation, as from smoldering bosoms getting vent. The oath is redacted, pronounced aloud by President Bailey, and indeed in such sonorous tone that the cloud of witnesses even outdoors hear it and bellow response to it. Six hundred right hands raised with President Bailey's to take God above to witness that they will not separate from man below, but will meet in all places, under all circumstances, wheresoever two or three can get together till they have made the Constitution. Made the Constitution, friends. That is a long task. Six hundred hands, meanwhile, will sign as they have sworn six hundred save one, one loyalist, Abdiel, still visible by this sole light point, and nameable for M. Martin Duke, from Castellandry in Languedoc. Him they permit to sign or signify refusal. They even save him from the cloud of witnesses by declaring his head deranged. At four o'clock the signatures are all appended. New meeting is fixed for Monday morning earlier than the hour of the royal session, that our hundred and forty-nine clerical deserters be not balked. We shall meet at the Recoyet Church or elsewhere, in hope that our hundred and forty-nine will join us, and now it is time to go to dinner. This, then, is the session of the tennis court, for I'm séance de jeu de pomme, the fame of which has gone forth to all lands. This is Mercury the Breeze's appearance, as do ex machina, this is the fruit it brings. The giggle of courtier in the Versailles Avenue has already died into gaunt silence. Did the distracted court, with guard de sol, barantine, triumvirate, and company, Imagine that they could scatter six hundred national deputies, big with a national constitution, like as much barn door poultry, big with next to nothing, by the white or black rod of a supreme usher. Barn door poultry fly cackling, but national deputies turn around, lion faced, and with an uplifted right hand swear an oath that makes the four corners of France tremble. President Bailey has covered himself with honor, which shall become rewards. The National Assembly is now doubly and trebly the nation's assembly, not militant, martyred only, but triumphant, insulted, and which could not be insulted. Paris disembogues itself once more to witness with grim looks the séance royale, which by a new felicity is postponed till Tuesday. The hundred and forty-nine, and even with bishops among them, all in processional mass, have had free leisure to march off and solemnly join the commons sitting, waiting in their church. The commons welcome them with shouts, with embracings, nay, with tears, for it is a growing life and death matter now. As for the seance itself, the carpenters seem to have accomplished their platform, but all else remains unaccomplished. Futile, we may say, fatal, was the whole matter. King Louis enters. Through seas of people all grim, silent, angry with many things, for it is a bitter rain, too, enters to a third estate, likewise grim, silent, which has been wedded, waiting under mean porches at back doors, while court and privilege were entering by the front. King and guard de so, there is no necker visible, make known, not without long-windedness, the determinations of the royal breast. The three orders shall vote separately. On the other hand, France may look for considerable constitutional blessings, as specified in these 530 articles. 
in which Gardasil is waxing hoarse and with reading, which five and thirty articles adds his majesty again rising. If the three orders most unfortunately cannot agree together to effect them, I myself will effect. Sous je ferai le bien de me beper, which being interpreted may signify you contentious deputies of the state general have probably not long to be here but in fine all shall now withdraw for this day and meet again each order in its separate place to-morrow morning for a dispatch of business this is the determination of the royal breast pithy and clear and here with king retinue noblesse majority of clergy file out as if the whole matter were satisfactorily completed these file out through grim silent seas of people one of the common deputies file not out but stand there in gloomy silence uncertain what they shall do one man of them is certain one man of them discerns and dares it is now that king mirabeau starts to the tribune and lifts up his lion voice barely a word in season for in such scenes the moment is the mother of ages had not gabriel honore been there one can well fancy how the common deputies affrighted at the perils which now yawn dim all around them and waxing ever paler in each other's paleness might very naturally one after one have glided off and the whole corpse of european history have been different but he is there list to the brule of that royal forest voice sorrowful low fast swelling to a roar eyes kindle at the glance of his eye national deputies were missioned by a nation they have sworn an oath but lo while the lion's voice roars louderest what apparition is this apparition of mercury de Bries. muttering somewhat speak out cry several messieurs shrilled de Bries, repeating himself you have heard the king's orders mirabeau glares on him with fire flashing face shakes the black lion's mane yes monsieur we have heard what the king was advised to say and you who cannot be the interpreter of his orders to the states general you who have neither place nor right of speech here you are not the man to remind us of it go monsieur tell those who sent you that we are here by the will of the people and that nothing shall send us hence but the force of bayonets and poor debris shivers forth from the national assembly and also finally from the page of history Hapless debris, doomed to survive long ages in man's memory in this faint way with tremulent white rod, he was true to etiquette, which was his faith here below. A martyr to respective persons, short woolen cloaks, could not kiss Majesty's hand as long velvet ones did. Nay, lately, when the poor little dolphin lay dead and some ceremonial visitation came, he was, he was not punctual to announce it, even to the dolphin's dead body. Monseigneur, a deputation of the States General, soon lacrime in rerum. But what does the oil de Bouf now when debris shivers back thither? Dispatch the same force of bayonets? Not so. The seas of people still hang multitudinous, intent on what is passing. They rush and roll, loud billowing, into the courts of the chateau itself, for a report has risen that Necker is to be dismissed. Worst of all, the guards Francais seem indisposed to act. Two companies of them do not fire when ordered. Necker, for not being at the séance, shall be shouted for, carried home in triumph, and must not be dismissed. His grace of Paris, on the other hand, has to fly with broken coach panels and owe his life to furious driving. The guard de corps, in which you were drawing out, had better be drawn in again. There is no sending of bayonets to be thought of. Instead of soldiers, the oil de bouffe sends carpenters to take down the platform. Ineffectual shift. In few instances, the very carpenters cease wrenching and knocking at their platform, stand on it, hammer in hand, and listen open mouthed. The third estate is decreeing that it is, was, and will be nothing but a national assembly, and now, moreover, an, an inviolable one. All members of it inviolable, infamous, treacherous towards the nation and guilty of capital crime is any person body corporate tribunal court or commission that now or henceforth during the present session or after it shall dare to pursue interrogate arrest or cause to be arrested detain or cause to be detained any on whose part soever the same be commanded which done one can wind up with this comfortable reflection from the abbe monsieurs 
You are today what you were yesterday. Courtiers may shriek, but it is and remains even so. Their well-charged explosion has exploded through the touch hole, covering themselves with scorches, confusion, and unseemingly soot. Poor triumvirate, poor queen, and above all, poor queen's husband, who means well, had he any fixed meaning. Folly is that wisdom which is wise only behindhand. A few months ago, these thirty-five concessions had filled France with a rejoicing which might have lasted for several years. Now it is unavailing, the very mention of it slighted. Majesty's express orders said it not. All France is in a roar. A sea of persons estimated at ten thousand whirls all this day to the palace royal. The remaining clergy, and likewise some forty-eight noblesse d'Orleans, among them, have now forthwith gone over to the victorious commons, by whom, as is natural, they are received with acclamation. The third estate triumphs. Versailles, town shouting round at it, ten thousand whirling all day in the Palais Royal. And all France standing a tiptoe, not unlike whirling. Let the oil de boeuf look to it. As for King Louis, he will swallow his injuries. Will temporize, keep silence, will at all costs have present peace. It was Tuesday the 23rd of June when he spoke that peremptory royal mandate, and the week is not done till he has written to the remaining obstinate noblesse that they also must oblige him and give in. Does Bremeno rages his last, Beryl Mirabeau breaks his sword, making a vow which he might as well have kept. The triple family is now therefore complete, the third erring brother, the noblesse having joined it, erring but pardonable soothed so far as possible by sweet eloquence from president bailey so triumphs the third estate and states general are become national assembly and all france may sing to doom by wise inertia and wise cessation of inertia great victory has been gained it is the last night of june all night you meet nothing on the streets of versailles but men running with torches and shouts of jubilation from the second of may when they kiss the hand of majesty to this thirtieth of june when men run with torches we count seven weeks complete for seven weeks the national carroccio has stood far seen ringing many a signal and so much having now gathered round it may hope to stand this is the end of section twenty eight volume one book five chapter two section twenty nine of the french revolution this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeremiah Sutherland, Victoria, British Columbia. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 5, Chapter 3, Burley the War God. The court feels indignant that it is conquered, but what then? Another time it will do better. Mercury descended in vain. Now has the time come for Mars. The gods of the Eau de Boeuf have withdrawn into the darkness of their cloudy Ida, and sit there shaping and forging what may be needful, be it billets of a new national bank, munitions of war, or things forever inscrutable to men. Accordingly, what means this apparatus of troops? The National Assembly can get no furtherance for its committee of subsistences, can hear only that at Paris the baker's shops are besieged that in the provinces people are living on meal husks and boiled grass. But on all highways there hover dust clouds with the march of regiments, with the trailing of cannon, foreign pandour of fierce aspect, Salis Samad, Esther Hazy, Royal Allemand, so many of them foreign to the number of thirty thousand, which fear can magnify to fifty, all wending towards Paris and Versailles. Already on the heights of Montmartre is a digging and delving, too like a scarping and trenching. The effluence of Paris is arrested Versailleward by a barrier of cannon at Sevres Bridge. From the Queen's Mews cannon stand pointed on the National Assembly Hall itself. The National Assembly has its very slumbers broken by the tramp of soldiery, swarming and defiling, endless, or seemingly endless, all round those spaces at dead of night, without drum music, without audible word of command. What means it? Shall eight or even shall twelve deputies, our Mirabeaus, Barnevs, at the head of them, be whirled suddenly to the castle of Ham, the rest ignominiously dispersed to the winds? No national assembly can make the constitution with cannon leveled on it from the Queen's Mews. What means this reticence of the Oeil de Beth, broken only by nods and shrugs? 
In the mystery of that cloudy Ida, what is it that they forge and shape? Such questions must distracted patriotism keep asking and receive no answer but an echo. Enough of themselves. But now, above all, while the hungry food year, which runs from August to August, is getting older, becoming more and more a famine year? With meal husks and boiled grass, brigands may actually collect, and in crowds at farm and mansion howl angrily, food, food. It is in vain to send soldiers against them. At sight of soldiers they disperse, they vanish as underground, then directly reassemble elsewhere for new tumult and plunder. Frightful enough to look upon, but what to hear of, reverberated through twenty-five millions of suspicious minds. Brigands and Broly, open conflagration, preternatural rumor are driving mad most hearts in France. What will the issue of these things be? At Marseilles, many weeks ago, the townsmen have taken arms, for suppressing of brigands and other purposes. The military commandant may make of it what he will. Elsewhere, everywhere, could not the like be done? Dubious on the distracted patriot imagination, wavers as a last deliverance some foreshadow of a national guard. But conceive above all the wooden tent in the Palais Royal, a universal hubbub there, as of dissolving worlds their loudest bellows the mad, mad-making voice of rumor, their sharpest gazes suspicion into the pale, dim world whirlpool, discerning shapes and phantasms, imminent bloodthirsty regiments camped on the Champ de Mar, dispersed national assembly, red-hot cannonballs to burn Paris, the mad war-god and Bologna's sounding thongs. To the calmest man it is becoming too plain that battle is inevitable. Inevitable silently nod Messeigneur and Broly, inevitable and brief. Your National Assembly, stopped short in its constitutional labors, may fatigue the royal ear with addresses and remonstrances. Those cannon of ours stand duly leveled. Those troops are here. The King's Declaration, with its thirty-five too generous articles, was spoken, was not listened to, but remains yet unrevoked. He himself shall effect it. Seul il fera. As for Broly, he has his headquarters at Versailles, all as in a seat of war, Clerks writing, significant staff officers, inclined to taciturnity, plumed aides de camp, scouts, orderlies flying or hovering. He himself looks forth, important, impenetrable, listens to Bessonval, commandant of Paris, and his warning and earnest counsels, for he has come out repeatedly on purpose, with a silent smile. The Parisians resist, scornfully cry, Messeigneur, as a meal mob may. They have sat quiet these five generations, submitting to all, there Mercier declared, in these very years, that a Parisian revolt was henceforth impossible. Stand by the royal declaration of the 23rd of June. The nobles of France, valorous, chivalrous as of old, will rally round us with one heart. And as for this which you call Third Estate, and which we call Canaille of unwashed sans culottes, of Patelin, scribblers, factious spouters, brave Broly, with a whiff of grape-shot, salve de canon, if need be, will give quick account of it. Thus reason they on their cloudy Ida, hidden from men, men also hidden from them. Good is grape-shot, Messeigneur, on one condition, that the shooter also were made of metal. But unfortunately he is made of flesh. Under his buffs and bandoliers, your hired shooter has instincts, feelings, even a kind of thought. It is his kindred, bone of his bone, this same canaille that shall be whiffed. He has brothers in it, a father and mother, living on meal husks and boiled grass. His very doxy, not yet dead in the spittle, drives him into military heterodoxy, declares that if he shed patriot blood, he shall be accursed among men. The soldier, who has seen his pay stolen by rapacious Foulon, his blood wasted by Soubise, Pompadour, and the gates of promotion shut inexorably on him, if he were not born noble, is himself not without griefs against you. Your cause is not the soldier's cause, but, as would seem, your own only, and no other gods nor man's. For example, the world may have heard now, at Bethune lately, when there rose some riot about grains, of which sort there are so many, and the soldiers stood drawn out, and the word fire was given, not a trigger stirred, only the butts of all muskets rattled angrily against the ground, and the soldiers stood glooming with a mixed expression of countenance, till clutched each under the arm of a patriot householder, they were all hurried off, in this manner to be treated and caressed, and have their pay increased by subscription. Neither have the Garde Francaise, 
the best regiment of the line shown any promptitude for street firing lately they return grumbling from reveillon and have not burnt a single cartridge since nay as we saw not even when bid a dangerous humour dwells in these gardes notable men too in their way valadi the pythagorean was at one time an officer of theirs nay in the ranks under the three-cornered felt and cockade what hard heads may there not be and reflections going on unknown to the public one head of the hardest we do now discern there on the shoulders of a certain sergeant hoche lazar hoche that is the name of him he used to be about the versailles royal stables nephew of a poor herb woman a handy lad exceedingly addicted to reading he is now sergeant hoche and can rise no farther he lays out his pay in rushlights and cheap editions of books on the whole the best seems to be consign these gardes francaises to their barracks so besenval thinks and orders consigned to their barracks the gardes francaises do but form a secret association an engagement not to act against the national assembly debauched by valadi the pythagorean debauched by money and women cry besenval and innumerable others debauched by what you will or in need of no debauching behold them long files of them their consignment broken arrive headed by their sergeants on the twenty sixth day of june at the palais royal welcome with viva with presents and a pledge of patriot liquor embracing and embraced declaring in words that the cause of france is their cause next day and the following days the like what is singular too except this patriot humour and breaking of their consignment they behave otherwise with the most rigorous accuracy they are growing questionable these gaud eleven ringleaders of them are put in the abbe prison it boots not in the least the imprisoned eleven have only by the hand of an individual to drop towards nightfall a line in the cafe de foy where patriotism harangues loudest on its table two hundred young persons soon waxing to four thousand with fit crowbars roll towards the abbe smite us under the needful doors and bear out their eleven with other military victims to supper in the palais royal garden to board and lodging in camp beds in the théâtre de variété other national pritoneum as yet not being in readiness most deliberate nay so punctual were these young persons that finding one military victim to have been imprisoned for real civil crime they returned him to his cell with protest why new military force was not called out new military force was called out new military force did arrive full gallop with drawn sabre but the people gently laid hold of their bridles the dragoons sheathed their swords lifted their caps by way of salute and sat like mere statues of dragoons except indeed that a drop of liquor being brought them they drank to the king and nation with the greatest cordiality and now ask in return why messeigneur Ambroli, the great god of war on seeing these things did not pause and take some other course any other course unhappily as we said they could see nothing pride which goes before a fall wrath if not reasonable yet pardonable most natural had hardened their hearts and heated their heads so with imbecility and violence ill-matched pair they rushed to seek their hour all regiments are not garde francaises or debauched by valadi the pythagorean let fresh undebauched regiments come up let royal allemand salah samad swiss chateau vieux come up which can fight but can hardly speak except in german gutturals let soldiers march and highways thunder with artillery wagons majesty has a new royal session to hold and miracles to work there the whiff of grapeshot can if needful become a blast and tempest in which circumstances before the red-hot balls begin raining may not the hundred and twenty paris electors though their cahier is long since finished see good to meet again daily as an electoral club they meet first in a tavern where the largest wedding party cheerfully give place to them but latterly they meet in the hotel de ville in the town hall itself flesselle provost of merchants with his four echevins could not prevent it such was the force of public opinion he with his echevins and the six and twenty town councillors all appointed from above may well sit silent there in their long gowns and consider with awed eye what prelude this is of convulsion coming from below and how themselves shall fare in that end of section twenty nine Section 30 of the French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Jeremiah Sutherland, Victoria, British Columbia. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 5, Chapter 4, To Arms. So hangs it, dubious, fateful, in the sultry days of July. It is the passionate printed advice of Monsieur Marat to abstain, of all things, from violence. Nevertheless, the hungry poor are already burning town barriers, where tribute on eatables is levied, getting clamorous for food. The 12th July morning is Sunday. The streets are all placarded with an enormous-sized deux par le roi, inviting peaceable citizens to remain within doors, to feel no alarm, to gather in no crowd. Why so? What mean these placards of enormous size? Above all, what means this clatter of military, dragoons, hussars, rattling in from all points of the compass towards the Place Louis XV, with a staid gravity of face, though saluted with mere nicknames, hootings, and even missiles? Bessaval is with them. Swiss guards of his are already in the Champs-Élysées with four pieces of artillery. Have the destroyers descended on us, then? From the bridge of Sèvres to utmost Vincennes, from Saint-Denis to the Champ de Mars, we are begirt. Alarm of the vague unknown is in every heart. The Palais Royal has become a place of awestruck interjections, silent shakings of the head. One can fancy with what dolorous sound the noontide cannon which the sun fires at the crossing of his meridian went off there bodeful like an inarticulate voice of doom are these troops verily come out against brigands where are the brigands what mystery is in the wind hark a human voice reporting articulately the job's news necker people's minister saviour of france is dismissed impossible incredible treasonous to the public peace such a voice ought to be choked in the waterworks had not the newsbringer quickly fled nevertheless friends make of it what you will the news is true necker is gone necker hies northward incessantly in obedient secrecy since yesternight we have a new ministry broly the war god aristocrat de breteuil foulon who said the people might eat grass rumour therefore shall arise in the palais royal and in broad france paleness sits on every face confused tremor and fremescence, waxing into thunder-peals of fury stirred on by fear. But see Camille Desmoulins from the Café de Foy, rushing out, sibylline in face, his hair streaming, in each hand a pistol. He springs to a table. The police satellites are eyeing him. Alive they shall not take him. Not they alive, him alive. This time he speaks without stammering. Friends, shall we die like hunted hares, like sheep hounded into their pinfold? bleating for mercy where is no mercy but only a wetted knife the hour is come the supreme hour of frenchman and man when oppressors are to try conclusions with oppressed and the word is swift death or deliverance for ever let such hour be well come us meseems one cry only befits to arms let universal paris universal france as with the throat of the whirlwind sound only to arms to arms yell response of the innumerable voices like one great voice as of a demon yelling from the air for all faces wax fire-eyed all hearts burn up into madness in such or fitter words does camille evoke the elemental powers in this great moment friends continues camille some rallying sign cockades green ones the color of hope as with the flight of locusts these green tree leaves green ribbons from the neighboring shops all green things are snatched and made cockades of Camille descends from his table, stifled with embraces, wetted with tears, has a bit of green ribbon handed him, sticks it in his hat, and now to courteous image shop there, to the boulevards, to the four winds, and rest not till France be on fire. France, so long shaken and wind-parched, is probably at the right inflammable point. As for poor courteous, who one grieves to think might be imperfectly paid, he cannot make two words about his images the wax bust of necker the wax bust of dolian helpers of france these covered with crape as in funeral procession or after the manner of suppliants appealing to heaven to earth and tartarus itself a mixed multitude bears off for a sign as indeed man with his singular imaginative faculties can do nothing or nothing without signs thus turks look to their prophet's banner also osier mannequins have been burnt and Necker's portrait has erewhile well figured aloft on its perch. In this manner march they, a mixed, continually increasing multitude, armed with axes, staves, and miscellanea, 
grim, many sounding through the streets. Be all theaters shut, let all dancing on planked floor or on the natural greensward cease. Instead of a Christian Sabbath and feast of ganget tabernacles, it shall be a sorcerer's Sabbath and Paris gone rabid dance with the fiend for piper. However, Bessonval, with horse and foot, is in the Place Louis Quinze. Mortals promenading homewards in the fall of the day saunter by from Chaillot or Passy, from flirtation and a little thin wine, with sadder step than usual. Will the bus procession pass that way? Behold it. Behold also Prince Lambesque dash forth on it with his royal en main. Shots fall and saber strokes. Busts are hewn asunder, and alas, also heads of men. A saber procession has nothing for it but to explode along what streets, alleys, tuileries, avenues it finds and disappear. One unarmed man lies hewed down. A garde française by his uniform bear him, or bear even the report of him, dead and gory to his barracks, where he has comrades still alive. But why not now, victorious Lambesque, charge through that tuileries garden itself, where the fugitives are vanishing? not show the sunday promenaders too how steel glitters besprent with blood that it be told of and men's ears tingle tingle alas they did but the wrong way victorious lambesque in this his second or tuileries charge succeeds but in overturning call it not slashing for he struck with the flat of his sword one man a poor old schoolmaster most pacifically tottering there and is driven out by a barricade of chairs by flights of bottles and glasses by execrations in base voice and trouble. Most delicate is the mob-queller's vocation, wherein too much may be as bad as not enough. For each of these base voices, and more each treble voice borne to all points of the city, rings now nothing but distracted indignation, will ring all another. The cry to arms roars tenfold. Steeples with their metal storm voice boom shut as the sun sinks. Armorers' shops are broken open, plundered, the streets are a living foam sea chafed by all the winds. Such issue came of Lambesque's charge on the Tuileries garden. No striking of salutary terror into Chaillot promenaders, a striking into broad wakefulness of frenzy and the three furies, which otherwise were not asleep, for they lie always those subterranean humanities, fabulous and yet so true, in the dullest existence of man, and can dance, brandishing their dusky torches, shaking their serpent hair. Lambesque with royal Allemand may ride to his barracks with curses for his marching music, then ride back again like one troubled mind. Vengeful garde Française, sacréing with knit brows, start out on him from their barracks in the Chaussée d'Antan, pour a volley into him, killing and wounding, which he must not answer but ride on. Council dwells not under the plumed hat. If the humanities awaken and Broglie has given no orders, what can a Bessonval do? When the garde Française, with Palais Royal volunteers, roll down, greedy of more vengeance, to the Place Louis XV itself, they find neither Bessonval, Lombesque, Royal Allemand, or any soldier now there. Gone is military order. On the far eastern boulevard of Saint-Antoine, the chasseurs Normandie arrive, dusty, thirsty after a hard day's ride, but can find no billet-master, see no course in this city of confusions, cannot get to Bessonval, cannot so much as discover where he is. Normandy must even bivouac there, in its dust and thirst, until some patriot will treat it to a cup of liquor with advices. Raging multitudes surround the Hôtel de Ville, crying, Arms! Orders! The six-and-twenty town councillors, with their long gowns, have ducked under, into the raging chaos, shall never emerge more. Bessonval is painfully wriggling himself out to the Champ de Mars. He must sit there in the cruelest uncertainty. Courier after courier may dash off for Versailles, but will bring back no answer, can hardly bring himself back. For the roads are all blocked with batteries and pickets, with floods of carriages arrested for examination. Such was Broly's one sole order. The Oeil de Boeuf, hearing in the distance such mad din, which sounded almost like invasion, will before all things keep its own head whole. A new ministry with, as it were, but one foot in the stirrup, cannot take leaps. Mad Paris is abandoned altogether to itself. What a Paris when the darkness fell! A European metropolitan city hurled suddenly forth from its old combinations and arrangements to crash tumultuously together, seeking new. 
Use and won't will now no longer direct any man. Each man, with what of originality he has, must begin thinking or following those that think. Seven hundred thousand individuals on the sudden find all their old paths, old ways of acting and deciding, vanish from under their feet. And so there go they, with clangor and terror, they know not as yet whether running, swimming, or flying, headlong into the new era. With clangor and terror, from above, Broly the war-god impends preternatural with his red-hot cannonballs, and from below, a preternatural brigand world menaces with dirk and firebrand, madness rules the hour. Happily, in place of the submerged twenty-six, the electoral club is gathering, has declared itself a provisional municipality. On the morrow it will get Provost Flessel, with an échevin or two, to give help in many things. For the present it decrees one most essential thing, that forthwith a Parisian militia shall be enrolled. Depart, ye heads of districts, to labor in this great work, while we here in permanent committee sit alert. Let fensible men, each party in its own range of streets, keep watch and ward all night. Let Paris court a little fever sleep, confused by such fever dreams of violent motions at the Palais Royal, or from time to time start awake and look out palpitating in its nightcap at the clash of discordant, mutually unintelligible patrols, on the gleam of distant barriers going up all too ruddy towards the vault of night. End of section 30of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Allen. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 5, Chapter 5. Give Us Arms. On Monday, the huge city has awoke, not to its weekday industry, what a different one! The working man has become a fighting man, has one want only, that of arms. The industry of all crafts has paused, except it be the smiths, fiercely hammering pikes, and in a faint degree, the kitcheners cooking off-hand victuals, or boucher, batoujour. Women, too, are sewing cockades, not now of green, which being d'artois color, the hôtel de ville, has had to interfere in it, but a red and blue are old Paris colors. These, once based on a ground of constitutional white, are the famed tricolors, which, if prophecy err not, will go round the world. All shops, unless it be the bakers and vintners, are shut. Paris is in the streets, rushing, foaming, like some Venice wine glass into which you would drop poison. The toxin, by order, is peeling madly from all steeples. Arms! Ye elector municipals! Thou flicel with thy eschvin! Give us arms! Flicel gives what he can, fallacious, perhaps insidious promises of arms from Charville. Order to seek arms here, order to seek them there. The new municipals give what they can some three hundred and sixty in different firelocks, the equipment of the city watch. A man in wooden shoes, and without coat, directly clutches one of them, and mounts guard. Also, as hinted, an order to all smiths to make pikes with their whole soul. Heads of districts are in fervent consultation. Subordinate patriotism roams distracted, ravenous for arms. Hitherto, at the Hôtel de Ville, was only such modicum of indifferent fireworks as we have seen. At the so-called arsenal, there lies nothing but rust, rubbish, and saltpeter, overlooked, too, by the guns of the Bastille, His Majesty's repository, what they call Garde Mouib, is forced and ransacked, tapestries enough, and gauderies, but of serviceable fighting gear, small stock. Two silver-mounted cannons there are, an ancient gift from His Majesty of Siam to Louis the Fourteenth, gilded sword of the good Henri, antique chivalry arms and armor, these and such as these, a necessitous patriotism snatches greedily for want of better. 
the Siamese cannons go trundling on an errand they were not meant for. Among the indifferent firelocks are seen tourney lances, the princely helm and hauberk glittering amid ill-hatted heads, as in a time when all times and their possessions are suddenly sent jumbling. At the Maison de saint Lazare, Lazar house once, now a correction house with priests, there was no trace of arms, but, on the other hand, born, plainly to a culpable extent. Out with it, to market, in this scarcity of grains? Heavens, will fifty-two carts, in long row, hardly carry it to Hallock Bled? Well, truly, ye reverend fathers, was your pantry filled, fat are your larders, over-generous your wine-bins, ye plotting exasperators of the poor, traitorous for stallers of bread. Vain is protesting, entreaty on bare knees. The house of St. Lazarus has that in it, which comes not out by protesting. Behold how, from every window it vomits, mere torrents of furniture, of bellowing and hurly-burly, the cellars also leaking wine, till, as was natural, smoke rose, kindled, some say, by the desperate St. Lazarites themselves, desperate of other riddance, and the establishment vanished from this world in flame. Remark, nevertheless, that a thief, set on or not by aristocrats, being detected there, is instantly hanged. Look at the Chatelet prison. The debtor's prison of La Force is broken from without, and they that sat in bondage to aristocrats go free, hearing of which the felons at the Chatelet do likewise dig up their pavement and stand on the offensive with the best prospects, had not patriotism passing that way fired a volley into the Fenlon world and crushed it down again under hatches. Patriotism consorts not with thieving and felony. Surely also punishment this day hitches, if she still hitch, after crime, with frightful shoes of swiftness. Some score or two of wretched persons found prostrate with drink in the cellars of that St. Lazare, are indignantly haled to prison. The jailer has no room, whereupon, other place of security, not suggesting itself, it is written, on les pendis, they hang them. Brief is the word, not without significance, be it true or untrue. In such circumstances, the aristocrat, the unpatriotic rich man, is packing up for departure. But he shall not get departed. A wooden-shod force has seized all barriers, burnt or not. All that enters, all that seeks to issue, is stopped there, and dragged to the Hôtel de Ville. Coaches, tumbrils, plate, furniture, many meal sacks. In time, even flocks and herds encumber the palace de grieve. And so it roars and rages and brays, drums beating, steeples peeling, Friars rushing with handbells. Quote, Oyez, Oyez, all men to their districts to be enrolled. Unquote. The districts have met in gardens. Open squares are getting marshaled into volunteer troops. No red hot ball has yet fallen from Besenval's camp. On the contrary, deserters with their arms are continually dropping in. Nay, now, joy of joys. At two in the afternoon, the guard Francais being ordered to send a knee, and flatly declining, have come over in a body. It is a fact worth many. Three thousand six hundred of the best fighting men, with complete accoutrement, with cannoneers even, and cannon, their officers are left standing alone, could not so much as succeed in spiking the guns. The very Swiss, it may now be hoped, Chateau View and the others will have doubts about fighting. Our Parisian militia, which some think it were better to name National Guard, as prospering as heart could wish. It promised to be 48,000, but will in a few hours double and quadruple that number. Invincible, if we had only arms. Let's see, the promised Charleville boxes, marked artillery. Here then are arms enough. Conceive the blank face of patriotism when it found them filled with rags, foul linen, candle ends, and bits of wood. Provost of the merchants, how is this? Neither at the Chartreux convent, 
whither we were sent with signed order, is there, or ever was there, any weapon of war? Nay, here, in the Seine boat, safe under tarpaulings, had not the nose of patriotism been of the finest? Are five thousand weight of gunpowder not coming in, but surreptitiously going out? What meanst thou, Flacelles? Tis a ticklish game, that of amusing us. Cat plays with captive mouse, but mouse with enraged cat, with enraged national tiger. Meanwhile, the faster, O ye black apron smiths, smite with strong arm and willing heart. This man and that, all stroke from head to heel, shall thunder alternating, and ply the great forge hammer, till stithy reel and ring again, while ever and anon, overhead, booms the alarm cannon. For the city has now got gunpowder, pikes are fabricated, fifty thousand of them, in six and thirty hours. Judge whether the black aproned have been idle. Dig trenches! Unpave the streets, ye others, assiduous, man and maid, cram the earth in barrel barricades, at each of them volunteer sentry. Pile the white stone in window sills and upper rooms. Have scalding pitch, at least boiling water ready, ye weak old women, to pour it and dash it on royal alamand. With your old skinny arms, your shrill curses along with it will not be wanting. Patrols of the newborn National Guard bearing torches scour the streets all that night, which otherwise are vacant, yet illuminated in every window by order, strange looking like some naphtha lighted city of the dead, with here and there a flight of perturbed ghosts. O oh, poor mortals, how you make this earth bitter for each other, this fearful and wonderful life, fearful and horrible, and Satan has his place in all hearts. Such agonies and ragings and wailings ye have, and have had, in all times, to be buried all in so deep silence, and the salt sea is not swollen with your tears. Great, meanwhile, is the moment when tidings of freedom reach us, when the long-enthralled soul from amid its chains and squalid stagnancy arises. Were it still only in blindness and bewilderment, and swears by him that made it, that it will be free, free. Understand that well, it is the deep commandment, dimmer or clearer, of our whole being to be free. Freedom is the one purport, wisely aimed at, or unwisely, of all man's struggles, toilings, and sufferings in this earth. Yes, supreme is such a moment, if thou have known it. First vision, as of a flame-girt Sinai, and this our waste pilgrimage, which thenceforth wants not its pillar of cloud by day, and pillar of fire by night. Something it is, even, nay, something considerable, when the chains have grown corrosive, poisonous, to be free from oppression by our fellow man. Forward, ye maddened sons of France, be it towards this destiny or towards that, Around you is but starvation, falsehood, corruption, and the calm of death. Where ye are is no abiding. Imagination may imperfectly figure how Commandant Benceval in the Champs de Mars has worn out these sorrowful hours. Insurrection all around, his men melting away. From Versailles to the most pressing messages comes no answer, or once only some vague word or answer, which is worse than none. A council of officers can decide merely that there is no decision. Colonels inform him, weeping, that they do not think their men will fight. Cruel uncertainty is here. War God, Brogli, sits yonder, inaccessible in his Olympus, does not descend terror-clad, does not produce his whiff of grape-shot, Sends no orders. Truly, in the chateau of Versailles, all seems mystery. In the town of Versailles, were we there, all is rumor, alarm, and indignation. An august National Assembly sits, to appearance, menaced with death. Endeavoring to defy death, it is resolved that Necker carries with him the regrets of the nation. 
it has sent solemn deputation over to the chateau with entreaty to have these troops withdrawn. In vain, His Majesty, with a singular composure, invites us to be busy rather with our own duty, making the Constitution, foreign pandors and such like, go pricking and prancing, with a swashbuckler air, with an eye too probably to the Salle de Menu, were it not for the grim-looking countenances that crowd all avenues there. Be firm, ye national senators, the sinusure of a firm, grim-looking people. The august national senators determine that there shall, at least, be permanent session till this thing end. Wherein, however, consider that worthy Lefranc de Pompignon, our new president, whom we have named Bailey successor, is an old man, wearied with many things. He is the brother of that Pompignon, who meditated lamentably on the Book of Lamentations. Savez-vous pourquoi je remis? C'est le monde toute sa vie. C'est qu'il le prévoyait que Pompignon de tradire. Poor Bishop Pompignon withdraws, having got Lafayette for helper or substitute. This latter, as nocturnal vice-president, with a thin house and disconsolate humor, sits sleepless, with lights unsnuffed, waiting what the hours will bring. So at Versailles, but at Paris, agitated Bensonville, before retiring for the night, has stepped over to old Monsieur de Sombrio of the Hôtel des Invalides. Hard by Monsieur Sombrio has what is a great secret. Some eight and twenty thousand stand of muskets deposited in his cellar there but no trust in the temper of his invalide. This day, for example, he sent twenty of the fellows down to unscrew those muskets, lest sedition might snatch at them, but scarcely in six hours had the twenty unscrewed twenty gun locks, or dog's heads, chien, of locks. Each invalide is dog's head. If ordered to fire, they would, he imagines, turn their cannon against himself, Unfortunate old military gentleman, it is your hour, not of glory. Old Marquis de Lugne, too, of the Bastille, has pulled up his drawbridges long since and retired into his interior, with sentries walking on his battlements under the midnight sky, aloft over the glare of illuminated Paris, whom a national patrol, passing that way, takes the liberty of firing at. Seven shots toward twelve at night, which do not take effect. This was the 13th day of July, 1789. A worse day, many said, than the last 13th was, when only hail fell out of heaven, not madness rose out of Tophet, ruining worse than crops. In these same days, as chronology will teach us, hot old Marquis Mirabeau lived stricken down at Argentuil, not within sound of these alarm guns, for he properly is not there, and only the body of him now lies, deaf and cold forever. It was on Saturday night that he, drawing his last life breaths, gave up the ghost there, leaving a world which would never go to his mind, now broken out, seemingly, into deliration and the culbut general. What is it to him, departing elsewhither, on his long journey, the old chateau Mirabeau stands silent, far off on its scarped rock, in that gorge of two windy valleys, a pale fading specter now of a chateau. This huge world riot in France and the world itself fades also, like a shadow on the great still mirror sea, and all shall be as God wills. Young Mirabeau sat of heart, for he loved this crabbed brave old father, sad of heart and occupied with sad cares, is withdrawn from public history. The great crisis transacts itself without him. End of section 31。section 32 of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。Please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Jeff Allen. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 5, Chapter 6. Storm and Victory. But to the living and the struggling, a new fourteenth morning dawns. Under all roofs of this distracted city is the notice of a drama, not untragical, crowding toward solution. The bustling and preparings, the tremors and menaces, the tears that fell from old eyes. This day, my sons, you shall quit you like men, by the memory of your father's wrongs, by the hope of your children's rights. Tyranny and pens in red wrath. Help for you is none, if not in your own right hands. This day ye must do or die. From earliest light, a sleepless permanent committee has heard the old cry, now waxing almost frantic, mutinous. Arms! Arms! Provost Placel, or what traitors there are among you, may think of those Charville boxes. A hundred and fifty thousand of us, and but the third man furnished with so much as a pike. Arms are the one thing needful. With arms we are unconquerable, men defying National Guard. Without arms, a rabble to be whiffed with grape shot. Happily the word has arisen, for no secret can be kept, that there lie muskets at the Hotel de Invalides. Thither will we. Kings! Procure, Monsieur Ethi de Corny, and whatsoever authority a permanent committee can lend shall go with us. The Senville's camp is there. Perhaps he will not fire on us. If he kill us, we shall but die. Alas, poor Vencival, with his troops melting away in that manner, has not the smallest humor to fire. At five o'clock this morning, as he lay dreaming, oblivious in the École Militaire, a figure stood suddenly at his bedside, with face rather handsome, eyes inflamed, speech rapid and curt, air audacious. Such a figure drew Priam's curtains. The message and monition of the figure was that resistance would be hopeless, that if blood flowed, woe to him who shed it. Thus spoke the figure and vanished. Withal, there was a kind of eloquence that struck one. Vesenvo admits that he should have arrested him, but did not. Who this figure, with inflamed eyes, with speech rapid and curt, might be, Bencival knows, but mentions not. Camille de Moline? Pythagorean Marquis Villati, inflamed with violent motions all night at the Palais Royal. Fame names him Young Monsieur Maillard, then shuts her lips about him forever. In any case, Behold, about nine in the morning, our national volunteers, rolling in long, wide flood, southwestward to the Hôtel des Invalides, in search of the one thing needful. King's procureur, Monsieur Athies de Corny, and officials are there. The curé of saint Antoine du Mont marches on Pacific at the head of his militant parish. The clerks of the Bazouchet in red coats we see marching, now volunteers of the Bajousset, the volunteers of the Palais Royal, national volunteers, numerable by tens of thousands, of one heart and mind, the king's muskets are the nation's. Think, old Monsieur de Sombreil, how, in this extremity, thou wilt refuse them. Old Monsieur de Sombreil would fain hold parley, send couriers, but it skills not. The walls are scaled. No invalid firing a shot. The gates must be flung open. Patriotism rushes in, tumultuous, from Grunsel up to Ridge Tile, through all rooms and passages, rummaging distractedly for arms. What cellar, or what cranny can escape it? The arms are found, all safe there, lying packed in straw, apparently with a view to being burnt. More ravenous than famishing lions over dead prey, the multitude, with clangor and vociferation, pounces on them, struggling, dashing, clutching. To the jamming up, to the pressure, fracture, and probably extinction of the weaker patriot. And so, with such protracted crash of deafening, most discordant orchestra music, the scene is changed. 
and eight and twenty thousand sufficient firelocks are on the shoulders of so many national guards, lifted thereby out of darkness into fiery light. Let Bensonville look at the glittering of these muskets as they flash by. Gars Francais, it is said, have cannon leveled on him, ready to open if need were. From the other side of the river, motionless sits he, astonished, one may flatter oneself, at the proud bearing of the Parisians. And now to the Bastille, ye intrepid Parisians! Their grape-shot still threatens, thither all men's thoughts and steps are now treading. Old de Lonnais, as we hinted, withdrew into his interior soon after midnight of Sunday. He remains there ever since, pampered, as all military gentlemen now are, in the saddest conflict of uncertainties. The Hôtel de Ville invites him to admit national soldiers, which is a soft name for surrendering. On the other hand, His Majesty's orders were precise. His garrison is but eighty-two old invalides, reinforced by thirty-two young Swiss. His walls, indeed, are nine feet thick. He has cannon and powder, but alas, only one day's provision of victuals. The city, too, is French. The poor garrison, mostly French. Rigorous old de Launier, think what thou wilt do. All morning, since nine, there has been a cry everywhere. To the Bastille! Repeated deputations of citizens have been here, passionate for arms, whom de Launier has got dismissed by soft speeches through portholes. Towards noon, Elector Thoroy de la Roserie gains admittance, finds de Launier indisposed for surrender. Nay, disposed for blowing up the place, rather. The Royt mounts with him to the battlements. Heaps of paving stones, old iron and missiles lie piled. Cannon all duly leveled. In every embrasure, a cannon. Only drawn back a little. But outwards, behold! Oh, Thoroy, how the multitude flows on, welling through every street, toxin furiously peeling, all drums beating the general. The suburb Saint Antoine, rolling hitherward, holy, as one man, such vision, spectral yet real, though, O Thoroy, as from thy mount of vision, beholdest in this moment, prophetic of what the phantasmagories, and loud gibbering special realities, which thou yet beholdest not, but shall, quote, que voulez-vous, unquote, said de Lonye, turning pale at the sight and with an air of reproach, almost of menace. Quote, Major, said Thoroy, rising into the moral sublime, what mean you? Consider if I could not precipitate both of us from this height, unquote. say only a hundred feet, exclusive of the walled ditch, whereupon de Lonier fell silent. The right shows himself from some pinnacle to comfort the multitude becoming suspicious. Grimensen, and then descends, departs with protest, with warning addressed also to the invalide, on whom, however, it produces but a mixed indistinct impression. The old heads are none of the clearest. Besides, it is said that de Launier has been profuse of beverages. Prodigioix de Bossum. They think they will not fire, if not fired on, if they can help it, but must, on the whole, be ruled considerably by circumstances. Woe to thee, de Launier, in such an hour, if thou canst not, taking some one firm decision, rule circumstances. Soft speeches will not serve, hard grape-shot is questionable, but hovering between the two is unquestionable. Ever wilder swells the tide of men, their infinite hum waxing ever louder into imprecations, perhaps into crackle of stray musketry, which latter, on walls nine feet thick, cannot do execution. The outer drawbridge has been lowered for Thoroy. New deputation of citizens, it is the third and noisiest of all, penetrates that way into the outer court. Soft speeches produce no clearance of these. De Longier gives fire, pulls up his drawbridge, a slight sputter, which has kindled the too combustible chaos, made it a roaring fire chaos, bursts forth insurrection, at sight of its own blood, for there were deaths by that sputter of fire, 
into endless rolling explosion of musketry, distraction, execration, and overhead from the fortress, let one great gun with its grape-shot go booming to show what we could do. The Bastille is besieged! On then, all Frenchmen, that have hearts in their bodies, roar with all your throats of cartilage and metal, ye sons of liberty, spur spasmatically whatsoever of utmost faculty is in you, soul, body, or spirit, for it is the hour. Smite thou, Louis Tournay, Cartwright of the Marais, old soldier of the regiment Dauphine. Smite at that outer drawbridge chain, though the fiery hail whistles round thee, never, over knave or fellow, did thy axe strike such a stroke. Down with it, man, down with it to Orcus. Let the whole accursed edifice sink thither, and tyranny be swallowed up forever. Mounted, some say, on the roof of the guard-room, some on bayonets struck into joints of the wall. Louis Tournay smites. Brave Aubin Bommeray, also an old soldier, seconding him. The chain yields, breaks. The huge drawbridge slams down, thundering. Avec fracas. Glorious, and yet, alas, it is still but the outworks. The eight grim towers with their invalid musketry, their paving stones and cannon mouths, still soar aloft intact. Ditch yawning impassable, stone-faced, the inner drawbridge with its back towards us. The Bastille is still to take. To describe the siege of the Bastille, thought to be one of the most important in history, perhaps transcends the talent of mortals. Could one but after infinite reading get to understand so much as the plan of the building? But there is open esplanade at the end of the Rue Saint Antoine. There are such four courts, Cour Avage, Cour des Lumes, arched gateway, where Louis Tournay now fights. Then new drawbridges, dormant bridges, rampart bastions, and the grim eight towers, a labyrinthic mass, high frowning there of all ages from twenty years to four hundred and twenty, beleaguered in this its last hour, as we said, by mere chaos come again. Ordinance of all calibers, throats of all capacities, men of all plans, every man his own engineer. Seldom since the war of pygmies and cranes was there seen so analogous a thing. Half pay Ellie is home for a suit of regimentals. No one would heed him in the colored clothes. Half pay Hui is harangued, guards Francais in the Palais de Grave. Frantic patriots pick up the grape shot, bear them, still hot, or seemingly so, to the Hôtel de Ville. Paris, you perceive, is to be burnt. Flessel is pale to the very lips, for the roar of the multitude grows deep. Paris wholly has got the acme of its frenzy, whirled always by panic madness. At every street barricade there whirls simmering, a minor whirlpool, strengthening the barricade, since God knows what is coming, and all minor whirlpools play distractedly into that grand fire maelstrom which is lashing round the Bastille, and so it lashes and it roars. Chaudla, the wine merchant, has become an impromptu cannoneer. See Georget, of the marine service, fresh from Brest, by the king of Siam's cannon. Singular, if we were not used to the like. Georget lay, last night, taking his ease at his inn. The king of Siam's cannon also lay, knowing nothing of him for a hundred years. Yet now, at the right instant, they have got together and discourse eloquent music. For hearing what was toward, Georget sprang from the breast de Légion and ran. Guards Francais also will be here, with real artillery. Were not the walls so thick? Upwards from the esplanade, horizontally from all neighboring roofs and windows, flashes one irregular deluge of musketry, without effect. The invalides lie flat firing comparatively at their ease from behind stone, hardly through portholes, show the tip of a nose. We fall, shot, and make no impression. Let conflagration rage of whatever is combustible. Guard rooms are burnt, invalid mess rooms. A distracted peruke maker with two fiery torches is for burning the saltpeters of the arsenal. Had not a woman run screaming, 
had not a patriot with some tincture of natural philosophy instantly struck the wind out of him butt of musket on the pit of stomach overturned barrels and stayed the devouring element a young beautiful lady seized escaping in these outer courts and thought falsely to be de launay's daughter shall be burnt in de launay's sight she lies swooned on a palace but again a patriot it is brave or bon marie the old soldier dashes in and rescues her straw is burnt three carloads of it hauled thither go up in white smoke almost to the choking of patriotism itself so that ellie had with singed brow to drag back one cart and riol the gigantic haberdasher another smoke as of tophet confusion as of babel noise as of the crack of doom blood flows the ailment of new madness the wounded are carried into houses of the rue serezul the dying leave their last mandate not to yield till the accursed stronghold falls and yet alas how fall the walls are so thick deputations three in number arrive from the hotel de ville Abbe Fauchette, who was of one can say with what almost superhuman courage of benevolence these wave their town flag in the arched gateway and stand rolling their drum but to no purpose in such crack of doom de Lognier cannot hear them dare not believe them they return with justified rage the few of lead still singing in their ears what to do the firemen are here squirting with their fire pumps on the invalid cannon to wet the touch holes they unfortunately cannot squirt so high but produce only clouds of spray individuals of classic knowledge propose catapults some down the sonorous brewer of the suburb saint antoine advises rather that the place be fired by a mixture of phosphorus and oil of turpentine spouted up through forcing pumps o spinola some down hast thou the mixture ready every man his own engineer and still the fire deluge abates not even women are firing and turks at least one woman with her sweetheart and one turk guards francais have come real cannon real cannoneers usher maillard is busy half pay elie half pay oula rage in the midst of thousands how the great bastille clock ticks inaudible in its inner court there at its ease hour after hour as if nothing special for it or the world were passing it told one when the firing began and is now pointing towards five and still the firing slakes not far down in their vaults the seven prisoners hear muffled din as of earthquakes their turnkeys answer vaguely woe to thee de Lognier, with thy poor hundred invalid broy is distant and his ears heavy Bezenville hears but can send no help one poor troop of hussars has crept reconnoitering cautiously along the quays as far as the pont neuf quote, we are come to join you unquote, said the captain for the crowd seemed shoreless a large-headed dwarfish individual of smoke-bleared aspect shambles forward opening his blue lips for there is sense in him and croaks quote, a light then and give up your arms unquote. the hussar captain is too happy to be escorted to the barriers and dismissed on parole who the squat individual was men answer it is major merat author of the excellent pacific avis au people great truly o thou remarkable dog leech is this thy day of emergence and new birth and yet this same day come four years but let the curtains of the future hang what shall de Lognier do one thing only de Lognier could have done what he said he would do fancy him sitting for the first with lighted taper within arm's length of the powder magazine motionless like old roman senator or bronze lamp holder coldly appraising thoreau and all men by a slight motion of his eye what his resolution was harmless he sat there while unharmed 
but the king's fortress, meanwhile, could, might, would, or should, in no wise be surrendered, save to the king's messenger. One old man's life worthless, so it be lost with honor. But think, ye brawning can I, how will it be when a whole bastille springs skyward? In such statuesque, taper-holding attitude, one fancies de Lognier might have left the Roy, the red clerks of Bazoche, curie of St. Stephen, and all the tag-red and bobtail of the world, to work their will. And yet, withal, he could not do it. Hast thou considered how each man's heart is so tremulously responsive to the hearts of all men? Hast thou noted how omnipotent is the very sound of many men? How long their shriek of indignation palsies the strong soul? Their howl of contumely withers with unfelt pangs? The Ritter Gluck confessed that the ground tone of the noblest passage in one of his noblest operas was the voice of the populace he had heard at Vienna, crying to their Kaiser, Bread! Bread! Great the combined voice of men, the utterance of their instincts, which are truer than their thoughts. It is the greatest a man encounters among the sounds and shadows which make up this world of time. He who can resist that has his footing somewhere beyond time. De Lunier could not do it. Distracted, he hovers between the two. Hopes in the middle of despair, surrenders not his fortress, declares that he will blow it up, seizes torches to blow it up, and does not blow it up. Unhappy old Delonier, it is the death agony of thy Bastille and thee. Jail, jailering, and jailer, all three, such as they may have been, must finish. For four hours now has the world bedlam roared. Call it the world chimera, blowing fire. The poor invalid have sunk under their battlements, or rise only with reversed muskets. They have made a white flag of napkins, go beating the chamad, or seeming to beat, for one can hear nothing. The very Swiss at the portcullis look weary of firing, disheartened in the fire deluge. The porthole at the drawbridge is open, is by one that would speak. See Auger Maillard, the shifty man, on his plank, swinging over the abyss of that stone ditch, plank resting on parapet, balanced by weight of patriots. He hovers perilous, such a dove toward such an ark. Deftly, thou shifty Auger. One man already fell and lies smashed, far down there against the masonry. Usher Maillard falls not. Deftly unerring he walks, with outspread palm. The Swiss holds a paper through his porthole. The shifty Usher snatches it, and returns. Terms of surrender. Pardon, immunity to all. Are they accepted? Quote, For d'officer, on the word of an officer, unquote, answers half-pay Hu Ying or half-pay Ellie, for men do not agree on it. Quote, they are! Unquote. Boucher Maillard, bolting it when down, rushes in the living deluge. The Bastille is fallen! Victory! The Bastille breeze! End of part 32《Of the French Revolution》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle Volume 1, Book 5, Chapter 7 Not a Revolt Why dwell on what follows? Hulin's what officer should have been kept but could not. The Swiss stand drawn up, disguised in white canvas smocks, the invalid without disguise, their arms all piled against the wall. The first rush of victors, in ecstasy that the death peril is past, leaps joyfully on their necks. But new victors rush, and ever new, also in ecstasy not wholly of joy. 
As we said, it was a living deluge plunging headlong, had not the Garde Française, in their cool military way, wheeled round with arms levelled, it would have plunged suicidally, by the hundred or the thousand, into the Bastille ditch. And so it goes plunging through court and corridor, billowing uncontrollable firing from windows, on itself, in hot frenzy of triumph, of grief and vengeance for its slain. The poor invalid will fare ill. One Swiss, running off in his white smock, is driven back with a death thrust. Let all prisoners be marched to the town hall to be judged. Alas, already one poor invalid has his right hand slashed of him, his maimed body dragged to the place de Grève and hanged there. This same right hand, it is said, turned back Delaunay from the powder magazine and saved Paris. Delaunay, discovered in grey frock with puppy-coloured riband, is for killing himself with the sword of his cane. He shall to the Hôtel de Ville, Hulin, Maillard, and others escorting him, Elie marching foremost with the capitulation paper on his sword's point. Through roarings and cursings, through hustlings, clutchings, and at last, through strokes, your escort is hustled aside, fell down. Hulin sinks exhausted on a heap of stones. Miserable Delaunay, he shall never enter the Hôtel de Ville. Only his bloody hair cue held up in a bloody hand that shall enter for a sign. The bleeding trunk lies on the steps there. The head is off through the streets, ghastly aloft on a pike. Rigorous Delaunay has died, crying out, O oh, friends, kill me fast. Merciful Delos must die. Through gratitude embraces him in this fearful hour and will die for him. It avails not. Brothers, your wrath is cruel. Your place de grève is become a throat of the tiger, full of mere fierce billowings and thirst of blood. One other officer is massacred, one other invalid is hanged on the lamp iron, with difficulty, with generous perseverance. The garde française will save the rest. Provost Flessel, stricken long since with the paleness of death, must descend from his seat to be judged at the Palais Royal, alas, to be shot dead by an unknown hand at the turning of the first street. O oh, evening sun of July, how at this hour thy beams fall slant on reapers amid peaceful woody fields, on old women spinning in cottages, on ships far out in the silent main, on balls at the orangery of Versailles, where high rouged dames of the palace are even now dancing with double-jacketed USA officers, and also on this warring hell porch of the Hotel de Ville, Babel Tower with the confusion of tongues, where not Bedlam added with the conflagration of thoughts, was no type of it. One forest of distracted steel bristles, endless, in front of an electoral committee, points itself, in horrid ready eye, against this and the other accused breast. It was the Titans warring with Olympus, and their scarcely crediting it, have conquered, prodigy of prodigies, delirious, as it could not but be. Denunciation, vengeance, blaze of triumph on the dark ground of terror, all outward, all inward things fallen into one general wreck of madness. Electoral committee had it a thousand throats of brass, it would not suffice. Abbe Lefebvre in the vault stand below is black as Vulcan, distributing that five thousand weight of powder with what perils these forty-eight hours. Last night, a patriot in liquor insisted on sitting to smoke on the edge of one of the powder barrels. There smoked he, independent of the world, till the abbe purchased his pipe for three francs and pitched it far. Elie in the grand hall, electoral committee looking on, sits with drawn sword bent in three places, with battered helm, for he was of the Queen's regiment, cavalry, with torn regimentals, face singed and soiled, comparable something to an antique warrior judging the people forming a list of basti heroes. O oh, friends, stain not with blood the greenest laurels ever gained in this world. Such is the burden of Elie's song, could it but be listened to. Courage, Elie, courage, ye municipal electors. A declining sun, the need of victuals and of telling news, will bring assuagement, dispersion, all earthly things must end. Along the streets of Paris circulate seven Bastille prisoners, borne shoulder high, seven heads on pikes, the keys of the Bastille, and much else. 
See also the Guard Française in their steadfast military way, marching home to their barracks, with the Invalides and Swiss kindly enclosed in Hollow Square. It is one year and two months since these same men stood unparticipating, with Brennus d'August at the Palais de Justice when fate overtook Despreminil. And now they have participated and will participate, not Guard Française henceforth, but Centre Grenadier of the National Guard men of iron discipline and humour, not without a kind of thought in them. Likewise, Ashlar's stones of the Bastille continue thundering through the dusk. Its paper archives shall fly white. Old secrets come to view, and long-buried despair finds voice. Read this portion of an old letter, dated à la Bastille, 7th of October, 1752. If for my consolation Monseigneur would grant me for the sake of God and the most blessed Trinity that I could have news of my dear wife, were it only her name on card to show that she is alive, it were the greatest consolation I could receive, and I should for ever bless the greatness of Monseigneur. Poor prisoner, who namest thyself, Quere Demery, and hast no other history. She is dead, that dear wife of thine, and thou art dead. Tis fifty years since thy breaking heart put this question, to be heard now first, and long heard, in the hearts of men. But so does the July twilight thicken, so must Paris, as sick children, and all distracted creatures do, roll itself finally into a kind of sleep. Municipal electors, astonished to find their heads still uppermost, are home. Only Moreau de Saint-Méry of tropical birth and heart, of coolest judgment, he with two others, shall sit permanent at the town hall. Paris sleeps, gleams upward the illuminated city, patrols go clashing without common watchword. There go rumours, alarms of war, to the extent of fifteen thousand men marching through the suburb Saint-Antoine, who never got it march through. Of the day's distraction, judged by this of the night, Moreau de Saint-Méry, before rising from his seat, gave upwards of three thousand orders. What a head, comparable to Friar Bacon's brass head. Within it lies old Paris. Prompt must the answer be, right or wrong, in Paris is no other authority extent. Seriously, a most cool, clear head, for which also, though all brave saint Mary, in many capacities, from August senator to merchant's clerk, book dealer, vice-king, in many places, from Virginia to Sardinia, shalt, ever as a brave man, find employment. Bézinval has decamped, under cloud of dusk, amid a great affluence of people, who did not harm him. He marches, with faint growing tread, down the left bank of the Seine, all night, towards infinite space. Resummoned shall Bézinval himself be, for trial, for difficult acquittal, his king's troops, his royal allemand, are gone hence for ever. The Versailles ball and lemonade is done. The orangerie is silent except for night birds. Over in the Salle des Menus, Vice President Lafayette, with unsnuffed lights, with some hundred of members stretched on tables round him, sits erect, out watching the bear. This day, a second solemn deputation went to His Majesty, a second and then a third, with no effect. What will the end of these things be? In the court, all is mystery, not without whisperings of terror. Though ye dream of lemonade and epaulette, ye foolish woman, his majesty, kept in happy ignorance, perhaps dreams of double barrels in the woods of Meudon. Late at night, the Duc de Lioncourt, having official right of entrance, gains access to the royal apartments, unfolds with earnest clearness, in his constitutional way, the job news. Me, said Paul Louis. C'est une révolte. Why, that is a revolt. Sire, answered Lyoncourt, it is not a revolt, it is a revolution. End of section 33。Section 34 of the French Revolution。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Allen. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 5, Chapter 8. Conquering Your King. On the morrow, a fourth deputation to the chateau is on foot, of a more solemn 
not to say awful character, for besides orgies in the orangery, it seems, the grain convoys are all stopped, nor has Mirabeau's thunder been silent. Such deputations is on the point of setting out, when, lo, his majesty himself, attended only by his two brothers, step in, quite in the paternal manner, announces that the troops and all causes of offense are gone, and henceforth there shall be nothing but trust, reconcilement, good will, whereof he permits and even requests a national assembly to assure Paris in his name. Acclamation, as of men suddenly delivered from death, gives answer. The whole assembly spontaneously rises to escort his majesty back, interlacing their arms to keep off the excessive pressure from him, for all Versailles is crowding and shouting. The chateau musicians, with a felicitous promptitude, strike up the sen de sa famille, bosom of one's family. The queen appears at the balcony with her little boy and girl, kissing them several times, infinite vivats, spread far and wide, and suddenly there has come, as it were, a new heaven on earth. Eighty-eight august senators, Bailey, Lafayette, and our repentant archbishop among them, take coach for Paris, with the great intelligence, benedictions without end on their heads, from the Bloc Louis Cons, where they alight, all the way to the Hôtel de Ville. It is one sea of tricolor cockades, of clear national muskets, one tempest of hazangs, hand clapping, aided by occasional rollings of drum music. Harangues of due fervor are delivered, especially by Lali Tawandal, highest son of the ill-fated murdered Lali, on whose head, in consequence, a civic crown of oak or parsley is forced, which he forcibly transfers to Bailey's. But surely, for one thing, the National Guard must have a general, Maru de Saint-Marie. He is of the three thousand orders, casts one of his significant glances on the bust of Lafayette, which has stood there ever since the American War of Liberty, whereupon, by acclamation, Lafayette is nominated. Again, in room of the slain traitor or quasi-traitor Placelle, President Bailey shall be provost of the merchants? No, mayor of Paris. So be it. Mayor de Paris. Mayor Bailey. General Lafayette. Vive Bailey. Vive Lafayette. The universal out-of-doors multitude rends the welkin in confirmation. And now, finally, let us to Notre Dame for a Tadam towards Notre Dame Cathedral, in glad procession, these regenerators of the country walk through a jubilant people in fraternal manner. Abe Lefebvre, still black with his gunpowder services, walking arm in arm with the white-stoled archbishop. Poor Bailey comes upon the foundling children, sets to kneel to him, and weeps. Today, our archbishop officiating, is not only sung, but shot with blank cartridges. Our joy is boundless, as our woe threatened to be. Paris, by her own pike and musket, and the valor of her own heart, has conquered the very war gods, to the satisfaction now of majesty itself. A courier is, this night, getting under way for Necker, the people's minister, invited back by king, by national assembly, and nation shall traverse France amid shoutings and the sound of trumpet and timbrel. Seeing which course of things, Messieurs of the Court Triumvirate, Messieurs of the Dead-Born Broigley Ministry, and others such, consider that their part also is clear, to mount and ride. Off, ye two loyal Broglies, Blignettes, and Princes of the Blood! Off while it is yet time! Did not the Palais Royal in its late nocturnal violent motions, set a specific price, place of payment not mentioned, on each of your heads, with precautions, with the aid of pieces of cannon and regiments that can be depended on, Majors, between the sixteenth night and the seventeenth morning, get to their several roads, men galloping at full speed, with a view, it is thought, to fling him into the river Oise, at Pont Saint Mayence. The Polignacs travel disguised, friends, not servants, on their coach box. 
Broglie has his own difficulties at Versailles, runs his own risks at Mentz and Verdun, does nevertheless get safe to Luxembourg, and there rests. This is what they call the first immigration, determined on, as appears, in full court conclave, his majesty assisting, prompt he, for his share of it, to follow any counsel whatsoever. Three sons of France, and four princes of the blood of St. Louis, says Weber, could not more effectually humble the burghers of Paris than by appearing to withdraw in fear of their life. Alas, the burghers of Paris bear it with unexpected stoicism. The man d'Artois, indeed, is gone, but has he carried, for example, the land d'Artois with him? Not even Bagatelle, the country house, which shall be useful as a tavern, hardly the four valet breeches, leaving the breeches maker. As for old Falloon, one learns that he is dead. At least a sumptuous funeral is going on, the undertakers honoring him, if no other will. Intendant Berthier, his son-in-law, is still living, lurking. He joined Bensonville on that Eumenides Sunday, appearing to treat it with levity, and is now fled no man knows whither. The emigration is not gone many miles. Prince Condé hardly across the Wies, when His Majesty, according to arrangement, for the immigration also thought it might do good, undertakes a rather daring enterprise, that of visiting Paris in person, with a hundred members of assembly, with small or no military escort, which indeed he dismissed at the bridge of Sebs. Poor Louis sets out, leaving a desolate palace, a queen weeping, the present, the past and the future, all so unfriendly for her. At the barrier of Passy, Mayor Bailey, in grand gala, presents him with the keys, harangues him in academic style, mentions that it is a great day, that in Henri Quatre's case, the king had to make conquest of his people, but in this happier case, the people makes conquest of its king, a conquis son roi, the king, so happily conquered, drives forward slowly through a steel people, all silent, or shouting only, Vive la nation, is harangued at the town hall by Moreau of the three thousand orders, by King's procurer, Major Ethes de Corny, by Lali Tolindal, and others. Knows not what to think of it, or say of it. Learns that he is the restorer of French liberty, as a statue of him, to be raised on the site of the Bastille, shall testify to all men. Finally, he is shown at the balcony, with a tricolor cockade in his hat, is greeted now with vehement acclamation from square and street, from all windows and roofs, and so drives home again, amid glad, mingled, and, as it were, intermarried shouts of Vive le Roy and Vive la Nation, wearied but safe. It was Sunday when the red-hot balls hung over us, in mid-air. It is now but Friday, and the revolution is sanctioned. An august National Assembly shall make the Constitution, and neither foreign pandor, domestic triumvirate, with leveled cannon, Guy Fawkes powder plots, for that too was spoken of, nor any tyrannic power on the earth, or under the earth, shall say to it, What dost thou? So jubilates the people, sure now of a constitution. Cracked Marquis saint Harouge is heard under the windows of the chateau, murmuring sheer speculative treason. End of section 34。section 35 of the French Revolution。this is a LibriVox recording。All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1. Book 5. Chapter 9. The Lantern. The fall of the Bastille may be said to have shaken all France to the deepest foundations of its existence. The rumor of these wonders flies everywhere with the natural spread of rumour, with an effect thought to be preternatural, produced by plots. Did D'Orléans 
or la clos nay did mirabeau not overburdened with money at this time send riding couriers out from paris to gallop on all radii or highways towards all points of france it is a miracle which no penetrating man will call in question already in most towns electoral committees were met to regret necker in harangue and resolution in many a town as ran caen lyon an ebullient people was already regretting him in brickbats and musketry but now at every town's end in france there do arrive in these days of terror men as men will arrive nay men on horseback since rumour oftenest travels riding these men declare with alarmed countenance the brigands to be coming to be just at hand and do then ride on about their further business be what it might whereupon the whole population of such town defensively flies to arms petition is soon thereafter forwarded to national assembly in such peril and terror of peril leave to organize yourself cannot be withheld the armed population becomes everywhere an enrolled national guard thus writes rumour careering along all radii from paris outwards to such purpose in few days some say in not many hours all france to the utmost borders bristles with bayonets singular but undeniable miraculous or not but thus may any chemical liquid though cool to the freezing point or far lower still continue liquid and then on the slightest stroke or shake it at once rushes wholly into ice thus has france for long months and even years been chemically dealt with brought below zero and now shaken by the fall of a bastille it instantaneously congeals into one crystallized mass of sharp cutting steel Chila tocca, where who touches it in paris an electoral committee with a new mayor and general is urgent with belligerent workmen to resume their handicrafts strong dames of the market dame de la halle deliver congratulatory harangues present bouquets to the shrine of saint genevieve unenrolled men deposit their arms not so readily as could be wished and receive nine francs with to dames royal visits and sanctioned revolution there's halcyon weather weather even of preternatural brightness the hurricane being overblown nevertheless as is natural the waves still run high hollow rocks retaining their murmur we are but at the twenty-second of the month hardly above a week since the bastille fell when it suddenly appears that old foulon is alive nay that he is here in early morning in the streets of paris the extortioner the plotter who would make the people eat grass and was a liar from the beginning it is even so the deceptive sumptuous funeral of some domestic that died the hiding-place at vitry towards fontainebleau have not availed that wretched old man some living domestic or dependent for none loves foulon has betrayed him to the village merciless boors of vitry unearth him pounce on him like hell-hounds westward old infamy to paris to be judged at hotel de ville his old head which seventy-four years have bleached is bare they have tied an emblematic bundle of grass on his back a garland of nettles and thistles is round his neck in this manner led with robes goaded on with curses and menaces must he with his old limbs sprawl forward the pitiablest most unpitied of all old men sooty saint antoine and every street mustering its crowds as he passes the place de greve the hall of the hotel de ville will scarcely hold his escort and him foulon must not only be judged righteously but judged there where he stands without any delay appoint seven judges ye municipals or seventy and seven name them yourselves or we will name them but judge him electoral rhetoric 
eloquence of Mayor Bailly is wasted explaining the beauty of the law's delay. Delay and still delay. Behold, O Mayor of the people, the morning has worn itself into noon, and he is still unjudged. Lafayette, pressingly sent for, arrives, gives voice. This Foulon, a known man, is guilty almost beyond doubt. But may he not have accomplices? Ought not the truth to be cunningly pumped out of him, in the Abai prison? It is a new light. Sansculottism claps hands. At which hand-clapping, Foulon, in his feigness, as his destiny would have it, also claps. See, they understand one another, cries dark sansculottism, blazing into fury of suspicion. Friends, said a person in good clothes, stepping forward, what is the use of judging this man? Has he not been judged these thirty years? With wild yells, sansculottism clutches him in its hundred hands. He is whirled across the Place de Grève to the lantern. Lamp iron, which there is at the corner of the Rue de la Vannerie, pleading bitterly for life to the deaf winds. Only with the third rope, for two ropes broke and the quavering voice still pleaded, can he be so much as got hanged. His body is dragged through the streets, his head goes aloft on a pike, the mouth filled with grass, amid sounds as of topfe from a grass eating people. Surely, if revenge is a kind of justice, it is a wild kind. O oh, mad sansculottism, hast thou risen in thy mad darkness, in thy suit and rags, unexpectedly like an enchilados, living buried from under his chinacria? They that would make grass be eaten do now eat grass in this manner. After long, dumb groaning generations, has the turn suddenly become thine? To such abysmal overturns and frightful and instantaneous inversions of the centre of gravity are human solecisms all liable, if they but knew it. The more liable, the falser and top-heavier they are. To add to the horror of Mayor Bailly and his municipals, word comes that Berthier has also been arrested, that he is on his way hither from Compiègne. Berthier, intendant, say, tax levier of Paris, sycophant and tyrant, forestaller of corn, contriver of camps against the people, accused of many things. Is he not Foulon's son-in-law, and, in that one point, guilty of all? In these hours, too, when sansculottism has its blood up, the shuddering municipals send one of their number to escort him with mounted national guards. At the fall of day, the wretched Berthier, still wearing a face of courage, arrives at the barrier, in an open carriage, with a municipal beside him, five hundred horsemen with drawn sabres, unarmed footmen enough, not without noise. Placards go brandished round him, bearing legibly his indictment, as sansculottism with unlegal brevity, in huge letters, draws it up. Il a vol le roi et la France. He robbed the king and France. He devoured the substance of the people. He was the slave of the rich and a tyrant of the poor. He drank the blood of the widow and orphan. He betrayed his country. Paris is come forth to meet him, with hand-clappings, with windows flung up, with dances, triumph songs, as of the furies. Lastly, the head of Foulon, this also meets him on a pike. Well might his look become glazed and sense fail him at such sight. Nevertheless, be the man's conscience what it may, his nerves are of iron. At the Hôtel de Ville he will answer nothing. He says he obeyed superior order. They have his papers. They may judge and determine. As for himself, not having closed an eye these two nights, he demands before all things to have sleep. Let him sleep. Thou miserable Berthier! Guards rise with him in motion towards the Abbaye. At the very door of the Hôtel de Ville they are clutched, flung asunder, as by a vortex of mad arms. Berthier whirls toward the lantern. He snatches a musket, fells and strikes, defending himself like a mad lion, is borne down, trampled, hanged, 
mangled. His head, too, and even his heart, flies over the city on a pike. Horrible in lands that had known equal justice. Not so unnatural in lands that had never known it. Le sang qui coule est-il donc si pur? asks Barnave, intimating that the gallows, though by irregular methods, has its own. Thou thyself, O reader, when thou turnest that corner of the Rue de la Vannerie, and discernest still that same grim bracket of old iron, will not want for reflections. Over a grocer's shop, or otherwise, with a bust of Louis the Fourteenth in the niche under it, or now no longer in the niche, it still sticks there, still holding out an ineffectual light of fish oil, and has seen worlds wrecked and says nothing. But to the eye of enlightened patriotism, what a thundercloud was this, suddenly shaping itself in the radiance of the Halkian weather, cloud of Erebus blackness, betokening latent electricity without limit. Mayor Bailly, General Lafayette, throw up their commissions in an indignant manner, need to be flattered back again. The cloud disappears as thunderclouds do. The Halkian weather returns, though of a greyer complexion, of a character more and more evidently not supernatural. Thus, in any case, with what rubs soever, shall the Bastille be abolished from our earth, and with it feudalism, despotism, and, one hopes, scoundrelism generally, and all hard usage of man by his brother man. Alas, the scoundrelism and hard usage are not so easy of abolition, but as for the Bastille, it sinks day after day and month after month, its ashlers and boulders tumbling down continually by express order of our municipals. Crowds of the curious roam through its caverns, gaze on the skeletons found walled up on the oubliettes, iron cages, monstrous stone blocks with padlocked chains. One day we discern Mirabeau there, along with the Genevese Dumont. Workers and onlookers make reverent way for him, fling verses, flowers on his path, Bastille papers and curiosities into his carriage, with vivats. Able editors compile books from the Bastille archives, from what of them remain unburned. The key of that robber den shall cross the Atlantic, shall lie on Washington's hall table. The great clock ticks now in a private, patriotic, clockmaker's apartment, no longer measuring hours of mere heaviness. Vanished is the Bastille, what we call vanished, the body or sandstones of it hanging in benign metamorphosis for centuries to come over the Seine waters, as Pont Louis says, the soul of it living, perhaps still longer, in the memories of man. So far, ye august senators, with your tennis court oaths, your inertia and impetus, your sagacity and pertinacity, have you brought us. And yet, think, messieurs, as the petitioner justly urged, you who were our saviors did yourselves need saviors. The brave Bastiers, namely, workmen of Paris, many of them in straitened pecuniary circumstances. Subscriptions are opened, lists are formed, more accurate than Eli's, harangues are delivered. A body of Bastille heroes, tolerably complete, did get together, comparable to the Argonauts, hoping to endure like them. But in little more than a year, the whirlpool of things threw them asunder again, and they sank. So many highest superlatives achieved by man are followed by new higher, and dwindle into comparatives and positives. The siege of the Bastille weighed with which, in the historical balance, most other sieges, including that of Troy Town, are gossamer, cost, as we find, in killed and mortally wounded, on the part of the besiegers, some eighty-three persons. On the part of the besieged, after all that straw-burning, fire-pumping, and deluge of musketry, one poor solitary invalid shot stone dead, what more, on the battlements. The Bastille fortress, like the city of Jericho, was overturned by miraculous sound. End of section 35
Section 36 of the French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Church. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 6, Chapter 1. Make the Constitution. Here, perhaps, is the place to fix a little more precisely what these two words, French Revolution, shall mean. For, strictly considered, they may have as many meanings as there are speakers of them. All things are in revolution, in change from moment to moment, which becomes sensible from epoch to epoch. In this time world of ours, there's properly nothing else but revolution and mutation, and even nothing else conceivable. Revolution, you answer, means speedier change, whereupon one still has to ask how speedy, at what degree of speed, and what particular points of this variable course which varies in velocity but can never stop till time itself stops, does revolution begin and end, cease to be ordinary mutation, and again become such. It is a thing that will depend on definition more or less arbitrary. For ourselves, we answer that French Revolution means here the open, violent rebellion and victory of disimprisoned anarchy against corrupt, worn-out authority. How anarchy breaks prison, bursts up from the infinite deep, and rages uncontrollable, immeasurable, enveloping a world, and faces after faces of fever frenzy, till the frenzy burning itself out, and what elements of new order it held developing themselves, the uncontrollable begot, if not imprisoned, yet harnessed, and its mad forces made to work towards their object, the sane, regulated ones. For as hierarchies and dynasties of all kinds, theocracies, aristocracies, autocracies, strumpetocracies, have ruled over the world, so it was appointed, in the decrees of providence, that the same victorious anarchy, Jacobinism, Sanculottism, French Revolution, horrors of the French Revolution, or whatever else mortals name it, should have its turn. The destructive wrath of Sanculottism, this is what we speak, having unhappily no voice for singing. Surely a great phenomenon. Nay, it is a transcendental one, overstepping all rules and experience, the crowning phenomenon of our modern time. For here again, most unexpectedly, comes antique fanaticism in new and newest vesture, miraculous as all fanaticism is. Call it the fanaticism of making away with formulas. De humer les formulas, the world of formulas, the formed, regulated world, which all habitable world is, must needs hate such fanaticism like death, and be at deadly variance with it. The world of formulas must conquer it, or failing that, must die execrating it, anathematizing it, can nevertheless in no wise prevent its being and having been. The anathemas are there, and the miraculous thing is there. Whence it cometh, whither it goeth, these are questions. When the age of miracles lay faded into the distance as an incredible tradition, and even the age of conventionalities was old, and man's existence had gone long for long generations rested on mere formulas which were grown hollow, of course, by time, and it seemed as if no reality any longer existed but only phantasms of realities, and God's universe were the work of the tailor and upholsterer mainly, and men were buckram masks that went about beckoning and grimacing there, on a sudden the earth yawns asunder, and amid Tartarian smoke, and then glare of fierce brightness, rises sans many-headed fire-breathing, and asks, What think ye of me? Well may the buckram masks start together, terror-struck, into expressive, well-concerted groups. It is indeed, friends, most singular, most fatal thing. Let whoever is but buckram in a phantasm look it to it. Ill verily may it fare with him, here methinks he cannot much longer be. Woe also to many a one who is not wholly buckram, but partially real and human. 
the age of miracles has come back. Behold the world phoenix and fire consummation and fire creation. Wide are her fanning wings. Loud is her death melody of battle thunders and falling towns. Skyward lashes the funeral flame enveloping all things. It is the death birth of a world. Whereby, however, as we often say, shall one unspeakable bliss seem attainable. This, namely, that man and his life rest no more on hollowness and a life, but on solidity and some kind of truth. Welcome the beggarliest truth, so it be one in exchange for the royalist sham. Truth of any kind breeds ever new and better truth. Thus hard granite rock will crumble down into soil under the blessed skyey influences and cover itself with verdure, with fruitage and umbrage. But as for falsehood, which is like contrary manner, grows ever falser, what can it, or what should it do but decrease, being ripe, decompose itself, gently or even violently, and return to the father of it, too probably in flames of fire? Sanculotism will burn much, but what is incombustible it will not burn. Fear not, Sanculotism. Recognize it for what it is, the portentous, inevitable end of much, the miraculous beginning of much. One other thing thou mayest understand of it, that it too came from God. For has it not been? From of old, as it is written, are his goings forth in the great deep of things, fearful and wonderful now as in the beginning. In the whirlwind also he speaks and the wrath of men is made to praise him. But to gauge and measure this immeasurable thing, and what is called account for it, and reduce it to a death-logic formula, attempt not, much less shall thou shriek thyself hoarse, cursing it. For that, to all needful things, has been already done. As an actually existing son of time, look with unspeakable manifold interest, oftenest in silence at what the time did bring, therewith edify, instruct, nourish thyself, or were it but to amuse and gratify thyself, as it is given thee. Another question which at every new turn will rise on us, requiring ever new reply, is this. Where the French Revolution specifically is? in the king's palace, in his majesty or her majesty's managements and maltreatments, cabals, imbecilities, and woes, answer some few, whom we do not answer. In the National Assembly, answer a large, mixed multitude, who accordingly seat themselves in the reporter's chair, and therefrom noting what proclamations, acts, reports, passages of logic fence, bursts of parliamentary eloquence seem notable within doors, and what tumults and rumors of tumult become audible from without, produce volume on volume, and naming it History of the French Revolution, contentedly publish the same. To do the like, to almost any extent, with so many filed newspapers, choix de rapport, Histoire parlementaire as they are, amounting to many horse loads, were easy for us. Easy but unprofitable. The National Assembly, named now Constituent Assembly, goes its course, making the Constitution. But the French Revolution also goes its course. In general, may we not say that the French Revolution lies in the heart and head of every violent speaking, of every violent thinking Frenchman, how the twenty-five millions of such, in their perplexed combination, acting and counteracting, may give birth to events, which events successively is the cardinal one, and from what point of vision it may best be surveyed, this is the problem. Which problem the best insight, seeking light from all possible sources, shifting its point of vision whithersoever vision or glimpse of vision can be had, may employ itself in solving. 
and be well content to solve it in some tolerably approximate way. As to the National Assembly, in so far as it still towers eminent over France, after the manner of a car-borne carocchio, though now no longer in the van, and rings signals for retreat or for advance, it is and continues a reality among other realities. But in so far as it sits making the Constitution, on the other hand, it is a fatuity and chimera mainly. Alas, in the never-so-heroic building of Montesquieu Mably card castles, though shouted over by the world, what interest is there? Occupied in that way, an august national assembly becomes for us little other than a Sanhedrin of pedants, not of the gerund grinding, yet of no fruitful or sort. And its loud debatings and recriminations about the rights of man, rights of peace and war, veto suspensif, veto absolute. And what are they but so many pedants' curses? May God confound you for your theory of irregular verbs. A constitution can be built. Constitutions enough, a la Sies. But the frightful difficulty is that of getting men to come and live in them. Could Sies have drawn thunder and lightning out of heaven to sanction his constitution? It had been well, but without any thunder? Nay, strictly considered, is it not still true that without some such celestial sanction, given visibly in thunder or invisibly otherwise, no constitution can in the long run be worth much more than the waste paper it is written on? constitution, the set of laws, or the prescribed habits of acting that men will live under is the one which images their convictions, their faith as it's to this wondrous universe and what rights, duties, capabilities they have there, which stands sanctioned, therefore, by necessity itself, if not by a seen deity, then by an unseen one. Other laws, whereof there are always enough ready-made or usurpations, which men do not obey, but rebel against and abolish by their earliest convenience. The question of questions accordingly were, who is it that especially for rebellers and abolishers can make a constitution? He that can image forth the general belief when there is one, that can impart one when, as here, there is none? A most rare man, ever as of old a god mission van. Here, however, in defect of such transcendent supreme man, time with its infinite succession of merely superior men, each yielding his little contribution, does much. Force likewise will all along find somewhat to do, and thus in perpetual abolition and reparation, rending and mending, with struggle and strife, with present evil and the hope an effort towards future good, must the Constitution, as all human things do, build itself forward, or unbuild itself, sink as it can and may, O C S, and ye other com committee men, and twelve hundred miscellaneous individuals from all parts of France. What is the belief of France, and yours, if ye knew it, properly, that there shall be no belief, that all formulas be swallowed, a constitution which will suit that? Alas, too clearly a no constitution, an anarchy, which also in due season shall be vouchsafed you. But after all, what can un an unfortunate National Assembly do? Consider only this, that there are twelve hundred miscellaneous individuals, not a unit of whom but has his own thinking apparatus, his own speaking apparatus. In every unit of them is some belief and wish different for each, both that France should be regenerated and also that he individually should do it. Twelve hundred separate forces, yoked miscellaneously to any object, miscellaneously to all sides of it, and bid pull for life. Or is it the nature of national assemblies generally to do, with endless labor and clangor, nothing? Or representative governments, mostly at bottom, tyrannies too? Shall we say, 
the tyrants, the ambitious, contentious persons from all corners of the country do in this manner get gathered into one place, and there, with motion and counter-motion, with jargon and hubbub, cancel one another, like the fabulous Kilkenny cats, and produce, for net result, zero. The country, meanwhile, governing or guiding itself by such wisdom, recognized or for the most part unrecognized, as may exist in individual heads here and there. Nay, even that were a great improvement. For of old, with the, their gulf factions and ghibelline factions, with the red roses and white roses, they were wont to cancel the whole country as well. Besides, they do it now in a much narrower cockpit, within the four walls of their assembly house, and here and there an outpost of hustings and barrelheads. Do it with tongues, too, not with swords, all of which improvements in the art of producing zero. Are they not great? Nay, best of all, some happy continents can do without governing. What sphinx questions, which the distracted world in these very generations must answer or die. End of section 36. Recording by Jeffrey Church. Section 37 of the French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Church. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 6, Chapter 2. The Constituent Assembly. One thing an elected assembly of 1200 is fit for, destroying, which indeed is but a more decided exercise of its natural talent for doing nothing. Do nothing, only keep agitating, debating, and things will destroy themselves. So, and not otherwise, proved it with the august National Assembly. It took the name Constituent as if its mission and function had been to construct or build, which also, with its whole soul, it endeavored to do. Yet, in the fates, in the nature of things, there lay for it precisely of all the functions the most opposite of that. Singular, what gospels men will believe, even gospels according to Jean-Jacques. It was the fixed faith of those national deputies, as if of all thinking Frenchmen, that the Constitution could be made, that they, there and then, were called to make it. How, with the toughness of old Hebrews or Ishmaelite Muslim, did the otherwise light unbelieving people persist in this their credo, quia impossibile, and front the armed world with it, and grow fanatic? and even heroic, and do exploits by it. The Constituent Assembly's Constitution, and several others, will, being printed and not manuscript, survive to future generations as an instructive, well-nigh incredible document of the time. The most significant picture of the then-existing France, or, at its lowest, picture of these men's picture of it. But in truth and seriousness, what could the National Assembly have done? The thing to be done was, actually, as they say, to regenerate France, to abolish the old France, and make a new one, quietly or forcibly, by concession or by violence. This, by the law of nature, has become inevitable. With what degree of violence depends on the wisdom of those that preside over it? With perfect wisdom on the part of the National Assembly, it had all been otherwise. But whether in any wise it could have been pacific, nay, other than bloody and convulsive, may still be a question. Grant, meanwhile, that this Constituent Assembly does to the last continue to be something. With a sigh, it sees itself incessantly forced away from its infinite divine task of perfecting the theory of irregular verbs to finite terrestrial tasks, which latter have still significance for us. It is the cynosure of revolutionary France, this National Assembly. All work of government has fallen into its hands, 
or under its control, all men look to it for guidance. In the middle of that huge revolt of 25 millions, it hovers always aloft as Carroccio or battle standard, impelling and impelled in the most confused way. If it cannot give much guidance, it will still seem to give some. It emits pacificatory proclamations, not a few, with more or less result. It authorizes the enrollment of National Guards, lest brigands come to devour us and reap the unripe crops. It sends missions to quell effervescences, to deliver men for the lantern. It can listen to congratulatory addresses, which arrive daily by the sackful. Mostly in King Cambus's vein, also to petitions and complaints from all mortals, so that every mortal's complaint, if it cannot get redressed, may at least hear itself complain. For the rest, an august National Assembly can produce parliamentary eloquence and appoint committees, committees of the Constitution, of reports, of researches, and of much else, which again yield mountains of print, printed paper. The theme of new parliamentary eloquence in bursts, nor in plenteous, smooth flowing floods. And so from the waste vortex whereon all things go whirling and grinding, organic laws, or the similitude of such, slowly emerge. With endless debating, we get the rights of man written down and promulgated, true paper basis of all paper constitutions. Neglecting cry the opponents to declare the duties of man. Forgetting, answer we, to ascertain the mights of man, one of the fatalist admissions. Nay, sometimes, as on the 4th of August, our National Assembly, fired suddenly by an almost preternatural enthusiasm, will get through the whole masses of work in one night. A memorable night, this 4th of August, dignitaries temporal and spiritual, Peers, archbishops, parlement, presidents, each outdoing the other in patriotic devotedness, come successfully to throw their untenable possessions on the altar of the fatherland. With louder and la louder vivant, for indeed it is after dinner too, they abolish tithes, seigneurial dues, gabelle, excessive preservation of game, nay privilege, immunity, feudalism, root and branch, then appoint a te diem for it, and so finally disperse about three in the morning, striking the stars with their sublime heads. Such night, unforeseen but forever memorable, was this of the 4th of August, 1789. Miraculous or semi-miraculous, some seem to think of it. A new night of Pentecost, shall we say, shaped according to the new time, the new church of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. It has its causes, now also its effects. In such manner labored the national deputies, perfecting their theory of irregular verbs, governing France and being governed by it, with toil and noise, cutting asunder ancient intolerable bonds, and for new ones assiduously spinning ropes of sand, were their labors a nothing or a something, and yet the eyes of all France being reverently fixed on them, history can never very long leave them altogether out of sight. For the present, if we glance into that assembly hall of theirs, it will be found, as is natural, most irregular. As many as a hundred members are on their feet at once. No rule in making motions, or only commencements of a rule. Spectators gallery allowed to applaud or even to hiss. President, Appointed once a fortnight, raising many times no serene head ab above the waves. Nevertheless, as in all human assemblages, like does begin arranging itself to like, the perennial rule, ubi homines sunt modi sunt, proves valid. Rudiments of methods disclose themselves, rudiments of parties. There is a right side, côte droit, a left side, côte gauche, sitting on Monsieur le Président's right hand or on his left, the Côte d'Ivoire conservative, the Côte Gauche destructive. 
Intermediate is Anglomaniac constitutionalism, or two-chamber royalism, with its Meunier, its Lallies, fast verging towards non-entity. Preeminent on the right side, pleads and perorates Casales, dragoon captain, eloquent, mildly fervent, earning for himself the shadow of a name. There are also blusters Barrel Mirabeau, the younger Mirabeau, not without wit. Dusky Despreminiel does nothing but sniff and ejaculate. Might, it is fondly thought, lay prostrate the elder Mirabeau himself, would he but try, which he does not. Last and greatest see for the moment the Abbe Maury, with his Jesuitic eyes, his impassive brass face, image of all the cardinal sins. Indomitable, unquenchable, he fights Jesuitico rhetorically, with toughest lungs and heart, for throne, especially for altar and tithes, so that a shrill voice exclaims once from the gallery, Monsieur of the clergy, you have to be shaved. If you wriggle too much, you will get cut. The left side is also called the Dorléans side, and sometimes derisively the Palais Royal. And yet so confused, real imaginary seems everything. It is doubtful, as Mirabeau said, whether Dorléans himself belongs to that same Dorléans party. What can be known and seen is that his moon visage does beam forth from that point of space. There likewise sits sea green Robespierre, throwing in his light weight, with decision, not yet with effect. A thin, lean Puritan, Priscian, he would make away with formulas, yet lives, moves, and has his being, wholly in formulas of another sort. People, such according to Robespierre, ought to be the royal method of promulgating laws. People, this is, this is the law I have framed for thee. Dost thou accept it? Answered from the right side from center and left, by inextinguishable laughter. Yet men of insight discern that the sea green may by chance go far. This man, observes Mirobo, will do somewhat. He believes every word he says. Abbe Sihez is busy with mere constitutional work, wherein, unluckily, fellow workmen are less pitiable than with one who has completed the science of polity. They ought to be. Courage, Siez, nonetheless. Some twenty months of heroic travail, of contradiction from the stupid, and the constitution shall be built. The top stone of it brought out with shouting. Say rather, the top paper, for it is all paper. And thou hast done in it what the earth or the heaven could require, thy utmost. Note likewise this trio, memorable for several things. Memorable were it only that their history is written in an epigram. Whatsoever these three have in hand, it is said, Duport thinks it, Barnave speaks it, Lameth does it. But Royal Mirabeau, conspicuous among all parties, raised above and beyond them all, this man rises more and more. As we often say, he has an eye, he is a reality while others are formulas and eyeglasses. In the transient, he will detect the perennial, find some firm footing even among paper vortexes. His fame has gone forth to all lands. It gladdened the heart of the crabbed old friend of man himself before he died. The very postillion of inns have heard of Mirabeau. When an impatient traveler complains that the team is insufficient, his postillion answers, Yes, monsieur, the wheelers are weak, but my Mirabeau, mean horse, you see, is a right one. Mais mon Mirabeau is excellent. And now, reader, thou shalt quit this noisy discrepancy of a national assembly. Not, if thou be of humane mind, without pity. Twelve hundred brother men are there, in the center of twenty-five millions fighting so fiercely with fate and with one another, struggling their lives out, as most sons of Adam do, for that which profiteth not. Nay, on the whole, it is admitted further to be very dull. Dull is this day's assembly, said someone. Why date? Pourquoi déter? 
answered Mihobo. Consider that they are twelve hundred, that they not only speak, but read their speeches, and even borrow and steal speeches to read. With twelve hundred fluent speakers, and their Noah's deluge of vociferous commonplace unattainable silence may well seem the one blessing of life. But figure twelve hundred pamphleteers droning forth perpetual pamphlets, and no man to gag them. Neither, as in the American Congress, do the arrangements seem perfect. A senator has not his own desk and newspaper here, of tobacco, much less of pipes. There is not the slightest provision. Conversation itself must be transacted in a low tone, with continual interruption. Only pencil notes circulate freely, in incredible numbers to the foot of the very tribune. Such work is it, regenerating a nation, perfecting one's theory of irregular verbs. End of section 37. Recording by Jeffrey Church. Section 38 of the French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Geoffrey Church. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 6, Chapter 3. The General Overturn. Of the King's Court, for the present, there is almost nothing whatsoever to be said. Silent, deserted are these halls. Royalty languishes, forsaken of its war god and all its hopes, till once the Ouy de Bouf rally again. The scepter is departed from King Louis, is gone over to the Salle de Menu, to the Paris town hall, or one knows not whither. In the July days, while all ears were yet deafened by the crash of the Bastille, and ministers and princes were scattered to the four winds, it seemed as if the very valet had grown heavy of hearing. Bissenval, also in flight towards infinite space, but hovering a little at Versailles, was addressing his majesty personally for an order about post-horses, when, lo, the valet in waiting places himself familiarly between his majesty and me, stretching out his rascal neck to learn what it was. His majesty in sudden collar whirled around, made a clutch of the tongues. I gently prevented him. He grasped my hand in thankfulness, and I noticed tears in his eyes. Poor king! The French kings also are men. Louis XIV himself once clutched the tongs, and even smote with them. But then it was at Louvois, and Dame Maintenon ran up. The queen sits weeping in her inner apartments, surrounded by weak women. She is at the height of unpopularity, universally regarded as the evil genius of France. Her friends and familiar counselors have all fled, and fled surely on the foolishest other errand. The Chateau Polignac still frowns aloft on its bold and enormous cubicle rock, amid the blooming champagnes, amid the blue girdling mountains of Auvergne. But no Duke and Duchess Polignac look forth from it. They have fled. They have met Necker at Bâle, and they shall not return. That France should see her nobles resist the irresistible, inevitable, with the face of angry men, was unhappy, not unexpected. But with the face and sense of pettish children, this was her peculiarity. They understood nothing, would understand nothing. Does not at this hour a new Polignac, first born of these two, sit reflective in the ha castle of Ham, in an astonishment he will never recover from, the most confused of existing mortals? King Louis has his new ministry, mere popularities, old President Pompignan, Necker, come back in triumph, and other such. 
But what will it avail him? As was said, the scepter, all but the wooden gilt scepter, has departed elsewhither. Volition, determination is not in this man. Only innocence, indolence, dependence on all persons but himself, on all circumstances but the circumstances he were lord of. So troublous internally is our Versailles and its work. Beautiful, if seen from afar, resplendent like a sun. See near at hand a mere sun's atmosphere, hiding darkness, confused ferment of ruin. But over France there goes on the indisputablest destruction of formulas, transactions of realities that follow therefrom. So many millions of persons all jived and nigh strangled with formulas, whose life nevertheless, at least the digestion and hunger of it, was real enough. Heaven has at length sent an abundant harvest, but what profits it, the poor man, when earth with her formulas interposes? Industry, in these times of inner insurrection, must needs lie dormant, Capital, as usual, not circulating, but stagnating timorously in nooks. The poor man is short of work, is therefore short of money. Nay, even had he money, bread is not to be bought for it. Were it plotting of aristocrats, plotting of Dorlian, were it brigands, preternatural terror, and the clang of Phoebus Apollo's silver bow, enough. The markets are scarce of grain, plentiful only in tumult. Farmers seem lazy to thresh, being either bribed or needing no bribe, with prices ever rising, with perhaps rent itself no longer pressing. Neither what is singular do municipal enactments, that along with so many measures of wheat you shall set so many of rye, and other the like, much mend the matter. Dragoons with drawn swords stand ranked among the corn sacks, often more dragoons than sacks. Meal mobs abound, growing into mobs of a still darker quality. Starvation has been known among the French commonality before this. Known and familiar. Did we not see them in the year 1775 presenting in sallow faces, in wretchedness and raggedness, their petition of grievances, and, for answer, getting a brand new gallows forty feet high? Hunger and darkness through long years. For look back on that earlier Paris riot, where a great personage, worn out by debauchery, was believed to be in want of bloodbaths, and mothers in worn raiment, yet with living hearts under it, filled the public places with their wild Rachel cries, stilled also by the gallows. Twenty years ago, the friend of men described Limousin peasants as wearing a pain-stricken look, a look past complaint, as if the oppression of the great were like the hail and the thunder, a thing irredeemable the ordinance of nature. And now, if in some great hour the shock of a falling Bastille should awaken you, and it were found to be the ordinance of art merely the remediable, reversible? Or has the reader forgotten that the flood of savages, which in sight of the same friend of men, descended from the mountains of Mount Dor? Lank-haired, haggard faces, shapes raw-boned and high sabots, in woolen jupes with leather girdles studded with copper nails. They rocked from foot to foot, and beat time with their elbows, too, as the quarrel and battle which was not long in the beginning went on, shouting fiercely, the lank faces distorted in the similitude of a cruel laugh. For they were darkened and hardened, Long had they been the prey of excisemen and taxmen, of clerks with the cold spurt of their pen. It was the fixed prophecy of our old Marquis, which no man would listen to, that such government by blind man's buff, stumbling along too far, would end by the general overturn, the colbut général. No man would listen. Each went his thoughtless way and time and destiny also traveled on. 
the government by blind man's buff, stumbling along, had reached the precipice inevitable for it. Dull drudgery, driven on by clerks with the cold, dastard spurt of their pen, has been driven into a communion of drudges. For now, moreover, there have come the strangest confused tidings by Paris journals with their paper wings, or still more portentous, where no journals are, by rumor and conjecture. Oppression not inevitable, a Bastille prostrate, and the Constitution fast getting ready. Which Constitution, if it be something and not nothing, what can it be but bread to eat? The traveler, walking uphill, bridle in hand, overtakes a poor woman. The image, as such commonly are, are dr of drudgery and scarcity, looking sixty years of age, though she is not yet twenty-eight. They have seven children, her poor drudge and she, a farm with only one cow, which helps to make the children's soup, also one little horse or garron. They have rents and quit rents, hens to pay to this seigneur, oat sacks to that, king's taxes, statute labor, church taxes, taxes enough, and think the times inexpressible. She has heard that somewhere, in some manner, something is to be done for the poor. God send it soon, for the dues and taxes crush us down. Fair prophecies are spoken, but they are not fulfilled. There have been notables, assemblages, turnings out and comings in, intriguing and maneuvering, parliamentary eloquence and arguing, Greek meeting Greek in high places has long gone on. Yet still bread comes not. The harvest is reaped and garnered, yet still we have no bread. Urged by despair and by hope, what can drudgery do but rise as predicted and produce the general overturn? Fancy then some five full-grown millions of such gaunt figures with their haggard faces in woolen jupes with copper-studded leather girths and high sabots, starting up to ask as if in forest roarings their washed upper classes after long unreviewed centuries Virtually this question. How have ye treated us? How have ye taught us, fed us, and led us while we toiled for you? The answer can be read in flames over this nightly summer sky. This is the feeding and leading we have of you. Emptiness. Of pocket, of stomach, of head, and of heart. Behold, there is nothing in us, nothing but what nature gives her wild children of the desert, ferocity and appetite, strength grounded on hunger. Did ye mark among your rights of man that man was not to die of starvation while there was bread reaped by him? It is among the mites of man. Seventy-two chateaus have flamed aloft in the Maconnais and Beaujolais alone. This seems the center of the conflagration. But it has spread over Dauphine, Alsace, the Lyonnais. The whole southeast is in blaze. All over the north, from Rouen to Metz, disorder is abroad. Smugglers of salt go openly in armed bands. The barriers of towns are burnt. Toll gatherers, tax gatherers, official persons put to flight. It was thought, says Young, the people from hunger would revolt, and we see they have done it. Desperate lackalls, long prowling, aimless, now finding hope and desperation itself, everywhere form a nucleus. They ring the church bell by way of toxin, and the parish turns out to the work. Ferocity, atrocity, hunger, and revenge, such work as we can imagine. Ill stands it now with the seigneur, who, for example, has walled up the only fountain of the township, who has ridden high on his ch chatier and parchments, who has preserved gain not wisely but too well. Churches also and canonry are sacked without mercy, which have shorn the flock too close for getting defeated. Woe to the land over which saint culottism in its day of vengeance, tramps roughshod, shod in the sabbats, 
high-bred seniors with their delicate women and little ones, had to fly half-naked under clouds of night, glad to escape the flames and even worse. You meet them at the table d'hôte of inns, making wise reflections or foolish that rank is destroyed, uncertain whither they would now they shall now wend. The mater will find it convenient to be slack in paying rent. As for the tax-gatherer, he long hunting as a biped of prey may now get hunted as one. His Majesty's exchequer will not fill up the deficit this season. It is the notion of many that a patriot majesty being the restorer of French liberty has abolished most taxes, though for their private ends some men make a secret of it. Where will this end? In the abyss, one may prophesy, whither all delusions are, at all moments traveling, where this delusion has now arrived. For if there be a faith from of old, it is this, as we often repeat, that no lie can live forever. The very truth has to change its vesture from time to time and can be born again. But all lies have sentence of death written down against them and heaven's chancery itself, and slowly or fast advanced incessantly towards their hour. The sign of a grand seigneur being landlord, says the vehement plain-spoken Arthur Young, our wastes, lands, deserts, ling, go to his residence. You will find it in the middle of the forest, peopled with deer, wild boars, and wolves. The fields are scenes of pitiable management, as the houses are of misery. To see so many millions of hands that would be industrious, all idle and starving. Oh, if I were a legislator of France for one day, I would make these great lords skip again. Oh, Arthur, thou, ha thou now actually beholdest them skip. Wilt thou grow to grumble at that too? For long years and generations it lasted, but the time came. Feather brain whom no reasoning and no pleading could touch, the glare of the firebrand had to illuminate. There remained but that method. Consider it, look at it. The widow is gathering nettles for her children's dinner, a perfumed seigneur, delicately lounging at the oeil de boeuf, as an alchemy whereby he will extract from her the third nettle and name it rent and law. Such an arrangement must end. Ought it? But, almost oh, fearful is such an ending, let those to whom God and his great mercy has granted time and space prepare another and milder one. To women it is a matter of wonder that the seigneurs did not do something to help themselves, say, combine and arm, for there were a hundred and fifty thousand of them, all violent enough. Unhappily, a hundred and fifty thousand scattered over wide provinces divided by mutual ill will, cannot combine. The highest seigneurs, as we have seen, had already emigrated, with a view of putting France to the blush. Neither are arms now the peculiar property of seigneurs, but of every mortal who has ten shillings wherewith to buy a second-hand firelock. Besides, those starving peasants, after all, have not four feet and claws, that you could keep them down permanently in that manner. They are not even of black color. They are mere unwashed seigneurs, and a seigneur, too, has human bowels. The seigneurs did what they could, enrolled in national guards, fled with shrieks, complaining to heaven and earth. One seigneur, famed Meme of Quince, Quincy, near Vesoul, invited all the rustics of his neighborhood to a banquet blew up his chateau and them with gunpowder, and instantaneously vanished, no man yet knows whither. Some half-dozen years back he came back and demonstrated that it was by accident. Nor are the authorities idle, though unluckily all authorities, municipalities and such like, are in the uncertain transitionary state getting regenerated from old monarchic to new democratic. No official yet knows clearly what he is. Nevertheless, mayors old or new to gather machachoses, national guards, troops of the line, justice, 
of the most summary sort is not wanting. The Electoral Committee of Macon, though but a committee, goes the length of hanging, for its own behoof, as many as twenty. The Prevot Dauphine traverses the country with a movable column, with tip staves, gallow ropes, for gallows any tree will serve and suspend its culprit, or thirteen culprits. Unhappy country! How is the fair golden green of the ripe bright year defaced with horrid blackness? Black ashes of chateaus, black bodies of gibbeted men. Industry has ceased in it, not sounds of the hammer and saw, but of toxin and alarm drum. The scepter has departed, whither one knows not, breaking itself in pieces, here impotent, there tyrannous. National guards are unskillful and of doubtful purpose. Soldiers are inclined to mutiny. There is danger that they too may quarrel, danger that they may agree. Strasbourg has seen riots, a town hall torn to shreds, its archives scattered white on the winds. Drunk soldiers embracing drunk citizens for three days, and Mayor Dietrich and Marshal Rochambeau reduced nigh to desperation. Through the middle of all which phenomena is seen on his triumphant transit, escorted through Belfort, for instance, by fifty national horsemen and all military music of the place, Monsieur Necker, returning from Bale, glorious as the meridian, though poor Necker himself partly guesses whither it is leading. One highest culminating day at the Paris town hall with immortal vivants, with wife and daughter kneeling publicly to kiss his hand, with Bessenval's pardon granted, but indeed revoked before sunset. One highest day, but then lower days, and even lower, down even to lowest. Such magic is in a name, and in the want of a name, like some enchanted Mambrino's helmet, essential to victory, comes the savior of France, beshouted, besymboled by the world. Alas, so soon to be disenchanted, to be pitched shamefully over the lists as a barber's basin. Gibbon could wish to show him to any man of solidity, who were minded to have the soul burnt out of him, and become a caput mortuum, by ambition, unsuccessful or successful. Another small facet we add, and no more. How, in the autumn months, our sharp-tempered Arthur has been pestered for some days past by shot, lead drops, and slugs, rattling five or six times into my chaise and about my ears, all the mob of the country gone out to kill game. It is even so. On the cliffs of Dover, over all the marches of France, there appear this autumn two signs on the earth, emigrant flights of French seigneurs, emigrant winged flights of French game. Finished, one may say, or as good as finished, is the preservation of game on this earth, completed for endless time. What part it had to play in the history of civilization is played plaudite, exiat. In this manner does Saint-Culottism blaze up, illustrating many things, producing among the rest, as we saw on the 4th of August, that semi-miraculous night of Pentecost in the National Assembly, semi-miraculous, which had its causes and its effects. Feudalism is struck dead, not on parchment only, not and by ink, but in very fact, by fire, say, by self-combustion. This conflagration of the southeast will abate, will be got scattered to the west, or else whither. Extinguish it will not, till the fuel be all done. End of section 38. Recording by Jeffrey Church. Section 39 of The French Revolution, Volume 1, by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Wayman. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 6, Chapter 4. 
in Q. If we look now at Paris, one thing is too evident, that the baker's shops have got their queues, or tails, their long strings of purchasers arranged in tails, so that the first come be the first served, were the shop once open. This waiting in tail, not seen since the early days of July, again makes its appearance in August. In time we shall see it perfected by practice to the rank almost of an art, and the art or quasi-art of standing in tail become one of the characteristics of the Parisian people, distinguishing them from all other peoples whatsoever. But consider, while work itself is so scarce, how a man must not only realize money, but stand waiting, if his wife is too weak to wait and struggle, for half days in the tail, till he get it changed for dear bad bread. Controversies to the length sometimes of blood and battery must arise in these exasperated queues. Or if no controversy, then it is but one accordant pange lingua of complaint against the powers that be. France has begun her long curriculum of hungering, instructive and productive beyond academic curriculums, which extends over some seven most strenuous years. As Jean-Paul says of his own life, to a great height shall the business of hungering go. Or consider, in strange contrast, the jubilee ceremonies, for in general the aspect of Paris presents these two features, jubilee ceremonials and scarcity of victual. Processions enough walk in jubilee, of young women decked and dizened, their ribbons all tricolor, moving with song and tabor to the shrine of Sainte Genevieve, to thank her that the Bastille is down. The strong men of the market and the strong women fail not with their bouquets and speeches. Abbe Fauché, famed in such work, for Abbe Lefebvre could only distribute powder, blesses tricolor cloth for the National Guard, and makes it a national tricolor flag, victorious or to be victorious in the cause of civil and religious liberty all over the world. Fauché, we say, is the man for te deums and public consecrations, to which, as in this instance of the flag, our National Guard will reply with volleys of musketry, church and cathedral though it be. Filling Notre Dame with such noisiest fuliginous amen, significant of several things. On the whole, we will say our new Mayor Bailly, our new Commander Lafayette, named also Scipio Americanus, have bought their preferment dear. Bailly rides in gilt state coach with beef eaters and sumptuosity. Camille Desmoulins and others sniffing at him for it. Scipio bestrides the white charger, and waves with civic plumes in sight of all France. Neither of them, however, does it for nothing, but in truth at an exorbitant rate, at this rate, namely, of feeding Paris, and keeping it from fighting. Out of the city funds, some seventeen thousand of the utterly destitute are employed digging on Montmartre at tenpence a day, which buys them, at market price, almost two pounds of bad bread. They look very yellow when Lafayette goes to harangue them. The town hall is in travail night and day. It must bring forth bread, a municipal constitution, regulations of all kinds, curbs on the sanculotic press, above all, bread, bread. Purveyors prowl the country far and wide with the appetite of lions, detect hidden grain, purchase open grain, by gentle means or forcible must and will find grain. A most thankless task, and so difficult, so dangerous, even if a man did gain some trifle by it. On the 19th of August there is food for one day complaints there are that the food is spoiled and produces an effect on the intestines, not corn but plaster of Paris, which effect on the intestines as well as that smarting in the throat and palate, a town hall proclamation warns you to disregard or even to consider as drastic beneficial. The mayor of Saint-Denis, so black was his bread, has by a dyspeptic populace been hanged on the lanterne there. National Guards protect the Paris corn market. 
First ten suffice, then six hundred. Busy are ye, by ye, Brissot de Arville, Condorcet, and ye others. For, as just hinted, there is a municipal constitution to be made, too. The old Bastille electors, after some ten days of psalmodying over their glorious victory, began to hear it asked in a splenetic tone, Who put you there? They accordingly had to give place, not without moanings and audible growlings on both sides, to a new larger body specially elected for that post. Which new body, augmented, altered, then fixed finally at the number of three hundred, with the title of town representatives, représentant de la commune, now sits there, rightly portioned into committees, assiduous making a constitution, at all moments when not seeking flower. And such a constitution, little short of miraculous, one that shall consolidate the revolution. The revolution is finished, then? Mayor Bailly and all respectable friends of freedom would fain think so. Your revolution, like jelly sufficiently boiled, needs only to be poured into shapes of constitution and consolidated therein? Could it, indeed, contrive to cool? Which last, however, is precisely the doubtful thing, or even the not doubtful. Unhappy friends of freedom, consolidating a revolution. They must sit at work there, their pavilions spread on very chaos, between two hostile worlds, the upper court world, the nether sanculotic one, and beaten on by both, toil painfully, perilously, doing in sad literal earnest the impossible. End of section 39《セクション40》of the French Revolution, Volume One, by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Wayman.《The French Revolution》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Six, Chapter Five, The Fourth Estate. Pamphleteering opens its abysmal throat wider and wider, never to close more. Our philosophes, indeed, rather withdraw, after the manner of Marmontel, retiring in disgust the first day. Abbe Reynal, grown grey and quiet in his Marseilles domicile, is little content with this work. The last literary act of the man will again be an act of rebellion an indignant letter to the Constituent Assembly, answered by the Order of the Day. Thus also philosophe Morellet puckers discontented brows, being indeed threatened in his benefices by that 4th of August, it is clearly going too far. How astonishing that those haggard figures in woollen jupes would not rest as satisfied with speculation and victorious analysis as we! Alas, yes, speculation, philosophism, once the ornament and wealth of the saloon, will now coin itself into mere practical propositions, and circulate on street and highway universally, with results. A fourth estate of able editors springs up, increases and multiplies, irrepressible, incalculable. New printers, new journals, and ever new, so prurient is the world, let our three hundred curb and consolidate as they can. Lustalo, under the wing of Prudom, dull-blustering printer, edits weekly his Révolution de Paris, in an acrid, emphatic manner. Acrid, corrosive, as the spirit of slows and copperas, is Marat, friend of the people. Struck already with the fact that the National Assembly, so full of aristocrats, can do nothing except dissolve itself and make way for a better, that the town hall representatives are little other than babblers and imbeciles, if not even knaves. Poor is this man, 
squalid and dwells in garrets a man unlovely to the sense inward and outward a man forbid and is becoming fanatical possessed with a fixed idea cruel losus of nature did nature o poor marat as in cruel sort knead thee out of her leavings and miscellaneous waste clay and fling thee forth stepdame like a distraction into this distracted eighteenth century work is appointed thee there which thou shalt do the three hundred have summoned and will again summon marat but always he croaks forth answer sufficient always he will defy them or elude them and endure no gag Cara, ex-secretary of a decapitated hospodar and then of a necklace cardinal likewise pamphleteer adventurer in many scenes and lands draws nigh to mercier of the tableau de paris and with foam on his lips proposes an anal patriotique the moniteur goes its prosperous way barrel weeps on paper as yet loyal rivarol royou are not idle deep calls to deep your domine salvum fac regem shall awaken pange lingua with an ami du peuple there is a king's friend newspaper ami du roi camille desmoulins has appointed himself procureur general de la lanterne attorney-general of the lamp iron and pleads not with atrocity under an atrocious title editing weekly his brilliant revolutions of paris and brabant brilliant we say for if in that thick murk of journalism with its dull blustering with its fixed or loose fury any ray of genius greet thee be sure it is camille's the thing that camille teaches he with his light finger adorns brightness plays gentle unexpected amid horrible confusions often is the word of camille worth reading when no others is questionable camille how thou glitterest with a fallen rebellious yet still semi-celestial light as is the starlight on the brow of lucifer son of the morning into what times and what lands art thou fallen but in all things is good though not good for consolidating revolutions thousand wagon-loads of this pamphleteering and newspaper matter lie rotting slowly in the public libraries of our europe snatched from the great gulf like oysters by bibliomaniac pearl-divers there must they first rot then what was pearl in camille or others may be seen as such and continue as such nor has public speaking declined though lafayette and his patrols look sour on it loud always is the palais royal loudest the café de foie such a miscellany of citizens and citizenesses circulating there now and then according to camille some citizens employ the liberty of the press for a private purpose so that this or the other patriot finds himself short of his watch or pocket-handkerchief but for the rest in camille's opinion nothing can be a livelier image of the roman forum a patriot proposes his motion if it finds any supporters they make him mount on a chair and speak if he is applauded he prospers and redacts if he is hissed he goes his ways thus they circulating and perorating tall shaggy marquis saint urige a man that has had losses and has deserved them is seen eminent and also heard bellowing is the character of his voice like that of a bull of bation voice which drowns all voices which causes frequently the hearts of men to leap cracked or half cracked is this tall marquis's head uncracked are his lungs the cracked and the uncracked shall alike avail him consider further that each of the forty-eight districts has its own committee speaking and motioning continually aiding in the search for grain in the search for a constitution checking and spurring the poor three hundred of the town hall 
that Danton, with a voice reverberating from the domes, is president of the Cordelier district, which has already become a Goshen of patriotism, that apart from the seventeen thousand utterly necessitous digging on Montmartre, most of whom indeed have got passes and been dismissed into space with four shillings, there is a strike or a union of domestics out of place, who assemble for public speaking, next a strike of tailors, for even they will strike and speak, further a strike of journeymen cordwainers, a strike of apothecaries, so dear is bread, all these, having struck, must speak, generally under the open canopy, and pass resolutions, Lafayette and his patrols watching them suspiciously from the distance. Unhappy mortals, such tugging and lugging and throttling of one another, to divide in some not intolerable way the joint felicity of man in this earth, when the whole lot to be divided is such a feast of shells. Diligent are the three hundred, none equal Scipio Americanus in dealing with mobs. But surely all these things bode ill for the consolidating of a revolution. End of section 40《Section Section Forty One of the French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Buchanan. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Seven, Chapter One. Patrollatism. No friends. This revolution is not of the consolidating kind. Do not fires, fevers, sown seeds, chemical mixtures, men, events, all embodiments of force that work in this miraculous complex of forces named universe, go on growing through their natural phases and developments, each according to its kind, reach their height, reach their visible decline, finally sink under vanishing and what we call die? They all grow. There is nothing but what grows and shoots forth into its special expansion. Once give it leave to spring. Observe, too, that each grows with a rapidity proportioned, in general, to the madness and unhealthiness there is in it. Slow, regular growth, though this also ends in death, is what we name health and sanity. A sans culottism, which has prostrated Bastilles, which has got pike and musket, and now goes burning chateaus, passing resolutions, and haranguing under roof and sky, may be said to have sprung, and by law of nature, must grow. To judge by the madness and diseasedness, both of itself and of the soil and element it is in, one might expect the rapidity and monstrosity would be extreme. Many things, too, especially all diseased things, grow by shoots and fits. The first grand fit and shooting forth of sans-culottism, with that of Paris conquering its king, for Bailey's figure of rhetoric was all too sad a reality. The king is conquered, going at large in his parole, on conditions, say, of absolutely good behavior, which, in these circumstances, will unhappily mean no behavior whatever. A quite untenable position, that of majesty put on its good behavior. Alas, is it not natural that whatever lives try to keep itself living? Whereupon his majesty's behavior will soon become exceptionable, and so the second grand fit of sans that of putting him in durance, cannot be distant. Necker in the National Assembly is making moan, as usual, about his deficit. Barriers and custom houses burnt, the tax-gatherer hunted, not hunting, his majesty's exchequer all but empty. The remedy is a loan of thirty millions. Then, on still more enticing terms, a loan of eighty millions. Neither of which loans, unhappily, will the stock jobbers venture to lend. The stock jobber has no country, except his own black pool of agio. And yet, in those days, for men that have a country, what a glow of patriotism burns in many a heart. 
penetrating inwards to the very purse. So, early as the 7th of August, a don patriotique, a patriotic gift of jewels to a considerable extent, has been solemnly made by certain Parisian women, and solemnly accepted with honourable mention, whom forthwith all the world takes to imitating and emulating. Patriotic gifts, always with some heroic eloquence which the President must answer and the Assembly listen to, flow in from far and near, in such number that the honourable mention can only be performed in lists published at stated epochs. Each gives what he can. The very cordwainers have behaved magnificently. One landed proprietor gives a forest. Fashionable society gives its shoe buckles, takes cheerfully to shoe ties. Unfortunate females give what they have amassed in loving. The smell of all cash, as Vespasian thought, is good. Beautiful, and yet inadequate. The clergy must be invited to melt their superfluous church plate in the royal mint. Nay, finally, a patriotic contribution of the forcible sort must be determined on, though unwillingly, let the fourth part of your declared yearly revenue for this once only be paid down. So shall a national assembly make the constitution, undistracted at least by insolvency. Their own wages, as settled on the 17th of August, are but 18 francs a day, each man, but the public service must have sinews, must have money. To appease the deficit, not to combler or choke the deficit, if you or mortal could. For withal, as Mirabeau was heard saying, it is the deficit that saves us. Towards the end of August, our National Assembly, in its constitutional labours, has got so far as the question of veto. Shall Majesty have a veto on the national enactments, or not have a veto? What speeches were spoken, within doors and without, clear and also passionate logic, imprecations, combinations, gone happily for the most part to limbo. Through the cracked brain and uncracked lungs of Saint-Horinche, the Palais Royal rebellows with veto. Journalism is busy. France rings with veto. I shall never forget, says Dumont, my going to Paris one of these days with Mirabeau, and the crowd of people we found waiting for his carriage about Leger the bookseller's shop. They flung themselves before him, conjuring him with tears in their eyes not to suffer the veto absolu. They were in a frenzy. Monsieur le Comte, you are the people's father. You must save us. You must defend us against those villains who are bringing back despotism. If the king gets this veto, what is the use of the National Assembly? We are slaves. All is done. Friends, if the sky fall, there will be catching of larks. Mirabeau, adds Dumont, was eminent on such occasions. He answered vaguely, with a patrician imperturbability, and bound himself to nothing. Deputations go to the Hôtel de Ville, anonymous letters to aristocrats in the National Assembly, threatening that 15,000, or sometimes that 60,000, will march to illuminate you. The Paris districts are astir, petition signing. saint Hurange sets forth from the Palais Royal with an escort of 1,500 individuals to petition in person. Resolute, or seemingly so, is the tall, shaggy marquis, is the Café de Foy. But resolute also is Commandant General Lafayette. The streets are all beset by patrols. saint Rouge is stopped at the Barrière des Bonhommes. He may bellow like the bulls of Bashan, but absolutely must return. The brethren of the Palais Royal circulate all night and make motions, under the open canopy, all coffee houses being shut. Nevertheless, Lafayette and the town hall do prevail. saint Hurange is thrown into prison. Veto absolu adjusts itself into suspensive veto, prohibition not forever, but for a term of time, and this doom's clamor will grow silent, as the others have done. So far has consolidation prospered, though with difficulty, repressing the nether sans culotic world, and the constitution shall be made. With difficulty, amid jubilee and scarcity, patriotic gifts, baker's cues, abbe fauché harangues, and with there are men of platoon musketry. Scipio Americanus has deserved thanks from the National Assembly in France. They offer him stipends and emoluments, to a handsome extent, all which stipends and emoluments he, covetous of far other blessedness than mere money, does, in his chivalrous way, without scruple, refuse. 
to the parisian common man meanwhile one thing remains inconceivable that now when the bastille is down and french liberty restored grain should continue so dear all rights of man are voted feudalism and all tyranny abolished yet behold we stand in queue is it aristocrat forestallers a court still bent on intrigues something is rotten somewhere and yet alas what to do lafayette with his patrols prohibits everything even complaint saint rouge and the other heroes of the veto lie in durance people's friend marat was seized printers of patriotic journals are fettered and forbidden the very hawkers cannot cry till they get a license till they get license and leaden badges blue national guards ruthlessly dissipate all groups scour with leveled bayonets the palais royal itself pass on your affairs along the rue Turin. the patrol presenting his bayonet cries to the left turn to the rue saint benoît he cries to the right a judicious patriot like camille desmoulins in this instance is driven for quietness sake to take the gutter o oh, much suffering people our glorious revolution is evaporating in tricolor ceremonies and complimentary harangues of which latter as lustelot accurately calculates upwards of two thousand have been delivered within the last month at the town hall alone and our mouths unfilled with bread are to be shut under penalties the caricaturist promulgates his emblematic tablature le patriotisme chasant la patriotisme patriotism driven out by patriotism ruthless patrols long superfine harangues and scanty ill-baked loaves more like baked bath bricks which produce an effect on the intestines where will this end in consolidation end of section forty one Section 42 of the French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Buchanan. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 7, Chapter 2. O oh, Richard, O oh, my King. For alas! neither is the town hall itself without misgivings the nether sans culotic world has been suppressed hitherto but then the upper court world symptoms there are that the oil de bouffe is rallying more than once in the town hall sanhedrim often enough from those outspoken baker's cues has the wish uttered itself oh that our restorer of french liberty were here that he could see with his own eyes not with the false eyes of queens and cabals, and his really good heart be enlightened, for falsehood still environs him, intriguing dukes de guiche with bodyguards, scouts of Buil, a new flight of intriguers now that the old has flown. What else means this advent of the Regiment de Flandre, entering Versailles, as we hear, on the 23rd of September, with two pieces of cannon? Did not the Versailles National Guard do duty at the chateau? Had they not Swiss? Hundred Swiss, gods de corps, bodyguards, so called? Nay, it would seem the number of bodyguards on duty has, by a maneuver, been doubled. The new relieving battalion of them arrived at its time, but the old relieved one does not depart. Actually, there runs a whisper through the best informed upper circles or a nod still more portentous than whispering, of his majesty's flying to Metz, of a bond, to stand by him therein, which has been signed by noblesse and clergy, to the incredible amount of thirty, or even of sixty thousand. Lafayette coldly whispers it, and coldly asservates it, to Count d'Estaing at the dinner-table, and d'Estaing, one of the bravest men, quakes to the core lest some lackey overhear it and tumbles thoughtful without sleep all night regiment flandre as we have said is clearly arrived his majesty they say hesitates about sanctioning the fourth of august makes observations of chilling tenor on the very rights of man likewise may not all persons the bakers cues themselves discern on the streets of paris 
the most astonishing number of officers on furlough, crosses of St. Louis and such like, some reckon from a thousand to twelve hundred officers of all uniforms, nay, one uniform never before seen by eye, green faced with red. The tricolor cockade is not always visible, but what in the name of heaven made these black cockades which some wear foreshadow? Hunger wets everything, especially suspicion and indignation. Realities themselves in this Paris have grown unreal, preternatural. Phantasms once more stalk through the brain of hungry France. O oh, ye laggards and dastards, cry shrill voices from the queues. If ye had the hearts of men, ye would take your pikes and second-hand firelocks and look into it not leave your wives and daughters to be starved, murdered, and worse. Peace, women! The heart of man is bitter and heavy. Patriotism, driven out by patriotism, knows not what to resolve on. The truth is, the Will de Bouff has rallied, to a certain unknown extent. A changed Will de Bouff, with Versailles National Guards in their tricolor cockades doing duty there, a court all flaring with tricolor, yet even to a tricolor court men will rally. Ye loyal hearts, burnt-out seigneurs, rally round your queen, with wishes which will produce hopes, which will produce attempts. For indeed, self-preservation being such a law of nature, what can a rallied court do but attempt and endeavor, or call it plot, with such wisdom and unwisdom as it has? They will fly escorted to Metz, where brave Boule commands, they will raise the royal standard. The bond signatures shall become armed men. Were not the king so languid? <sighs> Their bond, if at all signed, must be signed without his privity. Unhappy king, he has but one resolution, not to have a civil war. For the rest, he still hunts, having ceased lock-making, he still dozes and digests, is clay in the hands of the potter. Ill will it fare with him, in a world where all is helping itself. Where, as has been written, whosoever is not hammer must be stithy, and the very hyssop on the wall grows there, in that chink, because the whole universe could not prevent its growing. But as for the coming up of this Regiment de Flandre, may it not be urged that there were saint Orange petitions and continual meal mobs? Undebouch soldiers be their plot or only dim elements of a plot, are always good. Did not the Versailles municipality, an old monarchic one, not yet refounded into a democratic, instantly second the proposal? Nay, the very Versailles National Guard, weary with continual duty at the chateau, did not object. Only Draper Le Contre, who is now Major Le Contre, shook his head. Yes, friends, surely it was natural this Regiment de Flandre should be sent for, since it could be got, it was natural that, at sight of military bandoliers, the heart of the rallied Will de Bouffe should revive, and maids of honour, and gentlemen of honour, speak comfortable words to epauletted defenders, and to one another. Natural also, and mere common civility, that the bodyguards, a regiment of gentlemen, should invite their Flandre brethren to a dinner of welcome. Such invitation, in the last days of September, is given and accepted. Dinners are defined as the ultimate act of communion. Men that can have communion in nothing else can sympathetically eat together, can still rise into some glow of brotherhood over food and wine. The dinner is fixed on for Thursday the 1st of October, and ought to have a fine effect. Further, as such dinner may be rather extensive, and even the non-commissioned and the common man be introduced to see and to hear, could not His Majesty's opera apartment, which has lain quite silent ever since Kaiser Joseph was here, be obtained for the purpose? The whole of the opera is granted. The Salon de Hercule shall be drawing-room. Not only the officers of Flandre, but of the Swiss, of the hundred Swiss, nay, of the Versailles National Guard, such of them as have any loyalty, shall feast. It will be a repast like few. And now suppose this repast, the solid part of it, transacted, and the first bottle over. Suppose the customary loyal toasts drunk, the king's health, 
the queens with deafening vivats, that of the nation omitted or even rejected. Suppose champagne flowing with pot valorous speech, with instrumental music, empty feathered heads growing ever the noisier in their own emptiness, in each other's noise. Her Majesty, who looks unusually sad tonight, his Majesty, sitting dulled with the day's hunting, is told that the sight of it would cheer her. Behold, she enters there, issuing from her state rooms like the moon from the clouds, this fairest, unhappy queen of hearts, royal husband by her side, young Dauphine in her arms. She descends from the boxes amid splendor and acclaim, walks queen-like round the tables, gracefully escorted, gracefully nodding. Her looks full of sorrow, yet of gratitude and daring, with the hope of France on her mother bosom. And now the band striking up, O oh, Richard, O oh, Monroy, l'universe te abandon, O oh, Richard, O oh, my king, and world is all forsaking thee. Could man do other than rise to the height of pity, of loyal valor? Could feather-headed young ensigns do other than, by white bourbon cockades, handed them from fair fingers, by waving of swords drawn to pledge the queen's health, by trampling of national cockades, by scaling the boxes, whence intrusive murmurs may come, by vociferation, tripudation, sound, fury, and distraction, within doors and without, testify what tempest-tossed state of vacuity they are in, till champagne and tripudation do their work and all lie silent, horizontal, passively slumbering, with need of battle dreams. A natural repast, in ordinary times a harmless one, now fatal as that of Thiestes, as that of Job's sons, when a strong wind smote the four quarters of their banquet house. Poor, ill-advised Marie Antoinette, with a woman's vehemence, not with a sovereign's foresight. It was so natural yet so unwise. Next day, in public speech of ceremony, Her Majesty declares herself delighted with the Thursday. The heart of the wildy beef glows into hope, into daring, which is premature. Rallied maids of honor, waited on by abbeys, so white cockades, distribute them with words, with glances, to epauletted youths, who, in return, may kiss not without fervor, the fair sewing fingers. Captains of horse and foot go swashing with enormous white cockades. Nay, one Versailles national captain has mounted the like, so witching were the words and glances, and laid aside his tricolor. Well may Major Le Contre shake his head with a look of severity, and speak audible, resentful words. But now a swashbuckler, with enormous white cockade, overhearing the major, invites him instantly, once and then again elsewhere, to recant, and failing that, to duel. Which latter feat, Major Le Contre declares that he will not perform, not at least by any known laws of fence, that he nevertheless will, according to mere law of nature, by dirk and blade, exterminate any vile gladiator who may insult him or the nation. Whereupon, for the major is actually drawing his implement, they are parted, and no weasons slit. End of section 42section 43 of The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eden Ray Hedrick. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 7, Chapter 3. Black Cockades. But fancy what effect this Thiestes repast and trampling on the national cockade must have had in the Salle de Menu, in the famishing baker's queues at Paris. Nay, such Thiestes repasts, it would seem, continue. Flandre has given its counter-dinner to the Swiss and hundred Swiss, then on Saturday there has been another. Yes, here with us is famine, but yonder at Versailles is food, enough and to spare. 
Patriotism stands in the queue, shivering hunger-struck, insulted by patriotism, while bloody-minded aristocrats, heated with excess of high living, trample on the national cockade. Can the atrocity be true? Nay, look, green uniforms faced with red, black cockades, the color of night. Are we to have military onfall and death also by starvation? For behold the Corbeil corn-boat, which used to come twice a day, with its plaster of Paris meal, now comes only once. And the town hall is deaf, and the men are laggard and dastard. At the Café du Foy this Saturday evening a new thing is seen, not the last of its kind, a woman engaged in public speaking. Her poor man, she says, was put to silence by his district, their presidents and officials would not let him speak. Wherefore she here, with her shrill tongue, will speak, denouncing while her breath endures the Corbeil boat, the plaster of Paris bread, sacrilegious opera dinners, green uniforms, pirate aristocrats, and those black cockades of theirs. Truly it is time for the black cockades, at least, to vanish. Them patriotism itself will not protect. Nay, sharp-tempered Monsieur Tassin, at the Tuileries parade on Sunday morning, forgets all national military rule, starts from the ranks, wrenches down one black cockade which is swashing ominous there, and tramples it fiercely into the soil of France. Patriotism itself is not without suppressed fury. Also the districts begin to stir. The voice of President Danton reverberates in the Cordelier. People's friend Moray has flown to Versailles and back again. Swart bird, not of the halcyon kind. And so Patriot meets promenading Patriot this Sunday, and sees his own grim care reflected on the face of another. Groups, in spite of patriotism, which is not so alert as usual, fluctuate deliberative. Groups on the bridges, on the quays, at the patriotic cafés. And ever as any black cockade may emerge, rises the many-voiced growl and bark, Abba! Down! All black cockades are ruthlessly plucked off. One individual picks his up again, kisses it, attempts to refix it, but a hundred canes start in the air and he desists. Still worse went it with another individual, doomed, by extemper plebiscitum, to the lantern, saved, with difficulty, by some active corps de gare. Lafayette sees signs of an effervescence, which he doubles his patrols, doubles his diligence, to prevent. So passes Sunday, the 4th of October, 1789. Sullen as the male heart, repressed by patriotism, vehement as the female, irrepressible. The public speaking woman at the Palais Royal was not the only speaking one. Men know not what the pantry is when it grows empty. Only house-mothers know. O oh, women, wives of men that will only calculate and not act. Patriotism is strong. But death, by starvation and military onfall, is stronger. Patriotism represses male patriotism. But female patriotism? Will guards named national thrust their bayonets into the bosoms of women? Such thought, or rather such dim, unshaped, raw material of a thought, ferments universally under the female nightcap and, by earliest daybreak, on slight hint, will explode. End of section 43 of The French Revolution Section 44 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim McDougall the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 7, Chapter 4, The Menads. If Voltaire once, in a splenetic humor, asked his countrymen, But you Gulches, what have you invented? They can now answer, The art of insurrection. It was an art needed in these last singular times, an art for which the French nature so full of vehemence, so free from depth, was perhaps of all others the fittest. Accordingly, to what a height, one may well say of perfection, has this branch of human industry been carried by France within the last half-century. Insurrection, which Lafayette thought might be the most sacred of duties, ranks now for the French people among the duties which they can perform. Other mobs are dull masses, which roll onwards with a dull, fierce tenacity, a dull, fierce heat, but emit no light flashes of genius as they go. The French mob, again, is among the liveliest phenomena of our world. So rapid, audacious, so clear-sighted, inventive, prompt to seize the moment, instinct with life to its finger ends. That talent, were there no other, of spontaneously standing in queue, 
distinguishes, as we said, the French people from all peoples, ancient and modern. Let the reader confess, too, that taking one thing with another, perhaps few terrestrial appearances are better worth considering than mobs. Your mob is a genuine outburst of nature, issuing from or communicating with the deepest deep of nature. When so much goes grinning and grimacing as a lifeless formality, and under the stiff buckram no heart can be felt beating, here once more, if nowhere else, is the sincerity and reality. Shudder at it, or even shriek over it, if thou must. Nevertheless consider it. Such a complex of human forces and individualities hurled forth in their transcendental mood to act and react, on circumstances and on one another, to work out what it is in them to work. The thing they will do is known to no man, least of all to themselves. It is the inflammablest and measurable firework, generating, consuming itself. With what phrases, to what extent, with what results it will burn off, philosophy and perspicacity conjecture in vain. Man, as has been written, is forever interesting to man. Nay, properly, there is nothing else interesting. In which light also may we not discern why most battles have become so wearisome? Battles in these ages are transacted by mechanism, with the slightest possible development of human individuality or spontaneity. Men now even die and kill one another in an artificial manner. Battles ever since Homer's time, when they were fighting mobs, have mostly ceased to be worth looking at, worth reading of, or remembering. How many wearisome, bloody battles does history strive to represent, or even, in a husky way, to sing, and she would omit or carelessly slur over this one insurrection of women? A thought, or dim, raw material of a thought, was fermenting all night, universally in the female head, and might explode. In squalid garret, on Monday morning, maternity awakes to hear children weeping for bread. Maternity must forth to the streets, to the herb markets and bakers. Cues, meets there with hunger-stricken maternity, sympathetic, exasperative. Oh, we unhappy women! But instead of bakers' cues, why not to aristocrats' palaces, the root of the matter? Alone, let us assemble, to the Hôtel de Ville, to Versailles, to the Lanterne. In one of the guard houses of the Cartier Saint Eustache, a young woman seizes a drum. For how shall national guards give fire on women, on a young woman? The young woman seizes the drum, sets forth, beating it, uttering cries relative to the dearth of grains. Descend, O mothers, descend ye Judiths, to food and revenge. All women gather and go. Crowds storm all stairs. Force out all women. The female insurrectionary force, according to Camille, resembles the English naval one. There is a universal press of women. Robust dames of the hall, slim mantua makers, assiduous, risen with the dawn, ancient virginity tripping to matins, the housemaid with early broom, all must go. Rouse ye, O women. The laggard men will not act. They say, we ourselves may act. And so, like snowbreak from the mountains, for every staircase is a melted brook. It storms, tumultuous, wild shrilling, towards the Hotel de Ville, tumultuous, with or without drum music, for the Faubourg Saint-Antoine also has tucked up its gown, and with besom staves, fire irons, and even rusty pistols, void of ammunition, is flowing on. Sound of it flies, with a velocity of sound, to the outmost barriers. By seven o'clock on this raw October morning, fifth of the month, the town hall will see wonders. Nay, as chance would have it, a male party are already there, clustering tumultuously round some national patrol, and a baker who has been seized with short weights. They are there, and have even lowered the rope of the lantern, so that the official persons have to smuggle forth the short weighing baker by back doors, and even send to all the districts for more force. Grand it was, says Camille, to see so many Judas, from eight to ten thousand of them in all, rushing out to search into the root of the matter. Not unfrightful it must have been, ludicro terrific and most unmanageable. At such hour the overwatched three hundred are not yet stirring, 
none but some clerks, a company of National Guards, and Monsieur de Gouvion, the Major General. Gouvion has fought in America for the cause of civil liberty, a man of no inconsiderable heart, but deficient in head. He is for the moment in his back apartment, assuaging Usher Maillard, the Bastille Sergeant, who has come, as too many do, with representations. The assuagement is still incomplete when our Judiths arrive. The National Guards form on the outer stairs, with leveled bayonets. The ten thousand Judiths press up, resistless, with obtestations, with outspread hands, merely to speak to the mayor. The rear forces them. Nay, from male hands in the rear, stones already fly. The National Guards must do one of two things. Sweep the Place de Greve with cannon, or else to open right and left. They open. The living deluge rushes in. Through all rooms and cabinets, upwards to the topmost belfry, ravenous, seeking arms, seeking mares, seeking justice, while again the better dressed speak kindly to the clerks, point out the misery of these poor women, also their ailments, some even of an interesting sort. Poor Monsieur de Gouvion is shiftless in this extremity, a man shiftless, perturbed, who will one day commit suicide. How happy for him that Usher Mayar, the shifty, was there at the moment, though making representations. Fly back, thou shifty Mayar. Seek the Bastille Company, and O return fast with it, above all with thy own shifty head. For behold, the Judiths can find no mayor or municipal. Scarcely in the topmost belfry can they find poor Abbé Lefebvre, the powder distributor. Him, for want of a better, they suspend there in the pale morning light, over the top of all Paris, which swims in one's failing eyes. A horrible end? Nay, the rope broke, as French ropes often did, or else an Amazon cut it. Abbé Lefebvre falls, some twenty feet, rattling among the leads, and lives long years after, though always with a tremblement in the limbs. And now doors fly under hatchets, the Judiths have broken the armory, have seized guns and cannons, three money bags, paper heaps, torches flare. In few minutes, our brave Hotel de Ville, which dates from the fourth Henry, will, with all that it holds, be in flames. End of section forty four. Section forty five of the French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Allen. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 7, Chapter 5. Usher Maillard. In flames, truly, were it not that Usher Maillard, swift of foot, shifty of head, has returned. Maillard, of his own motion, for Gouvon or the rest would not even sanction him, snatches a drum, descends the porch stairs, rantan, beating sharp with loud rolls. His rogues march. To Versailles! Aion! A Versailles! As men beat on kettle or warming pin, when angry she-bees, or say, flying desperate wasps, are to be hived, and the desperate insects hear it, and cluster round it, simply as round a guidance, where there was none. So now these menads, round shifty Maillard, riding you share of the Châtelet, the axe pauses uplifted. Abe Lefrave is left half-hanged, from the belfry downwards, all vomits itself. What rub -a dub is that? Stanislaw Maillard, Bastille hero, will lead us to Versailles. Joy to thee, Maillard! Blessed art thou above riding Usher's. Away, then, away! The seized cannon are yoked with seized cart horse. Brown Lock Demoiselle Theroin, with pike and helmet, sits there as gunneress, with haughty eye and serene fair countenance, comparable, some think, to the maid of Orleans, or even recalling the idea of Pallas Athene. Maillard, for his drum still rolls, is by heaven-rending acclamation, admitted general. Maillard hastens the languid march. Maillard, beating rhythmic, 
with sharp rantan, all along the quays, leads forward with difficulty his monadic host. Such a host, marched not in silence. The bargeman pauses on the river. All wagoners and coach drivers fly. Men peer from windows, not women, lest they be pressed. Sight of sights. Bacantes, in these ultimate formalized ages. Franz Henri looks on, from his Pont Nou, the monarchic Louvre. Medici and Tuileries see a day not theretofore seen. And now Maillard has his menads in the Champs Elysees, fields Tartarian, rather. And the Hôtel de Ville has suffered comparatively nothing. Broken doors, and Abe Lefarve, who shall never more distribute powder. Three sacks of money, most part of which, for sanculatism, though famishing, is not without honor, shall be returned. This is all the damage, great Maillard. A small nucleus of order is round his drum, but his outskirts fluctuate like the mad ocean. For rascality, male and female, is flowing in on him from the four winds. Guidance there is none but in his single head and two drumsticks. O oh, my yard, when since war first was, had general of force such a task before him as thou this day? Walter the Penniless still touches the feeling heart, but then Walter had sanction, had space to turn in, and also his crusaders were of the male sex. Thou, this day, disowned of heaven and earth, art general of Menads. Their inarticulate frenzy, thou must on the spur of the instant render into articulate words, into action that are not frantic. Fail in it, this way or that. Pragmatical officiality, with its penalties and law books, waits for thee. Menad storm behind. If such hewed off the melodious head of Orpheus and hurled it into the Painuous waters, what may they not make of thee? The rhythmic merely, with no music but a sheepskin drum. My yard did not fail. Remarkable, my yard, if fame were not an accident and history a distillation of rumor, how remarkable wert thou? On the Elysian fields there is pause and fluctuation. But, for Maillard, no return. He persuades his menads, clamorous for arms and the arsenal. That no arms are in the arsenal. That an unarmed attitude and petition to a national assembly will be the best. He hastily nominates or sanctions General Lassie, captains of tens and fifties. And so, in loosest flowing order, to the rhythm of some eight drums, having laid aside his own with the Bastille volunteers bringing up his rear, once more takes the road. Chelo, which will promptly yield baked loaves, is not plundered, nor are the Sev potteries broken. The old arches of Sev's bridge echo under monadic feet. Seine River gushes on with his perpetual murmur, and Paris flings after us the boom of toxin and alarm drum, inaudible for the present amid shrill-sounding hosts and the splash of rainy weather. To Meudon, to St. Cloud, on both hands, the report of them is gone abroad, and hearths this evening will have a topic. The press of women still continues, for it is the cause of all Eve's daughters, mothers that are, or that hope to be. No carriage lady were it with never such hysterics, but must dismount, in the mud roads, in her silk shoes and walk. In this manner, amid wild October weather, they a wild and unwinged stork flight, through the astonished country, wend their way. Travelers of all sort they stop, especially travelers or couriers from Paris. Deputy Le Chapelier, in his elegant vesture, from his elegant vehicle, looks forth amazed through his spectacles, apprehensive for life, states eagerly that he is a patriot. Deputy Le Chapelier, and even old President Le Capelier, who presided on the night of Pentecost, and is original member of the Brenton Club. Thereupon rises huge shout, Vive Le Chapelier! And several armed persons spring up behind and before to escort him. 
Nevertheless, news, dispatches from Lafayette, or vague noise of rumor, have pierced through by side roads. In the National Assembly, while all is busy discussing the order of the day, regretting that there should be anti-national repasts in opera halls, and His Majesty should still hesitate about accepting the rights of man, and hang conditions and peradventures on them. Mirabeau steps up to the President, experienced Monier as it chanced to be, and articulates, in bass undertone, quote, Monier, Paris marche sur nous. Paris is marching on us, unquote. Quote, maybe, je ne sais rien, unquote. Quote, believe it or disbelieve it, that is not my concern. But Paris, I say, is marching on us. Fall suddenly unwell. Go over to the chateau. Tell them this. There is not a moment to lose. Unquote. Quote, Paris, marching on us? Responds Monier, with an ultra billier accent. Well, so much the better. We shall the sooner be a republic. Unquote. Mirabeau quits him, as one quits an experienced president getting blindfold into deep waters, and the order of the day continues as before. Yes, Paris is marching on us, and more than the women of Paris. Scarcely was Maillard gone, when Major de Gouvon's message to all the districts, and such toxin and drumming of the general, began to take effect. Armed National Guards from every district, especially the grenadiers of the center, who are our old guards Francais, arrive in quick sequence, on the Palais de Grieve. An immense people is there. Saint Antoine, with pike and rusty firelock, is all crowding thither, be it welcome or unwelcome. The center grenadiers are received with cheering. Quote, it is not cheers that we want, answer they gloomily. The nation has been insulted. To arms, and come with us for orders. Unquote. Ha, huh, sits the wind so. Patriotism and patrolitism are now one. The three hundred have assembled. All the committees are in activity. Lafayette is dictating dispatches for Versailles when a deputation of the center grenadiers introduces itself to him. The deputation makes military obeisance and thus speaks, not without a kind of thought in it. Quote, Mon General, we are deputed by the six companies of grenadiers. We do not think you a traitor, but we think the government betrays you. It is time that this end. We cannot turn our bayonets against women crying to us for bread. The people are miserable. The source of the mischief is at Versailles. We must go seek the king and bring him to Paris. We must exterminate, exterminate, the regiment de Flandre and the guards de Cour who have dared to trample on the national cockade. If the king be too weak to wear his crown, let him lay it down. You will crown his son. You will name a council of regency, and all will go better. Unquote. Reproachful astonishment paints itself on the face of Lafayette, speaks itself from his eloquent chivalrous lips. In vain. Quote, My general, we would shed the last drop of our blood for you, but the root of the mischief is at Versailles. We must go and bring the king to Paris. All the people wish it. To les peuples le bois, unquote. My general descends to the outer staircase and harangues once more in vain. Quote, to Versailles! To Versailles! Unquote. Mayor Bailey, sent for through floods of sanculotism, attempts academic oratory from his gilt stagecoach realizes nothing but infinite hoarse cries of, quote, Bread! To Versailles! Unquote, and gladly shrinks within doors. Lafayette mounts the white charger, and again harangues and re-harangues with eloquence, with firmness, indignant demonstrations, with all things but persuasion. Quote, to Versailles! To Versailles! Unquote. So lasts it, hour after hour, for the space of half a day. The great Scipio Americanus can do nothing, not so much as escape. Quote, More blue, mon general, 
unquote, cry the grenadiers, serrying their ranks, as the white charger makes a motion that way. Quote, you will not leave us, you will abide with us, unquote. A perilous juncture. Mayor Bailey and the municipals sit quaking within doors. My general is prisoner without. The play de grieve, with its thirty thousand regulars, its whole irregular Saint Antoine and Saint Marcel, is one miniatory mass of clear or rusty steel, all hearts set with a moody fixedness on one object. Moody, fixed are all hearts. Tranquil is no heart, if it be not that of the white charger, who paused there with arched neck, composedly champing his bit, as if no world with its dynasties and eras, were now rushing down. The drizzly day tends westward. The cry is still, quote, To Versailles! Unquote. Nay, now, borne from afar, come quit sinister cries. Hoarse, reverberating in long-drawn hollow murmurs, with syllables too like that of Laterne. Or else, irregular sanculatism may be marching off, of itself, with pikes, nay, with cannon. The inflexible Scipio does at length, by aide de camp, ask of the municipals whether or not he may go. A letter is handed out to him. Over armed heads, sixty thousand faces flash fixedly on his. There is stillness, and no bosom breathes till he have read. By heaven he grows suddenly pale. Do the municipals permit? Permit, and even order? Since he can no other. Clangor of approval rends the welkin. To your ranks, then, let us march. It is, as we compute, towards three in the afternoon. Indignant National Guards may dine once more from their haversack. Dined or undine, they march with one heart. Paris flings up her windows, claps hands, as the avengers, with their shrilling drums and shalms, tramp by. She will then sit pensive, apprehensive, and pass rather a sleepless night. On the white charger Lafayette, in the slowest possible manner, going and coming and eloquently haranguing among the ranks, rolls onward with his thirty thousand. San Antoine, with pike and cannon, has preceded him, a mixed multitude of all and of no arms hovers on his flank and skirts. The country once more pauses agape. Paris marche sur nous. End of section 45. Section 46 of the French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle Volume 1, Book 7, Chapter 6 To Versailles For, indeed, about this same moment, Maya has halted his draggled menads on the last hilltop, and now Versailles, and the Chateau of Versailles, and far and wide the inheritance of royalty opens to the wandering eye. From far on the right, over Marly and Saint-Germain-en-Laye, round towards Rambouillet on the left, beautiful all, softly unbosomed, as if in sadness in the dim, moist weather. And near before us is Versailles, new and old, with that broad frondent avenue de Versailles between, stately frondent, broad, three hundred feet as men reckon, with four rows of elms, and then the Chateau de Versailles, ending in royal parks and pleasant seas, gleaming lakelets, arbors, labyrinths, the menagerie, and great and little Trianon, high-towered dwellings, leafy pleasant places, where the gods of this lower world abide, whence, nevertheless, Black hair cannot be excluded. Whether Minadic hunger is even now advancing, armed with Pike Fursy. Yes, yonder, madame, where our straight frondent avenue, joined, as you note, by two frondent brother avenues from this hand and from that, 
spreads out into Place Royale and Palais Four Court. Yonder is the Salle des Menus. Yonder an august assembly sits regenerating France. Four Court, Grand Court, Court of Marble, Court narrowing into Court, you may discern next or fancy. On the extreme verge of which that glass dome, visibly glittering like a star of hope, is the Oeil de Boeuf. Yonder or nowhere in the world is bread baked for us. But, oh, mesdames, were not one thing good, that our cannons, with Demoiselle Terroigne, and all show of war, be put to the rear? Submission beseems petitioners of a national assembly. We are strangers in Versailles. Whence, to audibly, they comes even now sound as of toxing and general, also to put on, if possible, a cheerful countenance, hiding our sorrows and even to sing sorrow pitied of the heavens is hateful suspicious to the earth so counsels shifty maya haranguing his minads on the heights near versailles can in maillard's dispositions are obeyed the draggled insurrectionist advance up the avenue in three columns among the four elm rows singing henri iv with what melody they can, and shouting, Vive le roi! Versailles, though the elm rows are dripping wet, crowds from both sides, with, Vive nos Parisiennes! Our Paris ones forever! Prickers, scouts have been out towards Paris, as the rumour deepened, whereby His Majesty, gone to shoot in the woods of Meudon, has been happily discovered and got home, and the general and toxin set a sounding, the bodyguards are already drawn up in front of the palais grates and look down the avenue de Versailles, sulky in wet buckskins. Flandre too is there, repentant of the opera repast. Also dragons dismounted are there. Finally, Major Le Cointre and what he can gather of the Versailles National Guard. Though, is to be observed, our colonel, that same sleepless Count Destin, giving neither order nor ammunition, has vanished most improperly, one supposes, into the Oeil de Boeuf. Red coat is Swiss stand within the grades, under arms. There, likewise, in the inner room, all the ministers, Saint Priest, Lamentation Pompignon, and the rest, are assembled with Monsieur Necker. They sit with him there, blank, expecting what the hour will bring. President Meunier, Though he answered Mirabeau with a tant mieux, and affected to slight the matter, had his own forebodings. Surely, for these four weary hours, he has reclined not on roses. The order of the day is getting forward. A deputation to His Majesty seems proper, that it might please him to grant acceptance pure and simple to those constitution articles of ours the mixed qualified acceptance with its peradventures is satisfactory to neither gods nor men so much is clear and yet there is more which no man speaks which all men now vaguely understand disquietude absence of mind is on every face members whisper uneasily come and go the order of the day is evidently not the day's want till at length from the outer gates is heard a rustling and jostling, shrill uproar and squabbling, muffled by walls, which testifies that the hour is come. Rushing and crushing one hears now, then enter Ashamaya with a deputation of fifteen muddy dripping women, having by incredible industry and aid of all the macers, persuaded the rest to wait out of doors. National Assembly shall now, therefore, look its august task directly in the face. Regenerative constitutionalism has an unregenerate sanculotism bodily in front of it, crying, Bread, bread! Shifty Meyer, translating frenzy into articulation, repressive with the one hand, expotulative with the other, does his best. And really, though not bred to public speaking, manages rather well. In the present dreadful rarity of grains, a deputation of female citizens has, as the August Assembly can discern, come out from Paris to petition. Plots of aristocrats are too evident in the matter. For example, one miller has been bribed by a banknote of two hundred livres, not to grind. 
name unknown to the usher, but fact provable, at least indubitable. Further, it seems, the national cockade has been trampled on. Also, there are black cockades, or oh, where? All which things will not an august national assembly, the hope of France, take into its wise immediate consideration? And Minadic hunger, impressible, crying, black cockades, crying, bread, bread, adds after such fashion, will it not? Yes, monsieur, if a deputation to his majesty, for the acceptance pure and simple seemed proper, how much more now for the afflicting situation of Paris, for the calming of this effervescence? President Meunier, with a speedy deputation, among whom we notice the respectable figure of Dr. Guillotin, gets himself forthwith on March. Vice President shall continue the order of the day. Usher Meyer shall stay by him to repress the women. It is four o'clock of the miserable afternoon when Meunier steps out. Oh, experienced Meunier, what an afternoon, the last of thy political existence. Better had it been to fall suddenly and well while it was yet time. For, behold, the esplanade, over all its spacious expanse, is covered with groups of squalid dripping women, of lank-haired male rascality, armed with axes, rusty pikes, old muskets, iron-shot clubs, batons ferrés, which end in knives or sword blades, a kind of extempore billhook, looking nothing but hungry revolt. The rain pours. Garde du corps go caracoling through the groups amid hisses, irritating and agitating what is but dispersed here to reunite there. Innumerable squalid women beleaguer the president and deputation, insist on going with him, as not his majesty himself, looking from the window, sent out to ask, What we wanted? Bread and speech with the king. Du pain et parler au roi. That was the answer. Twelve women are clamorously added to the deputation and march with it across the esplanade through dissipated groups, caracoling bodyguards and the pouring rain. President Meunier, unexpectedly augmented by twelve women, copiously escorted by hunger and rascality, is himself mistaken for a group. Himself and his women are dispersed by caracolers, rally again with difficulty among the mud. Finally, the grades are opened. The deputation gets access, with the twelve women too in it, of which latter five shall even see the face of his majesty. Let wet minadism in the best spirits it can expect their return. End of section 46 Section 47 of the French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Buchanan. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 7, Chapter 7. At Versailles. But already Pallas Athena, in the shape of Demoiselle Terroigne, is busy with Flandre and the dismounted dragoons. She, and such women as are fittest, go through the ranks, speak with an earnest jocosity, clasp rough troopers to their patriot bosom, crush down spontoons and musketoons with soft arms. Can a man, that were worthy of the name of man, attack famishing patriot women? One reads that Teroin had bags of money, which she distributed over Flandre, furnished by whom? Alas, with money-bags one seldom sits on insurrectionary cannon. Calumnious royalism! Teroin had only the limited earnings of her profession of unfortunate female. Money she had not, but brown locks, the figure of a heathen goddess, and an eloquent tongue and heart. Meanwhile, saint Antoine, in groups and troops, is continually arriving, wedded, sulky, with pikes and impromptu bill-hooks, driven thus far by popular fixed idea. So many hirsute figures driven hither, in that manner, figures that have come to do they know not what, figures that have come to see it done, 
distinguished among all figures, who is this of gaunt stature with leaden breastplate, though a small one, bushy and red grizzled locks, nay, with long tile beard? It is Jordan, unjust dealer in mules, a dealer no longer, but a painter's lay figure, playing truant this day. From the necessity of art comes his long tile beard, whence his leaden breastplate, unless indeed he were some hawker licensed by leaden badge, may have come, will perhaps remain for ever a historical problem. Another Saul among the people we discern, Père Adam, Father Adam, as the groups name him, to us better known as bull-voiced Marquis saint Rouge, hero of the veto, a man that has had losses and deserved them. The tall Marquis, emitted some days ago from limbo, looks peripatetically on this scene from under his umbrella, not without interest. All which persons and things, hurled together as we see, Palace Athena, busy with Flandre, patriotic Versailles National Guards, short of ammunition, and deserted by D'Estaing, their colonel, and commanded by Le Contreur, their major, then caracoling bodyguards, sour, dispirited, with their buckskins wet, and finally this flowing sea of indignant squalor. May they not give rise to occurrences? Behold, however, the twelve she-deputies returned from the chateau, without President Mounier, indeed, but radiant with joy, shouting, Life to the king and his house! Apparently the news are good, Miss Dance? News of the best! Five of us were admitted to the internal splendors, to the royal presence. This slim damsel, Louison Chabray, worker in sculpture, aged only seventeen, as being of the best looks and address, her we appointed speaker on whom, and indeed on all of us, his majesty looked nothing but graciousness. Nay, when Louison, addressing him, was like to faint, he took her in his royal arms and said gallantly, It was well worth while. Elle en valut bien le pain. Consider, O oh women, what a king! His words were of comfort, and that only. There shall be provision sent to Paris, if provision is in the world. Grain shall circulate free as air. Millers shall grind, or do worse, while their millstones endure, and nothing be left wrong which a restorer of French liberty can write. Good news these, but to wet menads, all too incredible. There seems no proof, then. Words of comfort are words only, which will feed nothing. O oh, miserable people, betrayed by aristocrats who corrupt thy very messengers. In his royal arms, Mademoiselle Louisanne, in his arms... Thou shameless minx worthy of a name, that shall be nameless. Yes, thy skin is soft, ours is rough with hardship, and well wedded wading here in the rain. No children hast thou hungry at home, only alabaster dolls that weep not. The traitress, to the lantern! And so poor Louison Chabray, no asservation or shrieks availing her, fair slim damsel, late in the arms of royalty, has a garter round her neck, and furibund Amazons at each end, is about to perish so, when two bodyguards gallop up, indignantly dissipating, and rescue her. The miscredited twelve hasten back to the chateau for an answer in writing. Nay, behold, a new flight of menads, with M. Brunon, Bastille Valentier, as impressed commandant at the head of it. These also will advance to the great of the grand court, and see what is toward. Human patience and wet buckskins has its limits. Bodyguard Lieutenant M. de Savonnières, for one moment, lets his temper, long provoked, long pent, give way. He not only dissipates these latter menads, but caracoles and cuts, or indignantly flourishes at M. Bernon, the impressed commandant, and finding great relief in it, even chases him. Bruno, flying nimbly, though in a pirouette manner, and now with sword also drawn, at which sight of wrath and victory two other bodyguards, for wrath is contagious, and to pent bodyguards is so solacing, do likewise give way, give chase with brandished sabre, and in the air make horrid circles, so that poor Bruno has nothing for it but to retreat with accelerated nimbleness, through rank after rank, Parthian-like, fencing as he flies, above all, shouting lustily, on lui, la s'assassinier. They are getting us assassinated? Shameful. Three against one. Growls come from the les contrain ranks. Bellowings. Lastly, shots. Savonnier's arm is raised to strike. The bullet of a les contrain musket shatters it. The brandished sabre jingles down harmless. Bruno has escaped. This duel well ended. But the wild howl of war is everywhere beginning to pipe. 
the Amazons recoil. Saint Antoine has cannon pointed, full of grape shot. Thrice applies the lit flambeau, which thrice refuses to catch. The touch holes are so wetted, and voices cry, Eretez, il n'est pas tant encore. Stop, it is not yet time. Messieurs of the garde de corps, ye had orders not to fire. Nevertheless, two of you limp dismounted, and one warhorse lies slain. Were it not well to draw back out of shot range, finally to file off into the interior? If in so filing off there did a musketoon or two discharge itself at these armed shopkeepers hooting and crowing, could man wonder? Draggled are your white cockades of an enormous size. Would to heaven they were got exchanged for tricolor ones. Your buckskins are wet, your hearts heavy. Go and return not. The bodyguard file off as we hint, giving and receiving shots, drawing no life-blood, leaving boundless indignation. Some three times in the thickening dusk a glimpse of them is seen at this or the other portal, saluted always with execrations, with the woo of lead. Let but a bodyguard shoe face he is hunted by rascality. For instance, poor M. de Mocheton of the Scotch Company, owner of the slain war-horse, and has to be smuggled off by the Versailles captains, or rusty firelocks belch after him, shivering asunder his hat. In the end, by superior order, the bodyguards, all but the few on immediate duty, disappear, or, as it were, abscond, and march under cloud of night to Rambouillet. Weber ubi supra. We remark also that the Versailles have now got ammunition. All afternoon the official person could find none, till, in these so critical moments, a patriotic sub-lieutenant set a pistol to his ear and would thank him to find some, which he thereupon succeeded in doing. Likewise, that Flandre, disarmed by Pallas Athena, says openly it will not fight with citizens, and for token of peace has exchanged cartridges with the Versailles. Sans culottism is now among mere friends, and can circulate freely, indignant at bodyguards, complaining also considerably of hunger. End of section 47《セクション48 of the French Revolution》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Buchanan The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle Volume 1, Book 7, Chapter 8 The Equal Diet But why lingers Monnier? returns not with his deputation. It is six, it is seven o'clock, and still no Mounier, no acceptance pure and simple. And behold, the dripping monads, not now in deputation but in mass, have penetrated into the assembly to the shamefullest interruption of public speaking and order of the day. Neither Maillard nor vice-president can restrain them, except within wide limits. Not even except for minutes can the lion voice of Mirabeau, though they applaud it. But ever and anon they break in upon the regeneration of France with cries of, Bread, not so much discoursing. Du pain, pastant de longs discours. So insensible were these poor creatures to the bursts of parliamentary eloquence. One learns also that the royal carriages are getting yoked, as if for Metz. Carriages, royal or not, have verily showed themselves at the back gates. They even produced or quoted a written order from our Versailles municipality, which is a monarchic, not a democratic one. However, Versailles patrols drove them in again, as the vigilant Le Contre had strictly charged them to do. A busy man, truly, is Major Le Contre in these hours. For Colonel d'Estaing loiters invisible in the Oil de Bouffe, Invisible, or still more questionably visible, for instance, then also a too loyal municipality requires supervision. No order, civil or military, taken about any of these thousand things. Le Contre is at the Versailles Town Hall. He is at the Great of the Grand Court, communing with Swiss and bodyguards. He is in the ranks of Flandre. He is here, he is there, studious to prevent bloodshed, to prevent the royal family from flying to Metz the menads from plundering Versailles. At the fall of night we behold him advance to those armed groups of Saint-Antoine. 
hovering all too grim near the salle des menus. They receive him in a half circle, twelve speakers behind cannons, with lighted torches in hand, the cannon mouths towards Le Contre, a picture for Salvatore. He asks, in temperate but courageous language, what they, by this their journey to Versailles, do specially want. The twelve speakers reply, in few words, inclusive of much, bread and the end of these prebles, du pain et la fin des affaires. When the affairs will end, no major le contre, nor no mortal can say. But as to bread, he inquires, how many are you? Learns that they are six hundred, that a loaf each will suffice, and rides off to the municipality to get six hundred loaves. Which loaves, however, a municipality of monarchic temper will not give. It will give two tons of rice, rather. Could you but know whether it should be boiled or raw? Nay, when this too is accepted, the municipals have disappeared, ducked under, as the six-and-twenty long gown of Paris did, and leaving not the smallest vestige of rice in the boiled or raw state, they there vanish from history. Rice comes not. One's hope of food is balked, even one's hope of vengeance. Is not in de Machoton of the Scotch company, as we said, deceitfully smuggled off? Failing all which, behold only in de Machoton's slain war-horse lying on the esplanade there. Saint Antoine, balked, esurient, pounces on the slain war-horse, flays it, roasts it with such fuel of paling gates, portable timber as can be come at, not without shouting, and, after the matter of ancient Greek heroes, they lifted their hands to the daintily readied repast, such as it might be. Other rascality prowls discursive, seeking what it may devour. Flandre will retire to its barracks, Le Contre also with his Versailles, all but the vigilant patrols charged to be doubly vigilant. So sink the shadows of night, blustering, rainy, and all paths grow dark. Strangest night ever seen in these regions, perhaps since the Bartholomew night, when Versailles, as the Bassompierre writes of it, was a chetif chateau. Oh, for the lyre of some Orpheus to constrain, with touch of melodious strings, these mad masses into order. For here all seems fallen asunder, in wide yawning dislocation. The highest, as in dune rushing of a world, is come in contact with the lowest, the rascality of France beleaguering the royalty of France. Iron-shod batons lifted round the diadem, not to guard it, with denunciations of bloodthirsty anti-national bodyguards, are heard dark growlings against a queenly name. The court sits tremulous, powerless, varies with the varying temper of the esplanade, with the varying color of the rumors from Paris. Thick coming rumors, now of peace, now of war. Necker and all the ministers consult with a blank issue. The oil de bouf is one tempest of whispers. We will fly to Metz, we will not fly. The royal carriages again attempt egress, though for trial merely. They are again driven in by Le Contre's patrols. In six hours, nothing has been resolved on, not even the acceptance, pure and simple. In six hours? Alas, he who, in such circumstances, cannot resolve in six minutes, may give up the enterprise. Him fate has already resolved for. And Menadism, meanwhile, and Sansculottism take counsel with the National Assembly, grows more and more tumultuous there. Mounier returns not. Authority nowhere shews itself. The authority of France lies, for the present, with Le Contre and Usher Maillard. This, then, is the abomination of desolation, come suddenly, though long foreshadowed as inevitable. For, to the blind, all things are sudden. Misery, which, through long ages, had no spokesman, no helper, will now be its own helper and speak for itself. The dialect, one of the rudest, is what it could be, this. At eight o'clock there returns to our assembly, not the deputation, but Dr. Guillotine, announcing that it will return, also that there is hope of the acceptance pure and simple. He himself has brought a royal letter, authorizing and commanding the freest circulation of grains. Which royal letter menadism with its whole heart applauds? Conformably to which the assembly forthwith passes a decree, also received with the rapturous monadic plaudits. Only could not an august assembly contrive further to fix the price of bread at eight sous the half-quartern, butcher's meat at six sous the pound, which seem fair rates. 
Such a motion do a multitude of men and women, irrepressible by Usher Maillard, now make. Now does an august assembly here made. Usher Maillard himself is not always perfectly measured in speech, but if rebuked he can justly excuse himself by the peculiarity of the circumstances. But finally this decree well passed, and the disorder continuing, and members melting away, and no President Monnier returning, what can the Vice-President do but also melt away? The assembly melts, under such pressure, into delinquium, or, as it is officially called, adjourns. Maillard is dispatched to Paris with the decree concerning grains in his pocket, he and some women in carriages belonging to the king. Thitherward, slim Louison Chabray has already set forth with that written answer which the twelve she-deputies returned in to seek. Slim sylph, she has set forth through the black muddy country. She has much to tell, her poor nerves so flurried, and travels as indeed to-day on this road all persons do, with extreme slowness. President Moynier has not come, nor the acceptance pure and simple, though six hours with their events have come, though courier on courier reports that Lafayette is coming, coming with war or with peace. It is time that the chateau also should determine on one thing or another, that the chateau also should show itself alive, if it would continue living. Victorious, joyful after such delay, Monnier does arrive at last, and the hard-earned acceptance with him, which now, alas, is of small value. Fancy Monnier's surprise to find his senate, whom he hoped to charm by the acceptance pure and simple, all gone, and in its stead a senate of menads. For as Erasmus's ape mimicked, say, with wooden splint, Erasmus shaving, so do these Amazons hold, in mock majesty, some confused parody of national assembly. They make motions, deliver speeches, pass enactments, productive at least of loud laughter. All galleries and benches are filled. A strong dame of the market is in Monnier's chair. Not without difficulty, Monnier, by aid of macers, and persuasive speaking, makes his way to the female president, the strong dame, before abdicating signifies that, for one thing, she and indeed her whole senate, male and female, for what was one roasted war-horse among so many, are suffering very considerably from hunger. Experienced Monnier in these circumstances takes a twofold resolution, to reconvoke his assembly members by sound of drum, also to procure a supply of food. Swift messengers fly to all bakers, cooks, pastry cooks, vintners, restorers. Drums beat, accompanied with shrill vocal proclamation, through all streets. They come, the assembly members come. What is still better, the provisions come. On tray and barrow come these latter, loaves, wine, great store of sausages. The nourishing baskets circulate harmoniously among the benches, nor, according to the father of epics, did any soul lack a fair share of victual an equal diet, highly desirable at the moment. Gradually, some hundred or so of assembly members get edged in. Menadism, making way a little, round Monnier's chair, listen to the acceptance pure and simple, and begin, what is the order of the night, discussion of the penal code. All benches are crowded. In the dusky galleries, duskier with unwashed heads, is a strange coruscation of impromptu billhooks. It is exactly five months this day since these same galleries were filled with high-plumed, jeweled beauty, reigning bright influences, and now, to such length have we got in regenerating France. Methinks the travail throws are of the sharpest. Menadism will not be restrained from occasional remarks. Asks, what is the use of the penal code? The thing we want is bread. Mirabeau turns round with lion-voiced rebuke. Menadism applauds him, but recommences. Thus they, chewing tough sausages, discussing the penal code, make night hideous. What the issue will be? Lafayette, with his thirty thousand, must arrive first. Him, who cannot now be distant, all men expect, as the messenger of destiny. End of section 48《Oliver Vox》recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or if you wish to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim McDougall. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Seven, Chapter Nine. Lafayette. Towards midnight, lights flare on the hill, 
Lafayette's lights. The roll of his drums comes up the avenue de Versailles. With peace or with war? Patience, friends, with neither. Lafayette has come, but not yet the catastrophe. He has halted and harangued so often on the march, spent nine hours on four leagues of road. At Montreuil, close on Versailles, the whole host had to pause, and with uplifted right hand in the murk of night, to these pouring skies, swear solemnly to respect the king's dwelling, to be faithful to king and national assembly. Rage is driven down out of sight by the laggard march, the thirst of vengeance slaked in weariness and soaking clothes. Flandre is again drawn out under arms, but Flandre, grown so patriotic, now needs no exterminating. The way-worn battalions halt in the avenue. They have, for the present, no wish so pressing as that of shelter and rest. Anxious sits President Mounier, anxious the chateau. There is a message coming from the chateau that Monsieur Mounier would please return thither with a fresh deputation swiftly and to at least unite our two anxieties. Anxious Mounier does of himself send, meanwhile, to apprise the general that his majesty has been so gracious as to grant us the acceptance, pure and simple. The general, with a small advance column, makes answer in passing, speaks vaguely some smooth words to the national president, glances only with the eye at that so mixed a form national assembly, then fares forward towards the chateau. There are with him two Paris municipals. They were chosen from the three hundred for that errand. He gets admittance through the locked and padlocked grates, through sentries and ushers, to the royal halls. The court, male and female, crowds on his passage to read their doom on his face, which exhibits, say historians, a mixture of sorrow, of fervor, and valor, singular to behold. The king, with monsieur, with ministers and marshals, is waiting to receive him. He has come, in his high-flowing, chivalrous way, to offer his head for the safety of his majesties. The two municipals state the wish of Paris for things of quite pacific tenor. First, that the honor of guarding his sacred person be conferred on patriot national guards, say the center grenadiers, who, as guard Francaise, were wont to have that privilege. Second, that provisions be got if possible. Third, that the prisons, all crowded with political delinquents, may have judges sent them. Fourth, that it would please His Majesty to come and live in Paris. To all which four wishes, except the fourth, His Majesty answers readily. Yes, or indeed may almost say that he has already answered it. To the fourth, he can answer only yes or no would so gladly answer yes and no. But in any case, are not their dispositions, thank heaven, so entirely pacific? There is time for deliberation. The brunt of the danger seems past. Lafayette and Destin settle the watches. Sander grenadiers are to take the guard room they of old occupied as guard francais. For indeed the guard de corps, its late ill-advised occupants, are gone mostly to Rambouillet. That is the order of this night. Sufficient for the night is the evil thereof. Whereupon Lafayette and the two municipals, with high flow and chivalry, take their leave. So brief has the interview been, Mounier and his deputation were not yet got up. So brief and satisfactory, a stone is rolled from every heart. The fair palace dames publicly declare that this Lafayette, detestable though he be, is their savior for once. Even the ancient Venegris taunts admitted, the king's aunts, ancient grail and sisterhood, known to us of old. Queen Marie Antoinette has been heard often say the like. She alone, among all women and all men, wore a face of courage, of lofty calmness and resolve this day. She alone saw clearly what she meant to do, and Theresa's daughter dares to do what she means, were all France threatening her. Abide where her children are, where her husband is. Towards three in the morning, all things are settled. The watch is set, the center grenadiers put into their old guard room and harangued, the Swiss and few remaining bodyguards harangued, the way-worn Paris battalions, consigned to the hospitality of Versailles, lie dormant in spare beds, spare barracks, coffee houses, empty churches. A troop of them, 
on their way to the church of Saint Louis, awoke poor Weber, dreaming troublous in the Rue Sartory. Weber has had his waistcoat pocket full of balls all day, two hundred balls and two pairs of powder, for waistcoats were waistcoats then, and had flaps down to mid-thigh. So many balls he has had all day, but no opportunity of using them. He turns over now, execrating disloyal bandits, swears a prayer or two, and straight to sleep again. Finally, the National Assembly is harangued, which thereupon, on motion of Mirabeau, discontinues the penal code and dismisses for this night. Menadism, sans has cowered into guardhouses, barracks of Flandre, to the light of cheerful fire, failing that to churches, office houses, sentry boxes, wheresoever wretchedness can find a lair. The troublous day has brawled itself to rest. No lives yet lost but that of one war horse. Insurrectionary chaos lies slumbering round the palace, like ocean round a diving bell. No crevice yet disclosing itself. Deep sleep has fallen promiscuously on the high and on the low, suspending most things, even wrath and famine. Darkness covers the earth, but far on the northeast, Paris flings up her great yellow gleam, far into the wet black night, for all is illuminated there, as in the old July nights, the streets deserted, for alarm of war, the municipals all wakeful, patrols hailing with their horse who goes. There, as we discover, our poor slim Louison Chabray, her poor nerves all fluttered, is arriving about this very hour. There, Usher Maillard will arrive, about an hour hence, toward four in the morning. They report successively to a wakeful Hôtel de Ville what comfort they can report, which again, with early dawn, large comfortable placards shall impart to all men. Lafayette, in the Hôtel de Noailles, not far from the chateau, having now finished haranguing, sits with his officers consulting. At five o'clock, the unanimous best counsel is that a man so tossed and toiled for twenty-four hours and more fling himself on a bed and seek some rest. Thus, then, has ended the first act of the insurrection of women. How will it turn on the morrow? The morrow, as always, is with the fates. But his majesty, one may hope, will consent to come honorably to Paris. At all events, he can visit Paris. Anti-national bodyguards, here and elsewhere, must take the national oath, make reparations of the tricolor. Flandre will swear. There may be much swearing, much public speaking there will infallibly be, and so with harangues and vows may the matter in some handsome way wind itself up. Or, alas, may it not be all otherwise unhandsome, the consent not honorable, but extorted, ignominious. Boundless chaos of insurrection presses slumbering round the palace, like ocean round a diving bell, and may penetrate at any crevice. Let but that accumulated insurrectionary mass find entrance, like the infinite inburst of water, or, say rather, of inflammable, self-igniting fluid, for example, turpentine and phosphorus oil, fluid known to Spinola Santerre. End of section 49section 50 of the french revolution this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jeff allen the french revolution by thomas carlyle volume 1 book 7 chapter 10 the grand entreaties the dull dawn of a new morning drizzling and chill but had broken off over versailles when it pleased destiny that a bodyguard should look out of window on the right wing of the chateau to see what prospect there was in heaven and in earth. Rascality, male and female, is prowling in view of him. His fasting stomach is, with good cause, sour. He perhaps cannot forbear a passing malice on them. Least of all can he forbear answering such. Ill words breed worse, till the worst word came, and then the ill deed. Did the maldicent bodyguard, getting, as was too inevitable, better maldiction than he gave? 
load his musketoon and threaten to fire, and actually fire, were wise to whist. It stands asserted, to us not credibly. Be this as it may, menaced rascality and whinnying scorn is shaking at all greats the fastenings of one. Some write it was a chain merely. Gives way. Rascality is in the grand court, whinnying louder still. The male dissient bodyguard, more bodyguards than he do now give fire. A man's arm is shattered. Lecointe will depose that the Sieur Cardain, a national guard without arms, was stabbed. But see, sure enough, poor Jerome the Heretier, an unarmed national guard he too, cabinet maker, a saddler's son, of Paris, with the down of youthhood still on his chin. He reels death-stricken, rushes to the pavement, scattering it with his blood and brains. Alleluia! Wilder than Irish wakes rises the howl of pity, of intense revenge. In a few moments, the great of the inner and inmost court, which they name the Court of Marble, this too is forced, or surprised, and burst open. The Court of Marble, too, is overflowed. Up the grand staircase, up all stairs and entrances, rushes the living deluge. The Chutes and Verigny, the two sentry bodyguards, are trodden down, are massacred with a hundred pikes. Women snatch their cutlasses or any weapon and storm in monadic. Other women lift the corpse of the shot Jerome, lay it on the marble steps. There shall the livid face and smashed head, dumb forever, speak. Woe now to all bodyguards. Mercy is none for them. Mion Mandre de Saint-Marie pleads with soft words on the grand staircase descending four steps to the roaring tornado. His comrades snatch him up by the skirts and belts, literally from the jaws of destruction, and slam to their door. This also will stand few instants. The panels shivering in like pots herds. Barricade serves not. Fly fast, ye bodyguards. Rabid insurrection like the hellhound chase. Uproaring at your heels. The terror-struck bodyguards fly, bolting and barricading. It follows. Witherward! Through hall on hall. Woe now! Towards the queen's suite of rooms, in the furthest room of which the queen is now asleep, five sentinels rush through that long suite. They are in the ant room, knocking loud. Save the queen! Trembling women fall at their feet with tears, are answered. Yes, we will die. Save ye the queen. Tremble not, women, but haste, for lo, another voice shouts far. Through the outermost door. Save the queen! And the door shut. It is brave Miomendre's voice that shouts the second warning. He has stormed across imminent death to do it. Fronts imminent death. Having done it. Brave Tardive du Repari, bent on the same desperate service, was borne down with pikes. His comrades hardly snatch him in again alive. Mio Mandre and Tarbide let the names of these two bodyguards, as the names of brave men should, live long. Trembling maids of honor, one whom, from afar, caught glimpse of Mio Mandre, as well as heard him, hastily wrapped the queen, not in robes of state, she flies for her life across the Oil de Bouffe, against the main door of which, too, insurrection batters. She is in the king's apartment, in the king's arms. She clasps her children amid a faithful few. The imperial hearted bursts into mother's tears. Oh, my friends, save me and my children. O oh, mia mis, suave moi mia fons. The battering of insurrectionary axes clangs audible across the Oil de Bouffe. What an hour! Yes, friends, a hideous, fearful hour, shameful alike to governed and governor, wherein governed and governor ignominiously testify that their relation is at an end. Rage, which had brewed itself in twenty thousand hearts for the last four and twenty hours, has taken fire. Jerome's brained corpse lies there as live coal. It is, as we said, the infinite element bursting in, wild surging through all corridors and conduits. Meanwhile, the poor bodyguard have got hunted mostly into the Oeil de Bouffe. They may die there at the king's threshold. 
they can do little to defend it. They are heaping tabourets, stools of honor, benches and all movables against the door at which the axe of insurrection thunders. But did brave Mjolmin Dre perish, then, at the queen's door? No, he was fractured, slashed, lacerated, left for dead. He has nevertheless crawled hither, and shall live, honored of loyal France. Remark also, in flat contradiction to much which has been said and sung, that insurrection did not burst that door he had defended, but hurried elsewhither, seeking new bodyguards. Poor bodyguards with their thesis, opera repast. Well, for them, that insurrection has only pikes and axes, no right sieging tools. It shakes and thunders. Must they all perish miserably, and royalty with them? The Schutz and Varigny, massacred at the first inbreak, have been beheaded in the marble court, a sacrifice to Jerome's manes. Jordan, with a tiled beard, did that duty willingly, and asked if there were no more. Another captive they are leading round the corpse, with howling chauntings. May not Jordan again tuck up his sleeves? and louder and louder rages insurrection within, plundering if it cannot kill. Louder and louder it thunders at the oil de bouffe. What can now hinder its bursting in? On a sudden it ceases. The battering has ceased. Wild rushings, the cries grow fainter. There is silence, or the tramp of regular steps. Then a friendly knocking. We are the centre grenadiers, old guards francais. Open to us, messieurs of the Garde de Cour. We have not forgotten how you saved us at Fontenoy. The door is open. Enter Captain Gondrain and the centre Grenardiers. There are military embracings. There is a sudden deliverance from death into life. Strange sons of Adam. It was to exterminate these Garde de Cour that the centre Grenardier left home, and now they have rushed to save them from extermination. The memory of common peril, of old help, melts the rough heart. Bosom is clasped to bosom, not in war. The king shows himself one moment through the door of his apartment with, Do not hurt my guards! Soyons, frere! Let us be brothers! cries the captain Gondran, and again dashes off with leveled bayonets to sweep the palace clear. Now too Lafayette, suddenly roused, not from sleep, for his eyes had not yet closed, arrives with passionate popular eloquence, with prompt military word of command, National Guard suddenly roused by sound of trumpet and alarm drum, are all arriving. The death melee ceases. The first skyland bent blaze of insurrection is got damped down. It burns now, if unextinguished yet flameless, as charred coals do, and not inextinguishable. The king's apartments are safe. Ministers, officials, and even some loyal national deputies are assembling round their majesties. The consternation will, with sobs and confusion, settle down gradually into plan and counsel, better or worse. But glance now for a moment from the royal windows, a roaring sea of human heads, inundating both courts, billowing against all passages, Menatic women, infuriated men, mad with revenge, with love of mischief, love of plunder. Rascality has slipped its muzzle, and now bays, three-throated like the dog of Erebus. Fourteen bodyguards are wounded, two massacred, and as we saw, beheaded. Jordain asking, Was it worth while to come so far for two? Hapless to shoots and Varigny, their fate surely was sad whirled down so suddenly to the abyss as men are. Suddenly, by the wide thunder of the mountain avalanche, awakened not by them, awakened far off by others. When the chateau clock last struck, they too were pacing languid with poised musketoon, anxious mainly that the next hour would strike. It has struck, to them, an audible. Their trunks lie mangled, their heads parade on pikes twelve feet long, through the streets of Versailles, and shall about noon reach the barriers of Paris, a too ghastly contradiction to the large comfortable placards that have been posted there. 
the other captive bodyguard is still circling the corpse of Jerome amid Indian war whooping. Bloody Tal Beard, with tucked sleeves, brandishing his bloody axe when Gundran and the Grenadiers come in sight. Comrades, will you see a man massacred in cold blood? Off, butchers, answer they, and the poor bodyguard is free. Busy runs Gundran. Busy runs guards and captains, scouring at all corridors, dispersing rascality and robbery, sweeping the palace clear. The mangled carnage is removed. Jerome's body to the town hall for inquest. The fire of insurrection gets damped more and more into measurable, manageable heat. Transcend things of all sorts, as in the general outburst of multitudinous passion, are huddled together, the ludicrous, nay, the ridiculous, with the horrible. Far over the billowy sea of heads may be seen rascality, caprioling on horses from the royal stud, the spoilers these, for patriotism is always infected so, with a proportion of mere thieves and scoundrels. Gondran snatched their prey from them in the chateau, whereupon they hurried to the stables and took horses there. But the generous Diomedes' steeds, according to Weber, disdained such scoundrel burden, and flinging up their royal heels did soon project most of it in parabolic curves to a distance amid peals of laughter, and were caught. Mounted National Guards secured the rest. Now, too, is witnessed the touching last flicker of etiquette, which sinks not here, in the Chimerian world wreckage, without a sign, as the house cricket might still chirp in the pealing of a trump of doom. Monsieur, said some master of ceremonies, one hopes it might be debris as Lafayette in these fearful moments was rushing toward the inner royal apartment. Monsieur le Roy, who accord le grand entry? Monsieur, the king grants you the grand entries, not finding it convenient to refuse them. End of section 50 Section 51 of The French Revolution this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 7, Chapter 11. From Versailles. However, the Paris National Guard, wholly under arms, has cleared the palace and even occupies the nearer external spaces, extruding miscellaneous patriotism, for most part, into the grand court, or even into the forecourt. The bodyguards, you can observe, have now of a verity hoisted the national cockade, for they step forward to the windows or balconies, hat aloft in hand, on each hat a huge tricolour, and fling over their bandoliers in sign of surrender, and shout, Vive la nation! To which, how can the generous heart respond but with Vive le roi! Vive les gardes du corps! His Majesty himself has appeared with Lafayette on the balcony, and again appears. Vive le roi! greets him from all throats, but also from some one throat is heard Le roi à Paris! The king to Paris! Her Majesty, too, on demand, shows herself, though there is peril in it. She steps out on the balcony with a little boy and girl. No children! Point d'enfant! cried at voices. She gently pushes back her children and stands alone, her hands serenely crossed on her breast. Should I die, she had said, I will do it. Such serenity of heroism has its effect. Lafayette, with ready wit, in his high-flown, chivalrous way, takes that fair, queenly hand, and reverently kneeling, kisses it. Thereupon the people do shout, Vive la Reine! Nevertheless, poor Weber saw, or even thought he saw, for hardly the third part of poor Weber's experiences in such hysterical days will stand scrutiny. One of these brigands level his musket at Her Majesty with or without intention to shoot, for another of the brigands angrily struck it down. So that all, and the queen herself, 
nay, the very captain of the bodyguards, have grown national. The very captain of the bodyguards steps out now with Lafayette. On the head of the repentant man is an enormous tricolour, large as a soup platter or sunflower, visible to the utmost forecourt. He takes the national oath with a loud voice, elevating his head, at which sight all the army raise their bonnets on their bayonets with shouts. Sweet is reconcilement to the heart of man. Lafayette has sworn Flandre. He swears the remaining bodyguards down in the marble court. The people clasp them in their arms. Oh, my brothers, why would you force us to slay you? Behold, there is joy over you, as over returning prodigal sons. The poor bodyguards, now national and tricolor, exchange bonnets, exchange arms. There shall be peace and fraternity. And still, vive le roi, and also le roi à Paris, not now from one throat, but from all throats as one, for it's the heart's wish of all mortals. Yes, the king to Paris, what else? Ministers may consult, and national deputies wag their heads, but there is now no other possibility. You have forced him to go willingly. At one o'clock, Lafayette gives audible assurance to that purpose and universal insurrection with immeasurable shout, and a discharge of all the firearms, clear and rusty, great and small, that it has, returns him acceptance. What a sound, heard for leagues, a doom peal! That sound, too, rolls away into the silence of ages, and the chateau of Versailles stands ever since vacant, hushed still. Its spacious courts grass-grown, responsive to the hoe of the weeder. Times and generations roll on in their confused gulf current, and buildings, like builders, have their destiny. Till one o'clock, then, there will be three parties, National Assembly, National Rascality, National Royalty, all busy enough. Rascality rejoices, women trim themselves with tricolour. Nay, motherly Paris has sent her avengers sufficient cartloads of loaves, which are shouted over, which are gratefully consumed. The avengers, in return, are searching for grain stores, loading them in fifty wagons, that so a national king, probable harbinger of all blessings, may be the evident bringer of plenty, for one. And thus has sansculottism made prisoner its king, revoking his parole. The monarchy has fallen, and not so much as honourably, no, ignominiously, with struggle indeed oft repeated, but then with unwise struggle, wasting its strength in fits and paroxysms, at every new paroxysm foiled more pitifully than before. Thus Broglie's whiff of grape-shot, which might have been something, has dwindled to the pot valor of an opera repast, and, O oh Richard, O oh mon roi, which again we shall see dwindle to a favra conspiracy, a thing to be settled by the hanging of one chevalier. Poor monarchy! But what save foulest defeat can await that man who wills and yet wills not? Apparently the king either has a right, assertable as such to the death, before God and man, or else he has no right. Apparently the one or the other. Could he but know which? May heaven pity him! Were Louis wise, he would this day abdicate. Is it not strange so few kings abdicate, and none yet heard of has been known to commit suicide? Fritz I of Prussia alone tried it, and they cut the rope. As for the National Assembly, which decrees this morning that it is inseparable from His Majesty and will follow him to Paris, there may one thing be noted, its extreme want of bodily health. After the 14th of July there was a certain sickliness observable among honourable members, so many demanding passports on account of infirm health. But now, for these following days, there is a perfect murian. President Mounier, Lally Tollendal, Clermont Tonnerre, and all constitutional two-chamber royalists needing change of air, as most no-chamber royalists had formerly done. For in truth, it is the second emigration, this, that has now come, most extensive among commons deputies, noblesse, clergy, 
so that to Switzerland alone there go sixty thousand. They will return in the day of accounts, yes, and have hot welcome. But emigration on emigration is the peculiarity of France. One emigration follows another, grounded on reasonable fear, unreasonable hope, largely also on childish pet. The high flyers have gone first, now the lower flyers, and ever the lower will go down to the crawlers. Whereby, however, cannot our National Assembly so much the more commodiously make the Constitution? Your two-chamber Anglomaniacs being all safe, distant on foreign shores. Abbe Mori is seized and sent back again. He, tough as tan leather, with eloquent Captain Cazal and some others, will stand it out for another year. But here, meanwhile, the question arises— was Philippe d'Orléans seen this day in the Bois de Boulogne, in grey surtout, waiting under the wet sere foliage, what the day might bring forth? Alas, yes, the Eidolon of him was, in Weber's and other such brains. The Châtelet shall make large inquisition into the matter, examining a hundred and seventy witnesses, and Deputy Chabrou publish his report, but disclose nothing further. What, then, has caused these two unparalleled October days? For surely such dramatic exhibition never yet enacted itself without dramatist and machinist. Wooden punch emerges not, with its domestic sorrows, into the light of day, unless the wire be pulled. How can human mobs? Was it not Dorléans, then, and Laclos, Marquis Sillery, Mirabeau, and the Sons of Confusion, hoping to drive the king to Metz and gather the spoil. Nay, was it not, quite contrariwise, the Eur de Boeuf, bodyguard Colonel de Guiche, minister Saint-Priest, and high-flying loyalists, hoping also to drive him to Metz and try it by the sword of civil war? Good Marquis Toulonjon, the historian and deputy, feels constrained to admit that it was both. Alas, my friends, credulous incredulity is a strange matter. But when a whole nation is smitten with suspicion and sees a dramatic miracle in the very operation of the gastric juices, what help is there? Such nation is already a mere hypochondriac bundle of diseases, as good as changed into glass, atrabilir, decadent, and will suffer crises. Is not suspicion itself the one thing to be suspected? as Montaigne feared only fear. Now, however, the short hour has struck. His Majesty is in his carriage, with his Queen, Sister Elizabeth, and two royal children. Not for another hour can the infinite procession get marshalled and under way. The weather is dim drizzling, the mind confused, and noise great. Processional marches not a few our world has seen, Roman triumphs and ovations, Kabiric symbol beatings, royal progresses, Irish funerals, but this of the French monarchy marching to its bed remained to be seen. Miles long and of breath losing itself in vagueness, for all the neighboring country crowds to see. Slow, stagnating along, like shoreless lake, yet with a noise like Niagara, like Babel and Bethlehem, a splashing and a tramping, a hurrahing, uproaring, musket-volleying, the truest segment of chaos seen in these latter ages, till slowly it disembogue itself in the thickening dusk into expectant Paris through a double row of faces all the way from Passy to the Hôtel de Ville. Consider this, vanguard of national troops, with trains of artillery, of pikemen and pikewomen, mounted on cannons, on carts, hackney-coaches, or on foot, tripudiating, in tricolor ribbons from head to heel, loaves stuck on the point of bayonets, green bows stuck in gun-barrels. Next, as main march, fifty cartloads of corn which have been lent for peace from the stores of Versailles, behind which follow stragglers of the Garde du Corps, all humiliated in grenadier bonnets. Close on these comes the royal carriage, come royal carriages, for there are a hundred national deputies, too, among whom sits Mirabeau, 
his remarks not given. Then finally, pell-mell, as rear-guard, Flandre, Swiss, hundred Swiss, other bodyguards, brigands, whosoever cannot get before. Between and among all which masses flows without limit Saint Antoine and the Menetic cohort. Menetic especially about the royal carriage, tripudiating there, covered with tricolour, singing elusive songs, pointing with one hand to the royal carriage, which the illusions hit, and pointing to the provision wagons with the other hand, and these words, Courage, friends, we shall not want bread now, we are bringing you the baker, the bakeress and baker's boy. Le boulanger, la boulangère, et le petit mitron. The wet day draggles the tricolour, but the joy is unextinguishable. Is not all well now? Ah, madame, notre bonne reine, said some of these strong women some days hence. Ah, madame, our good queen, don't be a traitor any more. Ne soyez plus traître, and we will all love you. Poor Weber went splashing along, close by the royal carriage, with a tear in his eye. Their majesties did me the honour, or I thought they did it, to testify from time to time, by shrugging of the shoulders, by looks directed to heaven, the emotions they felt. Thus, like frail cockle, floats the royal lifeboat, helmless, on black deluges of rascality. Mercier, in his loose way, estimates the procession and assistance at two hundred thousand. He says it was one boundless inarticulate ha-ha, transcendent world laughter, comparable to the Saturnalia of the ancients. Why not? Here, too, as we said, is human nature once more human. Shudder at it, whoso is of shuddering humour. Yet, behold, it is human. It has swallowed all formulas. It tripudiates even so. For which reason they that collect vases and antiques, with figures of dancing bacchants, in wild and all but impossible positions, may look with some interest on it. Thus, however, has the slow-moving chaos, or modern Saturnalia of the ancients, reached the barrier, and must hold, to be harangued by Mayor Bailly. Thereafter it has to lumber along, between the double row of faces, in the transcendent heaven-lashing ha-ha, two hours longer, towards the Hôtel de Ville. Then again to be harangued there, by several persons, by Moreau de Saint-Marie, among others, Moreau of the Three Thousand Orders, now National Deputy for San Domingo, to all which poor Louis, who seemed to experience a slight emotion on entering this town hall, can answer only that he comes with pleasure, with confidence among his people. Mayor Bailly, in reporting it, forgets confidence, and the poor Queen says eagerly, Add with confidence, Messieurs, rejoins Bailly, you are happier than if I had not forgot. Finally, the king is shown on an upper balcony, by torchlight, with a huge tricolour in his head, and all the people, says Weber, grasped one another's hands, thinking now surely the new era was born. Hardly till eleven at night can royalty get to its vacant, long-deserted palace of the Tuileries, to lodge there, somewhat in strolling player fashion. It is Tuesday, the 6th of October, 1789. Poor Louis has two other Paris processions to make, one ludicrous, ignominious like this, the other not ludicrous nor ignominious, but serious, nay, sublime. End of the first volume End of section 51 End of the French Revolution, Volume 1 by Thomas Carlyle